CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I shall not assign time or place to the story that follows. It could have happened decades ago in one of several localities. Very likely it is happening somewhere right now. And it can happen all over the world at some indefinite time in the future if we relax our vigilance. For it is but one small episode occurring in a totalitarian state. Benjamin Ankek! Benjamin Ankek! Benjamin! Uh, uh, yes, what? What is it? I wouldn't do that if I were you. I'm trying to find my husband. Take my advice. Don't. Do you know him? My husband, Benjamin Antek. No, I don't know him. And neither does anyone else. <laughs> mystery drama, In the Dark, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Totalitarianism means precisely what it says. Of course, you are not permitted to oppose, but more than that, and more terrible, you are not even permitted to consent. You are only allowed to surrender, both mind and soul, to a vague and ill-defined power, to a pervasive, half-hidden terror. In short, you are required to give up everything that makes you, you. What is incredible is that so many people are not only willing, but eager to do just that. Benjamin Antek, open up. Antek, it's the police. We know you're in there. Open up. Bruno, you saw him come in, didn't you? Ah, you're Benjamin Antek. Yes, I'm Benjamin Antek. State police, you come with us. Hmm. May I ask why? What for? You'll find out. <laughs> Am I supposed to have done something? Get your coat. Well, I think there's been some mistake. I'm a musician. I play the cello. I don't mix in anything political, anything like that. Bruno, uh, get his coat for him. Well, I'm, I'm not interested in that sort of thing. I, I just play the cello. I'm part of a trio. A cello, flute, and... Uh, that's good. Thank you, Bruno. Here, uh, put this on. You'll need it. It's cold outside. <laughs> I can't imagine what you want with me. Put it on. This has to be a mistake of some kind. Ready? Well, I'd like to leave a note for my wife. No time for that. But she'll be home soon. Let's get going. Yeah, I suppose it's best to get this cleared up. That's the idea. So, let's go. Benjamin, I'm home. I thought you'd meet me at the station. What happened? You were rehearsing with Peter and forgot? Oh, your mother's going to be all right. She'll be glad to hear... Benjamin? Where are you? Are you home? You in here? Oh, I must say, that's pretty inconsiderate. After a whole month? <sighs> His own mother. I should think at least he'd want to hear about her. <sighs> yes? Hello? It's Karen, Mother Antek. Oh, Karen. You 
got home all right. Uh, yes, I got home all right. Uh, no trouble at the border. No trouble. How are you feeling? Oh, tip top, fit as a fiddle. How is Benjamin, okay? As uh, far as I know, he didn't meet me at the station. Didn't meet you at the station? Well, that's not like my Benjamin. Uh, let me speak to him. I'll give him a talking to. Well, he's not here. Well, where is he? I don't know. I thought at first he might be rehearsing with Peter Conrad. Peter plays the flute, you know. He and Helena live right downstairs. But Benjamin's cello is here, so that's not where he is. So, I guess I'll just have to wait for him to come home. Oh, Karen, if he doesn't come home soon, you know, he he could have had an accident. If he doesn't show up in 10, 15 minutes, I'll start calling the hospitals. Or, um... Or the police, huh? Um, all right, yes. Now, I'd, I'd better hang up. Benjamin may be trying to call me from wherever he is. Oh, yeah. He'll call. He'll call. Better still, he'll walk through the door. Uh, and, and when he does, Karen, you let me know, huh? One worries, you know. I know. Goodbye, my dear. Goodbye, Mother Antic. Benjamin, where are you? One worries, you know. Helena, you home? Who is it? It's Karen. All right to come in? I'm awfully busy, Karen. I need to talk to you, Helena. Well... Please? Helena, is Benjamin here? Who? Benjamin. There's nobody here but me. Uh, look, could I come in for a minute? No, I'm, I'm cleaning. The children will be home from school in an hour, and I, I well, was... It's just for a minute. I need to talk to somebody. Well, thank you. Uh, just for a minute. Well, what did you want to talk about? I, uh... I must say you don't seem very glad to see me. It's been a whole month. Has it been that long? Yes, Benjamin's mother's been quite sick. I've been looking after her. You crossed the border? It wasn't hard. Nobody tried to stop me. You were lucky. Well, maybe. Anyhow, Mrs. Antek is all right now. I had expected Benjamin to meet my train, but he wasn't there, so I came on home by myself. When I got here, there were no Benjamins. Really? My first thought was... Well, of course, he's down here with Peter. They're practicing. But then I saw Benjamin's cello, so then I thought... I really... I didn't know what to think. I was sort of upset. Oh, would you move your feet, would you, please? Oh, yes, sure. Thanks. Uh, I phoned Mother Antek and told her about Benjamin not being in the apartment. She said call the hospitals in case he'd had an accident. And, and she said call the police. Did you? Well, that's what I'd been doing. And? Nothing. I mean, nobody knows anything. Listen, Karen, he he'll show up. I know, but I was going crazy waiting, so I thought I'd just come down here. I thought maybe you or Peter oh, would... Oh, you, you can put your feet down now. Uh, Helena, did... Did you hear anything, anybody... I mean, did you hear anybody come to the house? If anybody did, they'd have to go right past your apartment to get to the stairs. So, did you hear anybody? No, I, I didn't hear a thing. Well, did Peter? I'm... Um, Sure, I don't know. Uh, well, when will he be home so I can ask him? He won't be home. Oh, you mean he's away? Yes. Yes, he's he's away. Where? Where'd he go? When will he be back? Look, I might as well tell you, Karen. Peter and I are divorced. Divorced? I just got my decree. But I thought you and Peter were... were so happy together. <sighs> Oh, one never knows, does one? About other people. I simply can't believe it. What about the children? That's why I had to divorce him. Because of the children. Helena, you're not making sense. Peter adores the children. They adore him. Look, Karen, I, I really don't want to talk about it. It's just too painful. You understand, don't you? Well, I, I, I guess I do. Oh, look. 
I'm sure you and Peter will get back together again. Not a chance. Oh, sure you will. First time he comes around and asks you to take him back, you'll say yes Look, and... Look, if he so much as shows his face at that door, I'll chase him down the street. Oh, really, really, Karen, I've got to finish up this cleaning before the children get home, so if you don't mind, I... Helena, you... You really don't want me here, do you? But it's not that, Karen. Yes, I... it is that. That's exactly what it is. I don't know what I've done to offend you, Helena, but obviously I've done something. I... All I can say is I... I'm sorry. Oh, Karen, I... I'm... Uh... I'm going back upstairs and wait for Benjamin. Oh, Karen, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Yes? Hello? Hello? Karen, dear. Oh. Oh, Mother Antec, it's you. I, I was hoping... You haven't heard from Benjamin... He hasn't come home. Uh, neither one. I'm starting to worry. Of course you are. Look, m maybe I should come and stay with you. No, no, no. You mustn't do that. You've been very sick. If anything should happen to you... But I don't like crossing the border, but if you need me... I'll be all right. Uh, Helena Conrad's right downstairs, oh, you know. Oh, yes, yes. Helena and Peter. Well, Helena anyway. She just told me she's divorced Peter. My goodness. Why did she do that? Uh, because of the children, she said. The children? Uh, what have the children got to do with it? Well, that's what I said, but she didn't seem to want to talk about it. Uh, actually, she didn't seem to want to talk to me about anything. She was very nervous and tense. I don't know. We've been such good friends. I, I really couldn't understand it at all. I, I don't understand it either. I, I just wanted to talk to somebody. Helena was so withdrawn, so hostile. I'm sure I must have hurt her feelings without knowing it, but I don't know when I could have done that because I haven't been here for a whole month. No, no, Karen, dear. But don't let it upset you too much. Oh, uh, well, it... This makes me feel so alone. I'm, I'm sure you have other friends, dear, to, to talk to. Of course. Of course I have. Oh, Mother Antek, I have to hang up. There's someone at the door. Oh, Benjamin. Oh, he wouldn't knock. Look, I'll call you when I know something. Oh, please, please do. Goodbye, my dear. Karen? Helena. Oh, Helen, I'm so glad. Come in, come in. I, I can't stay. I, I just wanted to tell you I'm sorry about... Well, you know, before. I mean, if I was That's rude... That's all right. Please, come in. No, I, I better not. Look, Karen, you said you went to the police. Yes, and I called the hospital. Where did you go? Down to the police station. Well, yes, of course. Who did you talk to? Uh, the officer at the desk, and he talked to some others. Men in uniform? Well, yes, they were in uniform. Then they were the regular police. Well, of course. Why? The regular police wear uniforms. The secret police don't. <laughs> Secret police in a totalitarian state do not wear uniforms. They are plain clothesmen. And theirs is a department unto itself, separate from the others. No one knows who appoints them. Perhaps they appoint themselves. But their knock on the door of a citizen is the first signal that he is losing control over his destiny. I'll continue shortly with Act Two. entire population is of one mind, then no individual has any mind at all. If all speak with one voice, 
then no one is saying anything. But this is the fundamental aim of the totalitarian state, to break each mind and silence each voice. The ultimate would be realized when every citizen looked precisely like every other citizen, ending in a mass of faceless people. Did you hear what I said, Karen? You were talking about the police, the regular police, the ones you talk to. They wear uniforms. The secret police don't. Are you trying to tell me that Benjamin, that it was the secret police that they took him? It's happened to other people. Happens all the time. But Benjamin, he, uh, he doesn't take any interest. He doesn't have any interest in things like that. He doesn't even go to the rallies. Very suspicious. Well, they, they can't take somebody away for just not doing something. Uh, oh, can't they? Can they? They can take you away for not applauding at the movies at the proper time. I can't believe Or laughing at the improper time. I never did anything. <laughs> Music was his whole life. Music, our home, and me. That's all he cared about. What could they have against him? What could they possibly charge him with? Oh, you know their motto, don't you? Give us the man, we'll find the charges. It's crazy. That's completely crazy. Of course, I can think of one reason they might have come for Benjamin. You can? Benjamin was very close to Peter. Well, of course, they were friends. They played duets together. And lived in the same building. And often had a drink together. Well, of course they did. Why not? Karen, right after you went to your mother-in-law's, a secret state police came for Peter. They took him away. Peter? Why Peter? What could they possibly want with Peter? How should I know? He had... He had weak lungs. Maybe that was it. Weak lungs? Is that what they said? They didn't say anything. They never say anything. But the man next door was carted away, and his mother thinks it was because he had a heart murmur. She can't think of any other reason. Peter is a young man. But a heart murmur or weak lungs? <laughs> These things can make a man... Unfit. Unfit? Yeah, like people who are handicapped or emotionally disturbed. Oh, Karen, it happens all the time. Certainly you know that. I, I have heard. I didn't really know. I, I wasn't sure. Well, I... if they could send Peter away, if they've sent Benjamin, they can send anyone away. You mean... to a jail? To a... Jail to a labor camp to an insane asylum for all I know. They don't tell you where, Karen. They don't tell you anything. They never tell you anything. Because they don't want you to know anything. All they want you to know is there's nothing you can do about it except forget it. Act as though it never happened, never was. Is that why you divorced Peter? Of course that's why. What did you think? Well, you said something about the children. If I did anything, if I if I made a fuss, if I behaved as though I as though I minded. They take my children away from me and put them in a home. Oh no, they would. Yes, yes, they would. They have. They do. A woman a woman I went to school with. Her husband disappeared, and she banged on doors, and she she demanded to know where he was, what they had done with him. Well, they they took her children. They, they, they put them in, in a state nursery. The oldest was only four, and they took them. I, I can't take a chance on losing my children, can I? Oh, Helena... I'm so sorry. Uh, no, no. It's all right. It, it's all right. I, I, I just have to put it out of my mind. I have to behave as though nothing happened. I'm sorry I carried on the way I did. I, I, I'm really sorry. Oh, how could you help it? No, I shouldn't have. I, I, I shouldn't have told you. I, I just wish you'd 
forget that I did. But I'm glad that you did. I'm grateful don't to you. Don't be glad. And please, don't be grateful. Don't be anything. As a matter of fact, Karen, the best thing would be for us just not to see much of each other from now on. But we're friends. Well, not close friends. We know each other, of course, but we are not close friends. Not anymore. Helena, we need each other. Not anymore. I need you. I have to have somebody to talk to. Find somebody else. If you can. Bruno? Sir? See you for a minute? Certainly, sir. Yes, sir. I've got a new assignment for you. Came down from the top. Mm-hmm. I stand ready. You know that. This is a big one. Good. Very good. What do you want now? I've been trailing Mrs. Antek. Antek? Antek? You remember her husband's the cellist? We sent him away about a month ago. I was with you when you picked him up. Well, this will be a more interesting job for you. I'd like that. You are to make a tour of the forced labor camps. Good. I've never been inside one. It's interesting. I can imagine. When do I leave? Right away. Production's fallen off and they want to know why. Is it malingering or what? Do we need to tighten up on the discipline? Are the camp commanders vigilant? Well, they all know you're coming. They'll show you around. Make your observations and write up your reports. Yes, sir. No one will know precisely why you're there, of course. Call it a friendly visit. Just to keep in touch. Well, you'll know what to say. Well, I... I appreciate this opportunity, sir. I I want you to know that. I'll put someone else on Mrs. Antek. Any sign of trouble with her? Hmm. She went to the police, of course. Oh, we all do that. She's seen her friend, Mrs. Conrad, and lives downstairs, but not often. Mrs. Conrad isn't too friendly. Mrs. Antek see anyone else? Oh, yes. She's been all over town trying to contact friends. Any success? No real success, no. Okay. The sooner she realizes her normal life is over, the better for her. We don't want her infecting other people. No. They're staying out of her way, all right. Oh, they better. They know what's best for her. And for themselves. Helena? Helena, please, just for a minute... Go away, Karen. I won't. I can't. I have to talk to someone, Helena. Just come to the door. I'm not going to go away. I'm going to stand right here. All day if I have to. Oh, Helena. How dare you do this to me, Helena? I'm desperate. No friend would do this to a friend. But I'm desperate. Don't you know that? We're all desperate. And I'm so frightened. It has been six whole weeks. I haven't been able to find out anything about Benjamin. Not anything. You never will. So make up your mind to it. I don't even know if he's alive or dead. Shut up. Shut up. Do you know what that's like? Not knowing if your husband... I know very well what it's like. Then talk to me about it. Quiet. Just be quiet. Look, come on inside. Come inside. Thank you. Thank you. But only for a minute. And keep your voice down. Helena, I have been all over the city. I've gone to see everybody who ever knew Benjamin at all. That was very silly of you. And nobody would talk to me once I told them why I was there. Oh, of course they wouldn't. And if you have any regard for them, you won't try to see them. They pass right by me on the street. Of course. They don't even look at me. Well, you shouldn't expect them to, if you ever cared for them at but all. they're our friends. Well, they're not now, and they never will be. What are you trying to do, ruin them? No. Well, then stay away from them. <sighs> and stay away from me, Karen. I have my children to think of. Then what am I to do? Where am I to go? Who will help me? No one. You're one of the lepers now, Karen. You're contagious. 
But what have I done? What did Peter do? What did Benjamin do? What did I do? Nothing. So, you see? No, I don't see. I don't see at all. Oh, you're still such an innocent. I can't... I've heard things. I don't know whether I believe them or not. I just never... Never thought anything like that would happen to me. Karen, I'm going to tell you something. And then you've got to go. And if you ever repeat what I'm going to say... I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Karen, I think it's important to... To them. To those... Those crazies. To pick up innocent people and send them off to a camp or whatever. I think it's important. But why? Why should it be? Because it tells everybody that nobody is safe. Nobody, nobody is ever safe. Nobody, not ever. Why? What is the point of it? The point is to develop a whole nation of people who do what they're told, who don't think, who don't feel, who simply react like trained dogs to a signal. After all... If they're going to take over the world, the whole universe, maybe, someday, they can't have people feeling and thinking. Now, can they? Hello? Karen? All right. I... I'm frightened, Mother Antek. No, 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 Karen. You mustn't let yourself be frightened. You must... You must just... carry on. Oh, but you don't know. You just don't know. I can't imagine. Wait till it happens to you. Then you'll know. You can't imagine till it happens to you. Then you know. Oh, my child. What what can I say? Nothing. Nothing. Because you don't know. Well, you'll call me. I don't know. I... I don't know if I should. I don't... I don't know about anything. Well, then, I'll call you. Um, we we have to keep in touch, you and I. Karen? Mother Antek? Yes, yes, my dear. Could you come here? Would you come here and stay with me? I'm so frightened. I haven't got anybody to talk to. Everybody avoids me. And Helena says I shouldn't go near anybody because I might put them in danger if they were seen talking to me. I mean, people I've known for years, sometimes they don't even nod when they pass me on the street. They never say hello or anything. They just hurry on by. Could you come and stay with me until we hear something about Benjamin? Could you do that? Karen, I think... I think we need to be... Careful. I think until things are straightened out somehow, we should be very, very careful about what we do and what we say. of the total population of the earth. Not one free voice, not one free thought, not one free line of poetry or prose. Well, think about it, and then go back and read again our precious Bill of Rights. I'll be back shortly with our concluding act. worth repeating that the incident you are experiencing could have occurred in one of several places and could be happening somewhere right now because man is intoxicated with the idea that everything is possible is he at the same time convincing himself that everything is therefore allowable is his arrogance really so stupendous as to believe that sir hmm oh 
Bruno, you're back. Yes, sir. Twenty minutes ago. I thought I should report to you straight off. Sit down. Tell me about your inspection tour. Give me a general idea. Well, to me, a novice, of course, at this sort of thing. Ah, that's a fresh viewpoint. Yeah, I was impressed uh, on the whole. The camp seemed to be run with remarkable efficiency. They appear to be getting the maximum amount of labor out of all the inmates. Is that so? Mm -hmm. Actually, sir, they are getting a lot of work out of them that really has no purpose. No purpose that I could see at any rate. Such as? Well, such as carrying rocks from one place to another in the morning and in the afternoon, carrying them back to where they were to start with. I, I couldn't really see any point of that. And to keep them busy. Keep them on the move. Mm, I suppose. Take my word for it. It's necessary. Reminds them what they're there for. Keeps them from brooding. Uh, there was a suicide at the, one of the camps the day I was there. Absolutely forbidden. Positively. It could spread. And so I was told. All the same, to me, it, it was depressing. What else? Uh, you remember just before I went, uh, before you sent me off on this tour, we were talking about that cellist fellow, uh, Benjamin Antek. Ah, oh, yes, that one. Uh, his wife is making a nuisance of herself. Well, is she? Yes, I assigned Charlie to follow her. Seems she's just wandering the streets, calling out her husband's name. Over and over and over. Nobody pays attention to him, but it's bothersome. I understand. I suppose I take Charlie off that duty and put you back on. Whatever you say, sir. It'll be a little rest for you after your long tour. Thank you, sir. Good. Uh, now go right up your full report on the camps. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, the cellist died. Antek? Really? Didn't last long, did he? Died in the box. In the box, eh? Well... Those innocents don't take to life in the camps. That's been my observation. Their minds start to go, and after that, they're finished. Well, run along now and type up your report. Six copies. Have one on my desk by noon. Benjamin Antek? Benjamin Madam. Antek? Oh. Madam Antek. Yes, what? What is it? I wouldn't do that if I were you. I'm trying to find my husband. Take my advice. Don't. Do you know him? My husband, Benjamin Antek. No. I don't know him. And neither does anyone else. But lots of people know him. We have lots of friends. He's well known in this city. He's performed in public. You see, he's a cellist, and if people come to hear him play, he's with a trio. They get written up in the newspapers. Madam. His Hunt. picture has been in the papers many times. Madam. And then, you see, he was taken away. I think by the secret police. I'd advise you to forget him. I can't. I can't. How how can you forget someone you've lived with so long and loved? How can you forget someone when you don't know where he is? Or if he's even alive? He is not. He is dead. Dead? He died in a punishment cell. Oh. When? Sometime last week. I see. You sure? I was there. I see. Well, then, there's no use looking for him, is there? No use at all. I see. Well, thank God. Let me in, please, Helena. I have something to tell you. Something important. Well? I'd like to come in, please. Okay. Come in. 
I'd like to sit down, please. You can't stay. This won't take long. Well, what is it? Benjamin's dead. Dead? How do you know he's dead? Somebody on the street came up to me and told me. Who? I don't know, but he said he was there when Benjamin died. He died in a punishment cell. Imagine. My Benjamin, who never hurt a living thing in any way, not by deed or by word. My Benjamin died in a... a punishment cell. Oh, Karen. I'm so very sorry. I hope he didn't suffer too much. For too long. Perhaps he didn't. You know what I said when the man told me? Oh, what did you say? I said, thank God. And I think I know why I said it. In fact, I'm sure I know. Why did you? If you want to tell me. Oh, I do. I do want to tell you if you let me. Of course I'll let you. This is why... You see, when I heard that he was dead, uh, he died last week. That's what the man said, the man who was there. Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as he told me Benjamin had died, then I knew. I knew for certain that Benjamin had existed. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think maybe I do. You see, as long as you don't know and nobody will tell you and nobody will admit having known him, your mind begins to play tricks on you. You start to think, maybe there was never any Benjamin at all, that you made the whole thing up. But you know that isn't true, but you start to believe it. You can't help yourself. Go on. You begin to feel... You never had a husband... You were never married for 20 years. None of that ever happened except maybe in a dream. But when you find out that that man, that husband, that Benjamin has died, well, that shows that he really lived. You see what I mean? I think so. And you didn't make it up. You didn't dream it. You lived it. It was real. It was true. It was a fact. Something awful happened. Something so awful, so unbelievably awful. But at least now you know. He died. He's dead. But you know you did have those 20 years with him, and they were real. They really happened. He really lived because... now he's dead. Well, I don't want to stay too long. That's all right. I... I had to tell someone. Stay as long as you like. No. I have to go upstairs and phone his mother. Thank you, Helena. Thank you very much. Sir? Hmm? Uh, oh, yes, Bruno. May I speak to you for a moment? Certainly, certainly. It's about Mrs. Antek, uh, the cellist's wife. Oh, yes, the one who was uh, caterwauling around the streets. That's the one. She isn't doing it anymore, sir. That's very wise of her. But she is doing something else. I wanted to get your opinion on that. Why? What's she doing? She stays home all day, but she goes out nights. Out where? No particular place. Just out on the streets, all over town. She's all bundled up in old clothes. I had a hard time recognizing her at first. She looks like an old woman, which she is not. What does she do? Uh, she... She writes on walls. She what? She writes on walls. With chalk. 
Uh, of course, as soon as she moves on, I erase whatever she's written, but a block or two later, there she is again, writing on a wall. What does she write? Uh, think, feel. Think, feel? What makes her do that, I wonder? I can't imagine. Unless... Yes, unless what? Well, she started it right after I told her that her husband's dead. You see, when she was wondering about shouting his name, I put a stop to it. I told her he died the week before, in the box. You fool! You unmitigated idiots! Me, sir? You mean me? Don't you know anything at all about the movements? Well, I... I thought I did. I, I certainly... No thought... one is supposed to know what's happened. Same as they're not supposed to know what's going to happen. But no one told me that. No one should have to tell you. If you had the proper blood in your veins, the right spirit in your soul, you'd have known without being told. These cattle are not entitled to facts. They're not entitled to anything but what we choose to tell them. They're there to do what they're told, to cheer and obey and cheer while they're obeying. You've been with a party this long, you don't even know that? Think. Feel, indeed. They'll think what we tell them to think, and they'll feel what we want them to feel, and that's the whole idea behind the movement. I'm sorry, sir. I, I didn't mean if... If I'd known, I'd never... All would. right, all right. Stop blubbering. Believe me, sir. I'll never make such a mistake again. No, you won't. I've learned my lesson. I wonder if you have. Oh, yes, sir, yes. I have. It seems to me that a year in a forced labor camp would drive the lesson home. Don't you think so? Or an insane asylum? I... Whatever you think best. I'm sure that's... That's what would be best. I'm sure, too. A little more indoctrination. May eh, Bruno? Yes, sir. I'm sure that's what I need. I think so, too. Just to make certain you're worthy to be a member of the ruling class. Now, go turn yourself in. totalitarian state can turn and devour its own. Within the system, there are those who, for whatever obscure reason, will inevitably prove themselves unreliable, at least in someone's eyes. And such a one, seen thus, is destined for reprimand, for punishment, or for extermination. Because this is the way of the totalitarian state. I shall be back shortly. One more word. I have heard that once upon a time, for what reason I cannot imagine, a certain gentleman spent many years cutting off the tails of rats, hoping to produce a strain of rats without tails. Now tell me, if we should remove the heads of a sufficient number of persons, would we at last produce headless people? I can only tell you it didn't work with the rats. They went right on being born with tails. Our cast included Terry Keane, Carol Titel, Ray Owens, and Ralph Bell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Here it presents. such changing times, it is inevitable we fear tomorrow more than yesterday. What's to become of us all? Will we be annihilated in our bed? Is there any way of living in peace ever again? Who can save us? Or is the end an inevitable radioactive fiery ball whirling through space? Today we explore a year in our future when we thought the sun had set for the last time. Elizabeth? My considered opinion is that the president is hiding somewhere. The whole idea has stunned me. I don't know what to think. Well, there's always the possibility the president's been kidnapped. But we're stymied by the message that he's held hostage by the Ray universe. We can't identify it. There's been no demand for ransom. What else is there to think but that your husband, in some strange state of mind, is a prisoner of himself? Our mystery drama, The Final Mind, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Norman Rose and Anne Williams. I'll do that shortly with Act One. What do doctors recommend to avoid constipation? These days, doctors stress the importance of fiber in the diet. Food fiber that helps the system regulate itself naturally. Metamucil is a laxative made from natural fiber. No chemical stimulants. So for occasional constipation, doctors recommend Metamucil more often than any other laxative. The way to overcome constipation is the natural way. But if not nature, Metamucil. Read label and follow directions. Denture wearers agree. Snug cushions hold loose dentures so comfortably tight, I feel confident again. Soft adhesive snug brand denture cushions ease sore gums from loose fitting plates. No messy fixing like powders or pastes. Snug is easy to shape and fit, won't wash off. Get temporary relief from loose fitting dentures until you see a dentist with Snug. Now in the new four cushion economy package. Snug, another fine product from Mentholatum. Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, Nelson Rockefeller, Bruce Jenner, Thomas Edison, Leonardo da Vinci. These people and many other brilliant, talented, creative people overcame a form of learning disability. This is Pat Collins for the Foundation for Children with Learning Disabilities. There are over 10 million children in this country who are learning disabled, and they can be helped to overcome their learning differences. We owe it to them and to ourselves. Some of these children can be our country's future doctors, lawyers, artists, scientists, and politicians. You can help children with learning disabilities. Please send a contribution to SCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. That's FCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. So as not to alarm you, although I am certain you aficionados of the Mystery Theater rather expect a little knee-knocking, goose-flesh, and spine-tingling fright, I shan't reveal the exact year this tale takes place. Tonight, I'd say, you can all go to sleep in safety. It's tomorrow, I cannot guarantee. We begin at a secret destination one mile under the surface of a Midwestern state in a concrete bunker where are gathered those who govern and defend the United States. What's the communicator reading, Mr. Freeman? Bombs are still bouncing off the Atlantic protection curtain. Bouncing off? Well, not only off, but most of them are being thrust back to the Asiatics. <laughs> it's almost too good to be true that the enemy's bombs could boomerang. I was pretty sure Justin would pull it off. He's our greatest scientist, so... Why wouldn't he come up with a laser formula which forms a protective roof over the entire country? 
Is that how it works? <laughs> yes, Freeman here. Security 5, this is Justin Day. Would like clearance to enter Control 1. She has clearance. Pass her through. <laughs> Elizabeth, it's good to see you. Max, I just got in from Atlanta. I thought all spaceports were closed. They can't stop me from trying my own. That antique jet can still take off? I was visiting my sister. The report came through on the zone monitor that the Asiatics are suing for peace. So I had to get here to find out if it was true. It hasn't been confirmed, Elizabeth. How, Justin? Uh, he's great. I don't think any of us could believe peace was that close, even if we heard it. You must be very proud of your husband, Mr. Day. Where is he? It's been weeks since I've seen him. Hey, he's been at it round the clock. We, we had a little follow-up with the Pacific Protection Curtain, and he's been down in Control 8 for three weeks, night and day. Five, Mr. Justin Day requests clearance to enter Control 1. I'll give him a smart salute, a big, fat, welcoming smile, and pass him through. Justin! The curtain works. It works. The Northeast Quadrant hasn't been touched. Elizabeth, am I ever glad to see you? Oh, I am beef. As you gentlemen won't mind, I'll just uh, stretch out on this air bed. Oh, that's better. Elizabeth, come sit beside me. Have you been here long? I've attended both times. Justin, is the Pacific Curtain in full operation? Sizzling. Justin, I heard on the monitor the enemy is asking for peace. That's the first sensible thing they've done. Oh, if it's more than a rumor, if it's true, then this is a moment to remember. It'll be centuries before we're threatened again by anyone. If we don't throw peace away, we can be so stupid, Max. So, oh, well, if it's true, what are you going to do for a living? Hmm? If the government can do without a national security chief, what will you do with yourself? Well, I've always wanted to be a librarian in a small town. How does uh, Shakespeare, North Dakota sound to you? Not bad. <laughs> I got it all picked out. My job would be to buy books for our library and read them. <laughs> How about you, Justin? What's there left for a scientist to do after he's invented the ultimate security blanket? Justin wants to return to his laboratory and keep searching for new worlds. You mean in space? No, in time. I'm not going to ask you to explain that because I don't think I could understand your answer. I can't explain it either, but it's all he talks about. You'll have to ask him yourself. Not now. The poor man's asleep. Uh, after 500 hours on his feet... Can you blame him? How close we had come to the end of everything. How quickly the fuse had been lit, burning from misgivings to mistakes, to misjudgments, to total war. Our only hope of survival lay in my husband's genius. And he delivered. Was there any wonder, then, that he would be rewarded with America's highest honor? Elizabeth, I won't accept the job. I can't. I've told the party that. I don't fit the mold, Elizabeth. You see, I'm an explorer. I'm not competent to manage such a huge enterprise as this country. Now, you may not get a choice. You may be conscripted. What good is an unwilling savior? No, I won't accept it. I can't. I have plans. Urgent, vital, and death-defying. I can't give up six years of my life playing world policeman from the White House. Plans more important than the president? Yes, by far. When I said death-defying, I meant just that. What in the world could be more important than serving your country as president? Mankind. Be specific. If I can complete my work, I believe I can find a way for man to live forever and for there to be plenty for all. Forever. <laughs> and defend the Constitution of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Mr. Justin Day. Those first months in office were unlike any the world had ever seen. Justin was able to find solutions to problems that had divided the world since the first great flood. Already there was talk of amending the Constitution so that Justin could remain in office ten years. The day that was proposed in Congress, Justin disappeared, vanished, leaving not a trace. 
Elizabeth, you mean you got up this morning and, and Justin wasn't there? Are, are you sure he went to bed last night? Max, I get to sleep before he does. He spends late hours in his laboratory. But this morning, his bed hadn't even been slept in. He's gone somewhere, that's all. Something he thought so important he couldn't tell any of us about it. Well, he'll be back, Max. I'm sure of it. Oh, well, thanks, Elizabeth. Look, I have to go. I'll, I'll keep you posted. But does, uh, does anyone besides ourselves know he's missing? Only the vice president. Charlie's called an urgent cabinet meeting in 10 Pulsar, so uh, I uh, better be on my way. Well, then they'll know. Well, it's their job to keep mining the store till the boss gets back. Let's trust it won't be long. <laughs> Justin did not return. The days turned into weeks, the weeks into months. There had been no provision in our 30th century constitution for such a tragedy. Everyone in government operated on a, a temporary basis. Vice President Charlie Wall, of course, doing double duty. It's almost three months. Seems hopeless to find him. He must have been kidnapped. Who knows, Charlie? No one's getting up. All our satellites have been programmed with Justin's birth and behavior code. There isn't a particle of universe we can reach by beings that can't react to his wavelength. That is, if somehow he's been spirited into space. Anyway, today's trace and search reports are due in on the Magna scanner any minute now, so uh, we'll have a look. Huh? Is Elizabeth joining us? Oh, yeah, she never misses a TNS report. Good evening, Max. Charlie. No. Any news yet? You're right on the button, Elizabeth. I'll turn on the scanner. Hello, Elizabeth. Justin? I sense you have Max and Charlie with you. Justin. Is that you? What is it, Elizabeth? You all right? Don't you recognize my voice? Justin, where are you? Elizabeth, who are you talking to? They can't sense me or hear my voice. Only you can, Elizabeth. I'm talking to Justin. He's in my head. I want you to tell Charlie what an excellent job he's been doing in my place. I want old National Security Max to advise Congress that I wholeheartedly endorse Charlie Wall as my successor for the remaining term of my office. Thanks. Justin says you must tell the leadership that Charlie is to officially take over the presidency. Well, ask Justin where he is. Keep her talking, Charlie. I'll get word to trace and search. Tell Max not to bother. I'm not within reach of our scanners. Max? Hmm. He says not to bother. Justin, where are you then? Don't be alarmed. I've been taken hostage on the Ray universe. It's a dimension in time and space, invisible and inexplicable to 30th century man. Can't you tell me anything, Justin? It takes a language that would be meaningless to you. I wouldn't know where to begin. All I can say is, I do not have mortality in the sense that we know it. Justin, are you dead? No, my dear wife. It is you who are dead to me. You said you were a hostage. How can we get you back? What ransom do they want? You'll hear from me again, at which time I'll tell you more. And tell Max and Charlie, even though they cannot sense or hear me, I know what they are thinking and saying. Max, Justin says he... It's a hostage in the very universe. I've never heard of it. We'll follow up. Uh, Mr. President, I... I hope you can hear me. Tell him I can. He can. Um, uh, Mr. President, uh, a word of warning to those who are holding you hostage. There isn't a vibration in space that cannot be picked up by our Magna scanners and located within millimeters. We shall find you and not rest until we do. Elizabeth... Tell Max I appreciate his national security posture, but he won't find my body. Not until I wish him to. Tell everybody not to look for me. You will 
will never find me. If everyone will do as I say, all will be well. <laughs> the first time. For me, that is. I have brought you many stories of a mysterious nature, but none in which the sound of man is the whole. Since all of us look towards the future with the hope that it spells better days of great enrichment and greater knowledge, I am stepping aside quickly now so that I may return very shortly with Act Two. Weekdays on CBS Daytime Television. Search for Tomorrow follows the lives of people who laugh and cry and love and hate as if there were no tomorrow. And on the young and the restless, experience the joys and sorrows of a community trapped in a world where life can be cruel and unfair one moment and joyous and giving the next. Not a fantasy land, but a place where the problems of everyday life must be faced head on. Search for Tomorrow and the young and the restless. Weekdays on CBS Television. When even I stopped going to my own coffee club, I knew something was wrong. It had to be my coffee. Then I switched to new and improved Kava Instant. Now no one leaves my house with a bitter feeling. Kava's the only 90% acid neutralized coffee. That means it tastes less bitter when you drink it, so it feels better after. And with this improved blend of coffee beans, Kava tastes better than ever. Now my coffee club is so popular, I even turned down my own mother. <laughs> new improved Kava Instant. Tastes better when you drink it, so it feels better after. Oh, isn't it awful? That price went up again. And maybe the quality is not all it should be. Maybe. But how can I know for sure? Consumer Reports knows for sure. They test and rate thousands of foods, home care products, appliances, automobiles, and much more. Their reliable brand name ratings appear right here in Consumer Reports magazine. Oh, Consumer Reports. My neighbor recommended it. I recommend it, too. Especially when you can take advantage of this money-saving offer. Just phone 1-800-331-1000 to get 11 monthly issues of Consumer Reports. Plus the big 1981 buying guide. Plus the 1982 buying guide when published. Plus the 383-page Health and Drugs Guidebook. A total of $26.25. Now all yours for only $12. Become an informed consumer. A Consumer Reports reader. Phone now toll free. With that 1-800-331-1000? Right, 1-800-331-1000. Don't get taken. Get consumer reports. Our story unfolds in that sometime of the future. One of the characters let slip the date, the 30th century. We'll take them at the word. A brilliant scientist, Preston Day, having succeeded in averting world war, has, by an appreciative country, been drafted into the presidency. He disappears, returning in voice only, a voice imprinted upon the mind of his wife, Elizabeth. She resumes the story. <laughs> Before I ever met Justin, I was a test pilot. Superstition and flying don't mix. <laughs> so I'm not a believer in portents, signs, or dreams. Our civilization hasn't arrived at the present millennium by conceding to ignorance and credulity. Superstition hampered the first 25 centuries of man. That we know. But I swear to you... The dream I had last night shocked me. This is how I've remembered it. Don't be angry with me, Elizabeth. But I have decided. Why would I be angry? Have you come back, Justin? Even if I could, would it be worth it, darling? Six years of presidential fence sitting, playing universal chess, conniving in the name of progress, I can't do it. Who else is there but you, Justin? Who was there before I had the honor? The best would be an exactingly programmed computer. It could keep our world on a balanced economic and political axis. A computer? Yes, yesterday. Emotions only get in the way. An emotionless computer. And I am on the verge of the concept. <laughs> No, I'm not going up in that plane with you and Max. I won't do it. But we need you, Elizabeth. 
You were only late to justice. It's useless, I tell you. We won't find him. Elizabeth, I'm the vice president. I've got to use every trick of the century. This is no ordinary kidnapping of some space colony, Governor. It's just in day, the sole and single power the U.S. has. I know, I know, Charlie. No, you don't know. Or you wouldn't be refusing to help Max and me. Of course you think I want my husband back. Yes, yes. But that's all he is to you, a beloved husband. That's all. That's everything. I want him back alive. I told you, Justin said, don't look for me. You will never find me. He could have said that if he were forced to. The world looks to us for leadership. And with Justin gone, there is no leader. Charlie, what's holding you two guys up? Let's go. Just a minute, Max. Elizabeth, we've got to have you with us aboard the Magna Plane. Our only hope is if our transmission is spotted, he'll communicate with you. And you could talk to him. Maybe persuade him to tell us what to do. Where he is. Is he free to return? And how and when? You don't believe he can. Or will. Do you, Charlie? No, Elizabeth, I don't. You don't think he's being held prisoner? No. And the Ray universe? There isn't any. I think Justin's concealed himself. No, I don't let myself think that. But you suspect it. Yes. We'll cross the Potomac and then, by using the White House as a central point, fly in ever increasing circles. Uh, Tom, uh, switch on the scanners and receivers. Yes, sir. Are you comfortable, Elizabeth? Max, I don't know what to think. I told Elizabeth it's our considered opinion that Justin is hiding somewhere. The idea has stunned me. I'm not ruling out the possibility he's been kidnapped. But overwhelming evidence doesn't point that way. In four months, we've not had a single ransom demand from his supposed captors on this gray universe. Uh, Mr. Freeman. Yeah, any signals yet? No, sir. The vice president would like you to join him aft. Right. Elizabeth, you keep your ears tuned to the scanner as we keep circling. Remember, it's for Justin's own good that we find him. And your good, Matt. And mine. Max, a message just came through on a special line to Control One. A red alert for big news. I'm glad I put this line in the aft compartment where Elizabeth couldn't hear it. He's in a tough spot, you know. Yes, I know. If the president has run away, what else is he but a traitor? Charlie, word on the hill is since you've taken over the boss's job, things are really rolling. And I didn't know that in addition to being a lawyer, you were an agronomist and an economist. That arid zone exploitation plan of yours is really something. Max... I'm going to tell you something I don't want you ever to repeat. Sure. I'm not an agronomist or an economist. I may have some insights, but no practical knowledge. What I do is, every night before going to sleep, I go over every problem that's come that day to my desk. And by morning, I've got the answers. I've heard of people who can do that solve their problems in their sleep. No, it's more than that. When I get up in the morning, Max, I've awakened feeling that somehow I've been told the answers by Justin Day. It's as though he's been advising me during the night. Signal for another message. Oh, uh, plug in my voice channel, will you? Hello, Control One, Max Freeman here. Go ahead with a message. Yes, Control One, I read you. Would you mind repeating that? Well, what is it, Max? They found the body of Justin Day at the foot of the Washington Monument. It's been a tough day for you, Elizabeth. Really tough. 
Don't go yet, Charlie. These last three days, I've hardly had time to think. I hate being alone. Just when you're 41. You had a lifetime before it. Would you mind putting on the communicator? You don't want to see all that's going on, do you, Elizabeth? Let the wounds heal. No. Turn it on. I want to. The irony of it all is Justin never wanted to be president. He used to say, if only he could continue as a scientist. He was on the track of eternal life. What? Yes. He said, if I can complete my work, I believe I can find a way for man to live in peace forever. Ironical, isn't it? You sure you want the communicator on? Please. The body of Justin Day lies in repose in a flag-draped coffin in the east room of the White House. A military guard of honor is keeping constant watch. Tomorrow, the coffin will be taken to the great rotunda of the Capitol to lie in state. Friday will be proclaimed by President Charles Wall as a national day of mourning. I had to give the world tribes enough time to get here. The extraterrestrial leaders on Ganymede and Callisto and Titan. Those satellite citizens get mighty touchy if they're not invited to state occasions. The core of drummers you are hearing will once again beat in cadence for the procession. Citizen, friend, allies and interstellar slaves, as you view my mortal remains, you should know I, Justin Day, am still with you. What am I hearing? Charlie, what's happening? Justin. Justin! Where are you? The likeness of me will be entombed in Arlington as I have wished. Yes, it is not me. It's happened. It's happened. Turn it off. I no longer need that box. I've, I've got to see if it's on in other channels. It served me when I needed it. It is no longer useful or necessary. He's on every transmission from here to the sun and back. And so I have dispensed with it. Elizabeth, I've got to meet for the MSP. Keep it. My body is yours. And then besides... What to tell our lives? It is yours. Do as I say, and all will be well. I've got to do this all alone. Another day of not knowing. And I'll go crazy. Last night, he said. The monument fly above it. Twenty thousand feet. Good. I'll check that. Turn on the gamma sensors. Circling Washington at twenty. Elizabeth, uh, it's no use trying to find me. Just that's not why I'm flying now. Believe me. What I am doing is for the best. Justin, how can you be alive without your body? Because all life is short. You are a voice inside my brain. No body. I don't need the flesh and blood machinery people use to transmit ideas. What comes to your mind from me, Elizabeth, is the transference of my mind. My mind lives. They always shall. And so can yours. I, I don't understand. I have made the final mind. The ultimate in reason. Final mind? What is it? It will give you orders. It will take the responsibility for a peaceful life from man's shoulders. Is it, is it a person you have made? The final mind? Justin? Justin? I cannot explain anymore. 
have so grand it forever. Live by it. All who do will never die. Oh, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Where are you? Please come back. It is my bequest to you. A creation of science. I don't care about science. I want you back, Justin. You have no right to leave me. I, I can't bear it alone without you. Elizabeth, what are you doing? Why that steep climb? To get away from your voice. I thought you loved me. I love the man, a real man. He knows words in my head. You took off today to find me over the Washington Monument, didn't you? This is the foolish dream I had. I clean up the ghost here over the clouds. The only place I can think more clearly. <laughs> your voice is spoiled even that. Why, Elizabeth? Why are you diving? No, Justin, don't you? Say it. Say it, Elizabeth. Because I don't wish to live without you. I don't want to be substitute. The title of mind is in power and order and what is best for mankind. I don't want any of that. I don't care about that. That mankind can count itself. Do you wish to be with me, Elizabeth, in my dimension? A universe of rays, of light, of knowledge. I want to be with you, Justin. I do. Even if it means extinction? Save me for myself. Can, can you come back? Are you sure you wish to die, this tale of tomorrow makes me feel somewhat like Sir Isaac Newton who said of his discoveries. I am like a boy playing on the seashore, now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell. Meanwhile, said Newton, the great ocean of truth lays undiscovered before me. If there are truths and answers to Acts 1 and 2, I hope they will be revealed to us when I return shortly with Act 3. I hope you got what I need. What's wrong? Pain, itch, you know, hemorrhoids. Been driving my truck all day, and I need preparation H. Right. Gives lots of people temporary relief. Its special ingredients relieve pain and itch flare-ups. Helps shrink swelling of inflamed hemorrhoidal tissue. That's real medicine. I'll take ointment and suppositories. Hi. Feeling better today? Oh, thanks to you, good buddy. Preparation H relieves pain and itch. Helps shrink swelling. Use only as directed. A family that's close shares the bad and the good. In colds and flu season, when everybody in the family shares aches, fever, and sore throat pain, millions of families also share one pain reliever, Bayer Aspirin. Bayer, because their whole family can use it. Bayer, because nothing else short of a prescription can do more for the aches, fever, and sore throat pain. When colds and flu make the rounds in your family, so should Bayer Aspirin. Remember, rest, fluids, and all you need is Bayer. Use only as directed. Hi, this is Andy Williams. I learned about the importance of donating blood when my mother became ill. Although most people could qualify as donors, many have not donated blood because they have not personally experienced the need, either for themselves or for those they care about. Presently, over 30,000 pints of blood are required in the United States every day, and the need is increasing. The balance between supply, demand, and human life depends on you, the public. Donors often respond when there is an emergency or a disaster. But blood of every group and type must be available at all times. Blood banks depend on people who are willing to give to meet the day-to-day -day blood needs. Donate today at a blood bank in your community. Blood is life. Let's keep it running. A public service of this station and the American Association of Blood Banks. A president disappears, yet his disembodied voice lives on. His wife, a former test pilot, desperate because her husband's body has been found and buried, takes off in her space jet, flies high, then spins to Earth. Her plane soars. The end to her dying seems inevitable. Where 
am I? Good morning, Elizabeth. Oh. You've been asleep. What? You're in Memorial Hospital. I am? Oh. How did I... You'll live. It's a miracle. Can you remember what happened? In the plane. In the plane, yes. Something drew me. The whole plane, it, it was as if I knew I had to do it. Crash. You wanted to die, is that it? Are you guessing? Or do you know? I know. Justin made me know. You too? You heard him? Last night when they brought you here, I went back to the White House. I sat there and I felt I heard him. I didn't hear a word, it's just... In the flesh, I knew. Everything? I don't know. How you wanted to die. Did he make you know about some insane machine? A computer he's built? No. He made it when? Since he disappeared? I have an idea he's been working on it for years. At 20,000 feet, I kept feeling he was right there. You were in your plane, flying. He was talking so strangely. Mostly about this thing. What did he call it? The final mind. Okay, okay, Elizabeth. Don't get yourself brought up. One last question and then I'll go. You thought you were losing control of your plane. Yes. For some reason, I was drawn into a spin. I couldn't pull her. It was like being in a vortex, sucking me into the sharp top of the Washington Monument. But, uh, that's all I remember. Did, did they find the flight recorder? So far, only very small fragments have been picked up. You are the only thing that came down in one piece. You walked out of that crash on your own two feet. Nothing broken, nothing even bruised. You're here for observation, that's all. So if I wanted to, I could get up and walk right out of the hospital? Yes, but don't. A couple of days here won't hurt. Um, I'm tired. I'm going to close my eyes now. Um, give my regards to Max. I'll see him soon. <laughs> Mr. Freeman, here are a few more pieces of that plane. Well, it was bound to happen sooner or later, Tom. Mrs. Day insisted on taking up these antique 20th century jets. I remember seeing her do stunts in it. Beautiful. Yeah, it was an old jet fighter which she rebuilt herself. You can't ask too much of them. The only other one around I know of is in the Spaceport Museum. Uh, for instance, uh, take a look at this section of an instrument panel. It's pretty primitive. Hey. Will you look at this? Got something? Yeah, these these three gauges behind the cracked glass. All the indicators are bent in one direction. Let me see, Max. Elizabeth, what are you doing here? Oh, I couldn't sleep at the hospital, so I came here. Oh. Is this all that's left of my baby? You must be unhinged, Elizabeth, coming out here in the dead of night. You, you've just been in a plane crash. I know. Charlie was telling me. Hey, it's nothing to joke about. I want you to get back to the hospital right now. Max, doesn't it strike you as awfully strange that I should dead stick it to the ground? What's left of the plane can be picked up by one hand, but I am all together. Unharmed, unhurt. It terrifies me. It's like a nightmare with a happy ending. Somebody's watching over me. Yeah. Tom? I want you to take Mrs. Day back to the Memorial Hospital. Max, please. Elizabeth, let me remind you, my job is Chief of National Security. I have this feeling that I ought to look around the monument a little more. There's something in the back of my mind that tells Elizabeth, me... Elizabeth, I am not kidding. Tom? All right. I'll go quietly. Tom, I uh, wonder if you could do me a favor. Sure, Mrs. Day. Instead of us walking straight off the monument grounds to Constitution Avenue, would you mind if we went round by the south end of the mall? It's shorter that way. 
Well, I guess so. Uh, the only thing is that the park lights aren't working on that side. It, it doesn't matter. Over by that big hedge, I I know a shortcut. Uh, this is Bay. Where are you? This is Bay. I, oh, boy. If I've lost you, there goes my job. Whatever it was, through my plane to the Washington Monument, was compelling me to do the same. Even the pitch black night, I could see it standing high on the ground, its sharp marble finger pointing 500 feet into the sky. I found myself at a small, flat stone door set into the base of the shaft. You're here. Just look for a round stone right under your feet. Under it is a handle. Huh? Turn the handle. The vault door will open. Enter. I, 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 I found the stone. Go ahead. The handle. I'm inside, Justin. Feel your way until you come to an iron railing. I'm holding on to the railing. Where are you, Justin? Keep walking. Now, stop. Directly ahead of you are narrow, circular stairs. They go down into the foundation for 36 feet. Walk down. Is that where you are, Justin? Down there? Walk, Elizabeth. Hurry. Go on. Go on, Elizabeth. I, I can't. I, I don't want to fall. Faster, Elizabeth. Why? You're being followed. Elizabeth, do as I say. Nobody is sure I hear your voice. No one really believes you still exist. They can't allow themselves to believe. Justin, I'm here now at the bottom of the foundation. Turn around. That's far enough. Do you see a phosphorescent glow? Yes. What else? A door. A large marble-faced door. A glow seems to come through the door. Walk toward it. Tell me what you hear. What do you hear, Elizabeth? It's, it's something powerful behind the door. Me Elizabeth, you are to place your hand in the center of this door. It will open to your touch. Inside, you will not see me. You will sense me. When they come for you, your body will be where you are standing. They will believe you died of a seizure to your heart. But you will be here with me, living forever. It's too strange. I'm right here, Elizabeth, on the other side. Let me go, Justin. Oh, don't do that to my will. You will be so proud of me, my dear. You will understand why I could not sacrifice six years of my life in such an elementary, childish occupation as being president. Elizabeth, where are you? You will not cry out. Elizabeth! Elizabeth, we know you're somewhere here. Charlie's here, too. Elizabeth, do as I say. Elizabeth. Hello. What are you doing down here? All right. I'm fine. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Elizabeth. I thought you were going to stay in the hospital. Why, have you followed me? I don't know. Seems like a good idea. It's four in the morning. You've been in a plane crash, and here you are waltzing around Washington. We thought maybe you needed help. Justin's in there. Oh, yes, 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 yes. He's behind that big door. What do you know? You don't believe me. I want you to tell them something. I will, Justin. Tell them. 
Right here is a self-powered perpetual dynamo locked into a gamma computer. And I have programmed it to meet every contingency known to man. The problems of floods, famine, politics, economics. I told you what I've named it. The final mind. Max? Charlie? I know you can't hear Justin. He instructs me to tell you that what he has invented is behind that door. Convince them of what I tell you. What's he saying, Elizabeth? He wants you to believe him. That sound is the kind of artificial super brain Justin calls the final mind. Well, what does he do? Read minds, hear sounds, and act. The secret lies at the top of this monument. The platinum rods act as a sensor, receiving thought signals from everywhere. Platinum rods? The lightning arrestors, yes. They receive thought signals. I get the message. This mechanism he calls the final mind solves the problems it receives and sends out solutions in return. Maybe there is something in it. I leave the final mind as my gift to mankind. Now I'll be on my way to other planets, other galaxies and systems in space to continue my work. My body is a hindrance to me. I bequeath that to the world also. Uh, Elizabeth, can we go now? You must be very tired. Do you believe? Why don't we prove it? I'll have the door open later and we'll have a look. A machine that's going to run the world. Everyone will want to see that. It's a treasure. He's lying, Elizabeth. Charlie's lying. The moment you leave here and go up the stairs, you'll be placed under restraint and taken away. And then the door will be broken down. It wouldn't. And then the final mind will be destroyed. Charlie, no, Max! What's the setting you do? Elizabeth, the alternative is a return to a world mismanaged and war-torn by misguided hands. Tell them it's up to them to decide. Charlie. Decide. Charlie, Max, listen. Don't hurt the final mind. Don't destroy Justin's words. forced open and the final mind broken to pieces, putting an end to a dream of peace and wrong life? Of course, we'll never know because this account takes place centuries into the future. However, if any of you happen to be around or come back in the 30th century and I am still at the creaking door, give me a call on the communicator and let me know. You're back from shop and it's good to be home. You need some soup and you're going it alone. Soup for one, that's all you Soup for one soups from Campbell. Special single servings of very special soup. The late show's over, everyone's asleep. You're a little bit hungry, want something to eat. It's soup for one, that's all you Soup for one from Campbell. Eight great single serving soups like old world vegetables that are spicy, zesty, and have a unique adult flavor all their own. The kids are out. The house works through. There's a moment of pleasure just waiting for you. Soup for one from Campbell. Now with a bright new label. And look for the 25 cent coupon in the special coupon section of your Sunday newspaper. So next time you feel like something special, remember, you've got a deliciously different soup from Campbell to call your very own. Winter is the perfect time to catch up on many indoor fix-ups. And True Value Hardware Stores offer helpful values on the tools and supplies you may need in their Super 8 Circular. Hi, Pat Summerall to suggest you look there for quality master mechanic tools to do the job right. Plus electrical and plumbing supplies, paint and more to make home projects easy and economical. Do it yourself and you'll save with the values featured in the Super 8 Circular and at participating True Value Hardware Stores and home centers. Before you fit into our uniform, you'll run a hundred miles. You'll strengthen muscles you never knew you had. And you'll study things you've never studied before. Then you'll fit the dress blues uniform of a United States Marine. Maybe you can be one of us.
the fury, the proud, and the rage. Right now, man is built only to learn from the past. Memory only goes backwards. Some say it's a good thing. It's better not to know what we're in for. I don't agree. If the final mind is in our future, I want to know. I'd even settle for a reliable answer as to whether I should wear a raincoat or a ski suit or the muter shorts tomorrow. I hope some scientist out there will give my idea a crack. Our cast included Norman Rose, Ann Williams, Paul Hecht, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. in the world. And yet, the supply has always been far in excess of the demand. And who can deny it? Or, put it another way, falsehood never lacks for hospitality, while truth usually starves in the streets. But wasn't it ever thus? What are you looking for in the closet? Stanley? It's here. I know it's here someplace. Tell me what you're looking for. Maybe I can help you. I know I put it... Ah, here it is. A gun. Stanley, we shouldn't have a gun in the house. Get rid of it. I will. After... After what? After I use it. especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The quiet of the night is shattered by the shrilling of a police whistle and followed by the keening of a siren. Sounds to constrain the heart and ice the blood. Once again, violence has burst forth in the city. Once again. She lies on a richly inlaid floor, a golden girl in a magnificent apartment. What beauty, what wealth. But what difference now? She lies on the floor in simple white slacks and sweater, the costume familiar to millions. But around her breast, another color is spreading slowly, seeping softly, a dark angry red. He looks at her. He sighs. He has seen so much of this. But of course, there is no way to get used to it. Yeah, it's Lieutenant Schaefer over at Endicott Boulevard. It's a homicide. A doc can work out the details, but she's dead enough. Her name's Susie Standish. That's right, the golf champ. Well, I guess she just won't win the tournament on Sunday. Get the team over here, start going. Hey, hey, you don't have to bust the glass in the door. I'm Stanley Standish. Where's my wife? Now just take it easy, Mr. Standish. Where's my wife? In the morgue. All right, how do you know it's her? How do you know it's Susie? The body was identified by her sister. How did it happen? Who did it? Look, you want to sit down? No, I don't want to sit down. Just have a seat anyway. Here. Here's some coffee. 
Who did it? Nice and hot. You need it. Tell me who did it. At this point, we don't know. At which point will you know? Look, you got to pull yourself together. Don't you tell me what I have to do. It was a burglar. She must have surprised him. <laughs> she's dead, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she's dead. You don't know. You don't know how good she was. How sweet. How kind. She was... She was number one on the tour, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I can tell you, no one resented her. No one. All the girls. No one was jealous of her. No one could ever say a bad word about her. All the publicity, all the money, none of it ever turned her head. Yeah, I read stories about it. Well, you could believe every one of them. What are we sitting around here for? Shouldn't we be doing something? All right, take it easy. Huh? I don't want to take it easy. I want some action. All right. I'll tell you what we can do. We can go over to the apartment. The, the apartment? Yeah. The apartment where she was... Oh, no. No, I don't want to go over there. Right, now, look, sooner or later, you're going to have to. No, I don't ever want to see that place again. The way it looks, it was a robbery. I guess you're the only one who could tell us exactly what was taken. It doesn't matter anymore. Oh, yes, it does. We might be able to trace some of it. Well, sure, figures. The trophies. The trophies. Uh, the way things are today, I didn't believe in keeping anything of value in the house. They were valuable? Oh, she had eight of them. Three were sterling silver. Five were gold. Oh, just for the metal alone, uh, she said today's prices, uh, they'd be worth between twenty-five and $30,000. More. That's why I didn't want them in the house. You understand? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, do you want to give me a list of those trophies plus a description? Uh, yes, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do that right away. Uh, the trophies, that's what that animal was after. That's why he was here. That's why he killed her. It's my fault. Your fault? Well, why did I let her become a golfer, you know? I mean, we could have led a different kind of life. She'd be alive today. Right, now, look, you can't blame yourself. Yeah, but I do. You see, Lieutenant... She was a librarian in a small town in Ohio. Uh, I was with the men's tour. I just qualified for my card. I felt I could become the greatest in the world. We fell in love, and uh, that was that. We were living from hand to mouth, but uh, we didn't care. We had each other. Doesn't that sound cornball? Well, I guess most... True stories, too. Well, one day she looked at me and she said, I'll never forget it. She said, Honey, I want to learn how to play golf. Hey, one golfer is enough in the family. Oh, I didn't say I wanted to be a golfer. I just said I want to learn how to play golf. Why? So I can play a round with you sometimes. <laughs> forget it. Why? Well, because you'll never be good enough to go around with me. Oh. Oh, look, I, I know that must sound, uh... But it's true, you know. I mean, I'm a professional. I, I perform at a certain level. I, I don't play golf. That's not a game to me. It's a job I work at. The fact is, if I don't know how to play golf, then I... I just can't really understand what you do. I want to be able to talk about your work with you. No. No, believe me, uh, you don't have to. When I come home after swinging those clubs all day, I want to forget all about golf. I still say we should play golf together. Susie. Stanley. When she called me Stanley, I knew that was the end of the argument, so one morning we went out to the first tee. I spent some 15 minutes trying to acquaint her with the fine points of the stance and the grip and the swing. When she simply smiled at me and said... Look, darling, in front of me is a round white ball resting on top of a pointed little peg. In my hand, I hold a metal shaft called a club. Some 400 yards directly ahead is a hole in the ground marked by a flag. Is all this correct? Yes, dear. The idea is to strike the ball with this club 
so that it goes into that hole. Right? Right. So, just stand back and let me do it. Suddenly, the ball was swept from the tee. It flew, swift as a bird, straight as a bullet, in a long, high, graceful arc, and came to earth and to rest in the exact center of the fairway, some 230 yards away. I couldn't believe my eyes. Susie, could you, um... (laughs) Could you do that again? Sure. Watch this one. Hey, that's even further, isn't it? I think I'm really getting the hang of this thing now. At first, I refused to believe she had never held a club in her hands before. But it was true. She was one of those people who were born to play golf. She needed some finesse, some experience, but all the basics were there. She had the swing. And people began to notice her. They tried to convince her to enter some amateur tournaments. I thought it would be a great idea. But I don't think it's such a great idea. Well, it'll give you something to do. I have enough to do. Just being your wife. Hey, you better not say that for publication. <laughs> that women's lib crowd will really get on you. Well, you know the old saying. Different strokes for different folks. Yeah, but your strokes on the golf course are absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm, I know. Hey, you're supposed to be modest. Would you rather I were modest or truthful? Truthful. (laughs) Mm, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. Why not? Because the truth isn't always the best thing. What could be more important than truth? Uh, How can you have a relationship if it isn't based on truth? Darling, successful relationships aren't based on truth. No? No. They're based on tact. I'd rather you were truthful than tactful. Then the truth. I'd better give up golf. Why? Because it'll lead to consequences. You see, darling, I'm a better golfer than you are. What? Ask anybody. Are you serious? You're all right. You're good enough for the tour most of the time. Oh, you make some money in the bottom half of the scores. Now and then you even win a tournament. Susie. It was hard enough to begin. Let me finish. But darling, I'm a natural. Who, who, who are these people you've been talking to? The most important one is me. I. Myself. I know what I can do with a golf club. Well, Stan, you can't have... Two golfers in the family. I still don't know what you're talking about. Especially if it's the wife who outclasses the husband. Stan, if I'm going to enter tournaments, I'm going to win. And we're going to lose control of it. I don't know if you read the sports page. Uh, I don't know if you follow golf, Lieutenant. Yeah, a little bit. But she caught on from the very first. And the reporters started coming around, not to see me. Oh, no. And at first I was, well, I was in kind of a daze. Until this one writer ran into me one day. Uh, his name is Pete Farrow. Hey, you must be Stan Standish, huh? Yeah, I guess I'm, uh, I'm hardly a household face. Oh, that's a mixed metaphor. <laughs> that's because I'm having a mixed drink. More than one, if you ask me. Yeah, but you're, uh, you're supposed to be the guy who's asking me, remember? Yeah, well, I guess you know what I want to ask you. Let me guess. Uh, how does it feel to be the wife, uh... Oops, beg your pardon. The husband of a star. <laughs> More or less. Well, sir, in vino veritas, uh, that's Latin. In wine, there is truth. For exactly, or is it, uh, precisely? What does it matter? You're probably asking yourself, where does this jock come off to spout Latin, huh? I used to spend a lot of my time in the library. Is that a fact? Which place is where I met sensational Susie. But, uh, to answer your question, if, if I can remember it, 
You see, sir, I accept reality. Uh, which reality is this? That I'm just a journeyman golfer. I can just hang around par. That gets me 10th to 23rd money. Just about. It's a nice living. It beats mine and coal. Yeah, but Susie. Ah, Susie. She's the golden girl. The gem of the tour. Why am I telling you all this? Isn't that what you write in your own column? How do you feel about it? She's one in a million. They love her. Not for what she does. But for what she is. Yeah. Hey, you wrote that, too. Yeah. She just radiates warmth and humanity. Her smile is not merely a movement of the lips. It's an expression that's straight from the heart. They love her. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Which is uh, why I'm giving up golf. I'll never be anything, and she'll always be everything. (laughs) I hope that answers your question. That's why you decided to give up the game, huh? Yes, Lieutenant. I I had no choice. You know, I guess you could say uh, it uh, gave me up. (laughs) Just like that? Yeah. Just like that. And you never regretted it. The Lieutenant is an idiot. (laughs) But I had to talk to him. Of course I regretted it. A moment hasn't gone by that I haven't regretted it. How can I tell that to him or anyone else? How can I tell him that I regretted it so deeply, so badly, that last night it finally all exploded inside of me? And I killed her. No, that's a surprise. Perhaps it's not too great a surprise to veteran sophisticated followers of our stories who take nothing for granted and suspect everybody of everything. The question is, will he get away with it? Well, don't take anything for granted there either. To be continued in Act Two shortly. not thyself by over-expecting happiness in a married state. Remember the nightingales, which sing only some months in the spring, but commonly are silent when they have hatched their eggs, says the learned Thomas Fuller. It's a rather complex thought, but we get the sense of what he means. And we know that Stanley Standish over-expected happiness in marriage. And when he was disappointed, he killed her. But of course, the police do not know that. Nor is he disposed to tell them. And you never regretted giving up golf? Well, it's like I told you before, Lieutenant. It it, it gave me up. I mean, when we first got married, she followed me around the men's tour. Now I was following her around the ladies. And it didn't bother you? Well, of course. It was was bothering both of us. Uh, Oh, one night we'd come home from a party. uh, She just won the open. And we just simply started to talk about it. Stan, you missed the Southern States Invitational. Yeah, 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 I know. But you had a chance to win. Oh, an outside chance. Uh, I, I probably placed my usual 18th, taking home my usual 3500 bucks. Uh, You're giving up. Well, no, that isn't true. Mm, I can see signs of it. Well, the fact is, I guess I, I gave up a long time ago. Oh, Stan... Oh, you're the star? You know what I am? (laughs) I'm referred to as her husband, who also plays golf. Darling, I'm sorry. For what? For doing this to you. Oh, the fact is, I did it to myself. You know, you you didn't want any part of it. I I pushed you into tournament golf. No, no, Stan. I wanted it. I, I, I tried to keep it from you. But the minute I got out on that golf course, I just felt, I I knew I was at home. I belonged. I couldn't be happy anywhere else. So, then, there we are. I was afraid. I am afraid of what it can do to our marriage. I've tried to give it up. I've tried to walk away from golf. But I can't. 
I'm living when I'm on that course. I'm sorry. Oh, hey, it doesn't have to be the end of the world. I did go to college, remember? <laughs> True, it was on a golf scholarship. But I did get a degree in business. That's it. What's it? You're going to manage me. Manage you? Yes. I need a manager. All this, this money coming in, it has to be invested. The endorsements, the commercials. Well, somebody has to handle all the contracts. Look, darling, you and I have been muddling through it somehow. But now, let's put it on a firm basis. Manage me. Be my manager. Oh, what am I supposed to do? Become a guy who lives off his wife? Oh, darling, I need you. Oh, sure. Well, somebody has to do it. Well, then get somebody to do it. Who can I trust? Who loves me? Who's always going to be looking out for my interests? A Stanley, don't be old-fashioned and... Yes, I'll say it. Stupid. No. It's not the way it was in the old days when sports stars were just well-paid heroes. Today we've become enterprises, corporations. Honestly, Stan, sometimes I think the least of it is when I'm swinging the club. Just look, look what's piled up on that table. Offers to appear in a movie, to do commercials, to invest. Oh, darling, please... So I became her manager, her agent, whatever you want to call it. I became one of those guys I never had any use for. But I began to see how useful, even how necessary, they are. And did she listen to you? Oh, yes. She didn't want to know anything except what she had to do on the course. All money, all the business decisions were mine. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I understand from what I read in the papers that you made uh, a few bad investments. I also made some good ones. That's how it goes. Now, why did he bring that up? What's he driving at? Nothing. What can he know? What can he prove? She was killed by a burglar who took the trophies. No one saw me do it. I'm in the clear. No point getting worried about it. Even as far as Foster is concerned. Everybody knows I had dealings with Foster. Uh, Stanley. Well, what do you want to see me about, Foster? Right now, it's about lunch. Well, I'm not hungry. Ah? Then let's get to business. Uh -huh. Who says we're going to talk business? You're here, aren't you? Oh, maybe it's curiosity. It could also be cupidity. Hmm? People make a lot of money with me. Now, people have also lost their shirts. What am I investing in? Foster Enterprises. <laughs> Which does what? Which considers uh, special situations. Legitimate special situation? Ah, that word legitimate now. You can't give it a hard and fast meaning. <laughs> Why not? Because legitimacy varies with uh, geography. Depends on where you are. In other words, what could be crooked here is legal somewhere else. <laughs> Perfectly legal. So, what do you say? I should have said... Get out of here. <laughs> What's crooked is crooked. But I listened. And I agreed. I gave him money. And I must say, it showed some spectacular results. Susie happened to ask me one day. How are we doing? Great. You're a cinch to take the Lady Grey tournament. No, I mean financially. Isn't that supposed to be my department? Oh, sure. Except... Don't tell me... I know. Polly. She doesn't mean any harm. She does, but let it go. I just wish you and Polly would like each other. I'm prepared to like Polly. She hated me from the first minute she saw me. Oh, Stanley, she doesn't hate you. She's my sister. My only sister. My only relative. 
She practically raised me. Well, I give her all that, but the fact is, she hates me. And she thinks I'm cheating you out of your estate. Oh, Stan. Well, it's true. So, she's been steaming you up. I'm not steamed up. Okay. Let's go over the books. No, let's not. Look, darling, I trust you. But I insist. To begin with, here's a bank statement. Uh, I want you to look at these certificates. Hmm? Also, these checks. Stanley, do... Do we... I never knew we had so much money. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, I'm so sorry. Forget it. It's just that she's my sister. Uh, tell Polly for me that uh, anytime she cares to, she may send her own accountant here to examine the books. I wonder if this lieutenant, who seems so sympathetic, actually suspects me. Is it a pose? I don't know. But I do know this. Sooner or later, Polly is going to show up and start screaming at me, accusing me. Let her. I'm ready for her. And speak of the devil. I guess I better answer that, Lieutenant. I've been looking all over for you. Polly. So... The criminal returns to the scene of the crime. Polly, this is Lieutenant Schaefer of the Homicide Squad. I've already met Lieutenant Schaefer. I am not impressed. What do you want, Polly? I want you to hang for Susie's murder. But I didn't murder Susie. That's a lie. Lieutenant, he's the killer. A lady, you have to have some kind of evidence. He went through her money. He gambled it away on phony investments. Is that true, Mr. Standish? It has to be true. He's doing business with Eben Foster. You lost all her money. She faced you with it. You had to kill her. Polly, poor Polly. You want it to be true, don't you? You need it to be true, but it isn't. It is. You say I killed her because I had squandered her money? What's the truth? I tripled it. It's a lie. Well, the documents are there. They're phony. The money is there. It's a counterfeit. Now, miss. I know what I must sound like. A mad woman. But, Lieutenant, I tell you, he killed her. Why, Polly? Why? I don't know why. But you do. Polly, I want to help you. You killed my sister, and you won't get away with it. You don't believe me, do you, Lieutenant? Well, lady, in our business, it's all facts and evidence. Believe me. What you're saying is he's going to get away with it. Look, we've set a special phone number. We've asked anyone who might have some information to call us. I have some information. I'm giving it to you in person. Why do you disregard it? We've checked him out. He wasn't aware of it. But we've looked into his activities carefully. There's no talk of another woman. I never accused him of that. We, uh... We don't feel he had any reason to be jealous of her. He hasn't swindled her out of her money. So I ask you, Miss Darney, what is... Or was his motive? I don't know. I only know he did it. All right, Polly, dear. You stay with that. Make a fool of yourself. Keep screaming that I'm the killer. And the more you yell, the better for me. I'm sorry, Polly. I'm sorry I had to kill her. But I had no choice. You're right for all the good it's ever going to do you. I killed her. And I'm going to get away with it. Brave words. Bold words. But certainly, there seems to be a basis for them. The police are evidently content that he's innocent. And in the final analysis, theirs is the only opinion that matters. But if he wasn't swindling her or cheating on her or resentful of the fact that she was having an affair, which she wasn't, why did he kill her? I think by this time, you should know. All the clues are there, and Act Three will be here shortly. consensus 
Love, or the lack of it, which some people call a manifestation in reverse, is the basic motive force of the world. No argument here. But love can mean many things to many people. Love can have an infinite variety of subjects, not to mention objects. One thing, however, we do know about love. It is no stranger to death. I know you're feeling all upset, Miss Darling. Would you like me to have a police officer see you home? No. No, thank you, Lieutenant. Stanley, please. I can forgive you. Confess. Sooner or later, it'll all become too much for you to bear. All right. Don't say a word. Just think about it. Goodbye. She sure doesn't like you. It would have been anybody Susie fell in love with. She didn't want her to get married. Polly's about 12 years older. They were orphans. Now, Polly's been like her mother. She gave Susie her whole life. And then Susie ups and marries and leaves her all alone. Yeah. Great deal of bitterness in the world. So much of it unnecessary. I should tell you something. Nobody says you killed your wife. No? Nobody says it isn't what it appears to be. A burglary and homicide. But, but... People are going to follow through on her sister's suggestion. They'll question whether there's some truth to her charges. Uh, my financial life is an open book. It was. As far as my honesty with my wife's money was concerned. Foster, uh, Eben Foster, he taught me things I never learned in college. <laughs> I didn't want to know how the money was invested. There were rumors he financed drug operations. I couldn't say. That he promoted riots, even revolutions in foreign countries. I didn't know. All I knew was he always gave me my money's worth. And great advice. Stan, I, uh... I have a little venture. Count me in, Foster. Without knowing what it is? Well, if I did, would it matter? <laughs> no, I suppose not. Tell me something, Foster. Why do you cut me in on these deals? You got enough money of your own. I like you, Stan. I like you because you're basically conservative. Hmm. You can say that? Look at the unorthodox way you work. Unorthodox, but uh, <laughs> conservative. I bet on sure things, and I respect small money. Small money? Watch the small money, Stan. Too many people make a pile and they forget. They don't watch the little stuff, and it starts to trickle away. And one day they look around, and it's all gone. Keep an eye on every dollar. You remember that. And I remembered. Hmm. While I didn't become a skin flint exactly, I was becoming rather thrifty. Susie noticed it. Thank you for waiting, ladies and gentlemen. Passengers holding seat numbers 19 through 37 can now board the plane. Come on, baby. That's us. Hey, that's the rear of the cabin. The tourist section. Well, that's how we're going, Susie. Oh, we can afford first class? Well, it's not a question of affording it. It's a question of needing it. Look, if this were a four-hour flight, you'd need the extra room for resting, but to pay twice as much for 47 minutes in the air, it's wasteful. But we've got the money. Hey, we've only got it for as long as we're judicious. Hey, that's a great word. I'm in charge of finances. Okay, Scrooge. Stick with me and you'll die rich. Why did I say that to her? It was the first time I ever used the word die in speaking to her. Now, she didn't notice it, but why had I used it? I don't know. Something was bothering me. And then I realized I wasn't playing golf. I missed it. I needed it. And so one afternoon I sneaked away. 
I went to some club up in the country and I I played for 18 holes. I felt marvelous. And then in the clubhouse, someone said, Hey, Stan, let me buy you a drink, huh? Oh, well, if it isn't Grantland Rice, the greatest sports writer that ever lived. <laughs> no, I'm too young to be Grantland Rice if he was still alive, and I'm too old to be his reincarnation. I'm just Peter B. Farrell. Hey, you were absolutely sensational. <laughs> was I? For a guy who hadn't held a club in his hand for five or six years? <laughs> well, he always had a good swing. Did I? What you needed, I always thought, was patience. Patience. Well, call it confidence. You always felt you had to kill the ball. You didn't trust your swing then. I mean, the way I saw you do it today. I went around in 80. Well, sure, your putting was rusty, but putting was never your problem, was it? No. And you always had the touch with the irons. I mean, you could cut 10 to 15 strokes off that score. And now you're shooting 70 and below? Well, you're a threat. No, no more. It's too late. Why? Well, she's the star. She's America's sweetheart. It's... I'm in her shadow. I just... I, I just couldn't make it happen, that's all. You know what I think, Stan? I think you gave up too easily. And quit too soon. That's the day it started. That's when it rankled. I said, I gotta get this monkey off my back. Playing privately, I got my game down beautifully. So I thought I'd enter a tournament. I told her. She didn't go for it. Stan, don't. Why not? Because... <sighs> Darling, I don't know how to tell you. Well, tell me the truth. Well, the truth is... You're not good enough. Yesterday, up at Birch Forest, I shot a 64, and that's a tough course. But you didn't shoot it in the tournament. What's the difference? One word. Pressure. That's what pro golf is all about. I'm playing in the tournament. Hello, Stan. Oh, what are you doing here, Farrell? The winner is back in the locker room. Oh, no. You're going to be my story. Why? Because you got the human interest. You're trying to come back. Oh, some comeback. Nine shots behind the leader, 16th place. Oh, you're still going to take away some money. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like I've never been away. <laughs> I'll never be able to play a round of golf as long as she's alive. And the minute I said it, I knew what I was going to do. Or had I known that for a long time? There was a revolver, an old thirty-two that belonged to my brother who died long ago. Nobody even knew about the gun. It was buried in a closet somewhere. And there were bullets. Stan, Stan, honey. I'm sorry about the tournament. It's okay. What are you looking for in that closet? This. A gun? Oh, you shouldn't have a gun in the house. I know. I'm going to get rid of it. Oh, good. I'm even scared to look at it. Turn around. Why? <gasps> Stanley, what are you doing? Susie, please. Uh, I have to. No, Stanley, no. I have to. Uh, Don't no. you understand? Uh, I have to. I had to. I don't think anyone heard the shots. I gathered all the trophies together. I messed up the place a little so it would look like there'd been a struggle. It was late at night. No one saw me as I went out the back entrance. And I drove away. Clear and clean. There were just a few things to do. Get rid of the gun. I stopped at the edge of the bridge. I threw the gun in the water. It would sink forever in the mud. And now, the trophies. What to do about them? Destroy them somehow. I looked at the heavy sack beside me. 
They could be worth over $30,000. What did Eben Foster say? Watch the small money. Hello? Foster? It's uh, Stan. Uh, a question. Yeah? Suppose you had some merchandise you wanted to get rid of in a discreet manner. Precious objects, uh... You know the sort of person? Contact a gentleman called Purvis. No names need be mentioned. He'll give you the best deal. I'll give you eight grand for the lot. By the weight of the silver and gold alone is... So why don't you go to one of them big jewelers on the avenue? Well, number one, you'd have to tell him who you are. Number two, you'd have to tell him what this is and how you got it. Yeah, but do I ask you questions like that? Now, what do you say? All right, here, ten big ones, cash. Take it or leave it. All right. Oh, Mr. Stanish, come in. Sit down. Thank you. I, I just uh, dropped by to see if perhaps there was some progress. Uh, not much, I'm afraid. You know how these things are solved? One of the killer's friends will turn them in for a reward. Oh. Why don't you offer one? A reward? A big one. You can never tell. It might produce results. How big? The bigger, the better. Could you, uh... Could you offer 50000 Why not? Why not, indeed? Why fifty? Why not 100000 I was the killer, and I was absolutely in the clear. I'm sorry I shot her, but she took away the most important thing a man has. His pride. Well... To drop in on police headquarters and my routine visit with Lieutenant Schaefer. A nice man. I rather like him. Anything stirring, Lieutenant? Oh, a few false alarms, but you have to expect that. Mm. Should I raise the ante? No, no, no. This is good enough. Keep it a little time. Excuse me. Mm. Lieutenant Schaefer. You in charge of the Susie Standish murder? Yes. You have any information? The guy that knocked her off and stole the trophies. He left them here with me. I don't know his name, but I know what he looks like. And when he left, I wrote down the license number of his car. Oh, that's good. Is it good enough to get the reward? Well, if you got all that merchandise, it's all yours. I'm around the corner. Give me two minutes. <sighs> Bingo. Oh, what is it? <laughs> These crooks, they all make stupid mistakes. He went out and fenced the trophies. Now, that was incredibly stupid. Oh, that was? Well, sure, the fence knew what they were. He knew there'd be a reward. You see? Oh, the reward would be bigger than the gold and silver he could realize from them. Oh, and it's good money. Nice, clean, legitimate. He'd be crazy not to do it. You mean the, uh... Fence to whom the crook went has now decided to report to the police. Uh -huh. It's a lucky day. Penny Wise, pound foolish. Had he thrown away the trophies, he would have been completely in the clear. But he was interested in the small money. Now, some of you purists may claim it was his word against that of a fence, but the trouble was that they found the 10,000 on him. Well, he'll be gone for a long time, but I won't. I'll be back shortly. said, steals trash, but he who robs me of my good name, ah, and just as important as one's good name is one's vocation, and some people have a talent or a calling, a work that they must do if life 
is to have a meaning. To some people, it's something cosmic, like finding a cure for a disease. To others, it may be something seemingly trivial, like a game of golf. But, as one of our characters said, different strokes for different folks. Our cast included Tony Roberts, E.V. Juster, Larry Haynes, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. If you had a mystery to solve and you were given your choice of the greatest detectives in the entire world, whom would you choose? I took a little poll of my own, and most of the people I asked had no hesitation in naming Sherlock Holmes as the man they'd most like to help them. So, I must assume that it would come as a shock to hear of someone who didn't want the help of the world's greatest detective. Dr. Huxtable, when I learned that the purpose of your visit to London was to enlist the services of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I was shocked. But, but, Mr. Wilder, the police have failed. His grace is by no means convinced that the police have failed. But I cannot understand why you object to using the services of Mr. Holmes. There's a great deal you can't understand, Dr. Huxtable. Suffice it to say that we neither need nor want the services of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Heard was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett from the A. Conan Doyle classic and stars John Beale. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Unfortunately, the crime of kidnapping seems never to go out of fashion. Historically, it reaches as far back as the ancient Greeks and Romans. However, I didn't know until recently that Sherlock Holmes was once called upon to solve a sensational abduction. Holmes' good friend Watson called it the case of the vanishing herd. quarters of Baker Street have had some dramatic entrances and exits, but none more sudden and startling than the first appearance of Thornycroft Huxtable, M.A. Ph.D. After his first thunderous knocking, the door opening and closing behind him, he took one step forward and collapsed, almost at Holmes' feet. Quick, Watson, I'll get a cushion. You fetch the brandy. Yes. If it's your diagnosis, if that's what our visitor needs. Well, I, I'll check, Holmes. Here's the cushion. Uh, right. What's his illness? Oh, absolute exhaustion. Well, possibly mere hunger and fatigue. I, I think some biscuits and milk would be better than brandy. Uh, oh, dear me, gentlemen. Forgive this momentary weakness. Uh, see, Mr. Holmes, I left the school to ensure that you come with me immediately to Mackleton. Uh, dear Dr. Huxtable. I, uh, how, 
How do you know my name? <laughs> uh, it's elementary, sir. He took your card from your pocket when he went to your aid. Oh, for which I, I do thank you both. But I'm, I'm quite recovered now, and we don't have much time if we're to catch the next train to Mackleton. I'm afraid that's out of the question. Have you heard nothing of the abduction of the only son of the Duke of Holderness? The ex-cabinet minister? Exactly. Uh, excuse me, sir. What have you to do with the abduction? My dear Watson, Dr. Huxtable is the headmaster of one of England's most exclusive schools. Oh. It's only logical to assume that the boy was taken from his school. We we tried to keep it out of the papers, but last night the Globe printed some rumors which I thought might have reached your ears. Well, I'm well aware that the Duke is one of the great men in the kingdom. Oh, and one of the wealthiest. His grace will hand a check for 5,000 pounds to whomever locates his son. Watson, pack a bag. We're accompanying Dr. Huxable to the north of England. Yes. Excellent, excellent. You relieve my mind, Mr. Holmes. And you, sir, when you've finished with your nourishment, will you tell me how it happened and what you now have to do with the matter? And finally, why you come to me three days after the event to engage my humble services. Oh, but, but you told me you hadn't heard of the abduction. Uh, so how could you know it took place three days ago? The state of your chin and the growth of your beard gives me the date. Now, finish your biscuits and milk, and we'll hear the story on the way. Mr. Holmes, you seem to be familiar with my school, the Priory. It's the best and most selective preparatory school in England. <laughs> but I felt that it had reached its zenith when the Duke of Holderness informed me that he wished to enroll his son and heir, Lord Saltmire. And when was this? Uh, uh, three weeks ago. The boy was charming and soon adapted and was extremely happy. Which was not the case at his home, huh? Well, uh, it is an open secret that the Duke's married life hasn't been as happy as one could hope. But the Duchess left Holderness Hall for the south of France uh, about a month ago. Uh, the boy sided with his mother and was certainly discontented, which uh, was the reason for the Duke sending him to my school. Hmm. And he disappeared he on... He was last seen Monday night. His absence was discovered on Tuesday morning. His bed had been slept in. He dressed himself fully before going out, and his room was in perfect order. There was no, no sign of any struggle. You've been very remiss in not coming to me sooner. However, it can't be helped. We can continue with this on the train. Any hope at all, Mr. Holmes? Uh, oh dear me, I, I'm not sure I've told you everything, but is it enough? It's to... enough to raise some very curious questions, Dr. Huxtable. Uh, no, I agree, Holmes. And my biggest question concerns the missing German professor, Heid... uh, Heidegger. Heidegger. Yeah, that's the chap. Holmes, don't you think it's suspicious that he turns up missing the same day as the lad? As I said, Watson, it's curious. Dr. Huxtable has assured us that there was no contact between the boy and Professor Heidegger. Oh, none whatever. The boy wasn't taking German, and so far as I know, they, they never even exchanged a word. Mm -hmm. That's all very well, but it's more than a coincidence that both he and the boy disappeared on the same day. Don't you agree, Holmes? Yes, Watson, I'm in complete agreement. It's much more than a coincidence, and one which we'll look into when we get to the school. Gentlemen, the Duke and his secretary, Mr. Wilder, are in my study here at the school. And I should like you to meet them. Of course. And follow me, please. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. His Grace, the Duke of Holderness, and Mr. Wilder. I came this morning, uh, Dr. Huxtable, too late to prevent your starting for London. 
prevent me, Mr. Wilder, from starting... Precisely when I learned that the object of your visit was to invite Mr. Sherlock Holmes to undertake this case. His grace is surprised, Dr. Huxtable, that you should take this step without consulting him. Oh, surely, Mr. Wilder, my, my seeking out Sherlock Holmes... Could... You're well aware of how his grace feels about notoriety and that Mr. Holmes' reputation is worldwide. Well, I agree with Mr. Wilder that you... Dr. Oxtable would have done wisely to consult me. But since Mr. Holmes is already privy to what has occurred, it would be absurd not to avail ourselves of his services. Uh, Your Grace, at the moment I assume you have received no ransom note? No, sir. Excuse me for the reference, but uh, it must be asked. Do you think the Duchess had anything to do with the matter? Why, I... uh... I do not think so, no. Uh, One more question, Your Grace. I understand that you wrote to your son upon the day this incident occurred. Ah, no, I wrote the day before. Exactly. But uh, he received it on that day. Aye, so I'm told. Uh, Was there anything in that letter which might have upset him or induced him to run away? Certainly not. Did you post that letter yourself? His Grace is not in the habit of posting letters himself. This letter was with the others on the study table, and I myself put them in the post bag. Thank you. How many letters did your grace write that day? Oh, twenty or thirty. I have a large correspondence, but surely that is somewhat irrelevant. Mm, Not entirely. For my own part, I have advised the police to turn their attention to the south of France... Now, I've already said that I do not believe the Duchess would encourage so monstrous an action. But the lad is strong-minded. And it is possible that, aided by the German, he may have fled to her. And now, Dr. Huxtable, I think we will return to the hall. After the Duke and his secretary had left somewhat abruptly, Holmes and I were shown to our rooms, and shortly thereafter we met with Inspector Richardson of the local police on the lawn underneath the windows of the missing Professor Heidegger. I've uh, long been a great admirer of yours, Mr. Holmes. When I can, I try to fashion my methods after yours. Well, thank you, Inspector. Hmm. I take that as a compliment. What do you make of our mystery here? Oh, no question but that the lad and the professor, this uh, German, are connected. I agree. Oh, they went off together, I'm certain. I've been told that uh, only the bicycle belonging to Professor Heidegger is missing. Ah, that's so. The boy had no bicycle. And it's quite certain that there's no other bicycle missing? Quite. I'm surprised that you haven't hit on the answer by now. The bicycle was a blind. They hid it somewhere and went off on foot. Excellent, my dear inspector. But um, weren't there other bicycles in the shed where the professor kept his? Several. Wouldn't someone desiring you to believe that they'd ridden off have hidden two bicycles rather than one? Oh, I suppose he would. But, but, but Holmes, you agreed with the inspector that the two were connected. And so they were, Watson, so they were. Oh, but how, Mr. Holmes, how? That's only a theory, Inspector. You shall have to wait until I can prove it. But uh, I'll give you a clue. The lad, young Lord Saltmire, went off fully dressed, correct? Correct. But let me call to your attention, Inspector, that the professor's rooms face the same way as the missing boys. And the professor went away only partly dressed, since your investigation showed that he'd left his shirt and socks on the floor. Uh, But, Mr. Holmes, what is that supposed to prove? I suggest you check out Professor Heidegger's eyesight. spent most of the evening poring over a large ordnance map of the neighborhood. This case grows upon me, Watson. Come over here like a good chap and look at this map. Mm. Now, here's the school. Now, you see this line 
It's the only road past the school. Yes, yes. It runs east and west. Yes, it's very clear. Huh? Oh, we can take it further, my good fellow. By a happy chance, I have proven that no one passed along that road after midnight on Monday night. We have the word of a constable and an innkeeper. But, but can you be sure of this, Holmes? Definitely. The lady who runs the inn was up waiting for a doctor, oh. and the constable never left his post at the crossroads. <laughs> so, Watson, we can say the fugitives never used the road at all. Uh, but the bicycle... Quite so. I say they must have traversed the country to the north or south. Now, if they went south, they'd encounter a number of tilled fields with stone walls dividing them, which makes a bicycle impossible. Oh. But uh, to the north... There's a great rolling moor intersected with paths. A cyclist doesn't need a road with the moor at the full. Come in. Oh, Dr. Huxtable. I say we, we, we have a clue at last. Thank heaven. Inspector Richardson found the boy's cap. Where? In the, in the van of some gypsies who camped on the moor. They left on Tuesday. Richardson has the, has the police on their trail. Today, they found them and the cap in the caravan. How did they account for it? Well, they said they found it on the moor Tuesday morning. Of course, they lied, but either the law or the Duke's purse will get the truth out of them. So we can all sleep well tonight. <laughs> good night. He's right, Watson. We we'll both need a good night's sleep, since we have to be up and about with the sunrise to see if we can find the real solution to this mystery. The gypsies may be telling the truth. From time immemorial, gypsies have had a bad name. I've tried to do some research to discover whether or not it's deserved, but it's difficult to find any definite statistics since the gypsy people are such fierce individualists. I think we'd best leave the answer to Sherlock Holmes and his encyclopedic knowledge when we return to Act Two shortly. Every fan of Sherlock Holmes knows that Arthur Conan Doyle was, in reality, a physician. They also know that he started out as a practicing doctor and only turned to writing to augment his income. However, I don't think I've ever heard any of the thousands of Holmes fans ever question why Doyle made Watson such a naive bumbler and also a physician. Was this really his opinion of the medical profession? I find this a fascinating question which ought to be investigated by some fan of the Holmes saga. just breaking over the Priory School and the Northern Moors when Holmes was at my bedside shaking me awake. Wake up, Watson. Wake up. There's tea or cocoa ready in the next room. I've already done the lawn and the bicycle shed, but I must beg you to hurry, for unless I'm much mistaken, we have a great day before us. I dressed hurriedly and joined Holmes, and we struck out on the russet peaty moor intersected with a thousand sheep paths. I say, Holmes... Isn't it late for us to expect to find any traces of their passage since so much time has elapsed? Ordinarily, you would be right, Watson. But the map showed a water course across the moor. In some parts, it even widens into a morass. At that part, I expect to find some evidence to support my theory. Uh, do you think the German professor was in league with the gypsies? Well, you may recall, Watson, that I asked you to think about the eyesight of this Professor Heidegger. Oh. What has that to do with anything? My dear chap, just look at the facts. The professor's window faces the same way as the Duke's son. Mm -hmm. The professor was known as a night owl. In his room, his socks and shirt were found. Evidence that a man had dressed in haste. Mm -hmm. Now, Watson, I submit that Professor Heidegger was looking out his window on Monday night and saw the lad climb down the vine and slip away into the night. Mm -hmm. The good man immediately dressed hastily 
threw on anything that came to hand, climbed down the ivy outside his window, got his bicycle, and rode after the lad to bring him back. Oh, it's Joe Holmes. That's amazing. Sheep. Sheep. Nothing but sheep seems to have been here. Oh, wait. Here are some tracks that aren't sheep. Not sheep, Watson, but not the marks we seek. These are cow tracks. Uh, you see, we're not going to find anything. Huh? We're temporarily checked, I'll grant you. But there's another morass down yonder, and a narrow neck between... Hello? What have we here? Uh, you, 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 you've hit it again, Holmes. We have it. Those are the tracks of a bicycle. A bicycle, certainly. But not the bicycle. I'm familiar with 42 different impressions left by tires. This was made by a Dunlop with a patch on the outer cover. Hmm? Heidegger's tires were Palmer's, which leave longitudinal stripes. Huxtable was very positive on that point, that Heidegger used Palmer's. Hmm. Well, this, this is the track of the boy, then, eh? It's so uh, possible. If we could prove that the young lad had a bicycle in his possession. But this we have totally failed to do. You see, of course, that this track was made by a rider going away from the school. And we shall follow it backwards before we go any farther. <laughs> we lose the tracks when we come out on the hard ground. Uh, Holmes, I, I, I see the suggestion of a spring over there. Excellent, Watson. Let's see if we can pick up that track again over where the ground is damp. Ah, ah, here we are again. It's still moving toward the school. Oh, dash it. It's no use, Holmes. It disappears as soon as the ground gets hard and the cow tracks cover it. Uh, it's useless to continue backwards. Let's return to the morass and see if we can't pick up some other clues. Is it possible, Holmes, that the professor changed tires deliberately in order to throw us off the scent? Watson, that's a truly brilliant idea. And a criminal who was capable of such a thought is a man with whom I'd be proud to do business. But I somehow doubt this is the case here. Come, Watson, back to our swamp. And let's hope for some luck. It was wearisome work systematically surveying the edge of the sodden section of the moor. And I confess I was beginning to doubt Holmes and his theory when I heard a cry of delight from him. Ah, the Palmer tire! Here's here, Heidegger, sure enough. Ah, ah, I congratulate you, Holmes. But I fear it won't lead very far. Why do you say that, Holmes? Oh, we shall see. Observe, Watson. Our rider is now undoubtedly forcing the pace. Mm. Look at this impression, where both tires are clear. See, that one is as deep as the other. Which means... That uh, the rider is throwing his weight onto the handlebar, as a man does when he's sprinting. By Jove, he's had a fall. Oh, here's a side slip. I think not, Watson. Look at this clump of gorse. I say, blood. Bad. Bad. It's turning ugly. Very ugly. Now stand clear, Watson. Not an unnecessary footstep. Hmm. What do I read here? He fell wounded. He stood up. He remounted. He proceeded. But there are no other tracks of any kind. There are tracks of cattle on this side path. Come, Watson. Let us push on. The search wasn't a very long one. The tire tracks began to swerve erratically. A gleam of metal caught my eye among the thick gorse bushes. Out of them we dragged a bicycle, palmer tired, one pedal bent, and the whole front of it horribly smeared with blood. I think we have our unfortunate Professor Watson. Right here. Give me a hand oh, and I tell see. me the cause of death. Yes. Well, I'm sure you didn't need me, Holmes, to tell you that the man died from a, a frightful blow on the head. 
You must have been an extraordinarily strong and courageous man to go on after receiving such an injury. Watson, we've progressed this morning. We've picked up several clues. But before we can proceed, we must separate the essential from the accidental. Uh, I'll be blessed if I know which is which. You do know. Now, let's go to the beginning. The lad was completely dressed. What do you deduce from that? Well, that he planned to leave and went off on his own free will. Capital, Watson. And now to our unfortunate German teacher. How did he leave? In haste. He, he saw something from his w window, or by Jove, he must have seen the lad leaving. He went after him to try to bring him back. Exactly. But now we come to a critical part of my deductions. What's the natural way for a man to pursue a small boy? Well, to run after him, of course. Of course. But the German turns to his bicycle. Why, Watson? I simply have no idea. Because he saw that the boy had some swift means of escape. Ah, the other bicycle. The one with the patched Dunlop tire. Perhaps. So it's most certainly a possibility, but let's continue. Our courageous German teacher meets his death five miles from the school. Yeah. He's killed by a savage blow to the head, delivered by a vigorous arm. So, our young Lord Saltmeyer must have had a companion in his flight. Well, my thought exactly. Yeah. Yet, when we survey the ground around the scene of the tragedy, what do we find? A few cattle tracks. Nothing more. So, another cyclist could have had nothing to do with the actual murder. Nor, indeed, can we find any human footmarks. Holmes, this is impossible. A wise remark. As I stated, it is impossible. Therefore... I must have gone wrong somewhere. Can you suggest any fallacy? The gypsies. Don't forget the gypsies. Are you suggesting that they have supernatural powers? They can use a caravan that doesn't leave tracks? And also their tribe leaves no footprints? Leave me at my wit's end. Not to worry, Watson. We've solved worse problems. We still have material. It's up to us to use it. Now, we've exhausted the Palmer, but let's see what the Dunlop with the patched cover has to offer us. We picked up the track of the Dunlop and followed it for some distance, but the moor soon rose into a long, heather-tufted curve, leaving the water course behind us, so no further tracks could be hoped for. We last saw the tracks, which could have gone on to Holderness Hall, the stately towers of which rose just some miles to our left, or to a low grey village which lay in front of us. Well, Watson, shall we toss a coin? Head to the left and tails to the right. I don't know about you, Holmes, but I could do with some refreshment. Tramping about in the moors gives a chap an appetite, you know. <laughs> Let's head for the village then, Watson. There must be an inn. As we approached a somewhat squalid inn with the sign of a gamecock above the door, Holmes suddenly grasped my shoulder and groaned with pain. Oh, oh, oh Watson... Here, my, my ankle. All right. I'll hop over to the landlord sitting in the doorway. Just help me. There. Thank you, Watson. And how are you, Mr. Reuben Hayes? Who are you? And how did you get my name so pat? Well, it's printed on the board above your head. So it is. You're a sharp one, ain't you? Well, I can read if you consider that sharp. I don't suppose you have such a thing as a carriage in your stables? No, I have not. I can hardly put my foot to the ground. So don't put it to the ground. Uh, this is really rather an awkward fix. I don't know how I'm going to continue. Neither do I. Well, the matter is very important. I'd gladly offer you a sovereign for the use of a bicycle. A, a sovereign? Huh? Where do you want to go? To Holderness Hall. <laughs> Parents of the Duke, I suppose. I know he'll be glad to see us. And how do you know that? Because we bring him news of his lost son. What? 
You're on his track, then. He's been heard of in Liverpool. They expect to get him any hour. I'll help you take the news to the hall. Thank you. But first we'll have some food. Then you can bring the bicycle around. I told you, man, I haven't got one. I reckon I have two horses as far as the hall. We'll talk about that after we've had something to eat. We were alone in the stone flag kitchen. To my astonishment, Holmes sprang up and walked to the window. Holmes, your ankle. <laughs> A miraculous recovery, huh, Watson? That ankle was for the benefit of our gracious host, Reuben Hayes. Mm. Gracious is certainly not the word to describe that ugly. What are you looking for? The answer. It's out there somewhere I know. It's something I've seen and missed. Something about tracks. By George. Of course. That must be it. What's an old chap? I do believe I've found the answer. <laughs> also found the answers in real life. He did in the famous case of a man named Oscar Slater, tried and convicted for murder. Until Doyle wrote a book showing that the evidence which had convicted him, a pawn ticket for a possession of the murdered woman, had been pawned before she was killed. Slater was released from prison. I'll be back with the solution to our mystery shortly. Another book by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle on the Oscar Slater case got Slater a full pardon and compensation for the years he had served in prison before Doyle managed to get him released. So when Doyle writes of Sherlock Holmes and his colleague Dr. Watson, he's not without qualifications on the logic of deduction. I stared at an excited Sherlock Holmes as he stood over me in the kitchen of that squalid hostelry in the north of England. Quickly, he rearranged the silverware on the table as he spoke, driving his point home. Watson, you remember seeing cow tracks today? Uh, yes, Holmes, m many times. Where? <laughs> Everywhere. Uh, they were at the morass, on the path, and again where poor Heidegger met his death. Exactly. And now, Watson, how many cows did you see? Cows? Well, come to think of it, I, I don't remember seeing any. It's very strange that we should see so many tracks and never a cow on the whole moor. Watson, look at the way I've arranged the silverware and some of your breadcrumbs. Hmm. Do they recall to you the way the tracks looked? Out there on the moor? Well, I, I, I really can't say. But I can. I can swear to it. I've been blind not to draw my conclusion before. And what is your conclusion? That it is indeed a remarkable cow which walks, canters, and gallops. I tell you, Watson, it wasn't the brain of a country innkeeper that conceived a trick like that. The coast seems to be clear. Save for that lad in the smithy. Let's slip out and have a look in the stable. There were two rough-haired, unkempt horses in the tumble-down stable. Holmes raised the hind leg of one of them and laughed. <laughs> Old shoes, Watson, but newly shod. Old shoes, but new nails. Mark that, Watson. <laughs> this case deserves to be a classic. Let's go across to the smithy. You two infernal spies. What are you doing prowling around in my barn? Tell me that now, eh? Why, Mr. Reuben Hayes. <laughs> One might think you were afraid of our finding something out. We've been having a look at your horses. But my ankle is so much better, I think I'll walk after all. It's not far, I believe. Uh, no one two miles to the hall gates. That's the road to the left. Holmes, I'm 
convinced that this Reuben Hayes knows all about it. A more self-evident villain I never saw. Yes, Mr. Hayes does give that impression. But then there's the matter of the cows. The vanishing cows. We must always keep that in mind. But I think we need another look at the inn in an unobtrusive way. Let's turn off at the road here and come upon it from the rear. Come, Watson. Let's scramble up this hillside. I, I say, Holmes. Holmes, look. Look there. Along the road from the hall. The cyclist. Down, Watson. Get down. Yes. Stay quite still. Good. Let me take a look as he goes past. I, I can see through these bushes, Holmes. Why, it's the Duke's secretary, Mr. Wilder. So it is. And riding as if the hounds of hell were his eagles. Come, Watson. Let's see where he's headed and what he does. We scramble from rock to rock, making our way to the top of the hill, to a point from which we commanded a view of the road and the inn. And by the time we reached this vantage point, Wilder had disappeared. But his bicycle was leaning against the wall near the front door of the inn. Suddenly, Holmes nudged me. Mr. James Wilder. There he is now, at the door. I see him, Holmes. I suggest we go down and have a closer look. Holmes, the bar is on the other side. Quite so. These quarters are for what one might call the private guests. Now, what in the world is Mr. James Wilder doing in this den at this hour of the night? And who is the companion who comes to meet him? I cannot say. At least I'd like a look at the tires on Wilder's bicycle. Let's go quietly over there. Right. And, and now a match. Yes, Please, yes. Sir. <sighs> There's our patch, Dunlop. Yes, it Holmes. Someone has lit a lamp in the window above us. I must have a look through that window, Watson. I can bend my back and brace myself against the wall. You think you can scramble up on my shoulders? Easily, old chap. Come, my friend. We've done more than enough for one day. At 11 o'clock the next morning, Holmes and I were ushered through the magnificent Elizabethan doorway of Holderness Hall and into his crazy study. And there stood Mr. Wilder, courteous and courtly, with some traces of the wild terror of the night before still lurking in his eyes. I know you've come to see his grace, but I'm afraid I have disappointing news for you. His grace is far from well. He has my sympathy, but I must see the Duke. I believe he's in bed. I will see him there. You refuse? Mr. Wilder, I told you, I must see the Duke. I intend to see him. I will wait here, if you ask me, but I will see the Duke. Oh, very well, Mr. Holmes. I'll tell him you're here and insist on seeing him. Well, Mr. Holmes, I shan't apologize for keeping you waiting... I understand you demanded to see me. What is it? I think, Your Grace, that I could speak more freely in Mr. Wilder's absence. Well, the fact is that Mr. Wilder is my confidential... Your Grace... If Your Grace wishes, I can leave. Yes, uh, perhaps you'd better go. Now, Mr. Holmes... Uh, my colleague, Dr. Watson, and I had an assurance from Dr. Huxtable that a reward had been offered in this case. I should like to have this confirmed from your own lips. Certainly, Mr. Holmes. If I was correctly informed, it amounted to 5,000 pounds to anyone who will tell you where your son is. Exactly. Uh, I see your grace's checkbook on the table. I should be pleased for you to make me out a check for 5,000 pounds. I know where your son is. And I know some, at least, of those who are holding him. Well, where is he? He is, or was, last night, at the Gamecock Inn, about two miles from your gate. I see. And uh, whom do you accuse? You, Your Grace? Mr. Holmes, how much do you know? I saw you together last night. Does anyone besides your friend know? I have spoken to no one. Well, however unwelcome the information you have gained... 
I'll be as good as my word and write you a check. I believe 5,000 pounds is the sum I owe you, is it not? I fear, Your Grace, that matters cannot be arranged so easily. There's the death of the schoolmaster to be accounted for. But you can't hold James Wilder accountable for that. It was the work of this brutal ruffian whom he had the misfortune to employ. I must take the view, Your Grace, that when a man embarks upon a crime, he is morally guilty of any other crime which may spring from it. Morally, Mr. Holmes, you're right, but surely not in the eyes of the law. Well, I... I appreciate your coming here before you spoke to anyone else. You will at least help me to minimize this hideous scandal. I want to help your grace to the best of my ability, but in order to do so, I must have absolute frankness. Mr. Reuben Hayes was arrested at Chesterfield on my information at 11 o'clock last night. You continue to amaze me. Well, I must say I'm glad to hear that Hayes has been taken, if it won't harm James Wilder. Your secretary... No, sir. My other son. Now it's my turn to confess amazement, Your Grace. Well, I see the time has come to conceal nothing. Mr. Holmes, I have two sons. James Wilder, illegitimate. And my legitimate son and rightful heir, Arthur, Lord Saltmire. I should certainly not like to sit in judgment on you, Your Grace, but... Mr. Holmes, when I was a very young man, I... I loved a girl with such a love as comes once in a lifetime. She refused my offer of marriage because she was a commoner and she felt that the difference in our station might harm my career. And where is she today? Dead, Mr. Holmes. And on her deathbed, I promised her one thing. To take care of our son, James Wilder. I have kept that promise. You seem proud of the fact, despite your knowing that he was responsible for the abduction of your legitimate heir. I only gained that knowledge last night after he'd heard of the murder. He confessed that he'd added a note in my last letter to Arthur, telling the lad that the Duchess wanted to see him, and that he, James, would arrange it if Arthur would meet him that night in the wood behind the school. And Arthur did, of course. Of course. It was then that James told my heir that all he had to do was steal out the next night and a man with a carriage would meet him in the wood and take him to his mother. That's why Arthur dressed and went off with Reuben Hayes. It's just unfortunate that the German saw him. It's also unfortunate that you didn't realize how your illegitimate son felt about your heir. I cannot understand... What James Wilder thought he stood to gain by this abduction? Was it to hurt you? I can't explain, Mr. Holmes. You see, James has always felt that it is in my power to break the entail. He also felt that as the eldest son, he should inherit my estate. I think he wanted to bargain with me. He'd give me back Arthur if I'd break the entail. He knew that I could never set the police on him, never. Well, surely your grace knows that you've condoned a felony. I have placed myself completely in your hands, Mr. Holmes. Just help me is all I ask. I, I think Watson and I can consider our little visit to the north a success. But uh, there's one small point on which I'd like some light. This fellow Hayes had shod his horses with shoes that counterfeited the tracks of cows. Did he learn such an extraordinary device from Mr. Wilder? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes, step this way, please. Now, look at this case here in the corner. Ah, I see that these shoes were dug up in the moat of Holderness Hall. Those shoes belonged to some of the marauding barons of the old days, and they were designed to throw pursuers off the track. Well, thank you, Your Grace. It's the second most interesting object I've seen in the North. And the first? Your Grace is Czech. I'm not a wealthy man.
facet of the story you just heard that amazes me. And that is, it's the only tale by Conan Doyle that shows Holmes with an interest in money. After thinking about it, I decided it was because Holmes didn't like the way the Duke treated his younger son and was punishing him for it. I'll be back shortly. did Sir Arthur Doyle prove his logical deductions in the field of real crime, but he also helped British intelligence. In World War I, he transmitted news to British POWs in Germany by sending what looked like ordinary books to them. However, he arranged to put needle pricks under various letters so as to spell out messages. But he started with the third chapter because he said the German censor would examine the earlier chapters more carefully. And he was right. Our cast included John Beale, Court Benson, Ian Martin, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I think I can say that one of the most asked questions and the most unanswered question of the 1980s and possibly the 1990s is this. Is there life on other planets? Out there, are there substantial thinking creatures who can at least match our intellect? If so, are they friendly or hostile? What do they look like? And will we be able to communicate with them? However, our tale today is not so much is there intelligent life in outer space, but is there intelligent life right here? Amos, huh? look there. Quick. Between the moon and that tall tree. It's coming closer. What is it? It's for the 4th of July instead of the 4th of December. I'd say it was a blue pinwheel gone crazy. Amos, it's not spinning. It's lighting up the sky. Now it's moving off. Over the hill. It's gone. What was it? Well, it, it, it could be a temperature inversion. It, it does that. It's an unidentified flying object. You and I have just seen one. <laughs> was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Jack Grimes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The CBS Television Tuesday Night Movies presents the tastiest little murder mystery of the year. Who is killing the great chefs of Europe? George Siegel is the junk food king. Jacqueline Bissett is the pastry chef who knows the way to a man's heart. Robert Morley is the restaurant critic dying for a good meal. What's the next victim's going to be? Dad! Dad is the murderer! You'll find out who is killing the great chefs of Europe. Tuesday at 9, 8 Central and Mountain on CBS Television. 
Anything else, Bill? Got something for hemorrhoid symptoms, Mr. Baxter? Pain, itch? Try this. Preparation H. In many cases, Preparation H gives prompt, temporary relief of occasional pain and itching of hemorrhoidal tissues. Great. Actually helps shrink swelling of tissues caused by inflammation. I'll try it. Hi, Bill. How are you today? Fine. Thanks to your good advice. Doctor-tested Preparation H helps shrink hemorrhoidal swelling as it relieves pain and itch. Use only as directed. Turn back toward the window. Crushed out a cigarette. Hi, this is Kenny Rogers. Every cigarette smoker can stop. Don't care how long or how much you smoked, how many times you've fallen off the wagon and tried to crawl back on, or how chained you may think you are to your cigarettes. And here's some tips on how to get loose from the cigarettes. First, believe in yourself. Then, begin to carry your cigarettes in a different place. Switch your brand of cigarettes at least twice a week. Don't carry matches or a lighter. Challenge yourself each morning by jotting down how many cigarettes you think you need. And at night, how many you actually smoke. Don't get crippled in your best years by heart disease. Get some help. Quit smoking. Call the American Heart Association and put your money where your heart is. Give to the American Heart Association. They're fighting for your life. the most fascinating events can only happen to those who live in big cities. This is quite untrue, and today's mystery theater story will prove it. Extraordinary happenings will occur to those who live in Hudson Falls, a small town where a young man and a young lady sit on a porch glider of an evening. Amos, I wish you wouldn't keep asking me. I haven't made up my mind. Hey, Susan, what are you going to... Don't you love gliders? I mean, they're so old-fashioned and sweet. Mother and Dad spooned on this when they were first married. Well, uh, I guess you're not going to give me a positive answer tonight. Now that she's passed away, Dad never sits out here anymore. Okay, I'll change the subject. I am being considered for the job of assistant editor to Harris on the newspaper. I'm very pleased. Well, I thought you'd be. That's why I had to come over and tell you. I mean, I'm pleased Dad is taking such a personal interest in his newspaper. Becoming a publisher has given him something to do. Doesn't he have any hobbies or, or friends? Dad's never been close to people. He spent all his time making money and now buying the Hudson Falls Gazette. Money's been his only interest. You know, Susan, we could give him something no money can buy. And I, I bet it would give him a whole new lease on life. We could? A baby. Uh, Amos, I haven't even agreed to marry you yet. Okay, then what about it? I've been asking you for two years now. Amos, I don't see myself married to you. Because I want to be married to someone who's going somewhere. What are you? A reporter on a small-town newspaper. Even if you got to be editor-in-chief, it's going nowhere. You're not ambitious. And I don't want to go nowhere with you. Amos! Hmm? Look up there, quick! Between the moon and that tall tree! It's coming closer! What is it? Today was the 4th of July. Instead of the 4th of December, I'd say it was a blue pinwheel firecracker gone crazy. It's not that. It's not spinning. It's lighting up the sky and coming this way. It's moving on. It's going over the hill past the baseball diamond. It's gone. Amos, what was it? Well, it, it could be a temperature inversion. It, it does that. Temperature? What are you talking about? That was an unidentified flying object. And you and I have just seen it. There is no such thing as UFOs, Susan. You don't think they're possible? Of course not. You mean a saucer with little green men on it? I don't think you're being funny, Amos. The joke could be on you. Well, uh, whatever it was, it's worth a picture. Now, if I were the assistant editor, I'd ask Jack if he had his camera ready. Jack? Jack who? Jack Sperry. 
Remember him from high school? He always liked you. Anyway, he's been a freelance photographer, and he came back to Hudson Falls and joined the paper last week. He's uh, sharing my place. Susan, whatever you think of me, I, I want you to know I love you. Even though you believe in visitors from outer space. You're hopeless. You've got a closed mind. I can believe anything is possible. You can't. And that, my friend, is the difference between us. Hey, Amos! Is that you? Wait till you see these shots I just developed. Oh, doggone it. You smelled up the bathroom again, making it into a dark room. Uh, 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 watch it. Watch it. These blow-ups are wet. Uh, you you took these? Yeah, yeah. Just an hour ago. I was standing outside, and all of a sudden, I saw this big flying silver pie. A hundred feet in diameter. Windows all around it. Comes zooming over the hill. Uh, uh, look. Look. Look at this one. Uh, not bad, huh? Uh, a little grainy, even though I opened it up as far as you'd go, but... They were traveling, man. I'll bet you Harris will print these on the front page tomorrow. Yeah, maybe, but the caption will read, Fake or phony? Pixies play pranks. Uh, could be, but it'll liven up the gazette. Uh, oh, hey, how'd you make out with Susan? Oh, I didn't even get up to bat. You know, I've been asking her to marry me for two years now. Jack, those shots you took, you know, we saw that thing flying around. Hey, Jack, I have an idea. W will you go along with it? Well, if it doesn't get me fired. Ah, if we do this right, it might even get you a promotion before you've been on the staff two weeks. What time is it, Jack? Why, you're not planning to break any speed records in this old car, are you? No, I just want to get to the top of this hill without being seen. That's, uh, quarter after ten. Oh, hey, where were you today? I looked for you at lunchtime. I spent most of the day in the library reading up on our uh, project, Operation Goofo. Oh, very funny. There's a whole shelf on UFO. People who've seen spacecraft actually been on board. You know, you keep reading that stuff. You can get to believe someday it could happen to you. Tony, uh, I didn't want to wait that long. You really think what we're going to do is the only way to Susan's heart? Well, I'm willing to gamble. You think this whole jalopy will make it to the top of the hill? Oh, she'd better. It's around that bend, then about 50 yards. If I don't make it to the top, then the whole plant falls through. Oh, now, Jack, when we get up there, we just got to hope that the brakes will hold so that she doesn't roll down the other side before we're ready. Nice going. And uh, do you see anyone ahead coming up the hill towards us? Mm, no, not a soul. Okay, then let's get out on the double. <laughs> You are really going through with this? I sure am. I can always take the bus to work. <laughs> well, what about me? When you show Harris the pictures you're about to take, you'll get a bonus big enough to buy two cars. I'd never do this to make a girl marry me. She said I'd never get anywhere, and I had no imagination. Well, we'll see. This old bus of yours is a real beauty. How can you part with her? Would you stop talking? <laughs> Your camera loaded? What do you think? All right, now I'll release the handbrake. You push the car forward on your side. I'll push from mine. I just hope the steering wheel stays straight and we let her rip. Okay, so she rolls downhill and crashes into some tree down there or into that stone fence. And we run like the devil after her. I mess myself up with dirt and lie down somewhere near it like I was thrown from the wreck. And I just take as many pictures as I can, right? Uh, oh, hey, uh, how come I didn't get hurt? We talked about this. You were riding with me. When the UFO ran us off the road, you had the presence of mind to jump clear right away. And because pictures are your business, your natural reflex was to take pictures of everything in sight. Now, once you got what you want, I'll, I'll hook it to the nearest phone and I'll call old Horace Bailey and tell him what happened. That way Susan will hear about it first. Gotcha. Okay, now. One, two, three, boy, and uh, there she goes, right after her. <laughs> Okay, but she's on fire. Oh, darn it. I figured everything but that. 
Uh, what do we do? What do we do? Oh, okay. If you jumped out. Remember that. Uh-huh. Now, I've got to get close to her and see if I can get singed to somehow make it look like I was inside when the UFO sides hey, Amos, you are not getting any closer to those flames. Wait a minute. I, I know what. I'll take off my clothes, tie them to the end of a stick, and then poke them into the fire just to get them a little burned. Oh, hey, Amos, don't do it. She no. could explode again. It's not worth it. Forget it. It's... Amos, you're not taking off your pants, too. Everything I've got to to make it look authentic. I'm supposed to take pictures of this? Not yet. Not until I singe the clothes and get them back on. That's the whole idea. Amos, something is going to go wrong. Somebody is going to see the flames and we'll be mobbed. Uh, uh, hey, uh... Amos, you're not taking off your shorts, too, are you? Well, now, how's it going to look if my clothes are burned with my underwear? Amos! Amos, where are you? Oh, oh this black smoke. He said I should keep taking pictures. Hey, hey, Amos! Amos, you okay? Amos! Somebody pulled the alarm. They're sending a pumper. Doggone it. My clothes fell off the stick right into the fire. Uh, are you okay? You didn't get burned? No, it's all right. It, it'll make a better story. Jack, why aren't you taking pictures? This is what the UFO did to me. Shots of you naked? Don't worry about it. can always be retouched. <laughs> here, here they are. You better skedaddle. <laughs> Over here, you guys. Ema has beat it. Two firemen are coming. They've got a portable foam extinguisher. Okay, stand back, you. Hey, you, taking the pictures. I mean, you. Hey, hey, watch it. There's a man behind the burning car. Watch, we aim that home. We're still back, Tony. Hey, you in the camera. Stop. Aim that foam higher, will you? Hey, stop, will you stop? <laughs> Let me out of here. Shut! Turn your phone down. Oh, look at him. Oh, boy, doing a sight, mister. <sighs> what are you doing out here on this frosty night, naked as a tape, and standing behind the burning car? You, uh, warming your hands, mister? <laughs> I know it's late, but will you please keep ringing? It's an emergency. Hello? Uh, Mr. Bailey? Who is this? Mr. Bailey, this is Amos Jones. I've taken the liberty of calling you at this hour because I've been witness to an attack by a creature or creatures from outer space. It's an important news story. You're holding that. Just hold it. Who is this? Amos Jones. I work for you on the Gazette. Uh, what time is it? Uh, it's, it's 4 a.m., sir. I was driving along and I was forced off the road by a UFO. It hit my car. You, I'm in the firehouse, sir. In the firehouse? Yeah, what are you doing there? Well, they're looking for a pair of pants to fit me. I I lost all my clothes in the fire. I was hit by a UFO, sir. I heard you the first time. You weren't hit hard enough. Now, you'll be in my office in the morning, and you'd better be wearing pants. Have you noticed how some people can't seem to do anything right, even on Mystery Theater? Here is Amos Jones... Young reporter who tries to impress the girl he wants to marry by wrecking his car to make it appear he was attacked by some arsonist from outer space. Just how far does Amos think this stunt will get him? You have no idea the surprises that are in store for Amos and yourselves. I shall be back shortly with Surprising Act Two. If you use a long-lasting nasal spray, you ought to check the package. If it has a big 12 on it, you're getting the longest-lasting relief you can get. You're using Duration Nasal Spray. Duration is different because Duration has the longest-lasting nasal decongestant. So Duration gives you up to 12 hours of relief. That's up to two to four hours longer relief than most other long-lasting nasal sprays. Look for the nasal spray with the big 12 on it. Duration. The proof is on the package. The package with the big 12 on it. For occasional use only as directed. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniels, and I'm very concerned about hunger in our world. Every minute, 21 children die because they don't have enough to eat. There is enough food to go around for everybody. What's needed now is for each of us to care enough to get involved in this issue. Now, I know you care. What can you do? Write politicians about your concern and support hunger organizations. Thank you. For further information, write Impact on Hunger, 145 East 49th Street, New York, New York, 10017. Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, 
Nelson Rockefeller, Bruce Jenner, Thomas Edison, Leonardo da Vinci. These people and many other brilliant, talented, creative people overcame a form of learning disability. This is Pat Collins for the Foundation for Children with Learning Disabilities. There are over 10 million children in this country who are learning disabled, and they can be helped to overcome their learning differences. We owe it to them and to ourselves. Some of these children can be our country's future doctors, lawyers, artists, scientists, and politicians. You can help children with learning disabilities. Please send a contribution to FCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. That's FCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Because a young reporter fakes an encounter with a UFO doesn't mean that many haven't been sighted around the world. There are countless affidavits, published accounts, and sworn testimonies, not only of sightings, but by people who believe they have been taken aboard a flying saucer. Up in Hudson Falls, it was a week of notoriety and ballyhoo, the value of which did not escape publisher Horace Bailey. Amos, I think we've got a tiger by the tail here. You come up with some first-class, first-hand news, and we cannot let the story die away. Oh, Mr. Bailey, I'm still shook up about that first encounter. Uh, when you see Susan, I, I hope you'll tell her that. I, I haven't been able to get a hold of her. You were near death, my boy. Uh, when that extraterrestrial machine came down right, right on top of us and, and sideswiped us, I really thought that was the end. Well, I, for one, would like to keep that story alive. It, it came at me buzzing like a, a giant beehive, a, a streak of blue light. All those little windows in a saucer, a hundred feet long, Mr. Bailey. A hundred? The first story we sent across the wire, you said 50. Now, you shape up, boy. Now, which is it, 50 or 100? A good reporter remembers details. Well, then, what you try remembering with all those strange faces looking at you out of the portholes as that darn thing buzzes by. This has just hit me. The tower on top of the Gazette building. Hmm? The, the one on the right side, we never put the water tank in it. Oh, ideal. Amos, I am turning the tower into an observatory, and in it, I am installing a telescope and perhaps even an automatic camera. Push a button, and it keeps taking pictures. And you, Amos Jones, I am putting you in charge. Well, that's very nice of you, Mr. Bailey. I've, I've, I've been meaning to ask. You, Amos, will be our nightly watchman protecting our civilization. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, yeah I uh, I didn't have any insurance on my car. I, I, I couldn't get collision because it's more than five years old. By Monday, everything will be installed. Well, do you think the Gazette could, could get me a replacement? Well, I've talked to the board. You know, a man like you who's in charge of his country's first privately endowed Center for Non-Terrestrial Study, NTS, should have transportation to return to his home at 5 in the morning. You 5? Duty roster, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. Your watch, my boy. You mean for me to spend my nights waiting for UFOs? When do I sleep? In the day. This is for science, Amos. If these Martians, or uh, whatever they are, like it here, they may start commuting. Who knows? They'll be back, and we will be ready. Every night? Well, I think there ought to be a, a couple of people working in shifts. If, I mean, don't you think I deserve a more... Normal schedule? More normal than what? It's Susan, Mr. Bailey, your daughter. You see, I, I know she's my daughter. Well, when am I going to see her? She works days in that law office. I'll be working nights, so I figure I ought to get Saturdays and Sundays off. Not to begin with, Amos. It's weekdays and weekends. Remember, Hitler always struck on a weekend. Uh, uh, so did Napoleon. We can't relax our vigil for a moment. <laughs> This is some great spot you have up here, Mr. Astronomer, in your telescopic tower. Now cut it out, Jack. No, no, I mean it. Hey, look at that telescope. 
What an observatory. Oh. <laughs> I got a good deal for old man Bailey. Two cameras, automatic. So I've loaded one with tri the other with infrared. You are so lucky. Would you shut up? The whole crazy idea is boomeranged on me. I'm on duty here every single night. Well, that's a real shame. Yeah, Susan won't talk to me on the phone. I don't know what's wrong. Here I go and cook up this whole scheme about UFOs that she was so excited about, and suddenly it's nothing doing. You haven't seen her? <sighs> Saturday, Sunday, I call her. She, she's not home. I, I leave messages. Here it is Monday, and I'm I'm on this cockamamie UFO watch, and, and, and what for? Now, what coop from outer space is going to fly by the village green of Hudson Falls to be observed and photographed? It's insane. Gee, I'm sorry it worked out this way. But what can you do? Well, there's got to be another sighting. That's what. I'd like to hang around and take the pictures for you, but these uh, these cameras are a cinch. Just push the button and you're in business. Ah, no. These sightings are going to be in my head, Jack. You understand? I'll get action from Susan and old Horace Bailey. You see if I don't. Believe me, I'm not spending any more nights in an empty water tower just because Napoleon declared war on a weekend. <laughs> This is where you and Amos live, Jack. It's a nice little apartment. Well, we managed to keep out of each other's way. Uh, Susan, uh, what I was saying on the way over is, uh, do you think it's fair? I mean, Amos feels like Napoleon banished to St. Helena. Do we have to talk about Amos? You asked me here to come see your portrait work. And I'm really into photography. Oh, I'll have them out in a minute, Susan. Oh, if you like some white wine, just help yourself. You see, I've been taking portraits for a heck of a long time, and... Uh, oh, yeah, here we are. Uh, now, this is the folder I'd like you to see. I'll uh, set the pictures flat on the table. Take your time. These are beautiful. I had no idea. Uh, well, newspaper work is just for now to support myself until I've got enough solid good prints to oh, get me an agent or interest a gallery. Photographs are really big now. Oh, um, while you're looking, I... I, I I just have to talk about Amos. Famous Amos. No, I'm not kidding, Sue. He's had a raw deal, and so I was thinking, could you, uh, could you put in a word with your father? What word? Well, make him understand that being cooped up in an old water tower, just waiting for a UFO to heave into view, is a waste of time. Do you really believe he was attacked by a flying saucer, and so his car burst into flames? Well, I was there, wasn't I? Loyal Jack was there. That doesn't answer my question. Well, what do you think? Amos made it up? What about the pictures I took? Your pictures show a car on fire and Amos running around in his birthday suit. There isn't a UFO anywhere. Well, of course not. The thing had gone by then. Is that why you don't answer when Amos calls? You don't believe it? This whole center for non-terrestrial study is a joke. I'll make a deal with you. I won't say I think you may be in cahoots with Amos if you take me to the Founder's Day picnic tomorrow. Okay. I guess so. You do that, and I'll keep my suspicions to myself. Susan, you are the prettiest blackmailer I ever met. But I still want you to remember, Amos is my friend. Good morning, Mr. Bailey. I, I, I've got something important to report. Yes, good morning, Amy. <laughs> you have? You, you saw another flying saucer. Oh, better than that. One of them landed on the village green last night, and they took me inside. Hey, Miss, you don't mean it. It took you inside. What was it like? Well, I've written the entire story down here, and I want you to read it very carefully. Hold, hold, hold everything. Uh, hello, uh, yeah, Miss Mergenweiler. Get me Harris. Uh, uh, here, now, let me have a look at your copy. Two men, pink suits, gray faces, led me into ship, windows all around, doors, oval shapes, strange symbols on door. Amos, I can't believe I'm reading this. All right. They placed me on the golden table, tube, fastened to the middle of my body, strapped me down, table spin. <laughs> it's too much, and this is too much for a mere mortal to comprehend. Well, I, I underwent a, an unusual flowing feeling, Mr. Bailey. It, 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 it's hard to explain in our words. 
Then the cable stopped. It, 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 it's all written down there. Then they, they let me get up. And one of them said, it worked. And the other one said, we'll get them all now. All of them. What did they mean? Well, I would say, those who were sent from outer space plan to take over our civilization. They are not friendly. They are to be feared. Jack, it's not that I don't care for Amos. It's that I think I like you better. Sue, I can't do this to him. This has got to be the last time we meet. The whole town's here on the green picnicking. It's not as if we were alone. Think of Amos. You've known him all your life. He's crazy about you. You can see the Gazette building from here. Look up there. In that tower, there he sits. A lonely watchman ready to give the alarm if we're invaded. Nice try. Amos isn't protecting anybody. Come on. How can you say that when he risked his life last night being forced on board a spacecraft? One that didn't make a dent on the green? You don't think it's strange that no one else in town saw it land? Look, Sue, I said I'd take you to the picnic. We've eaten all the sandwiches, we've finished off the beer, I've got a couple of rolls of film I have to develop and print, so if you don't mind, I'll be on my way. Okay, Jack. I'm... I'm sorry we don't seem to get along. Sue, we could, believe me. But so long as there's Amos, we can't. Hey, Amos. Okay if I come in? I, I know it's late, but you're on duty. Now I'm playing solitaire, or I deal you a hand. Amos, um, this thing is kind of snowballing. Aren't you afraid it'll get out of hand? Our civilization, as we know it, is being threatened, if that's what you mean. Did Horace Bailey tell you the call he got from Washington? No, I haven't seen the old man for two weeks. Not since I handed him my eyewitness account. I've been too busy. The White House is impressed with your early warning system for UFO attacks. And I expect there'll be public recognition of my efforts. Hey, Mas, hey, come off it. We know this whole McGill about you being taken aboard a spacecraft is so much baloney. Oh, we know that, do we? Don't put your head in the sand, Jack. The only way we can gear ourselves to combat an invasion from enemy planets is for everyone to hate space. Now, did, did you hear me? Quote, hate space. Unquote. I know. I've seen nothing but hate space billboards and bumper stickers. I got to hand it to you. You sure know how to get publicity. Hate space. You know, you almost have me believing it. Well, don't you, Jack? I know you've been dating Susan, and that's why I haven't got a chance with her. You're the reason. So when you come up to my observatory and say, Amos, don't you trust me? My answer is, no, I don't. Okay. Okay, I get the message. I thought you'd let me explain as an old friend. Nice try, old buddy. But our friendship is off. Because I'm cooped up here night after night. I'm imagining a flying saucer just landed on the roof. Just, oh, someone's pulling a stunt. It's no stunt, Mr. Jones. Oh, 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 oh who are you? How, how, how did you get in here so fast? The answer to your question is one you are not capable of understanding. My name is Smith. You may call me Mr. Smith. Uh, why are you dressed like that? This suit? No, no pockets. It's like you're wearing a flannel skin. You should also take note, Mr. Jones, that I have only one eye in the middle of my forehead and no mouth. You are hearing what I say from a sender receiver on top of my head. What is this? Is some game or something? Are you, are you, you, you trying to scare me because... Because I want you to know that I, yeah, I don't scare easily. If you ask me, Amos has opened the Pandora's box. 
Check your mythology, and you'll find that Pandora was sent to Earth by the god Zeus and fooled Epimetheus into thinking the box was a wedding present from the gods. On her wedding night, Pandora opened the box and out flew clouds of death, disease, and destruction throughout the world, which is how we came by them. Only one good thing remained inside Pandora's box, and that was hope, which is all I can offer you when I return shortly with Act Three. Hi, I'm Tommy James for the Bell System. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Reach out, call up and just say hi. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Saunders, this is Heartbeat. Little Bo Peep lost her sheep, but instead of being depressed, she decided to pull herself together. She realized it was her little old helpless me way of thinking that made her so vulnerable to circumstances and negative criticism that she was not only tearing herself down, but even turning people's compliments into downers by saying things like, you can't mean me, you're just trying to make me feel good. So, most of her friends began to conclude, well, if she doesn't like herself, why should I like her? After all, she knows herself better than anyone else. Bo Peep finally realized she needed to recognize her strengths and focus on them and not on her weaknesses. And this has given her a new sense of self-confidence. She likes herself. I'd like to send you a free copy of my booklet on feeling good about yourself. Just put the words feeling good on a postcard or in a letter and send it to Heartbeat, Hartford, Connecticut. This is free. This is Heartbeat. It didn't turn out exactly as Amos Jones had figured it. You see, Amos wanted to marry the boss's daughter, Susan. Susan believed in the unbelievable, and so, to impress her, Amos concocted stories of having met men from outer space. And now, poetry has become truth. Amos has actually been visited by an unearthly person, a Mr. Smith, a real non-terrestrial, with one eye, no ears or mouth, yet an ability to hear and speak you ask, Mr. Jordans, why I am dressed in this fashion. <laughs> this is not my clothing, what you call gray flannel. It is my skin. Sure, a funny-looking get-up. <laughs> You're doing very well in masking your fears. But let me assure you, I am not here to frighten you. Well, dear... What do you want from me? A great deal, I'm afraid, Mr. Jones. You have done all our interplanetary cousins a great injustice, and by extension, yourselves. I have? You have. Through some extraordinary chance perception, you have been able to describe a great many of our life support and travel systems. However, because humans are basically ignorant... You have created a monster. You have painted us as desiring the Earth's annihilation. And before I and my brothers return from whence we came, you will have to publicly forswear your hate space jingoism and admit to the world you told untruths. You manufactured outright lies. It, it, it was all a mistake. It, it snowballed. You see, there's this girl, Susan. Unless you reverse completely the falsehoods you have maligned us with, we shall change the angle of the sun so that your world is burned to a crisp instantly. Oh, you wouldn't. Would you? And 
Not an atom or an electron in any of the galaxies would be any the wiser. Your planet will never be missed. What? You couldn't, Mr. Smith. Five thousand years up in smoke? Jones, we are a proud and peaceful race. You are the troublemakers and the warriors. For centuries we have been hopeful you would have come to your senses and we could join you and show you how to attain peace and plenty. Space, Mr. Jones, is not to be hated but loved. Mm. Okay. The ball is in my court. I, I, I got to figure out a way of stopping what I started. You work on it. And let's see some progress when we return tomorrow night at this same time. You're going now? For a little cruise and survey. And would you care to have a look aboard before we leave? Yeah, who, me? Inside of one of those? Thank, uh, no. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. Uh, too bad. Yeah, no. It's an experience not unlike the one you dreamed up, but without a gold table. By the way, these automatic cameras can only photograph what was made or born or grown on your planet. <laughs> Nothing else. Of course I did. Amos, I was working late. I look out my window and there's this big orange thing whizzing off the roof, shooting out blue flames. Uh, what were they doing here, Amos? Well, one of them came to see me. Did you get this picture? And I'm just checking now. You... No, the automatic shutter seems to have melted. Oh, my boy, you were very brave indeed, considering how dangerous these creatures are. Mr. Bailey, I'm afraid I made a big mistake. I'd like to go on record as saying space people, those from galaxies beyond, are not harmful. They mean us no harm. They're good people. And to hate space would be a catastrophe, a national calamity. If they would like to be friends, they'd like to help us. We don't need any help like that. Anyway, it's out of my hands. Washington knows the whole story. If I were Washington, I'd ring this town with anti-aircraft guns and a fleet of fighter planes, so if they ever come back, we will be ready for them. <laughs> Hello? Is that you, Amos? Amos, you've done it again. I was in the park with Sue, and we saw a UFO set right down on the roof of the Gazette building. How'd you do it, Amos? It's fantastic. It, uh, who is this? It's Jack. Who, who, who's this? This is Mr. Bailey, and uh, are you Jack the photographer who works for me? Well, uh, yes, sir, that's me. Uh, where's Amos? He's right here. Do you wish to talk to him? No, no, no. I, I just wanted to let him know that I saw him. Yeah, well, so did I. And I'm up in the observatory with him. Now, you better come up here, Jack. Your cameras didn't work. They got jammed or melted or something. There's a, a step on it. Mr. Bailey, if we don't tell the truth that there are great people, a, a kind people, and that I lied about them, if I can't get the people to believe that, they're going to blow us right out of the galaxy. It's the end. Amos, I think you're somewhat overwrought. Now, it's a great strain meeting enemies from out there. Now, you just let me take care of all the details from here on in. Okay? Hey, Miss Jones. Um, I must have dozed off. I... Mr. Smith. Yeah. So you're still up here in the tower. Uh, Mr. Smith, where have you been? I, I, I've been a nervous wreck for a week. You said you'd be back the next day. Mr. Jones, we wanted to give you time to make the necessary repairs to our reputation. But I'm afraid time wasn't on our side. Mr. Smith, you've got to believe me. I went on the air, on television, I gave newspaper interviews. But I don't seem to be able to stop that hate space movement I started. We've waited a long time. And our patience is very thin. Every five centuries when we return, nothing has changed. Humans still prefer trouble as a way of life. Uh, but, but you're not going to move the sun, are you? Uh, give us a break. Mr. Jones, you will come with us. Now? On, on board your ship? 
Well, where are you taking me? For a little ride. Don't you see, by taking me away from Earth in this spacecraft, you ruin any chance you might ever have of getting your message across. I'll say this to your species. You never stop arguing and you never stop trying. But, Josie, when you die, what happens then? We're back where you began, and you began in the cave days. Of course, if you married and had children, word could be passed along. Oh, there's only one girl I would marry, and she won't have me. This young lady, where is she now? Hmm? Well, probably sitting on her front porch with Jack on the same porch glider we used to sit on. Ah, what is the address? You're going there? Well, you, you never set this saucer down in her backyard. It's too small. It, oh, I'll tell you what, though. There's a little league ballpark about a half a block away from Susan's house. You could land there. I feel sorry for Amos. I really do. It's all my fault. Oh, look. Hmm? Did you see that blue flash in the sky? It's gone now. Disappeared behind those trees. It's northern lights or temperature inversions. Take your pick. You sound like Amos did the first night we saw it. When I wanted to talk about him, you didn't. Now I don't, and you still do. Ah, hello, Jack. <gasps> Susan? <sighs> Amos, you scared me. What do you mean creeping up on us in the dark like this? Uh, Jack, there's a gentleman in back of the house who'd like to meet you. Oh. Well, bring him around. Well, he's a stranger and a little shy. I'll, I'll walk you back to him. Okay. Uh, Susan, I'll be back soon. Amos, what are you doing here? Where is Jack? Well, he's talking to this party. What's going on back there? I hear strange sounds. I can't quite make out. Well, why don't you come back with me and see? You're being so mysterious. Uh, it's actually a little further up the street, uh, in, in the baseball diamond. Uh, how are you and Jack getting along? We're good friends. Oh, Amos. Why did you go through all that hocus pocus? You don't really believe I've ever been in touch with those from outer space, do you? Amos, I really cared for you before all this. Now, where is Jack? Jack? Are you over there? I think he's just behind this big clump of pines. Why didn't you tell me? It's a real UFO. It's tremendous. And those flashing blue lights means it's about ready to take off. I can't believe my eyes. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to meet my friend, Mr. Smith, who's in charge of this expedition. How do you do, Susan? She has fainted. You'd better hold on to her, Mr. Jones. Oh, that is the young lady. Susan. Susan, are you all right? I have noticed over the centuries, both females appear to feel a weakness in their legs and a cloudiness over their eyes when they see us for the first time. It's the lack of mouth and ears, I expect. And to hear a faceless creature speak. Oh, please. Excuse me, Mr. Smith. I was unprepared for the truth. Uh -huh. Yes, I see. Well, Mr. Jones, you can prepare the lady. Goodbye, friends. I hope the next time we arrive on your planet, your civilization will be, shall we say, more civilized. Where am I? Your name is Jack, is it not? Yes. Oh, my God. Is, is this a nightmare or is this for real? To answer your first question, Mr. Jack, take a look out at the porthole nearest you. Do you see? We are climbing upward. <sighs> the sun is rising with us. You're, you're kidnapping me. Not at all. On our planet, you will have eternal life. <laughs> 
Why me? And it seemed to us you were complicating matters between Mr. Jones and Miss Susan. And we required them to make and produce offspring. A matter of spreading a belief. But you will be helpful to us. How? Is a sample of today's earthling to study. Will I... Will I ever get back home again? To Hudson Falls? Certainly. We are not barbaric. We do plan to pay another visit to your world in a few hundred years. Earth time. By then, we would hope hatreds of all kinds will have died. We can wait. We are a patient people. It's an axiom that we hate some persons because we do not know them. And we will not know them because we hate them. Is our tale that much a fantasy or is it perhaps a disguised fact? It could all happen. Somewhere in space, there could be those of superior ideals who are right this moment watching us and waiting for the day when we might all join hands for a better life. I shall return shortly. Cyril introduces Mr. Buster Crab, film actor and author of Buster Crab's arthritis exercise book. I wrote a book on relieving arthritis pain, and I recommend new icy hot cream in the tube. Rub it on. Icy Hot's penetrating warmth reaches way down inside to help relieve minor pain, while a feeling of coolness soothes your skin. I'm convinced that new greaseless Icy Hot cream will give you fast, effective relief that lasts for hours. Use only as directed. Like Minute Maid Orange Juice, some things never change. Teenagers. I need privacy, Mom. Why can't I have my own phone? And mothers. Next, you'll want your own car. Only if it has a phone. The great taste of Minute Maid Orange Juice is never going to change. It's always 100% pure. And we'll be making that same delicious taste when your kids have kids. Make sure of the taste. Make it me. years ago, the Roman poet Lucretius wrote, Nature is not unique to the visible world. We must have faith that in other regions of space, there exist other earths inhabited by other people and animals. In 1500 AD, the astronomer Copernicus had the same idea, and a thousand years later, the great philosopher Bruno agreed. But society disagreed, and in 1600, Bruno was burned at the stake. My point is, who knows how many light years ago, the Columbus of the cosmos may have started for your doorstep. Our cast included Jack Grimes, Jada Rowland, Russell Horton, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I was born under a lucky star. I am the seventh son of a seventh son. I am destined to be rich. The seventh son of a seventh son? According to all the legends... Mendel, I said goodbye. Stan. Huh? What? Your money or your life? What are you saying? Your money or your life? <sighs> Go ahead, take my life. I'm not joking. And I am? Look, my friend, you gave me a choice. I chose... I'm warning you. I don't have any money, so it has to be my life. What do you mean you don't have any money? Everybody has to have something. Nothing. But don't tell me you have nothing at all. Not a copper penny. So go ahead, shoot. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... of medicine has today rendered harmless certain plagues and diseases, prolonged life, and is now exploring the particles that make up mankind. But our search to understand the human brain brings science to a halt. Perhaps because, as Ambrose Bierce tells us, the mind has nothing but itself to know itself with. Small comfort. Yet a possible explanation why the true story of Jessica Wirth may never be known. What is your name? Jessica Wirth. Where do you live? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it's just on the corner of my memory. But, but it'll come back to me. Do you live alone or with your parents, uh, your mother and father? Don't ask me that. Don't ask me that. <laughs> Mystery drama, Who is Jessica Worth? Based on a true happening, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Marion Seldes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Did you ever see concrete cowboys to kind of keep their horses under the hood? Well, CBS TV's got a pair going town to town with itchy feet looking for the road to Easy Street and always finding trouble. They're Jerry Reed and Jeffrey Scott, and they're about as close as two coats of paint. They're fun-loving fighters and semi-do riders, but one thing concrete cowboys ain't is boring, and that's no mechanical bull. Concrete Cowboy premieres Saturday at 10, 9 Central and Mountain on CBS Television. Some job. Standing all day. And now I've got hemorrhoids. Better not neglect them. I was hoping they'd go away. When I get a flare-up, Preparation H often gives me fast temporary relief from pain and itch. You have hemorrhoids? Lots of people do. But Preparation H even helps shrink swelling of hemorrhoidal tissues caused by inflammation. I'll try Preparation H tonight. Good morning. Ready for the big sale today? Thanks to Preparation H. Preparation H relieves pain and itch, even helps shrink swelling. He was only as directed. Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, Nelson Rockefeller, Bruce Jenner, Thomas Edison, Leonardo da Vinci. These people, and many other brilliant, talented, creative people, overcame a form of learning disability. This is Pat Collins for the Foundation for Children with Learning Disabilities. There are over 10 million children in this country who are learning disabled, and they can be helped to overcome their learning differences. We owe it to them and to ourselves. Some of these children can be our country's future doctors, lawyers, artists, scientists, and politicians. You can help children with learning disabilities. Please send a contribution to SCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. That's SCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. This account came to light some years ago. The story baffled the police and physicians then, and it baffles them now. A young lady, whom we shall call Jessica Worth, suddenly developed the most unusual powers, but only when she was not herself. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Follow me to a room in a hospital where a young doctor is checking his patient's pulse. Good, good, good. Everything's fine. Pulse is fine. How are we feeling today, Jessica? Not better than yesterday. Oh, good. Glad to hear it. Uh, let me see. Uh-huh. Chart looks pretty good, too. I feel pretty good, Dr. Curran, when people come to see me, but... But I don't feel so good when I'm alone. Oh, don't the nurses and the residents visit you regularly? It's part of their training. Yeah, but they're so... Uh, how can I call it? Impersonal, you know? I mean, nobody says much to me. Well, let me just check those bandages, huh? 
Oh, yes, yes, that's fine. Oh, I think you're healing well. Dr. Curran. Yes, Jessica. You don't think I'm stupid, do you? No, no, you're anything but that. It wasn't all your fault you fell off that horse. Uh, maybe it was a little stupid to ride it under a tree branch, but those things happen. But that's what I mean. I don't remember any of that. Not a thing. Not a thing. I accepted what you told me. That's how I got this concussion. But I cannot remember ever being on a horse. Well, you weren't for very long. No, but don't you see, I don't even remember ever having learned how to ride. Well, what do your aunt and uncle say? Who? Aunt and uncle, Uncle Albert, uh, Aunt Emily. Well, I've seen them both, usually separately, but they talk about things I don't remember at all. Uh-huh. They say they're not going to let me ride on any of the horses at the farm for a long time. <laughs> is that so surprising? Well, it is to me. I've never been on a farm. I don't remember riding that horse. I don't even recognize them as my uncle and my aunt. Who am I, Dr. Curran? If they're my relatives, why don't I know that? Well, you don't remember anything? If you didn't call me Jessica, I wouldn't even know that's my name. Yes, it's certainly the result of the concussion. Well, what's so hard on her aunt and me, Doctor, is we're the only relatives Jessica has in the world. I will say this, she's been very polite and cooperative since she came home from the hospital... But she's like a stranger. And she still doesn't remember her life before the accident? No, nothing. And how can we say to her, don't you remember your mother and father died in an accident when you were 14? They uh, had a sailboat, a storm came up, it must have been capsized and they both drowned. You can't say those things. Is a... Is there no way at all? Well, I don't know if there is a treatment that can help restore Jessica her memory. So little is known about the conscious and subconscious, it would be wicked to punish Jessica for our inability to help her. Uh, where is she now? Oh, she's out on a bicycle. We got her a very nice one, and she's taken to riding around wherever she can find a country road. Yeah, this is a nice layout you've got. I can see for miles from this window. We keep horses and cows and chickens, but I'm retired, and it's really more of a gentleman's farm. That's uh, that's the main road, is it? Uh, the uh, the one I came up on? Yes, you have to be real careful when you pull out of our driveway. It's showing a bad feature of the place. You see that line of trees there on either side? Well, they hide the corner, and there's a blind curve back there. Sometimes cars zip along at a fast clip and almost don't make it. We've had a few who didn't miss the big tree opposite. Yes, I can see from this window what you mean. Oh, oh, no, not again. No, it's, it's Jessica. She, she's lying in the road. She's been hit. Dr. Curran, I'm Jessica's Aunt Emily. Oh, yes, please come in. I, I was just about to make my rounds. Are you... Uh... Are you on your way to visit, Jessica? Doctor, it's been months and months since she was hit by that car. There doesn't seem to be any improvement. Well, there is some, and not much, but some. But you have to realize Jessica has suffered two major concussions within two years, and that's bound to have its effect. It's, it's only her youth and innate strength that's saving her. From what? Saving Jessica from what? Doctors don't speculate. Uh, I don't know whether Albert has told you, but since her mother and father died, we're the only family Jessica has. We brought her up to be a lovely young lady. And now this... Yes, but what is it you want me to do? Well, I, I don't suppose anything. I know you're doing everything that can be done. Now, why don't you visit Jessica more than once a week? Oh, I've tried to, Doctor. I've tried to. In the beginning of this awful thing, I did. I'd go in there and I'd sit next to her and she'd look at me. But she doesn't know who I am. It's destroying me. Albert, he... He has more strength than I do. Now, Emily, suppose we both go in and visit with her together right now. Huh? You and I. Oh, would you? Maybe I can learn how to cope with this 
been watching you. I'll uh, just tell the desk um, where I am. Oh, hello, Susan. Uh, this is Dr. Karen. I'm going to be with Jessica Worth. Uh, unless it's an emergency, please don't ring through. Oh, and, um, Susan, if Dr. Sabin calls, tell him I'll definitely be at his house for dinner tonight. Uh, thanks, Susan. Are we all set, Emily? And let's go. you brought with you? Is she a doctor, too? And now, Jessica, think. You you know your Aunt Emily is not a doctor, don't you? Aunt Emily? You came here before. I remember you because you must live a very healthy outdoor life, don't you? Your cheeks are so nice and red. Aren't her cheeks red, Dr. Curran? And why, why don't you make the effort to remember, Jessica? When am I going to get out of the hospital? I feel like I've been here all my life. Now, if you keep falling from horses and letting cars knock you off bicycles, you might as well start learning to be a nurse and stay on here in a professional capacity. Well, do you think I could? What's her name? What's her name? The, the, the doctor you brought in there with you. Uh, Emily. Aunt Emily. Does that ring any bells? Dr. Emily, do you think by lying in bed like this I could still study up and become a nurse? What is it? What's the matter with her? Why did she leave all of a sudden like that? Jessica, that was not a doctor. It was your Aunt Emily. Now, naturally, she's upset. You, you, you don't know her. I don't have an Aunt Emily. There's a nice-looking older man who comes to visit me quite a lot. He says he's my Uncle Albert. Well, I don't even have an Uncle Albert. Now, if you think hard, now try and think back. What can you remember? I've been sick. I know that. You told me a car hit me, and before that, I fell off a horse. I can almost remember that because you convinced me. And Jessica, now Jessica, physically, you are healing just fine. I'm very pleased. The whole staff here are happy about that. You're, you're eating well. You're sleeping well. The food we give you doesn't seem to disagree with you. But your mind isn't doing as well. Because I can't remember those two people. I don't know them. Why don't you believe me? All right. Now, let's say, for the sake of argument, I do believe you. Then why are they pretending that I'm related to them? That I can't say. But but let's follow this with you. Uh, You want to play uh, questions and answers? Sure. All right. What's your name? Jessica Worth. And where do you live? I'm not sure. It's just on the corner of my memory. It'll come back to me. Do you live alone or with your parents? Uh, Your mother and father? Don't ask me that. Why not, Jessica? Oh, so cold standing out here on our little dock, waiting for them. Waiting for who, Jessica? I know they'll come back. Dad's a marvelous sailor. I'm just going to wait right here, I am. See? They sent the Coast Guard out to find them, so I know nothing could have happened. Dad's a wonderful sailor, and so is Mother. So freezing, but I just can't go and leave here. Go inside. I've cooked dinner for all of us. It's keeping nice and warm for them. They want me to be here when they come back. Won't they? Won't they? Jessica, Jessica, I want you to close your eyes, lean back, and try to remember something else. Yes? I'll do whatever you say. I trust you. Good. Now, you have been in this hospital two times because each time you had an accident and you came here to get well. Now, those two people, the the older man and the lady who come and visit you, they love you. And ever since your mother and father died, you, you know that, don't you, that they died, Jessica? I know that. I was 14. Yes. Well, since then, your Uncle Albert and your Aunt Emily have brought you up like their own daughter. Your Aunt Emily was your mother's sister. She never had any children. Well, why doesn't she come to visit me in the hospital? Well, she does come, but you upset her terribly by not recognizing her. She she was here just now. 
that lady with the red face? Yes, that's who it was. Oh, I'm sorry I said that. Oh, I do wish I could remember. I'll try to. Yes, I, I want you to try. Well, it's almost time for your supper. I'll stop in again tomorrow and we'll talk. Oh, Jessica, I'm always spending more time with you than any of my other patients. I'm, I'm supposed to be at a doctor friend's at 7 o'clock sharp. I, I promised him he, he cooks up wonderful beef stew and it's awful when it gets cold. I feel so tired. Maybe I'll just rest a while and uh, forget about the food. Jessica? <laughs> Jessica, can you hear me? <laughs> That girl, when she drops off, she is out like a light. What Dr. Bob Kern didn't know was that his patient would remain unconscious for the next five weeks. Jessica was fed intravenously and kept alive. When she awoke, she became a totally different personality. But... More of that when I return shortly with Act Two. If you use a long-lasting nasal spray, you ought to check the package. If it has a big 12 on it, you're getting the longest-lasting relief you can get. You're using Duration Nasal Spray. Duration is different because Duration has the longest-lasting nasal decongestant. So Duration gives you up to 12 hours of relief. That's up to two to four hours longer relief than most other long-lasting nasal sprays. Look for the nasal spray with the big 12 on it. Duration. The proof is on the package. The package with the big 12 on it. For occasional use only is directed. Hi, Pat Summerall to say that True Value Hardware Stores offer a wide selection of quality master mechanic hand tools so you can choose the right tool for the project at hand. Like the 12-foot power tape rule with locking toggle blade for just $5.48. Or the home bracing torch kit, complete with rods, fuel, and instructions for just $15.48. Like all master mechanic tools, both are backed by the promise of satisfaction or a free replacement, and they're sold only at participating True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers. Hi, this is Andy Williams. I learned about the importance of donating blood when my mother became ill. Although most people could qualify as donors, many have not donated blood because they have not personally experienced the need, either for themselves or for those they care about. Presently, over 30,000 pints of blood are required in the United States every day, and the need is increasing. The balance between supply, demand, and human life depends on you, the public. Donors often respond when there is an emergency or a disaster, but blood of every group and type must be available at all times. Blood banks depend on people who are willing to give to meet the day-to-day -day blood needs. Donate today at a blood bank in your community. Blood is life. Let's keep it running. A public service of this station and the American Association of Blood Banks. Doctors tried to find an explanation for Jessica Worth's five-week coma. It eluded them. And then, one midnight, she awoke and called the night nurse, who immediately called Dr. Curran at home. He lost no time in arriving at Jessica's bedside. Well, young lady, this is a fine time to get your doctor out of bed. Are you the doctor? <laughs> That's a rather long sleep you had, Mrs. Rip Van Winkle. I feel fine. What's your name? Dr. Curran? Dr. Curran? You don't remember me? No. Have we met? Yes, we've met. Doctor, I'm very hungry and famished. Well, it's after midnight. I'm afraid the hospital kitchen is closed. Oh, isn't that the limit? Now, let me take your pulse, Jessica. Now, don't pull your hand away from me. Can't help it. It's like there's a string pulling my hand up to the back of my head. Can you move your fingers? I can't tell. Am I moving them? My whole hand feels numb. Yes, yes, they're, they're moving. Now, ju just, just relax, Jessica. By morning, your muscles may have relaxed some, and you'll be able to bring your right hand down from behind your head. I don't like this. I want to bring my right hand down right now. 
Would you please grab hold of my fingers and pull? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a try. Hold on. Does that hurt? I don't feel anything. I think my whole side has no feeling. All right, easy, Jessica, easy. No, no. Now, let's leave it where it is. Oh, this is too much. Why do you keep calling me Jessica? Well, I thought we were on a first-name basis. I stopped calling you Miss Worth years ago. Jessica Worth? Is that my name? <laughs> what do you think? It's a stupid name. It's not my name. What is your name? I don't know. <laughs> not dumb. I can't remember, but I know it's not Jessica. Well, don't worry. It'll come to you. I'm not worried. I'm just annoyed at myself. I mean, imagine forgetting that. It's so dumb. All right. I know what I'll do. Until I remember, I'm going to call myself Tiffany. I've always liked that name. <laughs> What am I doing in this hospital? Was I in an accident? Uh, yes, several. I'll tell you all about it tomorrow. Am I all right now? You seem to be <laughs> very much all right. Well, then I don't have to stay here. I hope not. Um, your Aunt Emily and your Uncle Albert will be so happy. I've got an aunt and an uncle? Yes. Is there anything else I don't know about myself? Well, don't think about it tonight. Well, it doesn't bother me, but it's kind of crazy. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Curran, what's your first name? Uh, it's Bob. Do you mind if I call you Bob? No. You're real nice. I'm glad you're my doctor. Well, I'm glad you're not upset with your short memory. Okay, uh, Tiffany, I'll come by after breakfast. Yes, well, what about my right hand up there in the back of my head? How am I going to eat? Use your left hand. Oh, of course. What's my problem? There are pianists who play with one hand and painters who paint it with one hand. Maybe it'll be fun. Oh, nurse, uh, is there a fresh tape in my recording machine? I, I'd like to dictate some progress reports. Yes, doctor. Good, thanks. Oh, let me see. I'd like to record some notes here. It's, um... February the 13th, the case of Jessica Worth continues to be as puzzling as ever. In her alternate personality of Tiffany, for the past five years, she has been making a success of her life. In all that time, she has never once remembered she was once Jessica Worth. The partial paralysis of her right hand continues, but in spite of that handicap, she has demonstrated extraordinary artistic talent. For the past uh, 60 months, she has painted with her left hand only and has completed several hundred watercolors, <clears throat> uh, well over a hundred oils, which I am told are of exceptional quality. She lives on the farm with her uncle... And, oh, hmm. uh, y yes. You who? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Put it through, please, nurse. Uh, Emily. Emily, how are you? What? Well, when did this happen? Okay, all right, I'll get there as fast as I can drive. Now, Doctor, I never thought I'd be seeing the inside of this hospital again. No, neither did I, Albert. Now, Emily, Emily, please don't worry. You know, for no reason. She just fainted dead away. One minute, Tiffany was laughing and talking about buying some more canvases. The next thing, we couldn't wake her up. Uh, how is she? Uh, Jessica, uh, Tiffany is under 24-hour observation. Oh, the poor girl. It's so sad to think she's off again. Well, does anybody know how long she'll be out like this? And now, I suggest that both of you go back to the farm. I'll be seeing Jessica, Tiffany every day, and if there are any changes, believe me, you will be the first to know. <laughs> Tiffany, can you hear me? It's, it's, it's Bob. Hello, Dr. Bob. Tiffany, huh? Good girl, you're awake. I must have just dropped off. Did you get to your doctor friends in time for dinner last night? You didn't let the beef stew get cold, did you? What? I said... I know, I know, I know. I heard you, Tiffany, but I'm not sure what you're talking about. Why are you calling me Tiffany? You know my name. Yes, I... I know your name. You are Jessica Worth. 
You've come back. What do you mean, come back? Where was I? I wish I knew. How's your right hand? I don't know. Is there something wrong with it? I've got it under the covers. Here it is, if you want to look at it. Can you move it behind your head and then down again? I guess so. Uh, Welcome home, Jessica. Will you please tell me what's happened? I will, Jessica, I promise. But today I want you to rest. I'll, uh, I'll be here tomorrow. But this isn't my room. I remember my room in the hospital very well. Why did you have me move? I'll try to explain everything tomorrow. In the meantime, all I can say is... I'm very glad to see you again. Albert... Uh, Emily, I didn't want to tell you this over the phone, but before we go into Jessica's room, well, expect to find another change in her. For the better. I think so. I hope so. She isn't Tiffany anymore, is she? Well, is, is that true? Yes. Emily, how did you know? Because he said Jessica's room. She's not uh, Tiffany anymore? Oh, that's right. Well, are you ready? Good. Let's go in. I brought just one color of Tiffany's with me. I thought if I was holding it, maybe she'd wake up, you know. And now she is awake. And she's Jessie. Jessica, look who's come along to visit you. Hello, Jessie. How are you? I'm all right. I had a really good sleep last night, and that's two nights in a row. <sighs> Uncle Albert and Emily, what's happened to you both? No, nothing. Everything's fine. It's because of me, isn't it? You've been worried about me. I, I can see it in your faces. Oh, Uncle, you've got so many more lines in your face in just a few days. And Aunt Emily, my dearest Aunt Emily, come over here, both of you. Let me put my arms around you. Dr. Bob, I want to go home. Is there any reason why I can't? I don't think so, Jessica. We'll run a few tests, and maybe by the end of the week, you can be discharged. What's happened to them? They've grown so old, looking almost overnight. How do you feel? Something terrible has happened to them, and you're hiding it from me. And, Bob, when did you start wearing glasses? Uh, and the things that happen overnight. Jessica, it isn't overnight. It's been five years. For five years, you were another person. I was? Yes, yes, you took the name of Tiffany. I was somebody else? And then, a month ago, Tiffany, who lived in your body, she fainted and went into a coma. She was in a coma for a month. And yesterday, the person who came out of the coma was me, Jessica Worth? Is that time you were Tiffany all blank? I've lost... Five years. Tiffany painted this. Tiffany painted Jessica, this. Jessica, Jessica, no. This was the work of a dead woman. Oh, Bob. Why is it getting dark? What's happening? Bob, I can't see you. I'm here, Jessica. I'm right here. What's happening to me? I can't see a thing. Have you transcribed the tape I made last week on Jessica Worth? Yes, Doctor. Uh, I am going to dictate an additional paragraph into the machine now, so would you add it to the previous report, please? Yes, Doctor. Oh, what's the date today? 
Uh, yes, it's uh, March, March the 10th. Um, further developments in the Jessica Worth case. Uh, tests reveal increasing deterioration of patient's eyesight. Claims sight comes through the top of her head. Have secured cooperation of Professor Henry Anglin, specialist in clairvoyance field, to examine Jessica. I'm particularly concerned her claims are not hysteria-induced. Professor Anglin, I thought you and I and Dr. Curran would enjoy our meeting here in the garden. It's the first of May and the flowers are out. It'd be a shame to miss all this by being indoors. Uh, well, Miss Worth, does your aunt take care of all these flowers? Will I help? I love to help. Colors and how well nature blends them always amazes me. I mean, look at those orange daylilies, how well they go with the pink roses and the black irises, the raspberry poppies. And wait till the annuals come out. I mean, do you know anybody who would dare mix colors like that? Bob, is Miss Worth saying that she can see those flowers? Even though she's totally blind? That's exactly what she's saying. I have the distinct feeling that the impressions I get come through the top of my head. I see. Well, then, let's begin some uh, preliminary tests, all right? Mm Mm-hmm. As you sit here, can you tell me what is in your sightless field of vision? Uh, Jessica, the professor means uh, what can you see? Well, a little to the left, below us, is the well... The bucket has come off the wheel and has fallen to the ground behind the well. It's lying on its side and there's a frog inside the bucket. And all of that, the bucket and the frog, is on the far side of the well. I see it very clearly. And further down, there's the brook and a mother duck with three, what, no, four little ones climbing out right now. Mm Mm-hmm. Bob, would you uh, please walk down to the well and let us know what you find? I'm glad to. Now, I'll give you a shout. You know, it's worth we with our sight cannot see through the well or around it or inside that bucket. Also, the land drops away so sharply the brook isn't visible or the the mother duck or her brood. But can you see the ducks now, Professor? Yes, yes, I can. How many are there? Uh, a larger one and four ducklings behind it. Uh, Professor Anglin. I have what? There is a bucket back here, and it is lying on its side, just as Jessica said it was. And there's a frog inside it. All right, come on back. I'm sorry to have put you to all this trouble. Trouble? This could be fantastic. It, it really could. I'm going to suggest to your aunt and uncle that we take more time and run tests quite scientifically. Is there a place where I could set up some equipment and we wouldn't be disturbed? Well, I'm sure they'll let us use the barn. Now, listen, I know that I can see for miles around. For instance, there's an airport about 20 miles away, I think, and I can see the airplanes on that field and their colors and the hangars and even that um, red stocking thing that tells which way the wind is blowing. When you see, Jessica, how do you feel? As if the whole top of my head is on fire. There's so much light that comes into my head, it almost burns me. And everything is very clear. Clearer than I remember it when I could see with my two eyes. Jessica, I think you ought to know that the nearest airport, if you go in any direction, is 55 miles away. We have altered some names and dates, but the tale of Jessica Worth's other personalities and astral vision did happen. Not only was there a Dr. Bob Kern and a Professor Anglin, but dozens of investigators to probe the mystery of Jessica's paranormal powers. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Californians get into natural things. Natural dirt and mud stains. In Texas, we get into big things. Big barbecue stains. Spring wash gets up, what America gets into. Mississippi Red. New England chowder. Kentucky bluegrass. Spring wash gets up, what America. 
Greenwash even showed Missouri. What do doctors recommend to avoid constipation? These days, doctors stress the importance of fiber in the diet. Food fiber that helps the system regulate itself naturally. Metamucil is the laxative made from natural fiber. No chemical stimulants. So for occasional constipation, doctors recommend Metamucil more often than any other laxative. The way to overcome constipation is the natural way. But if not nature, Metamucil. Read label and follow directions. Before you fit into our uniform, you'll run a hundred miles. You'll strengthen muscles you never knew you had. And you'll study things you've never studied before. Then you'll fit the dress blues uniform of the United States Marine. Maybe you can be one of us. The few, the proud, the Marines. If you're a retailer, you need customer traffic now. Radio is the hot traffic builder. This station will tell you how the right message, the right promotion, the right schedule can make your sales grow fast. Every day, radio reaches more adults than newspapers, TV, or magazines. So get radio sending the people your way. Heat up customer traffic and sales now. Radio, it's red hot. Get more facts. Call this station or the Radio Advertising Bureau. They brought you this message. Jessica Worth, a girl with more than one identity who inexplicably loses her sight and then claims paranormal ability to see near and far, was the problem confronting Professor Anglin and Dr. Robert Kern. So they arranged a series of tests to discover the validity and secret of Jessica's unusual powers. (laughs) I really have to laugh, Bob. If any of my associates at the university were to see me now setting up a test laboratory in a barn... Well, not every scientist has livestock as his observers. Um, well, Jessica, are you, uh, are you ready for another go at the tests? You're the doctor. Well, this is a tedious business. It takes time. We've been at it for two weekends, but I, I think it's worth it. All right, now, Miss Worth, I've prepared this envelope. It has writing inside it. It is sealed and placed inside a double thickness silver foil envelope. Would you take it, please? Thank you. Now, if you would hold it to your forehead and tell me the contents, if you can. It says, when moving forward toward the discovery of the unknown, the scientist is like a traveler who reaches higher and higher summits from which he sees in the distance new countries to explore. Louis Pasteur. Is she correct, Professor? A uh, quotation from uh, Louis Pasteur? Of course. Why didn't I think of that before? What? Miss Worth isn't reading what's in the envelope. She's reading my mind. Is that what I'm doing? I knew what was written there. But I actually saw the words on a piece of paper, folded four times. Well, how were they written? Did you recognize the handwriting? It wasn't by hand. It was on a typewriter. What kind of type? Big, little? Mm, funny kind of type, like italics, sort of slanting. And Louis Pasteur was written in capital letters. All right, we'll see. I don't think so. I do not think so. But it is, Professor. Exactly as Jessica said it was. Slanting type. Hmm. I think I have a way of proving once and for all whether the subject is relying on telepathy or clairvoyance. How about tomorrow, everybody? Right here? There's a fresh tape around here somewhere. Oh, here we are. That's good. All right. Now, um, further report on tests for paranormal powers believed possessed by Jessica Worth. Professor Anglin is almost convinced. Today he brought an envelope containing a page he had ripped from an old congressional record. He, he hadn't looked at it, so had no idea what it contained. Jessica put the envelope to her head and read it. I made a tape of what she said, and later we compared it. She had not made one mistake. 
Next, Anglin wants to test Jessica for astral projection, the ability to see events at great distances. Her uncle and aunt are driving south for a few weeks, so we might set up the laboratory in the house. Oh. Hello? Uh, Jessica, what is it? I saw it. It was awful. Well, well, what, well, what was? Where are you? I'm at the farm. Oh, 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 what a terrible accident. All right, Jessica. Now, please, please calm down so I can understand you. Now, what There's accident? There's broken glass everywhere. She's been thrown clear, and I don't think she's hurt that badly, but Uncle Albert. All the blood. Where is it? Somebody call for an ambulance. But your uncle and aunt are driving down to Florida. There's a sign on the road, but I can't make it out. It's so dark. Jessica, Jessica, do you hear me? Now listen, put your outside light on. I, I'm leaving for the farmhouse right now. Do you understand? I'm on my way. The ambulance came and they took Uncle Albert and Aunt Emily away. I don't think he was wearing his safety belt. You saw all this, Jessica? Yes. I was asleep. Uh, suddenly, I heard a car crash. I actually heard it. They were on a road in Maryland. I saw the whole thing. Uh, Jessica, Jessica, listen to me. You're not to think about it anymore. Do you hear? Yes. Good. Now, what, what's the time? Uh, a little after three. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll call the chief of police. It's, it's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Hello? Yes, it's me, Emily. Dr. Carr and I happen to be over at the farm. Yes. Yes. Uh, but but you're you're all right, huh? But Emily, look, uh, let let me come down and get you. All right? Uh, they will uh, tonight. Tomorrow. All right. I'll I'll break the news. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Goodbye. Uncle Albert is dead. I think so. I, I don't think they've told her yet. He fell asleep and they, they ran off the road. Emily says she wasn't hurt. Some friends are driving them back up here. Being able to see so much and so far is a curse. It really is. I'm so tired. I think I'll just... Close my eyes. Jessica, why don't you go up to bed, huh? Jessica? Jessica, do you, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Jessica? D D Tiffany? And who might you be? I'm Dr. Robert Curran. Dr. Curran? Yes, Bob Curran. I've been treating you. Whatever for? What's the matter with me that I should need treatment? <laughs> Professor Anglin, Jessica has a new psyche, and it's called Lorna. She appeared the night her uncle Albert was killed. Like the others, she has no memory of anything that preceded her appearance. Yes, but what happened? You mean the girl no longer has any paranormal powers? Well, she isn't Jessica any longer. We have to accept that. She, she has no control over the various people that she becomes. Well, what brings it on? I'm afraid that would take years of study. Who is she now? Well, it's Lorna, uh, a name we both liked. So, she is Lorna. Did I hear someone mention my name? Oh, I was coming to see you, Dr. Curran. Oh, sorry. Didn't know you had company. Oh, um, Professor Anglin, uh, Lorna Worth. I am... Uh, how do you do? You'll forgive my ignorance, but what are you a professor of? <laughs> the supernormal, the supernatural... Any manifestations of that type? How fascinating. You must tell me about it sometime. In the meantime, Dr. Cohen, I'm clearing out that room with its hideous watercolors and oils, and I'm chucking them out. Where do you throw the trash? Now, Lorna, you will do no such thing. I'm warning you. I won't. Are you telling me what to do? We'll see about that. <laughs> Lorna, stop, stop that, do you hear? Lorna, oh, let go of me, these eyesores offend me. Yeah, that may be, but they are not your property. Now, stop it, Lorna, let me stop go. it, I say. Oh, hit me, hit me. Don't hit me, can Who are you? Who are you? What's your name? I'm... Dr. Bob Curran. Bob? Bobby? 
Uh-huh. Bobby. Jack. And what's yours? I don't know. You don't remember your name. No, I forgot it. Well, we'll just have to give you a name, won't we? How about Margaret? It is three weeks since Jessica Worth has surfaced as a very little girl. Only in thought and voice, for it is always Jessica's body. We decided, she and I, to call her Margaret, a name she approved of. All through these many manifestations, Jessica's Aunt Emily has been the rock of Gibraltar. I suppose it helps soothe the pain of losing her husband because there's no telling which girl she may find at breakfast in the morning. Bob, we have a problem. Emily, that is the understatement of the century. Are the four Jessicas becoming too much for you? Uh, You know, I've taken to locking the room where Tiffany kept her paintings because of Lorna. Now, yesterday, neither of them was here, only little Margaret. I sent her into the kitchen for a glass of milk, and when she didn't come back, I went looking for her. At the top of the stairs... It was Lorna trying to get into the room at those paintings. I'm afraid I screamed at her and she became Tiffany. Well, when did this start, the the girl switching identities so quickly? Just a few days ago. I'd be talking with Jessica and Tiffany would answer me. Emily, you must be some kind of a catalyst. Something about you that makes these different personalities appear so quickly. Uh, and does any of them know the other three exist? Uh, no. None of them does. No. Well, I'd like to find a way for them to accept one another so they could all live peacefully together. Delicious dinner. <laughs> As Emily told me it would be. Thank you. Did you did you always like to cook? Mm, even before I was a teenager. How about when your mother and father were alive? I used to cook for them all the time. My mother taught me. It's a great talent. <laughs> the last vacation that summer, mother and dad went out sailing and never came back. Do you remember I told you? I cooked every day. I loved that. Jessica... You know, that's the first time you've talked about your mother and father without going to pieces. I'm sure you've been aware of the strange lapses in time. Uh, Either you suddenly go to sleep or the seasons change. You, uh, You know that. I know it. I know it. And there are three other Jessicas beside yourself. There's a little girl called Margaret and two about your own age. One called Tiffany and and the other called Lorna. You are four people. It's hard for anyone to live with that. It's hard for Aunt Emily. But I don't know anything about those other Jessicas. What can I do? Well, you four are going to start writing letters to each other. That way you may get to know who you all are. Jessica, Lorna, Tiffany, and Margaret. You mean I would write to the me that's Lorna? Yes, and she would write to you about her life, what she does with it, what she thinks. And then I'd ask Tiffany to write to you, and you'd write to her as she paints. And Lorna would write to her, and she'd write back. Like we're all separate people. Yes, well, now, now, it could happen, Jessica, that one by one, these other personalities could leave you. On the other hand, nobody knows. Others could turn up. But I think if you get to know each other, you could learn from each other and maybe even enjoy each other's comfort. I'd like to try. Jessica, you are one of those very unusual people who has more than one life crowded into that one brain. I hope this works. It will. If all of you wanted to. And what about those psychic powers I had, the seeing things in my mind, far away, and and letters hidden? Can I give all that up? I don't want that power. Perhaps if you don't use it, Jessica, it too will go to sleep. I hope so. And will you be around in case... Well, 
In case I need you. Oh, I certainly shall. I wouldn't miss how all this turns out for anything in the world. There it is. Names, places, and dates changed. But the young woman of many personalities and psychic powers is a matter of record. As for Dr. Bob Kern, there's an interesting fact about him. He stayed a bachelor. Perhaps his interest in the case was just scientific, although I suspect maybe he was waiting for the others to leave forever so he could propose to Jessica. He did love her, you know. I'll be back shortly. Like Minute Maid orange juice, some things never change. Fathers, you know, Amy, after your tonsils come out, I'll give you all the ice cream you want. Then kids. Really? What would you give me for my appendix? The great taste of Minute Maid orange juice is never going to change. It's always 100% pure. And we'll be making that same delicious taste when your kids have kids. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniels, and I'm very concerned about hunger in our world. Every minute, 21 children die because they don't have enough to eat. There is enough food to go around for everybody. What's needed now is for each of us to care enough to get involved in this issue. Now, I know you care. What can you do? Write politicians about your concern and support hunger organizations. Thank you. For further information, write Impact on Hunger, 145 East 49th Street, New York, New York, 10017. of us who find the one personality we were born with enough of a burden can sympathize with a person crammed with unlimited personalities. That is, if we believe that possible. Conan Doyle, who was a doctor and held a scalpel before he held a pen, once said, there is an old maxim of mine that when you have excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Our cast included Marion Selvis, Joan Shea, Paul Hecht, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, friends, oh, hello, Harry. You caught me just as I was leaving. You're not going anywhere. What's this about bankruptcy? <laughs> well, what have we gave you there? What happens to me... I'm out in the cold. Broke. You looted the assets. Even my 50000 Oh. WKBN, Youngstown, Ohio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Marshall. Since man began, he has sought to penetrate the secret of the human heart, that beating muscle that perpetuates lifetimes. What would happen, we ask ourselves, if during a medical procedure to repair or replace a damaged heart, an unexpected change in the patient took place? The operation was successful, you had a new lease on life, but you left the hospital, not yourself. That's a gorgeous rainbow silk scarf you've got around your neck, Janet. That's the problem, see. I, I mean, the scarf hides the problem. Here, let, let me take it off. <gasps> oh, great heavens. Those bruises on your neck. What happened? This is why I had to see you. It's Jim. He tried to choke me to death last night. <laughs> was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Marion Seldes and Patricia Elliott. I'll be back shortly with Act One.
The name James Barclay is not unknown to you. Extraordinary scientist, he is the discoverer of the RNK factor, the infallible prenatal test determining the nature of an embryo child, whether it will be born aggressive, submissive, etc. A discovery that can affect the future of an entire nation. It is night, four o'clock in the morning to be precise. Barclay's wife, Janet, suddenly wakes. Hands are closing about her throat, strangling her. Uh, uh, help! Uh, uh, Jim! Jim! You have to drop my throat! Get away, Jim! Stop! Stop! Uh, what, are you, what are you doing? Let go of me! What? What, what, what is that? Janet? Are you all right? I? I knocked a lamp off the night table. I'll put the overhead light on. Oh. What time is it? It's still dark outside. Janet, what are you standing over there for? Now come back to bed. What happened to you, Jim? To me? Don't you know what you were doing just now? Janet, what? What's the matter with your neck? You keep rubbing it. Don't you remember? I don't even know what you're talking about. Honey, look at me. Janet, are you afraid of me? You, you are, aren't you? Uh, I guess I am. Well, I, I, can you tell me why? What, what have I done? I was asleep, and I, I felt two hands on my throat sque- squeezing it. It was dark. I, I couldn't see it. Uh, and there was someone in here trying to choke you? Uh, uh, I'm taking my pistol, and I'm getting up. and going to search every room in this house. Why didn't you tell me there was an intruder? Jim, put, 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 the, put that revolver away. If there is someone here, I'm going to find it. It is necessary. Put, put, put the gun away. Now, now please. Well, okay. Okay, if you say so. Shut the drawer. There, there wasn't any intruder. The, the person who was trying to strangle me was you, Jim. Me? I, I, I was able to get away from you, and, and that's why I, 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 I'm sort of in shock, I, I guess. Oh, my Lord. Darling, I was trying to strangle you? But... But, honey, I was asleep. I don't know anything about this. That's what makes it all so scary, Jim. You don't remember that you were trying to kill me. Hello? See, uh, this is Janet. Janet, I was just thinking about you. Uh, lunch today. Mm, would have loved it, darling. I haven't seen you for too long. Uh, you mean you can't? Well, it's a darn Broadway Critics Award. Michael got the best play prize again, and it's about the fifth he's gotten. And I have to go along. Food is ghastly. Speech is grisly. It's so boring, Janet. You've no idea. Uh, I understand. I, I'm sorry. You sound kind of funny, child. Is everything all right? It isn't anything that I can talk about on the phone. Oh, what about tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow's out too, I'm afraid, darling. Oh, I'm simply devastated. See, Mike's going tonight to Hollywood to discuss the movie version of his play, and he won't go near the place if I don't come along. But we'll be back in two weeks. Two weeks? Oh, uh, see, I, re- I really have to talk to you before then. Janet, you don't have to send up any more distress flares. You come over here right away. Today? Yes, today. What about Michael and the play prize? Well, he'll just have to accept the honors gracefully, all by himself, won't he? Now, you're sure it's all right. Oh, I don't think Michael will be too upset. Besides, I've got something to tell you which I think only you will understand. So be here at 12. Bye. I'll be there. Michael! Michael Farnsworth Gray. Whenever you use my middle name, I know you've decided to do something I won't be too happy about. I'm not going to the award luncheon with you today. Janet's coming over, and we're going to have something here. Celia, 
You know I can't abide these ceremonies alone. Well, you just run along. And don't eat too many of those creamy things. You know what the doctor said. I've been watching my weight for years. <laughs> so have I. <laughs> watching you get heavier and heavier. But now, darling, your health's at stake, especially since you've given up all forms of exercise. I don't know what's come over you. You loved hiking and stuff. I've always hated exercise. And who's Janet? <laughs> James Barclay's wife. Do you remember him, the famous scientist? Well, Janet and I got to know each other in the hospital, waiting for you two to be let out. You mean the James Barclay? The RNK factor man? I never met him in my life. Oh, yes, you did. Both had heart operations at the same time. Of course you remember. You shared a room in the hospital. You were never like this before, K44K. K44K? That's the third time today you've called me by that poetic name. What? I said... Oh, never mind. Well, if you won't come with me, you won't. Bye-bye, K44K. Mike, you've really become a pill in the last four months. Now, I ask you again, as politely as I can, is that some secret code that I'm supposed to know? So long. See you when I get back. See, what a beautiful spot. I love this garden and this old-fashioned furniture. Do you know that Mike wrote his first short story on this table? <sighs> I'm sorry. I, I thought I wasn't hungry, but I am. <laughs> Here's a good salad. It's good to see you, Counselor. Mm. <laughs> Nobody's called me that since I got married. You don't do law work anymore? Married to Jim? When would I have time? Well, this will be the first time a lawyer has come to see me about her problems. I must say, Janet, that is a stunning rainbow silk scarf you've got round your neck. Well, that is the problem. I mean, that hides the problem. Here, let me take it off. Oh, oh great heavens. Those bruises on your neck. What happened? This is why I had to see you, see you. It's Jim. I think he tried to kill me last night. What? Jim? I, I know. I couldn't believe it at first either. I thought... I, well, I don't know what I thought. And if I hadn't been able to pull away, who knows? The terrible thing is he doesn't remember doing it. Oh, you poor thing. There's something awfully wrong with him, see you. In his right mind, Jim would never dream of such a thing. Jim loves me. Well, of course he does. Janet... You just said in his right mind he'd never do it. Have you noticed much else different about him since the heart operation? I'll tell you why I ask. I think since the heart operation, Mike's become a completely different person. For instance, he would never have considered selling any of his plays to Hollywood. Secondly, since he came home from the hospital, he simply stopped writing. He says he may never write again. Third, he was an avid outdoorsman. I mean, we always went camping once a year. We've got a garage full of equipment. Well, he looked at it the other day and he said, What's this? I was never interested in hunting or fishing. Whose stuff is this? He's changed, see. But at least he isn't murderous. What I'm afraid of is that Jim might try it again. But you don't mean that. I mean exactly that. Jim wasn't playing any games with my throat. Well, you must have been frightened to death. I'm still not over it. One more thing. The day before yesterday, he started calling me a number. And when I say, what's that mean? He says, what's what mean? Numbers. I've got the same routine from Mike. He calls me K44K. What's yours? ZXY77. ZXY77. That's a nice ring to it. How does Jim explain calling you that? He doesn't. It, it passes right by him. Incredible. What do you suppose changed our husband so completely? Oh, see, I wish I could guess. I wonder about the other girls. I'd like to find out, too. Five of us. <laughs> the fearful five, remember? Having lunch and dinner every night in that hospital cafeteria, keeping each other hopeful. Madge Courier. Her husband was the ambassador. To, to Russia, wasn't mm -hmm. it? He'd come back to have his open-heart surgery... Dr. Tyson operated on him that same week. And Betty, of course. 
Betty Trambakos. She's my neighbor right up on the hill there. Married to that shipping tycoon, Aristotle Trambakos. You, me, Madge, Betty, who was the fifth? Um, um Myra. I talked to her once oh, a week. Oh, of course, Myra. Her husband's taken over the Philharmonic. Yes, it's the conductor, Dimitri. Let's, let's ask them how their men are doing. You do, Betty, and I'll do Madge and Myra. Yes, and have they noticed anything different? And if so, what is uh, it? Unless, uh, I wonder... Oh, some more iced tea? The pictures mm. are still full. Mm, thanks. Uh, you wonder what? Well, it occurs to me. You know, Mike is a great kidder. Do you suppose when Mike and Jim were sharing that room in the hospital, when they had their operations and recuperating, do you suppose they cooked this up between them and they're, they're just playing some kind of a game? No. no. I don't think so. And these black and blue marks on my neck don't think so either. Oh, of course. How dumb of me. But the numbers racket could be a game. Me, K44K, U, Z, X, Y, 7, 7. But to attack you like that, Janet, it ain't funny. If you ask me, I'd try to get Jim somewhere for observation. And if he won't go, you ought to think about moving out. I have, in a way... I've moved to another room, m m made it my bedroom. I've hidden his gun, and every night I lock my door. Leonardo da Vinci, painter, scientific observer, inventor, researcher, equaled the accomplishments of ten titans. The human body was his uncharted continent. The heart, he wrote, moves of itself and does not stop unless forever. Had da Vinci lived today, what unnumbered secrets he could have probed. If that heart is tampered with, does it indeed alter the body and mind that houses it? I shall return shortly with Act Two. of two prominent men, one a scientist, the other a playwright, are disquieted by their husband's peculiar behavior. The writer has completely reversed his personality. The scientist has tried to murder his wife. Both men had undergone open-heart surgery. Had this anything to do with their metamorphosis? Janet and Celia have set about finding out. They're in the garden where we left them. Janet, you've decided me. I'm not going with Mike to California. I'm staying here and do some detection with you. You will, see you. There's one other person we ought to talk to. I don't know if we could. That's Dr. Tyson. I mean, he's the one who performed all those operations. Maybe he could tell us something we ought to know, like, like what changes in personality to expect and, and so on. What's troubling us is a lot more than changes of personality. Besides, in Jim's case... His triple bypass was done by Dr. Bob O'Brien. You mean Dr. Tyson had nothing to do with Jim? Oh, he was there. Dr. O'Brien is a much younger man. Jim's known him for years. Dr. Tyson was in the operating room all through it, but Bob O'Brien actually did the work. That's what Jim wanted. Well, we'll begin with the girls, woman to woman. I'm hopeful. Whatever they tell us will help. None of this. None of it. Adds up. Thanks, Bob, for squeezing me into your office hours at such short notice. Oh, no, not at all, Jim. How's my favorite cardiac patient? Well, I'm not so sure, Bob. That's why I had to see you. No? Oh? Any pains or tightness of any kind? No, 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 no. I think I'm in pretty fair shape. I get a little tired, but I knock off before exhaustion sets in. Uh, Bob, I wouldn't want Janet to know we've discussed this. Fair enough. All right. Two weeks ago, Janet accused me of trying to choke her to death during the night. I, I don't remember any of it. Anything else? Well, she keeps telling me I'm a completely changed person since you performed the triple bypass. And last but not least, she says sometimes I refer to her not by her name or darling or anything like that, but I call her a number. 
Oh. Specifically, I call her ZXY77. Do you? Well, I most certainly don't. Why should I? She's moved out of our bedroom and sleeps in another room and locks the door every night. I suppose I have a talk with Janet. I'm no psychiatrist, but at least I can talk to her as a friend. Oh, I sets a load off my mind. But you know how it is. After a biggie like a heart operation, you're always a little doubtful. You can pick up where you left off. I, I am beginning to doubt my sanity. Jim, I'll do my best. I don't believe it, Janet. Is that what Myra said? Word for word. Dimitri came home after his first rehearsal with the Philharmonic, broke his baton in half and said, Never again the orchestra stinks, I won't conduct. This, mind you, about the Philharmonic. <laughs> of course there was an uproar. Did she mention whether he calls her by a number? Yes, he does. Myra is a uh, uh, Q of uh, 515. That rules out a practical joke. And Mike and Jim never met Dimitri. He was on another floor. We knew Myra, but they didn't know him. Did you reach Betty? No, she's still away. She's gone with her husband to that Greek island he owns. I left a message with Mrs. Doyle, the housekeeper, that I called. About Madge Courier, I did get to her. You remember the ambassador came in from Russia and he was operated on, I think, a day before Mike was. Wait till I tell you about him. Celia, I'm home. Join us in the garden, Mike. Back from California. Will you look at what he's wearing? <laughs> I tell you, a year ago, Michael Farnsworth Gray wouldn't have been seen dead in such an outfit. Janet, don't tell me this was the same lunch you two were having when I left for California. Hello, Michael. C oh, congratulations on the picture. Oh, Michael isn't going to let them make a movie out of one of his plays, are you, darling? Who says I'm not? In fact, I am. Well, well wonders never cease. You were so pure once. Well, I'd better be on my way. You two want a little time alone. No, no don't go, Janet. Please. Well, I have to. Uh, lots to do. I'll walk you to your car. Uh, bye, Mike. The new Michael Farnsworth Gray is just too much for me. Now, what about Madge and her ambassador husband? Well, he's got himself transferred to Washington, got himself appointed as advisor to the president, and Madge is stunned. He's never had any ambition before. I've arranged to see Dr. O'Brien. We've known him and his wife a long time. Maybe Bob can clear up this mystery. Will you let me know, Janet? I'm not going to Lotus Land. I want to stay here and get to the bottom of this. Janet, I think perhaps you're dramatizing the situation. But how can you say that, Bob? I tell you, Jim tried to strangle me. There's been a complete personality change. And sometimes he calls me by a number. What number does Jim assign to you? Assign? Well, that's a funny word to use. I used the wrong word. What number is it? ZXY77. Oh. Frankly, I don't know what to make of it. Well, I'm not the only one. Jim's hospital roommate, Michael Gray, he calls his wife by a number, too. Gray. Morris Tyson did his surgery. I studied under Tyson, Janet. No one better in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. So you can't put your finger on anything it might be? So far as I can see, Jim tolerated the procedure very well. If there's something bothering him, it's got nothing to do with the surgery. Then why has it affected every one of the five men who had that operation in that hospital that week? I can tell you one heart patient who didn't. Who feels fine, was operated on in that hospital by Morris Tyson himself, and has a new lease on life. I'd like to meet him. All right. He had a rheumatic heart, severe valvular damage. After surgery, the man recovered, never attacked his wife, and never changed his personality. Well, I'd like to talk to him. You are? It was me. All right, Janet. Are you satisfied? Conclusion. Different patients react differently. Bob... Would you mind if I talked myself to Dr. Tyson? Of course not. 
Oh, and give my regards to Jim, will you? Yes, and, and you remember me to marry. She's a darling. Darling Mary. Good old W66W. <laughs> I came over just as fast as I could. I saw Bob O'Brien. He wouldn't go along with anything I said. Didn't think Jim was behaving extraordinarily. It was a standoff. Then, I got up to go and I said to him, Remember us to marry his wife. He closed the door. I was standing outside, fumbling in my bag for the car keys, when I heard Bob say through the door very clearly... Darling Mary, good old W66W. Just like that. So your heart specialist also calls his wife by a number. Oh, it makes no sense. Here, yeah, am I starting to hear things that aren't said? I mean, the door was closed, so I didn't see him say it. When you were talking to him, did he seem strange in any way? No. Well, he was his old self, considerate, concerned, everything you could ask for in a doctor. Yeah, none of that glazed look that Michael gets when I'm talking to him. Oh, that man makes me so furious. Janet, I'm having so much trouble with him. And he's as dead set on moving to California as I'm adamant about staying here. Oh, someone's at the door. I'm coming! Mrs. Doyle, what are you doing here? Did you walk down the hill? I know you don't drive. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Gray. I had to speak with you myself, not over the telephone. Well, come in, come in. Oh, no, 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 no. I see you have company. Mrs. Doyle, what is it? Have mercy on us. Oh, have mercy on us. It's Mrs. Tumbra. Go, Betty. Something's happened. Oh, just a few minutes ago, this cable came from me. It's from Mr. Tom Brockles in Greece. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you read it. Mrs. Trumbacos drowned yesterday and having body buried in Athens will notify you upon my return. Aristotle Trumbacos. Betty. Drowned. I haven't kept you up, Bob. No, I was waiting for you, Dr. Tyson. Is W66W still up? My wife? No, she's gone to bed. We won't be disturbed. I've just been reading up on our files, making sure everything's in order. There'll be a new set of patients coming our way, so I want the decks cleared. I'm afraid, Bob, everything is not in order. I suppose you read about the death of Tom Brocko's wife, uh, some island off Corfu. She drowned. I did. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I might have handled it differently. Aristotle is going to miss her. Well, there was no alternative. She became too inquisitive. There is too much at stake for our procedure to be jeopardized now. That's precisely, Bob, why I've come to see you. The wife of one of your patients. You mean Janet Barkley? Yes, I do. She may be dangerous. All day yesterday, she sat outside my office waiting to see me. Now, I had to go out the back way to avoid her. Today, she managed to catch up with me as I was going into a cardiology conference at the hospital. She had learned that Tombraco's wife had drowned. She said it wasn't possible. She knew the girl, Betty. Five Ys had become friendly the week we did the uh, X and K batches. I know. They formed a club of sorts. Well, the Barclay woman had done some investigating, she told me, and she knew Betty Dombrakos was an excellent swimmer. That she must have been killed. Therefore, Bob, since you selected James Barclay to become one of us, you will have to find a way to rid us of his wife. Such a serious situation, I would be tempted to quote from Alice in Wonderland. You will remember when Alice mysteriously grew taller and taller, she said, Curiouser and curiouser, which is indeed my reaction to what we have heard so far. Curiouser and curiouser. 
For more and more, join me when I return shortly with Act Three. We are putting together a jigsaw puzzle of delicate and deadly pieces. Five men, leaders in their field, a scientist, a playwright, a great conductor, a shipping tycoon, and an ambassador have undergone heart operations within one week. The scientist's wife, Janet, horrified by her husband's attempt to kill her, tries to find a link between his operation and his new personality. In fact, each of the wives reports a decided change in their men. All but one of the wives who has mysteriously drowned. Tell me, Dr. Tyson, what else did Janet Barkley suspect besides Betty's death? That there must be unseen forces that have changed husbands. She asked about uh, how you handled her husband's operation. Now, was it possible that when you performed the arteriotomy and constructed the grafts, that some foreign substance could have entered Barkley's body? Or at the point where the three proximals were constructed to the ascending aorta. She's certainly done her homework. Her own words were, when Dr. O'Brien put Jim on the heart and lung machines, what else did those machines pump into him beside blood and oxygen? Barkley came to see me. He thinks his wife Janet is imagining things. Well, I've had him sent to Athens to be with Tom Brockos in case there's trouble. Barclay told his wife he had to attend a scientific meeting. Now it's your turn to move. How much time do I have? The last thing Janet Barclay said to me was that if I couldn't or wouldn't give her a satisfactory explanation, she would use her legal connections to alert Interpol and ask them to investigate whether Betty Tambracos died naturally, accidentally, or was murdered. <laughs> Janet, I set aside all my appointments this morning so that I could see you. I think it's too late. Uh, I'll I'll keep on trying to find out what's in back of all this, but I'm afraid that what I am fighting for is something I've already lost. What do you mean? I've lost the man I married. And now I'm married to a man I don't know and don't love. Janet, you have to make allowances. Don't tell me it takes time to recover. I know all that. I'm not expecting Jim to juggle barbells or do anything strenuous, but it's his mind that needs to get well, if it's not too late, which I suspect it is. And I'm only one of four wives with whom I spend hours and days together at the hospital that fateful week. They all say their husbands are strangers. We're like sisters. We were five, now we're four. Who knows when we'll be three or two. Janet... Would you mind? I'd like to take your blood pressure. Why? Your face is flushed, and I think, for everyone's sake, I'd like to check you out. Anything you think or say is bound to have a reaction upon your body. Right through that door is the examining room. You stretch out on the table, and I'll be right there. Uh Uh-huh. Well, uh, how does it read? Blood pressure's a little on the high side. No, 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 no. Stay right there. Uh, Let me check your pulse. Is it all right if I talk? Oh, certainly. I have to say, I do feel so much better and reassured when I'm talking to you. Did you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Is my pulse normal? A little fast, perhaps, but it's nothing. I don't know. Maybe you've been pushing yourself too hard. Uh, Janet, uh, are you feeling all right? Well, I guess it's the strain, but I am getting a whopper of a headache. Oh, I can give you something for that. Uh, Here you are. Here, take these two tablets. Um, Here, I'll just pour you some water. If you can uh, spare the time, I'd like you to undergo a stress test, Janet. Uh, It's simply a treadmill that's monitored by a doctor and... You do some controlled walking so we can measure how your heart is reacting. We have one here in the office. Uh, We'll take an EKG, and uh, as I said, there's a specialist and a nurse with you all the time. Is it like the stress test Jim had, the the, the one that turned out positive? The same. 
But do, do you really think that I need that? Well, let's play it safe, hmm? I'll check when the doctor's free and uh, we'll take care of it right now. Uh, come on back into my office. Oh, good. They'll be able to schedule you in a few minutes. Uh, you feeling any better now? I'm sort of woozy. You relax right there and let's go over what's bothering you, huh? Mostly that I, I can't make sense of what's happened. There's no explanation. Janet, you know very well that sometimes there isn't any explanation. Ponce de Leon was absolutely positive the Fountain of Youth existed in Florida. And he was determined to find it. He didn't because there isn't any Fountain of Youth. Thousands searched for the gold of El Dorado. Even Sir Walter Raleigh went looking. There was no gold. No lost continent of Atlantis. No treasure hidden in King Solomon's mines. I'm sure Jim would agree with me. Jim's gone to Greece. I don't know why. Scientific meeting. The point is, Janet... Perhaps there are some things better left unknown. Do you understand? Yes. There is no explanation. And it's a mistake to search for one. Janet. Janet, can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Tyson. Yes, Dr. O'Brien. I have the patient here in my office. I shall be sending her along to you. Fine. I'll have an ambulance pick her up and get her to the hospital right away. I'm much obliged. See you later, Doctor. Janet! Janet! Wake up! Uh, Mrs. Gray! Oh! Oh, what? Oh, see, what are you doing? Mrs. Gray, will you please leave my office directly? Happy to. I'm taking Janet with me. Come on, Janet. On your feet. Oh. We're getting out of here. I'm in the middle of a consultation with Mrs. Barkley. Uh, How did you get into my office? Hold on to my hand, Janet. Uh, That's the girl. You all right now? Uh, out we go. I insist that you leave Just her. Listen, doctor. I have a very important appointment with this lady, and you're preventing me from keeping it. She'll see you some other time. What is all this about? Where are we going? To my house. No, no. On second thought, to yours, it's safer. Wait till I tell you the big news and you'll understand. Last night, Mike said maybe he was wrong. He'd go to California alone. I could keep the house. And let's seal the bargain with a kiss, he said. So I thought, well, what the heck? I'm married to this guy. <laughs> Do you know what he did? Hmm? He put his arms around me. And he held me like in a vise. And he kissed me until I couldn't breathe. I almost blacked out. I, don't ask me how I got away. I just did. And it made me realize, Janet, you and I are alone in this. Yeah, there's an ambulance following us. There is? Ambulance? It's practically right on top of us. If we're being chased, let's give him a run for his money. That first side street, that's wide enough. Okay? Uh, okay. Now, here we go. Now, hold on. <laughs> You are right, Janet. Why don't we pull up and just let him pass us? No, no, I've got a hunch that's exactly what he wants us to do. We'll make that left up ahead. You ready for it? Mm. Oh, Janet, I'm on the wrong way in a one-way street. There's a guy coming straight at us. Get out. We've got to run for it. Janet, do you hear me? We can't stay here. Can't you move? Hey, you lady! You're not gonna get me! Dr. Tyson, for Janet. In surgery. Dr. Janet, Barnes, can you hear me? In surgery. You're in the hospital. At your request, Janet, we're going to operate on you and see if we can bypass the occlusions that have made it difficult for you to get enough oxygen to your heart. Nurse... Uh, will you prop up Mrs. Barkley so she can sign this? 
It's a release form, Janet, so that Dr. Tyson and I can do all the procedures that are necessary. Would you just sign here, Janet? Mm. That's fine. Yes. I signed it. You will be anesthetized so you don't feel anything. We have a special operating room for cases like yours. I've got to say this, Dr. Tyson. This Janet Barkley is the most tenacious and courageous of her species. Well, I have to agree with you. Originally, I wanted to destroy it. But I have come to realize we are going to be fortunate to have her stamina on Arturus. What about the other one? Celia Gray. No, I think not. Uh, let her go. Let, uh, the most I can say for her is that her heart's in the right place. Hardly a suitable candidate for transportation, then. No, 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 no. Not worth it. We want only the best types of models. Bob? She's conscious. I thought she was prepped and ready for the procedure. Not quite yet. I want her to know what is happening to her. Well, why didn't you just say triple bypass as we do to the others? She never would have believed me. And she's not the kind to accept transferal to Arteris without an argument. I remind you, Dr. O'Brien, I am the one who makes our decisions on Earth. But if you're the wise man we believe you are, you will accept my recommendations. I tell you, Janet will be cooperative and valuable if she knows. True, we exchanged all the others in the X and K batches for Arturians without their knowledge. Aristotle, Dimitri, Willis, Michael. Even this girl's husband, James, transferred peacefully, quietly. In the end, Janet will transplant better than any so far. She is one of the true survivors of the best in mankind. I take it uh, you wish to take charge of her. I certainly do. Janet. Yes? Are you comfortable? Yes. You have heard Dr. Tyson and me talking, haven't you? Yes. Dr. Tyson comes from the planet Arteris. He came here alone... And then enrolled me. Arteris is the only planet with the same characteristics as Earth. In atmosphere, soil, vegetation, and minerals. It is inhabited by Arturians. Creatures very like you and me. Inbreeding and disease have weakened Arturians. And so Dr. Tyson was sent to Earth to secure the exchange of the finest species of mankind to that weakened planet. We're just beginning our work. It is accomplished by ionic transference. My husband Jim would understand that, but, but he is in Greece. Now, Jim is closer than that to you. When you are fully anesthetized, a selected Arturian, similar in most characteristics, will replace what we on Earth used to call our soul. And your soul will find itself in an equally similar being on Arturus. You mean my husband had already been... been... Yes, Janet. You were living with his replacement who naturally assumed you were his original Arturian mate. ZXY77. No. No. No, let me go. Janet, you don't understand. You will be joining your real husband. Not the James Barkley here on Earth. But the Jim Barkley who at this moment is on Arturus. Dr. Tyson, please stand by to begin. How can I be sure? How can I know? Dr. Tyson, could we make an exception? Arrange for Mrs. Barkley to communicate with her husband on Arturus. It would help. This is Dr. Tyson. Will you have scientist Barkley in voice contact with us? His Earth wife, Janet Barkley, is here, ready for transference. Janet? Janet? Are you there? Jim? Yes. It's me, Janet. I'm on the 
the planet Archers. Come, join me. Please come. There's no anger, Janet, and no death. It's like Earth, Janet, but better. I always felt it wasn't you here. You weren't yourself. Start. Start now. It only takes a little while and you'll be with me. Please come, Janet. Are you ready now, Janet? Yes, I am. Jim, I'll be there soon. I love you too, Jim. Should you come across a friend or relative acting in a way you believe is strange... Rather than dismissing the incident by saying, oh well, he's not himself, consider the possibility that he isn't. That by ion transference, the original person had been shipped off, shanghai if you will, to the planet Arturus. Now, this account informs us that Arturus is transplanting only the most brilliant of humans. So, I guess most of us can feel safe in our own beds. I shall return shortly. in space, we are assured, have but scratched the surface of the cosmos. There are many worlds revolving about many suns. Listening devices have been set up here on Earth to receive any message issuing from any other planet. All because man cannot accept Earth to be the sole inhabited occupant of space. Perhaps we need the assurance that we are not alone. So, who can foretell? One day, many of us may transplant to other planets, whether they be our tourists or not. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Patricia Elliott, Bob Caliban, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Every age must have its heroes... You may well ask, what is a hero? Obviously, a hero must be one who performs heroic deeds. In the past, we had great patriots, great soldiers, great statesmen, and great scientists. Active men and women who changed the face of our nation and the course of our history. Is it a commentary on our times that today's heroes are only images on a screen? How did... uh... You get into my dressing room. Please, I don't want your money. I don't want your autograph. And I don't want you to make love to me. (laughs) So, uh, what's left? I want you to find my husband. He disappeared. Well, why don't you go to the police? Well, you're the police. You're Captain Mace Hacker. Oh, look, come on now. You're a grown-up lady. I'm just an actor. Oh, please, Captain Hacker. Captain Hacker is a character dreamed up by a writer. No, no, he's real. He's you. 
the best detective in the world. The only man who can help me. Our mystery drama, The Shadow of a Killer, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Fred Gwynn. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Looking sedan comes to a stop before a seedy, sagging tenement building in a desolate section of a dreary slum. Three men get out. One is tall and rugged, with what might be described as craggy features. Quietly, they enter the dismal hallway. Each has a revolver in his hand. They stop before a door. The tall, rugged one raises his foot with one crashing blow. He kicks the door open. Police! Freeze! Hey, what's the idea? Against the wall. Eddie, Jerry, frisk these animals. Well, hey, look at here. On the table, all these bills. Uh, they wouldn't be from the bank job where you kill the guard and two customers, would they? I, I don't know how that dough got there. You don't know how that dough got there, look, do you? Look, we'll, we'll, we'll make a deal. All this dough, you keep it. It's not enough. It's 250 grand. There's not enough money in the whole world. <laughs> Cut and print it. That was perfect, Mace. It's a take. Okay, Maxie, you can get up off the floor. Terry, look! Maxie! His mouth's bleeding! Hey, what is this? He's hurt. Mace, what'd you do to him? I... I don't know. He must have really hit him. I thought it looked too lifelike. Hey, Max. Max, I'm... I'm sorry. Somebody go get some water. Yeah. Uh, get a doctor. Uh, say, Max, listen, I'm... I'm... I'm sorry. What got into you? We're only making a movie... Max. Yeah. What? Oh. Huh? Oh, good. He's coming around. Oh. What? What happened? Uh, you're going to be all right, Max. You're going to be all right. Hi, Mace. Oh. Listen, Perry. Maybe you better not call me Mace anymore. This never happened to me before. I, I never lost control in a scene. How's Max? He's okay. It'll be in the papers. Why? There was a reporter on the set from the Trib, a dame. You should have seen her eyes light up. I can see tomorrow's headlines. The violence is not phony in the TV series Captain Mace Hacker Homicide. Boy, that's all I need. That's worth a million bucks in publicity. You know what I'd like to do? Walk away from the show. What, now? You're the hottest series in Hollywood. Perry, I'm scared. Of what? That's just it. I don't know. Uh, maybe you ought to see a shrink. Perry, what do you think of me? Well, I always thought you were a good actor, but now I believe you're great. You get better every week. Yeah, but maybe. But I want the truth. When they first called me into director series, it was just another cop story. No better, no worse. But may the good Lord forgive me, we have now become a work of art. Look, Perry, tonight I'm in no mood for soft soap. You've developed something with the show, Mace. You've brought it to a new height of realism. I'll tell you what, I'd like to go back to Broadway and do a play. Ah, uh, in the first place, they'd never let you out of your contract. Second, you're doing some absolutely first-rate acting right now. That's the problem, Perry. I'm no longer sure it is acting. What does that mean? I wish I knew what it meant. It's got to mean something. Yeah. Perry, I've been trained as an actor. And I know that what we create is an illusion. Well, sure. But what if... What if what we create is real? Real? How? In what way? Mm, don't try to nail me down. It's, it's, it's just the... 
It's just a character. I, I don't know. When I walk off the set, sometimes I get the feeling that I'm not walking away from it. Ah, oh, you're too intense. <laughs> That's no help. Perry, you're a stage actor, a fine one. You've played the classic Shakespeare, Ibsen, Chekhov. You come out here to do a TV series. You're accused of selling out, of frittering away your talents. So you say to yourself, I'll show these jokers what acting really is. I'll prove that performing as Mace Hacker can be as great as performing Hamlet. That's what you think, huh? And you've proved your point. Now you can relax. Hey, who are you? And uh, how did you get in here? My name is Irene Fluitt. I was on one of the studio tours. We watched you filming your show. And the guide pointed this out as your dressing room. So I sneaked away from the rest of them and came back here. Uh, the door was open. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, so here you are. Oh, please don't have me thrown out. I, I never have anybody thrown out. Uh, I'll say to you what I say to the rest of them. If you want a picture with my autograph, I'm glad to oblige. And now, let me open the door for oh, you. But please... Uh, look, let me explain something. We have a fantastic security system here. Special cops who know exactly how to handle this type of situation. So, if you think you might be able to work this into a big deal, you, you'll never get it off the ground. I don't want your money. I don't want your autograph. And I, I don't want you to make love to me. <laughs> so what's left? I want you to listen. Uh, look, I really don't have any time. I want you to find my husband. Find your husband? He's disappeared. Well, why don't you go to the police? You're the police. What? You're Captain Mace Hacker. No, no, no. I'm Alvin J. Miller. Please, Captain Hacker. Uh, look, Mace Hacker is a character dreamed up by a writer. And I'm just an actor who plays the part. Don't say that. Uh, Mace Hacker... Is a fictional character. No, he is not a fictional character. Mace Hacker is the best detective in the world. There is no Mace Hacker. I see him every week. I believe in him. And now finally I'm talking to him. Uh, how would it be if I uh, got you a taxi? No, no, please. But... Please don't dismiss me as if... As if I were a nut. I know I sound like one. But I have seen you on television. And I feel your absolute dedication to... Law and order and and justice. Oh, those words. Listen, the writers put those words in my mouth. But neither they nor anyone else can put that conviction in your voice. You are Mace Hacker, and you know it. You're the world's best cop, because you've had more experience, more training than any police officer in the world. What are you talking about? Oh, what cop has worked on as many crimes as you have? And you've solved them. Because you used correct techniques. Look, I really don't have any more time. Oh, please. Please find my husband. Uh, look, Mrs... Uh, please. Uh, Fluid. <laughs> you have to understand... No. I... No, don't turn me down. I have nowhere else to go. Please. Maybe... Maybe they murdered him. Uh, maybe who murdered him? I don't know. But he knew too much. Ab about what? I don't know. But they... They had to get him out of the way. Who had to get him out of the way? They... They did. Who are they? My husband drives a truck. Last Wednesday night, he was very nervous. He couldn't eat his dinner. What's the matter, I asked him. Oh, please, Mrs. Fluid. No, no, I uh, won't leave here until you listen to me. Uh, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Mrs. Fluid, let me drive you to your home, and you can tell me about it on the way. This isn't a trick now. You're going to listen to me? You've got to promise. I promise. here for Encero Beach. Well, as I was telling you, he was very nervous. I guess you could say scared. I asked him what was the matter. At first he wouldn't say anything. 
And finally he said, Irene, I'm in a jam. Well, what does that mean, I asked. I'd better not tell you, he said. But, but I'm your wife, I said. And he said, I gotta keep you out of this. And then... Yes? Well, then he just got up from the table and he went out. Where? I don't know. I haven't seen him since. He didn't come home that night. So the next morning, I, I went to the police station. Uh-huh. What did they do? Oh, they listened. They wrote everything down. I gave them his picture and that's it. Nothing's happening. How do you know? They're probably doing the very best they can. Well, I don't say they aren't. But their best isn't good enough. Look, all I know is my husband is gone. Look, Mrs. Fluid, he's your husband. Uh, you may feel a special way about him, but the fact is, he was in wrong somewhere. Somehow. He said so himself. He, he told you he was in a jam. But he wouldn't do anything wrong, I know. Oh, this is the house right here. Hey, this is the house. <laughs> Quite a place. Well, ever since we were married, that's all both of us ever wanted. A nice place to live in. Oh, please, won't you come in? Uh, I'd like to, but I'm due back for a story conference in about 40 minutes. Please, so... find my husband. What, what makes you think I can... Because you're Captain Mace Hacker. Oh, please, let's not start that all but, over but again. But you are. Whether you like it or not. Uh, Mrs. Floyd, I'm sorry. I have to go. You're afraid. Of what? Afraid you'll be unable to live up to your responsibility. What responsibility? Your responsibility to me. What responsibility do I have to you? To me and to the millions who watch you and who believe in you. I, I never asked anyone to believe in me. Oh, but you do. You speak to all of us and you say, I'm here. I'm here to protect you. You can count on me. Now, you know you say that. But those are just words. The, the writer's words. But we believe you. I believe you. <laughs> pretenses which after a while become real, if not to the pretender, then to his audience. And why not? So many of us play a role in this life, and there are those of us who are actually paid fabulous sums to do it. They say sometimes you can't tell the real people from the pretenders without a scorecard. Maybe we'll have to issue some in Act Two, which comes shortly. people to think you are. This is a piece of advice that comes to us from no less a philosopher than Pythagoras himself. And so there must be something to it. But like all these previous nuggets fashioned by the great sages, there's always considerable difficulty, not to mention distance, between the desire and the deed. But I believe you. You are Captain Mace Hacker. I believe you. I said I was sorry. I'll never believe anybody again as long as I live. Uh, Mrs. Fluid. Um, uh, Miss, Mrs. Fluid. <laughs> Mrs. Fluid. Mrs. Fluid. Yes. Uh, you must let me apologize. For what? That's it. I 
I don't even know for what. Uh, but I have this feeling I've done something wrong. Uh, uh, may I come in? Say, this is a beautiful home you have here. We're very proud of it. Look, you don't really have to apologize to me. Uh, I realize what I did was quite silly. It, it's just that I'm desperate. I don't know where to turn. Oh, I would offer you a drink, except I know you never take one. That's right. Um, I, I'll tell you what you could offer me, though. Whatever it is I'm smelling, it must be delicious. Oh, that's dinner. I just left it to simmer on the stove. What is it? Beef stew. <laughs> you see, ever since I became Mace Hacker, whenever I go out to eat, Wherever I go, I'm recognized. I can never enjoy a meal. Well, would you care for some? Well, thank you. And, uh, why don't you tell me more about your husband? All right. I want to do the scene between Hacker and Inspector Kelly again. We have practically the same dialogue in every show. You should be able to do it in your sleep. So let's do it in one take. Roll them. Mace Hacker, script 28, scene 27, take two. Action. First, Mrs. Fluett, you tell me your husband drives a truck. Then I find out you live in this fantastic house in very exclusive Encero Beach. Ha! Hey, where do those lines come from, Mace? What? Mace, what script are we doing? Uh, I, I don't... Who is Mrs. Fluett? Uh, M- Mrs. Fluett? Yeah, whose husband drives a truck. Mace, none of this is in the script. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I realize that. You okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, uh, I, I just must have been thinking about something. You want to take a break? No, 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 it's, it's okay, I'll be all right. Um... Uh, let's take it again. Uh, hello, Mrs. Fluett. Oh, uh, good evening. Uh, you mind if I come in? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, Mrs. Fluett, I want you to tell me the truth. About what? About your husband. I told you everything. You told me he drives a truck. Yes, that's right. Uh, Well, what other source of income does he have? None that I know of. I checked the records at City Hall. You bought this house for $170,000. Yes, we did. On a truck driver's salary? Well, he makes very good money. Not that good. He told me he came into some inheritance... An aunt of his died. Who was she? I don't know. I never met her. Well, well, he never did either. She lived in England. Who does your husband work for? Kazmaier. W.J. Kazmaier. Uh-huh. What kind of outfit is it? Oh, they import novelties. You know, all sorts of little souvenir-type items from the Far East. Uh-huh. It's a warehouse, huh? Yes, I, I think so. Mm, I see. And he drives his stuff from there to various stores and so forth? Well, I would imagine so. It it seems to me you don't know very much about it. Well, he... He never talked much about his job. Mm -hmm. And you never wondered about where all the money was coming from? I was brought up in a family where a woman never asked her husband such questions. (laughs) Uh, Who have you been talking to downtown at police headquarters? A certain Inspector Rockfield. Rockfield, huh? Do you know him? Inspector Rockfield. Who? Oh, yeah, yeah, anytime. Send him right in here. Mace Hacker, come right on in and sit yourself down. Thanks, Inspector. Hey, uh, before I forget, September 23rd is a date for the annual PBA affair. 
I know the men will want you for guest of honor as usual. Sure. Mace. <laughs> Isn't it remarkable how I instinctively call you Mace? It's just because you happen to be so real to all of us in the department. Uh, Inspector. Hey, I, uh, I guess you want my comments on the next script. Usually Perry calls me up about that. As usual, I've got nothing to say. Oh, a couple of little nitpicky things, but I don't even know if it pays to bring them up. Uh, Inspector, could I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, what's being done on the George Fluitt case? The what? The George Fluitt disappearance. George Fluitt? That name doesn't ring a bell. Is it, uh, something recent? It's very recent, Inspector. George Fluid. Doesn't mean a thing. Well, I've been talking to his wife. She says she's been in here to see her. Well, we get hundreds of these things, and, uh, I see Fluid, Fluid. Let me think, uh, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he did disappear, then. So she claims. She said he was nervous, scared, in a jam of some sort. Yeah, yeah, I remember. That's what she said to me. Uh-huh. Well? Hey, we get 20, 30 disappearances a month like that. Do you know why? No. Your average guy who disappears fades out for two reasons. They both begin with a D. Dames or debts. So his wife, his mother, his sister, his girlfriend, whoever's left holding the bag, she comes in here and try to sweeten the pot. They figure if they can throw a little mystery into it, a little hint of homicide, maybe we'll try harder. Uh, so what you're saying is you don't believe her? What I'm saying is don't worry about it, Mace. <laughs> so what's so funny? Uh, that's exactly like the line in your show. When your boss, Inspector Kelly, tries to touch you off a case, don't worry about it, Mace. Yeah, and I always answer, okay, but do you mind if I scout around a little bit? Uh, well? What, Mace? Do you? Do you mind if I scout around a little bit? What are you talking about? I can't believe it. It must be a joke. Yeah. Well, all right, cinnamon. Mace Hacken? Uh, Mr. Kazmaier. Why, it is. It is Mace Hacken. Uh, do you mind if I come in? Uh, oh, oh, sure, sure, sure. Come on in. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, sit down. <laughs> oh, what can I do for you? I want to talk to you about George Fluid. George Fluid. I understand he drove a truck for you. Oh, yeah, 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 he did. What do you know about him? <laughs> All I know is he he hasn't been in to work for over a week now. Uh -huh. Do you have any idea why? No. Mm, was he in any kind of trouble that you know of? Trouble? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, are you in any sort of trouble, Mr. Kazma? Me? In, in trouble? <laughs> what kind of a question is that? <laughs> a very simple question. Now, wait a minute. Are you, are you uh, actually working with the police? You didn't answer the question. Well, you... well no. No. I, I'm not in any trouble. Mm -hmm. I may be back. Thank you, Mr. Kazmaier. You've been a lot of help. You, uh, resting? Oh, no, no, no. Just going over my lines. Uh, come on in, Perry. When am I doing the set? You've got about an hour. Listen, I, uh, I got a phone call from that cop. You know, the technical advisor for the series, Roxfield. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of weird thing. And he had this crazy notion that you were actually talking to him like a cop who wanted to work on it. Well... They're not doing anything on it. If if you ask me, this guy's been murdered. 
How do you know the guy's been murdered? Call it one of my famous hacker hunches. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't go around on the assumption you're a real cop. And she's not even a good-looking dame. Who isn't? I'm putting a couple of things together. First, you throw some lines into a script about a dame named Mrs. Fluitt. All this out of left field. Then later, the inspector calls me and tells me you're trying to involve yourself in the disappearance of a guy named George Fluitt. So I drove out to look. Who is this Mrs. Fluitt to you? She asked me to find him. Why you? Because to her, I'm a cop named Mace Hacker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can understand that. To her, you're Mace Hacker. But who are you to you? Who, who am I? Yeah. Who are you? During our story so far, we've had little bits and pieces of suggestion, innuendo, even a certain amount of hard evidence. But the central question remains, as it must, until, of course, we solve it one way or another in Act Three shortly. are fated to live out our fantasies in private. However, here we have an actor named Alvin J. Miller who plays the role of a television cop named Mace Hacker so convincingly that quite a few people have come to think of him as Mace Hacker. Indeed, their number has become so large that he's beginning to believe it himself. What are you trying to do, Mace? I'm going to find the killer of George Fluitt. But you're not... Uh, I'm not what? You're not a real cop. I'm Mace Hacker. Now, listen. It happens. It happens to all of them sometimes, especially to actors who play doctors and detectives. You get so involved in it, after a while, it seems to be real. It is real. No, it is not. It's just a story that comes up on a screen for an hour. And it's gone. You turn off the picture, and it's all gone. But I'm still here. Mace Hacker is still here. Well, a lot of this is my fault. I've been working it too hard. Listen, maybe you'd better... Uh, I, I know what you're going to say. Maybe I should see a doctor. Why not? Why should you be the only big star that's never been to a shrink? Mace Hacker has to help this woman. Why? Because she's getting the runaround from everybody else. Tell me, Mrs. Fluid, have the police been out here to see you? No. Do they know where you live? Well, yes, they must. They took down my address. Mm. They know where your husband works? Yes, yes, it's all in the form I filled out. Um, how did your husband get along with his employer, uh, uh, Mr. Kazmaier? I'm all right, I suppose. You suppose? Well, I told you, he would never talk about business. I would assume if they didn't get along, Mr. Kazmaier would have fired him. It's that simple, isn't it? <laughs> you live in a simple world, Mrs. Lewis. I'm sorry. And you still insist you have no idea why your husband should have been nervous or frightened that night? No, sir. Just exactly how much did your husband make a week? I told you, he never discussed business with me. What did you do for money? He gave me some to run the household. How much? As much as I needed. How much did it come to? Oh, uh, about $200 a week. Uh -huh. And he paid all the bills? Yes, I suppose so. Did he keep any papers around the house? 
I, I don't know. You don't know? I keep telling you I don't know anything about business. But you know about this. Hmm? It's a light switch. See? Turns on the electricity. You have to pay the utility company money for it, right? And yeah. and this, see? It's a telephone. And it happens to be in working order. And every month the company sends you a bill. Well, well yes, but... There's a mortgage on this house. And every month the bank has to be paid. So where are all these bills kept? Wh where's your husband's checkbook? Where does he keep his record? I told you, I don't know. You're lying. You have no right to talk to me like that. How much does your husband take home a week? Not enough to give you 200 for your pocketbook. Not enough to maintain a place like this. So where does the money come from? I don't know. You never asked yourself, how does a truck driver pay for this kind of a setup? I told you there was a legacy. What legacy? Where's the letter from the lawyer? I never asked him. You never asked him anything. Because you didn't want to know. But you knew there had to be something dishonest going on. No, I, I... You're living in this house three years now, Mrs. Floyd. Where did you live before? And please don't tell me you don't remember. I didn't say that. You had a two-room flat over on Vanderlee. Mm, not such a hot neighborhood. Your, your husband worked for a big national outfit, Universal Transport. But everything changed... The day he took the job with Kazmaier. Didn't it? Didn't it? Yes. Why? What do you want me to tell you? The truth. The truth. Well, I... I taught at Downstate. I was one of those plain-looking girls who did well at school, but not so good at other things. Like dates. It's an old story. Mm, they're the best kind. All my friends said it couldn't work. He and I, no, oh, we were from two different worlds. He'd never even finished high school. But he was a man. And he was handsome. And he... I guess he was in awe of me. Can you imagine? Yeah. He just couldn't believe his good luck. That someone like me could be attracted to someone like him. At first, I couldn't believe it myself. I come from a very poor background. I worked hard to put myself through school. I always yearned for nice things. Mm -hmm. And so you started to demand them. It's funny how it worked. I never said one word. <laughs> that can be the loudest demand of all. That's right. The money started to roll in. It's the only way I can describe it. Uh, and you never asked him a single question. I couldn't. Why not? Because I had to justify it to myself. And so I created a kind of make-believe world where everything was all right. And then when he disappeared, I couldn't accept it. So I also had to go to a make-believe detective. What else can I tell you? I guess you told me everything. Inspector Rockfield, how are you doing on the fluid case? Oh, nice. No. You look. She walks in here. She says, my husband disappeared. She shows you his picture, a real handsome guy. You look at her, a very plain Jane. So you say to yourself, simple. He walked out on her. That's what you said, wasn't it? Now, wait a minute. That's you... how you wrote it off. Who says we you wrote... You take down all the information as a matter of form. George Fluitt, truck driver, 37 Primrose Way in Cerro Beach, age 36. Employer, Kazmaier, Inc. 
You wouldn't happen to go for this dame, would you? And then you took the sheet of paper and dropped it into the files. There's a terrific story on that sheet of paper. But nobody around here bothered to read it. What story? How does a truck driver make enough money to live in a house on Encero Beach? What kind of salary does he get at Kazmaier? Is he moonlighting? If so, at what? If not, why is he worth so much to Kazmaier? Kazmaier imports novelties from the Far East. So, what else could they be importing? A hundred questions. But how many did you ever ask yourselves? None. Now, look. This investigation is proceeding along in an orderly manner. Hey, you wouldn't kid an old buddy, would you? I'm telling you. The secret lies at Kazmaier. What are you doing here? Good evening, Mr. Kazmaier. What are you doing here? You again, the one who plays a detective. Uh, you haven't answered my question. What are you doing here? Oh, <laughs> I got every right to be here. This happens to be my warehouse. Uh-huh. You keep very late hours. That's how to get ahead in this world. How'd you get in? I, uh, Jimmy'd open a window in the back. Well, the burglar alarm must be out of order. No, 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 it's fine. I, uh, happen to know what to do about burglar alarms. Oh. Is there any reason why I shouldn't call the police? Absolutely. Because I'd tell them what I was looking for. Oh, yeah? What are you looking for? Look, Kazmaier, you and I could save a lot of time if you told me. Uh, drugs? Diamonds, is it? Or counterfeit? <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, you uh, caught me robbing your warehouse. So call the cops. Nah. No, why not? If you're on the level. Oh, you're a famous television detective. What are you looking for, publicity? Why should I give it to you? Why? Because this is a perfect setup for something crooked. You're a reputable businessman. Nobody bothers you. Maybe your truck driver figures it out. Maybe it was his idea. Anyhow, he is in on it. He started making a lot of money. Now, you tell me the rest. Uh, was he becoming too greedy? Hmm? Too dangerous? Or, or maybe the other thing. Maybe his conscience started to bother him. Maybe he wanted to get out. Huh? No, Kazmaier, don't try to open that desk drawer. And just keep your hands exactly where I can see them. That uh, gun of yours, is that the one you use in the show? <laughs> is it loaded with real bullets or blanks? Mine has live ammunition. I'm betting yours doesn't. Should we find out? It doesn't matter. They're wise to you. Nobody's wise to me except maybe you... In a little while, you're not going to make too much difference. You killed him, didn't you? Yeah, he's beginning to ask for too much money. He married a lady with very expensive tastes. Where'd you hide his body? Same place I'm going to hide yours. Come on, let's go. What makes you think I'm going quietly? I'd hate to have to drag your body out to my car. So why should I make it easy for you? Okay, have it your way. Uh, don't shoot, Inspector. We can take him alive. What? You... I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Kazmaier. <laughs> you fell for the oldest trick in the book. Listen, listen, look. We can we could make a deal. What kind of deal? In a warehouse. I, I I got a shipment of drugs. You were right. A half a million dollars just for you. It's not enough. All right, name your price. There isn't enough money in the whole world, Kazmaier. And just don't you make a move. Yeah? Yeah. Give me Inspector Rockfield. Mace, it's absolutely fantastic. You actually found the killer of this fellow fluid. You solved the case. Yeah. Well, how'd you do it? Oh, how do I always do it? 
Uh, just routine police work. <laughs> the media's eating it up. The whole country's talking about it. It was a good show. What was a good show? Listen, Perry, for a while back there, the scripts were all beginning to sound the same. But this time, the writers really wrote a great one. About Irene Fluitt and her husband. Mace, that wasn't... That wasn't a show. You never even meet the guy. But, you know, you can picture the whole relationship he has with his wife. <laughs> the writers could only come up with something like that every week. We're ready on the set, Perry. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. You ready, Mace? You know me, Perry. I'm always ready. All right, everybody. Places. Roll them. Mace Hacker, script number 52, scene one, take one. The problem. Does any of us really know who we are and where we are? It's all rather complex, you know. It would be relatively simple if we knew the difference between reality and illusion. At one time, the separation was quite obvious. Now, it may not even exist. But I do. And I shall return shortly. At one time, our heroes were drawn from real life. They were real people who did real things. Buffalo Bill actually rode a horse in the wild, untamed West and shot Buffalo. Today, our Western heroes are movie stars. Our great soldiers are movie stars. Our great doctors and detectives and lawyers are movie stars. And we invest these shadows on the screen with reality. And it isn't necessarily their fault if we take their make-believe seriously. And if, after a while, they do too. Our cast included... Fred Gwynn, Joyce Gordon, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. believe this story, at least not in its every particular. I'm not sure I believe all of it myself, but if you will listen carefully, and if you will surrender certain prejudices you may not even know you have, I believe you will recognize a bit of truth that you have always known and never acknowledged. Emily? Paul? Is that you, Emily? Yes, Paul. What are you coming home? I don't know exactly. You've been gone a long time. What are you doing over there anyway? Well, I'm... Uh, I'm looking for the blue door. Our mystery drama, Behind the Blue Door, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Jada Rowland. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I suppose. 
suppose everyone has felt that he or she was looking for something, that life was one long, blind search. Perhaps there are a few who have actually found what they were seeking and are content. But if there are, I've never met one. Everyone I know, the ones who are honest at any rate in what they tell me, is still looking. Paul is pretty nearly perfect. He's nice looking. He makes a lot of money. But he works hard for it. I like the way he wears his clothes. The way he combs his hair. The way he drives his car. The way he treats me. Why do I say he's pretty nearly perfect? He's perfect. And he loves me. Truly, deeply, sincerely loves me. He wants to marry me, for heaven's sake. What are you trying to say, Emily? Oh, I don't know exactly, Paul. It's just that... It's so hard to put into words. The right words. I, I can't seem to find them. I, Emily, I... you're 22 years old. You've been graduated from a good school. You majored in English composition. You were editor of the school paper. You sold a story to the town paper. Oh, all that stuff. You certainly ought to be able to tell me whatever it is you want to tell me. Haven't I always listened to you? Whatever you had to say, haven't I always listened? Yes. And, oh, yes. Yeah. And you have listened to me. That's what made me fall in love with you, I think. More than anything else, that you listened. Really? Well, you did. Didn't you? I think so. You certainly looked like you were listening. I was. I was. And sometimes you'd answer me a month later. That really got to me. It, it meant that you hadn't just been listening, which was a great thing all by itself, but it meant that you heard me and that you thought about what I said, and a month later you picked up where I'd stopped talking, and and we went on from there. Now, am I making any sense to you? Yes. Well, haven't you felt the same way about me? I mean, all this time we've been together, that no matter what happened to us, even if we had to be separated for a while, for whatever reason, when we got together again, we'd pick up right where we left off. Don't, don't you feel that, or is it just me that feels that? If you say it's just me, I... I, 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 I don't know what I'll do. It, it, it isn't just me that feels that way, is it, Emily? Is it? No. It isn't just you. <laughs> I knew it. I, I knew it. It wasn't just me. I, well, you and I could go on talking to each other forever. I know it. So you see, that means that we should get married. Paul, what you said before about us being separated for a while. Wouldn't make the least bit of difference. Maybe we ought to try it. What for? You, you mean you want to try it out? Is that it? Yes. I want to try it out. I want to go to Europe for a while. For a month, maybe. I have some money of my own. My father left me some money in his will. I want to use it to go away. To go abroad for a month. Um, wh where will you go? I mean, it, if you want to tell me. Paris, I guess. <gasps> Isn't that where everybody goes the first time? To Paris. I've been in Paris five days now. Staying at a little hotel in the left bank. There's something here. It's in the air. It's in the way the lights fall after dark. It's in the shadows they cast. It's in the street. They have streets here named after poets. Imagine that. I've already had a letter from Paul. It came this morning. He says, Dear Emily, Guess what I've been doing since, since you left. I've been looking for a house. A house for us when we're together again and ready to take up where we left off. I know just the sort of house I want for us. Not too big, not too small, with an upstairs and a downstairs, front door and a back door, and a whole real dining room just for sitting, sitting down, down and, and eating. Sitting down and eating, and he goes on like that. Dear Paul. Darling Paul. Why don't I go home right this very minute and marry him? And find our house and go and live in it to the end of our days? Why don't I? I'm so excited I can hardly stand it. After I finished reading Paul's letter, 
I thought I'd go for a walk. Today, I saw it. I was walking down one of the narrow little streets a few blocks off the Seine, and I saw it. The blue door. You know what? I wasn't even surprised. It was though... It was as though I'd known all my life it would be there, waiting for me. It didn't surprise me either that it wasn't locked. I just turned the big carved handle and went in. And it didn't surprise me that on the other side was a garden, all planted with roses and threaded with narrow little gravel walks. And what surprised me least of all was seeing a man coming towards me down one of those gravel walks. He was holding out his arms to me. Emily. Hello. Oh, hello. I'm so glad I found you. I'm glad, too. You really are glad, aren't you? Well, of course I'm glad. I've been waiting for you. I'm sorry it took me so long. Oh, it doesn't matter now that you're here? No, it doesn't matter. Not really. May I ask you something? My darling Emily, you may ask me anything you have a mind to, anything at all. Do you think I'm pretty? Do I think you're pretty? Well, now... It's very important to me. Everything you think about me is important. You can't imagine how important. So tell me. I... I think... I think you're very pretty. <laughs> I'm so glad. Did you think otherwise, that perhaps you weren't pretty? Well, not quite. I hoped I was. But now that I know you think so, now I'm sure. Is it so important to be pretty? I want to be pretty for you. That's all? Just pretty? You make me sound so vain. What about being kind and loving and merry of heart? Slow to anger, quick to forgive. You could never make me angry. Never. I wouldn't love you so much if I thought you were so mean-spirited you could never get angry. Really? You mean that? I really mean that. Oh, my goodness. When you're hurt or humiliated or neglected or treated unkindly, I should most certainly expect you to become angry. And to show it. Well, you'd never hurt me. Or humiliate me, or any of those things. Are you so sure of that? Of course I'm sure. I'm only a man, you know, very ordinary, with ordinary feelings. Oh, no, not you. Yes. Me. Me. And every other man. I think that I should leave now and go back to my hotel. You've given me things to think about. I hope so. Well, you have. I'll come back tomorrow. And we'll talk some more. Good. I hardly slept that night. I stared into the darkness. And out of the dark would come the image of the blue door. My heart would beat a little faster. And I seemed to feel the big carved handle. Turn it. Open the door and walk in. See the garden. Then see him. What a lot we would have to say to each other. What a lot of questions I would ask. And he would answer them all. I thought I remembered exactly where the blue door was. On the Rue des Saint-Pères. Or one of those tiny streets near a little old church. I was sure I could walk straight to it. But my memory had played a trick on me. I couldn't find it. M Monsieur? Hmm? Pardon? Uh, S'il si vous plaît. Mademoiselle? Um, je uh, cherche. Je cherche. Vous um, cherchez, oui? Uh, Qu'est-ce que vous cherchez? Oh, you don't speak English at all, do you? Uh, vous ne, vous ne parlez pas anglais? Oh, je regrette, mademoiselle. One moment. 
Oh, I have a little dictionary. Here. Uh, Ruby, show me. Uh, yes, we. Oui. Oh, oh, here it is. Je cherche une porte. Who cherches a port? Oh, wait a second. Un instant. Um, attendez. Oh, here. Yes. Une porte bleue. Yes. A bleu? Vous, vous comprenez? Bleu? Porte? Bleu? Oui, je comprends. Oh, I was here yesterday. A blue door. Pardon? Uh, la, la porte bleue. Il était ici yesterday. Ici, un bon Oh, don't you understand? I have to find it. It's very important to me. It is important. Oui, je comprends. Mais il n'y a pas un bon I tell you, there is. There has to be. I was here. I saw it. I opened it. I went inside and there, there was a garden and... Il n'y a bed. pas un bon are you trying to tell me there's no blue door in this neighborhood? He was very polite, this policeman. But very firm. And there was no mistaking what he was telling me. There is no blue door in this neighborhood. No blue door. No garden on the other side of it. No tall wise and loving man in the garden. I'd imagined all of it. I dreamed of my happiness. And now I was awake. And my happiness was gone. I wandered up and down the little streets for a while, not really expecting anymore that I'd find what I had started out to look for. Just wondering how I could have been so happy one day. And the next, so unbearably sad. Yes, it can happen that way. In a day, in an hour, a minute or a second, joy can turn to despair. Love is lost and only solitude remains. Here are four simple and touching lines from a seldom quoted 19th century poet, George MacDonald. Alas, how easily things go wrong. A sigh too much or a kiss too long. And there follows a mist and a weeping rain. And life is never the same again. I'll be back with Act Two shortly. The mystery of the blue door persists. The door, the beautiful garden beyond it, and the wise and loving man in the garden. Is it really there? Is the garden really there? Most important, is the man really in the garden behind the door? Well, I don't know of my own personal knowledge, but of this I am pretty sure. Every woman believes that all three exist somewhere, only waiting for her to find them. It's not for me to tell her... She's wrong. I wandered listlessly up and down the Rue des Saint-Père for a couple of days and all the other little streets in that quarter. I've never felt so alone. I thought perhaps I might run across the Frenchman who told me there was no blue door. Il n'y a pas une porte bleue dans ces environs. There's no blue door in this neighborhood, mademoiselle. Back at my hotel, I did the one thing I've always done when I was unhappy and alone. I did it without thinking, without asking myself why I was doing it. I just did it. I called Paul. Emily? Is that you, Emily? It's me, Paul. How was Paris? Oh, <laughs> Paris is all right. All right? That's not the way people talk about Paris. It's lovely. Really lovely. Paris is lovely. You, uh, met anybody? What? Uh, you, uh, you sound lonely, kind of. I am, kind of. Ha haven't you met anybody at the hotel or someplace? A, a cute girl like you, I'd have thought you... I met somebody. Oh. I met a man. Uh, he, did he take you out? No. We just, uh, you know, talk, 
talk for a while, that's all. He hasn't called you or anything? No. I haven't seen him again. I guess he's left town or something. I haven't met anybody else except a Frenchman on the street. I was looking for something and he... He tried to help me, but... But he couldn't. Uh, looking for what? A blue door. A, a what? A, a blue door. You said a blue door? Is that what you said? Yes. But I couldn't find it. Oh. Uh, well, uh, when are you coming home? I don't know exactly. Soon? Make it soon, huh? I'd like to. So do it. Not right away. Emily, I think I've got a surprise for you. We'll have, anyway. Really? What? A house. I think I found a house. I took your mother to see it, and she likes it a lot. She thinks you'll like it. As a matter of fact, she's positive. I'm about to put a down payment on it. I don't know if you should do that, Paul. I don't want to take a chance on losing it. It's a salt box type of house. That's what your mother says. Pretty old. Uh, needs a little fixing up. But... Paul, I'm going to Rome. What? What did you say? I'm going to Rome. I've never seen Rome. Uh, so as long as I'm here, I, I think I should. Everybody should see Rome. I don't know why I said that to Paul about going to Rome. But as long as I'd said it, I thought I might as well do it. And there was clearly no point in staying in Paris looking for a blue door. It didn't exist. So I went to the Gare de Lyon and bought a ticket. The porter settled me and my luggage in a pretty little compartment. I sat staring out of the window, still on the same days, in the same lost state of bewilderment I'd felt in Paris. There was another train from the track right next to the one I was on. The windows of its dining car were right opposite me. People were sauntering in and out, finishing or ordering drinks or food. I was starting to wonder if I was hungry, if I ought to eat something, when I saw him. man from the garden behind the blue door. He was sitting with a woman. A very attractive woman. And they were talking to each other. I didn't stop to think what I was doing or what I meant to do. I hustled off my train and into the other one, and into the dining car. But when I looked at the table where I'd seen him, the man wasn't there. Only the very attractive woman. All by herself. I beg your pardon. Yes. Something I can do for oh, you. Oh, you speak English. I'm an American. Oh, good. So am I. Did you want to sit down here? I'll be leaving in a minute or two. Uh, there, are, there are other tables. I'd like to sit here with you if, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. I'm just finishing my drink, but would you like one? Some wine or something? No. No, I, I don't want anything. Thank you. I. You see, I, I saw you sitting here before... Oh? Uh, only there was a man sitting with you? Oh, yes. I, I saw you from over there. Uh, over where? Uh, from that train, my compartment. I could see you from the window of my compartment. But that's the train to Rome, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yes, it is. I've been in Paris, and uh, I thought I'd go to Rome. You're making sort of a grand tour, are you? Uh, not exactly. I, I'm i looking for someone. Oh, a friend? Uh, not exactly. Kind of. A man. Oh, I see. I suppose that sounds silly. Not at all. I'm looking for a man myself. You are? Well, isn't every woman? <laughs> of course, I don't mean just any man. I mean the right man. Is that what you mean? I yes. Uh, but... We all have this unshakable conviction that somewhere there is the absolute one right man. That's how I feel. Won't you? And I've felt that way since I was 14. I still do. Yes. Well, you see, I think I found him. The absolute one right man? I met him in Paris. Oh, my. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> well, we had a long talk, he and I. He gave me a lot to think about. Yes? And? I was supposed to see him the next day at the same place. But... Oh, don't tell me. He um, disappointed you... He didn't show up. It's 
It's worse than that. When I went to the place where I was supposed to meet him again, he wasn't there. No, I'm really sorry. No, it's worse than that. The, the place wasn't there either. I beg your pardon. It was a garden in the Latin Quarter. Behind a blue door. But when I went back, there wasn't any blue door. Do you think you, um, you forgot the address or something? Well, I didn't really know the address, but I knew where it was, near an old church. I went right to it, only it wasn't there. I went back quite a few times and looked all over, up one street and down another. But the man was right. There's no blue door in that neighborhood. So I decided to go to Rome. I, I don't know why. Uh, uh, forgive me, but I think this train is getting ready to pull out. Uh, then I saw you here at this table talking to that man. And he's the man from the garden. Really? So if you tell me who he is... I don't know who he is. You don't? No. He just sat down at this table. We exchanged a few pleasantries. He had some coffee. And he left. I've no idea who he is. But he must be on this train somewhere, don't you think? I suppose he is. <laughs> Look, I think we're going to pull out any minute. I don't care. Oh, but what about your train to Rome? What about your luggage? You do have a suitcase or something, don't you? It's on the other train. <laughs> well, don't you think you should... Oh, uh-oh. I'm afraid it's too late. The train started up. It's all right. I don't want to go to Rome anyway. I want to stay right here on this train and go wherever it's going. You mean you don't know? Where is it going? Why, to Venice. Venice. And that's where I'm going. Venice. I'm sure this nice lady thought me very peculiar, to say the least. But she stayed with me long enough to explain how to get into Venice from the train station. The Vaporetto and all that. And then she left. I had some coffee. Then I started walking up and down the train. None of it was any good. The man didn't seem to be on the train at all. And neither did the woman. In Venice, I found a pension to stay at and I started wandering around Venice. Just the way I'd wandered around Paris. In the days... In a dream. And on the third day, near the fish market, I saw it. The blue door. It had a lovely wrought iron handle and I turned it. Not at all surprised that the door wasn't locked. I walked in. And there it was. The beautiful garden. With lilies and roses and geraniums and little gravel walks. And there he was. I knew you'd be here. You did? I had an awful time finding you. I'm sorry. I went back to the blue door in Paris. But it... It wasn't there. What happened to it? I really don't know. I thought I was going to see you again and talk to you. I... I was called away. You've no idea how upset I was. Well, where have you been all of this time? Oh, traveling around here and there. I've had a terrible time finding you. It's a miracle what I found you at all. In Paris, I went back to the blue door the next day and you weren't there. The blue door wasn't even there. I looked all over for it and couldn't find it. It simply wasn't there. I nearly went crazy looking for it. Poor little girl. So I decided to go to Rome. I even bought a ticket. I even got on the train at the Gare de Lyon. I don't know what I thought I'd do in Rome, but I couldn't think of anything else to do. I didn't want to go home, not yet anyway. You'll have to go sometime. I know that, but not yet, not yet. Anyway, while I was sitting in my compartment on the train that was going to take me to Rome, I looked out the window, and on the next track there was a different train. And I saw you in the dining car. So I got off my train. I rushed over to the other one and into the dining car, but you'd gone. Yes. Yeah. So? You'd been sitting at a table for two. With a woman. So? A woman you didn't even know. She told me she didn't even know your name. 
But I stayed on the train anyway when it pulled out. I came to Venice. I don't have any clothes but the ones I've got on. I wandered all over Venice till my feet are sore and I'm so tired. And then, just now I found the blue tour. And you. And so, what now? Well, doesn't it mean anything to you? What should it mean to me? That I love you. Oh. Is that all you're going to say? Just, oh. I really can't think of anything to say but, oh. You could say, you love me back. You could say that. I could, yeah. But I don't think I should. You really must go now. Oh, won't you, won't you even kiss me goodbye? Of course. Once on this cheek. Like that. And once on the other cheek. Like that. I stumbled out of the garden and onto the street. I could hardly see where I was going because my tears were blinding me. By the end of the street, I'd stopped crying. And I turned around and went back. He owed me something, this man. Something besides two brief kisses, one on each cheek. But when I got back to where I'd left him, I might have known it wouldn't be. Perhaps you'll remember that at the beginning of this little tale, I said that to most, if not all of us, life seems one long blind search. What we are listening to here is the long blind search of a young girl named Emily. Just as she thinks the search has come to an end, that the eager, arduous pursuit is over. Things change. Shapes alter. Even people are not as they were. And, as we shall see in Act Three, the search goes on. The world never stands still. Today is not like yesterday. And tomorrow will be different from today. It is not quite true, the ancient French saying, tout ça change, tout c'est la même chose. That is, the more things change, the more they are the same. At least, for each one of us, things are changing all the time. For better or for worse. But never the same. But if things change, why, so do we. I couldn't quite bring myself to go home. Twice now, in Paris and in Venice, I'd found what I was looking for. And both times, I'd lost it. I began to feel like a character in a book or a play or a movie. Not me, myself. But some made-up character going through certain motions, making certain sounds. Strange motions strange sounds. To tell you the truth, I felt not altogether sane. Still, I couldn't go home. Not yet. So, I went to London. I bought some clothes and other things in London. I found myself a nice hotel in the Chelsea district. And then, I did the only natural thing I could think of to do. I called Paul. Emily? Is that you? It's me, all right. (laughs) How are you, Paul? Uh, The operator said London was calling. Well, that's where I am. London. I thought you were in Rome. I was in Venice for a while. Emily, are, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Maybe you should come home. I will. I really will. When? Pretty soon, I think. Listen, I've got a big surprise for you. Guess what it is? You bought the house. You you guess. First try. Emily, you're going to love it. I know you are. Of course, if you don't, uh, well, we'll just have to find another one. 
but I have a feeling you're going to like this one. It's got an upstairs... And a downstairs, and a front door, and a back door, and a dining room just for sitting down and eating in. How'd you know? I just knew. Well, it's uh, got an attic, too, and a cellar. Sounds wonderful. Oh, it is wonderful. And it, it's got a garden, roses and things. Really? Your mother's been working on that. I've been doing things to the house. Emily, come home. I will. I will. When? Soon. Only not right now. Not just yet. Honey, are you, are you all right? I'm all right, yes. I'm all right. It's just that... Are, are, are you crying or something? You sound like you're crying. I'm not crying. I'm not really crying. It's just I, that... I, I'm going to fly over there and get you and bring you back. No, please don't do that. Please don't do that. I, I, I just don't mind telling you. I've been worried about you. So is your mother. We've talked about it. All this traipsing around. I wasn't traipsing around. Well, what would you call what you've been doing? I don't know. Well, whatever you call it, stop it and come home. I will. Soon. I promise? I promise. After I hung up the phone, I found I actually was crying. Not big heaving sobs. Just those quiet little tears that go crawling down your cheeks and into the corners of your mouth. Well, I couldn't have that. So, I washed my face and put on one of my new dresses and went downstairs into the nice cozy lobby. And there she was. The woman from the train to Venice. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. We met on the train, remember? The train to Venice. In the dining car. Yes. I remember you very well. Look, I'm having tea and some of those marvelous little cucumber sandwiches. Why don't you join me? Well, just for a minute. I'll ask for another cup. Have you been here long? A few days. Having any fun? Mostly I've been shopping. I <laughs> I didn't have any clothes when I got here. So. Uh... Oh, that's right. I remember. You left your luggage on the train to Rome. Did you ever find it? I didn't even try to. I... When I got off the train, I looked for you. Really? Actually, I looked for you on the train, too. And later, on the Vaporetto. But I couldn't find you anyplace. I was, um, you might say, occupied. Staying to myself, more or less. I looked for that man, too. The man who was sitting at your table in the dining car. Oh? You were looking for him? I wanted to talk to him. You might say he was occupied, too. Keeping to himself, actually, uh, Actually, he and I were occupied with each other. Really? You told... You told me you didn't even know him. That's true. I... I didn't know him. Didn't even know his name. But remember that little talk you and I had about looking for the absolute right man? How that's what every woman is looking for? Yes, I remember. Was this man... Did it turn out that he really is absolutely the right one for you? Well, I'm not counting any chickens, you understand, but... I understand. I think probably he is. I hope so. I hope I'm the absolutely right woman for him. I'm sure you are. Now I've got to go. I started to wander around the Chelsea district. There were so many darling old houses. Lots of them with gardens. I began to think of Paul. And the house he'd gone ahead and bought. With a front door and a back door. And an upstairs and a downstairs. And a dining room. And I saw it again. The blue door. It was a lighter blue this time. Paler. Cooler. Even a little faded. But I couldn't pass it by. I went up to it. Took hold of the big brass knob. Turned it. And then let it go. 
For the first time, I didn't want to open the blue door and go inside. I turned around and took a taxi cab to the airplane office and bought a ticket for home. I'm so glad. Uh, where's Paul? In the car. He's not supposed to park. So let's hurry up and see about your luggage. Oh, this is it. That dinky thing. Where's your big suitcase? I lost it. Left it on a train. Oh, Emily. <laughs> well, come on. Paul's waiting. Now, tell me, how was it? Did you have a good time? Did you see everything? Did you meet anybody interesting? I met a woman. Quite interesting. I liked her. She was something like you. Come to think of it. Oh, here's Paul. Got himself a brand new car. Paul? As well as a brand new house. Here we are, Paul. I can't wait for you to see the house. I love it. Hi, love. Hi, Paul. Where's your luggage? She's lost it. Now, who wants to sit in the middle? Me. I do. So, hop in. Let's get cracking before I get a ticket. All set. Glad to be back. Yep. Paul, let's drive straight to the new house, okay? Okay with you, Emily? Okay with me. Oh, Emily, you're going to adore it. It's almost 200 years old, but it's in very good condition. Just a few little things that needed to be done to it, and Paul took care of those. Uh, with a little outside help. Oh, now, you did most of it yourself. You know you did. Paul's so handy with tools and things, just like your father. Of course, you don't remember your father, but I've told you, I remember him. I remember him very well. No, darling, you couldn't remember him at all. I know exactly what he looked like. Medium tall with wavy brown hair and blue eyes with dark lashes and a beautiful smile. And of course, you've seen pictures, but you never saw him. I saw him twice. Darling, you couldn't have. Paul, did Emily ever tell you about her father? Well, not much. And there wasn't very much to tell as far as she was concerned. She never knew him. I knew him very well. Oh, darling, please. <laughs> you see, Paul, when they took me to the hospital to bring this sweet child into the world, my husband was already ill. Temperature of 104. Pneumonia. Some strange variety. They didn't respond to antibiotics. No response at all. So, after I had Emily, they brought me home. She was a week old. And I walked up the path to our house with her in my arms, and I heard this tapping on an upstairs window. I, I looked up, and there he was. Your husband? Yes. He'd got out of bed and somehow struggled to the window to catch his first glimpse of his daughter. Heaven knows how he did it, but he did it. He waved, a tired little wave, and blew a kiss. And then the nurse came to the window and led him back to bed. He died the next day. Well, at least he saw her. He waved to her at something. I mean, not much. Not enough, but something. But she could never have seen him. She was only a week old. I saw him twice. No, I don't think you could have seen him the next day, darling. He was quite delirious. His temperature had shot way up. They'd never have let you in the room with him. All the same. Anyway, you were one week old. Your eyes didn't even focus. Where did you meet him originally? In Venice. On a train. Oh, yes. We actually met on the train from Paris to Venice. In the dining car. Yes. Yes. Actually, it was in the dining car. He sat down at your table. That's right, he did. Have I told you all this? He didn't make any impression on you at first. But later. In Venice. No, before that. You looked him up on the train. And you and he spent a lot of time together. Then came Venice. You were absolutely right. Heavens. Your memory is better than mine. Imagine you're remembering all that. It was in Venice that you started to fall in love. But it wasn't till you got to London that you were sure. Hey, we're coming to the house. Oh, yes. See, Emily, the little salt box. See the god, roses and uranium. And look, oh look, a blue door. Paul 
says he and Mother argued a lot about what color he should paint the door. Green or red, maybe, or maybe yellow. Then Paul said no. Blue to match my eyes. Well, it doesn't match my eyes exactly, but it's a lovely color. The same clear blue as the eyes of my father. of you are going to object that a weak old child is not even conscious that a man she will later know as her father even exists. That a new baby is conscious only of a warm, protective female body. And of course, you are right. Nevertheless, as the baby grows, and growing, dreams, especially if the baby is a girl, the dreams will be of a tall, strong man who will one day find her desirable and love her. I'll be back shortly. Others of you may object that our story only dramatizes Maurice Metterling's story of the bluebird of happiness and the search for it, which ended back home where it had been all the time. That we have simply changed the bluebird to a blue door. All right. I'll agree with you, but at least grant me that in any form, under any disguise, the story is a good one and bears telling over and over again. Our cast included Jada Rowland, George Firth, Ann Williams, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dream. Presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Everyone knows, or let us say that most sophisticated people will agree that our soul, or our psyche, or our body, cannot be entered by demons or evil spirits who then proceed to drive us mad. The problem is, every time we begin a sentence with those two words, everyone knows we are already asking for trouble. Face it, Alice. I'll never get another job again. Oh, that's no way to talk. Unless... Unless what, Joe? Unless he forgives me. Unless who forgives you? The... The river. The river? How can a river... Oh, what kind of nonsense? I shouldn't have told you. I should have known you wouldn't understand. Our mystery drama, Troubled Water, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Ralph Bell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The famous Madame de Stahl, who had all the brains in the world, but who wasn't very much to look at, once wrote a letter to a very pretty, mental lightweight named Madame Recamier. I would gladly give one half of the wit with which I am credited for one half of the beauty that you possess. So then, are they mutually exclusive, brains and beauty? 
Who knows? If she could only have one, which would a woman choose? Which do you think she really needs? Yes. Who? Oh, look, uh, tell her I'm in a meeting. Yes. No, 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 I can't do that. Uh, Have her come in and uh, then ring me so I can say I have an important call. Uh, How am I going to get through this? Alice! Alice Carpenter! Hello, Frank. Aren't you going to give your old boss a kiss? (laughs) Are you ever a sight for sore eyes? Sit down. Oh, sit down. You haven't changed a bit in 12 years, Frank. Oh, I have, too. I'm balder, fatter, slower. I I can only play doubles now. Doctor's orders. (laughs) But, oh, you look the same. Pretty as ever. No, no. Prettier. I hardly recognized the place when I came in. Well, I'll have you know... Perkins Construction is big time now. We even have an interior decorator. And, oh, how do you like the English accent on my receptionist, huh? Mm, Yes. It all dates back to that big job that Joe brought in for you ahead of schedule. Way under budget estimate. Where have you and Joe been keeping yourselves? Why, just the other night, Peggy and I, we were talking... Oh, excuse me, dear. Yes. Who? Oh, for crying out loud. All right. Uh, Tell him to hold on. Alice, uh, I have this call from my party chief out on a job in Alaska. I know it'll run for at least an hour. The thing for you to do is uh, have Joe and, well, you and Peggy and me get together for dinner one night, huh? You know, sometime soon. Oh, sure. Sure. Sorry I disturbed you, Frank. I know how busy you are. Oh, but... Never too busy to say hello to an old friend. I said you haven't changed, Frank. When I was your secretary, I would also ring your phone to get you off the hook. That party chief is still having his problems out there in Alaska, isn't he? I'm sorry, Alice. Is he the same one? Alice. As I recall, I invented him. (laughs) That girl outside needs a bit of training. I could tell by the tone in her voice that you really didn't want to see me. Please, Alice. You you know why I'm here. Yes. You have to help Joe. Well, sure, if you need some money. No, no, it hasn't come to that yet. But I'll tell you what it has come to. I am going around to all the people I know in this business. Behind his back, of course. If he knew he'd kill me or he'd kill himself... Maybe both of us. You can't tell me a guy with Joe's ability can't find... Frank, you know the word is out. They say he's lost his nerve. His judgments become erratic. (sighs) A lot of other things. But he can come back. He needs a chance. Give him a job. (sighs) The thing is, I don't have a job for him uh, at this time. You have been running this ad for over a month. Construction Chief Engineer, South America. Alice, this job could kill the man who takes it. It's a malaria-infested jungle. And that's why nobody wants it. But Joe can't afford to be particular. Alice, I'm sorry. Fifteen years ago, Joe's knowledge and skill saved this company. You'd have been out of business. I know, but I can't run this place on sentiment. Be practical. Two years ago... Would you have dared to offer a job like this to a man like Joe? Now you've got him over a barrel. And please don't say I was in here to see you. Listen. Don't make me beg, Frank. All right. Thank you. Come on. I'll take you to lunch. No, it it isn't necessary. You deserve it. You've had a rough morning. (laughs) So did you. Well, were you around noon? I called a few times. Oh, uh, out shopping, one thing and another. Uh, Any luck? Luck? What's luck? We can say with Mr. Emerson that shallow men believe in luck. We can 
also say, with whoever it was that said it, that luck is the residue of desire. Come over here and give the old man a kiss. Oh, Joe. <laughs> it's wonderful to see you in a good mood again. And now, sit down. Oh, I should be starting dinner. We're going out to dinner to celebrate. To, to celebrate? The Great Awakening. But, Joe, what happened? I'm at peace with myself, my darling. Finally. Oh, Joe. This morning I was sitting in the park, wondering where to go next. To whom should I give the opportunity to brush me off today? Darling, that's no way to... <laughs> now, now, now. I started to talk to myself. Joe, I said, you've built highways into the frozen polar wastes, oil refineries in the burning deserts, railroads that climb the towering mountains, and bridges across the raging rivers. There isn't a continent on the face of this earth that doesn't contain a monument to your ability. Now, that is good, positive thinking. But, Joe, I said, you're through. They don't want to know about all the successes... I just want to talk about the one big failure. Oh, Joe. The bridge. The railroad bridge over the Uria River, south of the Punjab. Fifteen killed, fifty injured. Thirty million dollars down the drain. You're through, Joe. No one will ever trust you with an important project to I get. won't have any more kind of talk like that, now, Joe. Sometimes a woman has to understand that her husband isn't going to be a winner. I've come to the end of the line. And this is the great awakening? This is how you're at peace with yourself? Yes. By accepting the fact that no one will ever give you a job again? I may get another job. Oh. oh. When? When he has decided to forgive me. What? What did you say? Now I'm going to find out if you're really my wife. If? After 15 years. You've never been tested before. Tested? I froze with you in Alaska. I almost died of thirst in the Sahara. I need you now, Alice. I need you to help me. Of course. I want to help you. Not your way. My way. Any way. Name it. I want you to accept what I'm going to tell you. I don't want you to fight it. I've been living with that bridge over the Uria... If you could just put it out of your mind. I keep saying how. Why? I did everything right. I know I did. What did I forget? What did I overlook? And then I remembered. I remembered. What? You had come up from Benares to join me. Remember? Oh, yes. It was the weekend before. Yes. Remember how beautiful, how peaceful the camp was? Mm -hmm. The work gang had just finished supper. They were celebrating some kind of holy night. Mm -hmm. There was dancing. And then she appeared. Suddenly. Out of nowhere. Do you remember? Oh, I remember. A blind old beggar lady. Oh, no. She was Hunifa, the sorceress. Hunifa, the witch. All right, dear. Do you remember she wore a headdress and necklaces and bracelets, all made of gold and silver coins? Mm, I think so. You could hear them rustle and jingle every time she moved. Her voice. Can you ever forget her voice? Sahib... I am Honey. Art thou hungry, mother? Go then to the cook fires and say that Carpenter Sahib orders that food be given thee. I am Honey. I'm maiden to all the gods and high priestess to the spirit of the Uya River. The Sahib has come from across the black ocean. To build this bridge across the waters of the Uya. Is this true? This is true. With whose permission? The government. The government can but give authorization. But permission is granted only by the spirit of the river. 
The Sahib must ask for it. Very well, Hudifa. I ask. This should have been asked at the beginning. I'm sure, but Sahibs have many concerns. It must now be asked at a ceremony. A ceremony? Before all the people to show that the spirit of the river must be obeyed. But I cannot do that. I cannot officially support this kind of superstition. The spirit of the river demands it. Hear, O Sahib, gather the people now and go to the riverbank and ask forgiveness. Now, Hunifa... Or thou shalt be punished, Sahib. Punished? A curse shall be leveled against thee, and at the hour of noon tomorrow, the bridge will fall. How can the bridge fall? It's concrete and steel. The bridge will fall, and you shall be cursed. No, you know it can't happen. At noon, tomorrow, the bridge will fall. He has spoken. The spirit of the river has spoken through me. His high priestess, who At noon, the bridge fell. Oh, Joe. It fell. Oh, please. Please, when you talk like this. And so, this afternoon, I sat in that park. I prayed. You know to whom I prayed? I'm afraid to hear. I prayed to the spirit of the river. And I felt it was not just the spirit of the Uriya River in India, but the... The spirit of all the rivers in the world. I prayed for the spirit to forgive me. Perhaps you should see a doctor. I prayed. And suddenly I heard a tinkling. The jingling sound of her coins and jewels. And saw her standing in front of me. In the park? Yes. You mean she, she was there and... No one else saw her? I didn't say she was there. I said I saw her. Does the sahib repent the sin? Oh, yes. Yes, I repent. Does the sahib believe in the spirit of the river? Yes. No. The sahib wishes to believe. He must try harder. He must give himself completely. He must allow the spirit of the river to fill his body and soul. Yes, yes. And at the moment when the sahib truly believes, the curse shall be lifted. I believe, Hunifa, I believe. Oh, Joe, you can't do this to yourself. I believe completely. Don't give way. Don't yield to ignorant superstition. There is no spirit of the river. Hanifa, tell him I believe. I believe. Hello? Joe? Uh, yes, uh, who is it? It's me, Frank. Frank? It's been such a long time. Uh, look, Joe, are you working? Working? How would you like to save my life? I've got a job here, a real tough one, but your style. Uh, a j job? Look, why don't we talk about it tomorrow at lunch, huh? You want to pick me up at, say, 1230. I'll see you. Yeah, uh, Frank. Yeah, see ya. Well, Alice... What do you say now? What do you say? One of the most effective devices in storytelling is the pause. If one picture is worth a thousand words, one pause can be worth a thousand pictures. 
And while Alice is pausing to try to give Joe an answer, we shall pause for the short intermission that must precede Act Two. What is superstition? Very often, it may turn out to be the next person's devoutly held belief. We royal dangerous waters when we erect our own orthodoxy as a platform for everyone. And we may become embroiled in a deadly game that any number can play. What do you say now, Alice? I was cursed by the spirit of the river. No. And no one wanted to give me a job. I prayed to the spirit of the river for forgiveness. I said, please lift the curse. And what happened? Frank offered me a job. That is superstition. That is not why you got the job. It isn't? Can you suggest another reason? No. No, I guess I can't. Got a minute, Frank. For you? Of course, Alice. Sit down. I want to thank you for giving Joe the job. I agreed to, didn't I? The way you did it made him think he was doing you a favor. Oh, forget it. If he ever found out that I... He he mustn't, Frank. I understand. Thanks again. Alice, that bridge in India, I've been thinking about it. It could have collapsed for reasons that had nothing to do with Joe's ability. Well, what are you saying? Well, being fair, he wasn't responsible for the original design. He may have been victimized by crooked contractors. There was political opposition to the thing. He could have been sabotaged. Thanks for saying all that, too, Frank. I believe in Joe. I'll prove it. You already did. You gave him a job. I'm going to trust him with my only son. Frank Jr. just graduated from Caltech. That little boy? Oh, top man in his class. The fact is, he's a genius. Is the job you're putting Joe on... A job for a youngster without experience? Well, he can learn a lot from Joe. Then he'll pull his own weight. Well, Frank, you're the boss. No, Joe's the boss. But Alice, how'd you like to use your influence? I'd rather not. But you do need another man. You're not being swamped with applications. You could get by with a junior. Yeah, but uh, not Frank's kid. Why not, Joe? Maybe I'm scared. Of what? I don't know. Of everything. If I fail, I... Oh, you can't talk like that. I don't want to discuss it. But I thought that according to your evaluation of this thing, you've been forgiven. Yes, but he's a jealous spirit, this spirit of the river. Suppose he... Turns on me again. Oh, Joe. The job is for an oil company. They have to build a railroad through the jungle. You built railroads Yes, before? sure, but at one point I have to build a bridge across a river. What will I do? If, if, if... if what? If the spirit says no. Do you want to resign? No. You have a lot of paperwork to get through. I told Frank to hire a secretary for me. And I told him I would take the job. Alice, I don't want you. And I'll also be going to Brazil with you. This time I say no. Why do you always start these arguments? You never win them. I'll also call young Mr. Frank Perkins Jr. and tell him to be at your office at one shop. Hi there. I'm Frank Perkins, Jr. Uh, Joe Carpenter in? Frank Perkins, Jr. is here. I'll be right out. And, um, who are you? I'm Alice Carpenter, Joe's wife. Oh, very interesting. Your first job? Oh, I could have caught on in a lot of places for much more money. Oh, really? Yeah, you should see some of the top outfits that wanted me. But the old gent said this would be a great experience. I'm, uh, Joe Carpenter. Oh, hi there. I give him the uh, personnel forms to take to Harry Wilson's secretary. She's just on the hall to your right. No, I know where she is. It's, uh, ten after two. 
Weren't you supposed to be here at one? Hey, I was here 15 minutes early, but uh, I met Harry Wilson's secretary, and we started talking, and before you knew it, uh, well, I took her to lunch. Well, um, get those forms over there right away. All right, oh, Chief. Joe. What's the matter? Why didn't you let that kid have it? I've got too many more important problems on my mind. What's more important than letting everybody know who's boss on this project? You never let anyone get away with that kind of attitude before. Where's my materials list? You still haven't told me, Joe. What is the matter? Nothing's the matter. Hello. Oh, it's you. It's Joe around. He's over at a steel mill in Branchville. They've got a new alloy he wants to look at. You're working late, aren't you? Well, there's a lot to do. Just about dinner time. Oh, thanks for reminding me. I'll send out for a sandwich. Uh, look, um, I got a better idea. Have dinner with me. No, thanks. I told Joe I'd meet him here at the office. I could have you back in time. Junior, I am Joe's wife. <laughs> what does that mean? Only that he saw you first. Do you realize we're leaving for Brazil the day after tomorrow? Don't you have things to do? Well, sure. But, uh, I'd rather have dinner with you. I'll go ahead. I'll go, sure, sure. <laughs> Pretend to be busy. But in the long run, uh, everyone must surrender to my fabulous charms. Good night, Junior. to turn in, Joe. It's almost midnight. I have to check through these schedules. You go to the tent. I'll be there in a while. Oh, please. Don't stay up too late. Now, don't uh, forget your mosquito netting. No, I won't. Hi there. Oh, hello, Junior. Oh, look, you just call me that because you think it will keep me in my place. Can't you sleep either? I was in the operations tent with Joe. <laughs> Listen. How can those natives swing a pick and shovel all to him dance all night? They don't have too many worries, I suppose. Good night. Uh, must you go? You don't uh, get to see a moon like that one back home. How do you like the job so far? I never talk shop after the day's work is done. Especially with a beautiful woman. I'm glad you came along? I'm glad you came along. Well, this is about as far as I can go. Joe's decided to keep the permanent base here. You'll be moving into the jungle in a few days. And you're going to stay here alone? No, the supply clerks will be here. The repair shop, the dispensary. You have quite a little group. I think I'll ask Joe to assign me here as a bodyguard for you. You won't learn much engineering that way. I'm not learning an awful lot now. What do you mean? Well, let's go down to the campfire, huh? No. Watch the dancing? No, thanks. I'd better turn in. Uh, oh, well. The job's going to last at least two years. I can wait. Joe, what... Yeah? What time is it? It's quarter four in the morning. Oh. You can't sleep either? It always takes me a while to settle in on a job. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Junior. Yeah? You know, he's a bright boy. I'm beginning to have my doubts. No, oh, I admit he's a bit brash. Yes, but, uh... All right, what about it? Well, he... He said he wasn't learning much on this job. Oh? Is he complaining? No, it just happened to come out. I uh, guess he really isn't. Seems to me that you're going around in circles... Getting this job off the ground. You're two weeks behind schedule now. I'm being very careful, Alice. Yes, yes, I can understand that. And another thing, let me worry about the job, huh? Yes, dear. And now, let's get some sleep. Junior, tell the foreman to knock his crew off with the child. Sure. Hey, Pedro, time to manjar. Joe? 
Alice, what are you doing here? Well, this jeep was back at the base and no one was using it. Why did you come here? You know that I distinctly said... Dr. Joe, it's the 14th. What about it? You haven't started on the bridge. I know that. The support should have been in already. Alice. You're stalling. It's the same kind of bridge. And look at the river. It's just like the Uya. Why are you stalling, Joe? Alice. I... I prayed. Oh, Joe, be sensible. I prayed every day since we arrived here. For what? For permission to build the bridge. The spirit of the river has to grant me leave to build the bridge. I refuse to believe that. I didn't get his permission last time. You know what happened. I won't go through that again. You're stalling. Call it that, all right. Call it anything you like. But I need permission. I won't sink that first foundation until I get permission. But you cannot stall indefinitely. It doesn't have to be indefinitely. In a little while, the rainy season starts. And I can knock off for at least five months. That'll give me time. Joe, your design is sound. Yes, that's what I thought last time. No, Alice, I'm praying for permission. So far, it hasn't been granted. I'll wait. There's another way to look at it. No, there isn't. I floundered the spirit last time I was punished. I prayed for forgiveness. And then suddenly I was hired for a job. But that... That could have been... Yes? A a coincidence. You don't really believe that. You've lost your judgment. And you're using this, this... This whole business with the spirit of the river and this old Indian witch just as a cover-up. Now, don't say that. You can't face the bridge. Don't do this to me. Don't weaken my belief, my faith. The spirit doesn't answer me because my commitment isn't complete. Help me, Alice. Help me to believe again. remarkable what a wife may be asked to do in, well, call it the line of duty. Ladies, how might you react if your husband asked you to help him believe in something called the spirit of the river, which rules every body of water in the world? The heroines on our show are constantly blazing new trails, aren't they? And this one leads right into Act Three. Mr. Browning says, Our interests on the dangerous edge of things, the honest thief, the religious atheist, the tender murderer, everything it would seem carries within itself the seeds of its own contradiction, positive, negative. These are two sides of the same emotion. Help me, Alice. I can't help you destroy yourself with superstitious nonsense. You have to go back to the base camp. I brought the big tent, Joe. It's in the Jeep. Well, look who's here. Are you staying a while? She's on her way back to the base. This is no place for a woman. I am not that fragile. I don't want you here, Alice. But, Joe, I... Junior, tell Jose I want one of his best men over here on the double. He's to take my 404 rifle and drive Mrs. Carpenter back to the base. Uh, Joe, um, why don't you let me take her back? You... Why not? I can handle a 404 rifle. All right. It isn't as though you're any use to me around here anyhow. Why don't you let me take you away from all this, Alice? You're almost 15 years younger than I am. I've always been fascinated by older women. I happen to love my husband. Yeah... You know, Joe was a lot like you when he was your age. You'll settle down, too. Mm. Joe, huh? What's the matter? Does he actually think he's ever going to finish this job? What do you mean? Well, I might have said too much. You might as well say the rest of it. Okay. I'm supposed to learn from this guy, but he hasn't shown me a thing. Well, yeah, he's shown me a lot of inefficiency and waste. And he's always leaning on Tompkins and Connolly. Okay, they're competent engineers, but neither of them's a ball of fire. I see. You know, the bad part is, 
everybody's wise to Joe by now. Even the native laborers sense it. So everybody's stalling on the job. But what's Joe doing? Search me. I can't figure him out. They say he used to be a great engineer. He's still a great engineer. Okay. Stop. Stop right here. What? Uh, pull into this clearing and turn around. We're going back to Joe. <laughs> Sending you back to the base is the first smart thing Joe's done on this job. The place isn't safe back Turn there. this thing around. But Joe said Forget that I... Forget what Joe said. Somebody has to give orders around here. <laughs> And that's all there is to it. Go ahead, Pedro, and do as Mrs. Carpenter says. I see all the materials are here for the bridge support. Yes. So, what are you waiting for? Let's not start that again, Alice. I'd like to finish it. It isn't something we can argue about. It's a matter of belief. Superstition. Look, look, down there, by those bulldozers. Frank Perkins, Jr., what about Frank Perkins, Jr.? What do you suppose he would think if he knew what we were talking about? I'm not interested in what Junior thinks. Well, for that matter, what would any intelligent person think? If you're going to stay here, just don't get in my way. All right. But I still say you could start the bridge. Listen. Did you hear that? Yes. It was thunder. It was more than just thunder. It means the rainy season's about to start. We couldn't begin work on the bridge now, no matter what. Relieved, aren't you? Now I can get away from the river. We'll go to the high ground on the other side. We'll start that end of the job. It could be another year before I have to face that bridge. Jose, get the men ready to break camp. Hey. What are we doing, Joe? Isn't it obvious we're suspending operations? Well, that's what Tompkins told me. I can't believe it. Why not? Well, because the schedule calls for getting in the bridge supports. Obviously, we can't keep that schedule. The rainy season's starting early. We could still do it. It's my judgment and my decision to suspend operations now. Where'd you go? I suppose so. I'll have Pedro take down the tent. Just because some old... I guess I can call her an old hustler in the swindler sense of the word. Alice, I don't want to hear anymore. Just because she sold you a bill of goods about some spirit of the river. I was under the impression that a man and his wife were one flesh, one spirit, one mind. I see now that I was wrong. No, you weren't. I suppose everyone has to have a special private place which can't be shared or even understood by anyone else. It's your imagination. Oh. If only I could somehow prove you were wrong. Goodbye, Junior. Yeah, goodbye. I wish you weren't in love with him. <laughs> Sometimes I wish the same thing. Hey, with everybody gone, we could have a great time out here. Oh, listen, Junior. In a couple of years, I'm going to be an old lady. You'll never be an old lady, Alice. And you'll still be a boy. You know, that's your problem. You look at me as if I were a kid. Well, aren't you? Being a man isn't a question of how old you are. It isn't? It's a question of how you stand up to responsibility. And you know what I'm talking about. If I were chief here, those bridge supports would be going in right now. I'd show you, Alice. Junior, we're all set. Yeah. You'll be responsible for breaking camp. It shouldn't take you a week to weatherproof what has to be left. Get the rest of the stuff packed for shipment. Okay, Chief. See you back at the base camp. Goodbye, Junior. Goodbye, Alice. Listen to that rain. It can go on like that for months. Shouldn't Junior have been back here by now? Yeah, he's a couple of days late. Could something be wrong? Well, could have been delayed. He had a lot to do back there. Where are you going? Out for a ride. In this rain? Well, the jeep's covered. But well, where would you want to go? I just want to go, that's all. Junior! Alice. I was worried about you, so... Oh, the bridge! Yeah. I figured I could get a good piece of it up. But Joe ordered you to be... I did it because I wanted to prove something to you. I didn't know it could rain like this. 
Yeah, Alice, I, I, I'm in trouble. The, the river's rising too quickly. My foundations will be washed oh, away. Oh, Junior. Look, I, I was wrong, Alice. I, I'm in a jam. I, I, I disobeyed orders, and all the material, I could be ruined for life. Get Joe, Alice. But what can Joe do for you now? I don't know. Maybe he can think of something. Please get him. Go get Joe. Alice, what have you got to say now? There is a spirit of the river. And nothing may be done without his permission. And if that sounds like black magic out of the Middle Ages, make the most of it. Joe, the boy's in a jam. And who got him into it? You did. Me? Yes. My eyes are open. I saw how you flirted with him, flattered his vanity, boosted his ego. That isn't true. Did you or did you not give him to understand that he could rise in your estimation if he started that bridge? Why would I do that? To prove something to me about my so-called superstitions? I didn't. Oh, Joe, what's the difference now? If the structure's washed away, millions of dollars are down the drain. He made his decision. He'll be ruined. No one will ever give him another job. He doesn't have to worry. His father owns the business. He'll put him in another job. How do you think he got this one? How do you think you did? Because some old bag fed you some mumbo-jumbo about the spirit of the river? You simply cannot accept the facts. And you don't know what the facts are. Maybe Junior's father did get him his job. But your wife got you yours. What are you talking about? The spirit of the river accepted You'd my prayer. You'd still be home waiting for that spirit of the river if I hadn't swallowed every ounce of pride, humbled myself, and begged Frank Perkins to hire you. Everyone said you were washed up. Maybe they were right. Maybe you need this nonsense to justify yourself. Stay here. Where are you going? <laughs> Joe, I, I shouldn't have done it. Of all the stupid... I'm in a jam. You deserve to be for trying to show me up. Oh, chew him out later. The river must be rising over a foot an hour. All right. I always had a plan for what I would do if I started building and the rains caught me. You throw a dam to block the rapids three miles upstream. How do you know? Who told you? You did, Joe. You've been so upset about this job, you've been talking about it in your sleep. Joe... Get me out of it. We're going to blow a piece of that cliff just above the rapids. The debris will slow down the water. How many men have you still got? Um, close to 50. Have them get to work on sandbags. Then we'll load the motorboat with TNT. You'll come with me and cut fuses. But you can't ride in a boat filled with explosives in this kind of storm. How else can we get there? rising anymore. It is, but not enough to hurt us. I was so nervous till I heard the dynamite. And then I was so scared till you got back. It'll be all right now. Everything will hold. Joe, you must be angry with me. What for? Because of what I told you about my going to Frank, about the job. Yeah. I thought about it for a bit. I had to do it, Joe. Just to prove that this spirit of the river thing was a phony. And now you're sure? Well, you saw what happened? How do you know, for the sake of argument, how do you know that it wasn't the spirit of the river that made you go to Frank? Maybe that's the way the spirit works. Oh, Joe, I... I asked the spirit of the river for a sign to set the bridge... But what would such a sign be? What did I expect? Well? I don't know. Maybe the spirit of the river made you work on Junior to disobey orders so that I would have to bail him out. Maybe that was the sign. Do you really believe that, Joe? When you're in the middle of civilization, you believe one thing. But when you're out in a jungle, or desert, or desolate mountain range, there's nothing but you and nature. You believe a little bit of everything. Isn't 
that just about the way it is for most people? Don't most of us believe a little of this and a little of that? Don't we try to hedge our bets? Maybe we aren't superstitious, but we still avoid black cats and walking under ladders and all unnecessary activity on Friday the 13th. And who refuses the gift of a four-leaf clover? I may have a gift of sorts for you when I return. said, where knowledge ends, faith begins. That would seem to tie it up neatly, but what is knowledge, and what is faith? There are those who insist that knowledge consists of having faith in one's facts. If you can't solve this problem to your own satisfaction, be comforted by the thought that it has troubled the world's greatest minds since the beginning of time. And the answer is still nowhere in sight. Our cast included Ralph Bell, E.V. Jester, and Bob Caliban. The entire production is under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. There's a famous, if ancient, phrase... Written by the Latin poet Virgil, Timeo Danaos Dona Ferentes. Translation, Beware the Greeks Bearing Gifts. This would seem to contradict another, perhaps older saw, Never Look a Gift Horse in the Mouth. The story I bring you relates to both of these, but in the end, you will have to decide which is closer to the truth. What's that? It's the burglar alarms, Nancy. Where are you going? To turn off that racket. Oh, no, you're not. The alarms didn't go off by themselves, Ted. What have you got to protect yourself with if... if there's actually someone else in the house? Our mystery drama, The Gift House was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Joyce Gordon and Paul Hecht. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Until six months ago, she was one of the lucky ones. Her name was Nancy Ryan. She had come from the Midwest to conquer the theater and miraculously landed in the chorus of a top hit as a dancer. She thought then she was pretty lucky. Then she met Ted Pryor, a reporter for the New York World Sun, and having married him, knew she was the luckiest girl in the world. Three months after they were married and her pregnancy was confirmed, she had no doubt that the whole world was her oyster. Then life decided to redress the balance. What? Oh, where, where are we? Oh, uh, turn it off, Ted. What? The alarm, honey. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Mm. I love you. Good morning. I love you, too, but... Oh, dear. What is it? Oh, same old morning problem. It comes with being pregnant. I'll see you later. Oh, Nancy, what have I done to you? 
And what are you going to do when you hear the bad news? Feel better, honey? Mm, no problems. It's the way girls are built. The baby's great. Well, that's good. Come here. Mm. Ah, that's nice. Oh, let's snooze a little, huh? Oh, Ted, we can't. You'll be late at the paper. Oh, uh, that's all right. They're, uh, they're not expecting me this morning. What? what who? Oh, where? Oh, it's not the alarm this time, darling. It's the phone, dummy. Here, I'll get it. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay, I have it. Hello? Good morning. I trust I didn't disturb you. No, no, no. That's that's all right. Um, uh, who who is this? Well, my name is G. Wellington Montgomery. I am uh, a solicitor. Would I be talking to Mr. Edward Pryor? Um, yeah, yeah. This is Ted Pryor. Well, happy to make your acquaintance. But actually, I I think it's your wife I wish to speak with. Was she the former Nancy Ryan? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. From Ponca City, Oklahoma. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Nancy Evans, right? Uh, no, no, wait, wait a minute. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, w- w- what is all this about? Well, I think perhaps it would be better if I talk to your wife directly. I may have some information for her that would be greatly to her benefit. Yes, Mr. Montgomery, I understand. Oh, I certainly will. Just let me talk it over with my husband. Oh, of course. I'll get back to you as soon as I can and let you know our plans. Thank you. Well, can I know just what this is all about? Well, but didn't you hear? Well, yes, yeah, some uncle of yours or relative or whatever he was died and uh, left you something. That's or... right. Oh, I forgot he was even around. He was a cousin or something of my mother's. I never even met him. But, honey, he's left me everything as his sole heir. What's everything? Well, just an old house, I guess. Mr. Montgomery said there was only a couple of hundred dollars in cash. Well, where is the house? Cookuntuck. How's that again? Cookuntuck. It's an Indian name. Oh. It's not that far away. It's right out on Long Island near Bontor. Is that where this Montgomery lawyer is at? Yes. I mean, he lives in Montauk. Oh. So, uh, what happens now? Well... There are papers to sign, giving us title to the house and all that. And once that's all cleared away, it's ours to do whatever we want with. Uh, Yeah, Uh, yours. Well, what what do you mean mine? Everything we have, we share. Yeah, Uh, well, uh, that's the trouble. What do you mean, Ted? I, um, I haven't anything to share as of now. Honey, I still don't understand. No, of course you don't. You see, um... Uh, you see, darling, I um, I don't have a job. I, I I mean, I haven't had one for almost two weeks. <gasps> the paper fired you? Well, it's just that circulation's fallen off. <laughs> Last in, first out. That was me. I mean, how do we swing this apartment with no one working? Afford a baby and come up roses. I think we better do what the lawyer suggested. Like what? Like, rather than try to do all this by mail... We drive out to Kokantuk and take a look at the house I inherited. Sure. Great. What are we driving? Well, a rental car. Okay, honey. Pack your fancy duds. We're on our way. Hey, this is the life, eh? Oh, Ted, it's beautiful. Ah, too bad it isn't real summer. Well, it's Indian summer. That's even better. Just look at all the trees. Mm. They're a riot of color. Uh Uh-oh. What is it? Looks like your color is going to be blotted out. Patches of fog ahead. Oh, dear. I hope it doesn't get any thicker. Where are we now? Well, we just went through Amagansett. We should be there in half an hour. Oh. What's wrong, honey? Oh, I I don't know. You cold? You want me to uh, roll up the window? No. No, I'm not cold. It's just... Just what? My mother used to call it a ghost walking over your grave. Oh, Ted, I I just had this nutty premonition we shouldn't go any further. We should turn back and run. Without even seeing the house? Well, I I told you it was nutty. (laughs) I guess 
she'll just have to excuse a pregnant old lady. Well, I certainly am grateful the fog lifted. Now you can see the house Chris left you. Oh, well, I'm grateful too, Mr. Montgomery. Um, what do you think, Dad? Well, it's bigger than I thought. <laughs> Sure is a screwball joint, though. Oh, but honey, it has a quaint and, I don't know, individual charm. <laughs> you could say that, all right, Mrs. Pryor. Individual. Why, Chris built this house up from the ground with his own hands. Excepting for the help he got from Pete Prouty and old Amos Scobie, rest his soul. Uh, are they dead, too? Like my uncle? Oh, Ed Scobie died 30 years ago, maybe. But Pete Prouty's still spry. Wasn't my Uncle Chris ever married? Oh, 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 oh. he was married, all right. Sourest apple ever came out of the barrel. Never would live in this house with him, hold up in a little apartment she had in Montauk. Made him stay there with her. You mean he never used the house? Oh, he used it, all right. Excuse to get away from her. I'd say Chris Evans spent the better part of 40 years building this house just so he could be with his cronies and a jug of wine to keep from remembering he was married to the sorriest excuse for a woman the good Lord ever devised. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry, my dear. I, I'm afraid I'm not giving your house a very good name. Oh, I don't know. I think my uncle had good reason to love it. There must be a magnificent view from the cliff here when it's not foggy. All the way to Portugal, Europe. It's like another world. Hey, look down there, Nancy. There's a nice little sandy beach. Mm. It's good for swimming because it's sheltered from the big Atlantic seas. And a fine natural harbor. Chris used to move a catboat down there. And he... Uh-oh. There's something wrong, Mr. Montgomery? Yes, wind shifted. It'll bring the fog back. Besides, it's after sunset and the light goes fast these four days. If you want to see anything in this house of yours, we'd better get on with it. Hey, is that a is that a car in the garage there? Yeah, that's uh, Chris's old Packard station wagon. Runs like a dream. <laughs> or at least it did up to the day he died. Well, is that part of my inheritance? Sure is. Now, uh, we'll have to go around the side of the house. The front door's on the lee side. Okay. Hey, isn't that a kitchen door right next to the garage? That's what it is. But uh, we can't get in that way. <laughs> it looks as though you have enough keys there to open everything. <laughs> I surely do. But there's only one that's important. This fella. <laughs> <laughs> what a funny, fat little key. What's it for? Burglar alarm. Burglar alarm? You have many robberies around here? Oh, not so you notice. Nobody's got that much to steal. <laughs> but Chris, he's... He's not only got one system, but two... A backup in case the first one fails. Well, what was he afraid someone might be after? And if you ask me, I think he put him in to keep his wife out. <laughs> I don't think he ever used them after she up and died. Well, here we are. That's the alarm. And now for the door. I was the one who put the alarms back on while the house was standing empty, just in case. <laughs> now, now, watch your step. Mm -hmm. It's kind of dark here in the hall. Uh, living room's to the left. Uh, I'll get some light. Oh, shakes a oh, What's happened? The whole room is torn apart. Somebody was sure looking for something. Well, it looks as if a hurricane went through here. Yeah. What about the rest of the house? We'd better have a look. Modified at all the damage. Fortunately, there is some insurance. I'll get busy on that first thing in the morning. Yeah, what I'd like to know is that what whoever it was was looking for must have been something pretty valuable. Oh, couldn't have been anything like that. I've handled Chris Evans' affairs all my life. And I tell you, he was a man who lived up to every penny he made. And to that, he never made much more than pennies. Well, then why would anyone have done all this damage? Well, that's what I said from the first. I don't know what young people are coming to these days. Vandalism. Sheer vandalism. But uh, that's beside the point for the moment. First things first. Now, uh, obviously, you can't stay here tonight as oh, you planned. Of course so... we can stay here. The place is a shambles, Nan. Well, darling, the big bedroom with the foam mattress, that's not damaged too badly. And there are plenty of sheets, I saw. We have all the food we brought along in the cooler, and there's even some instant coffee in the kitchen. We'll make out. 
Well, now, if you're sure... Oh, of course I am. Uh, Mr. Cryer? Whatever Nancy wants, Nancy gets. Well, then, that fog's getting pretty thick. Might be a good idea for you to stay put. <laughs> well, I'll be in my office all tomorrow morning. I'll wait for you to get in touch with me. Goodbye now. <laughs> It's the alarms. Well, well, where are you going? I'm going to turn off that racket. Oh, no, you're not. Are you crazy? You've got nothing to defend yourself with. Those alarms didn't go off by themselves, Ted. There's someone else in the house. Which one of us has not wakened at some time in the middle of the night to that gagging feeling of the heart in the throat and the spine-chilling belief that an intruder was violating the privacy of our home. It never turns out to be true, of course, or seldom, but just suppose one time it did. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Whatever present or imagined terror might be stalking the house, there was a point at which even Nancy had to agree with Ted that the awful jangle and scream of the burglar alarms simply had to be stilled. Once Ted armed himself with a heavy wrought iron doorstop, Nancy was persuaded to allow him to go downstairs and turn them off. It just doesn't figure, Nancy. What, Ted? The two of us have checked every window, every door, every contact in the house, and everything is sewed up tight. What could have set off the alarm? Well, couldn't it have, you know, short-circuited? Well, possibly. Except after I turned it off, I, I flicked it back on and, and it was operating fine. Well, what does that mean? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a speck of dust, a, a leak, a bird flew against the window too hard. I don't know. I, I don't want to speculate on anything else. Oh, Ted, you mean like someone really tried to break in? Well, if he did, he didn't make it. We've searched this house from top to bottom. We know there's only the two of us. Well, now what do we do? Well, we have no phone to call for help, but well, we do have a nice stout bolt on the inside of our bedroom door. <laughs> yeah, let's go crawl back into bed. Hmm? Lock the door, pull the covers over our head, and cross our fingers we can get what's left of a good night's sleep. coffee, Ted. Well, the coffee will do. How about us? Well, I'm still trying to think it through. What's wrong with this house? Uh, you got me. But something's off the beam. You know, I think we should bail out, get back to New York, put it up for sale. Oh, in this condition, who would buy it? But it isn't only that. Just think what we could make of this place, honey, given a little time. You'd want to live here? Well, just till the baby comes and I can get back to work. It would solve our financial bind. <gasps> What's that? Relax, honey. This time it's someone who's asking to come in. It's, it's the front doorbell. Oh. Now, stay where you are. I'll get it. Morning. Name's Prouty. Peter Prouty. I'm the nearest neighbor right down the hill. Oh, good morning, Mr. Prouty. I'm, uh, I'm Ted Pryor. I saw you drive up last evening with that lawyer fellow from Montauk. Uh, Montgomery? You fixing to buy this place? Um, well, well, no, not not exactly. My, um, my wife inherited it. From Chris Evans? Yeah, I didn't know he had any relatives. You, you knew Mr. Evans? All my life. Me and him is just like that. Uh, so, no wonder the place was not for sale. You, uh, thinking of selling? Why, well, uh, I don't know. We, we just got here. Well, I got some worried last night when I heard the alarms go off. They got my shotgun, came up the hill, but then the noise stopped. And then I just checked you out this morning. All right? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I don't know what happened to the alarm system. Maybe some animals set it off. It's kind of weird. Uh, a lot of weird things been happening up here since Chris passed on. I don't understand, well, anyway, would you uh, would you care to come in and uh, meet my wife? Perhaps join us in a cup of coffee. There, 
There are some questions you might be able to answer for us. And in spite of all the damage, you don't believe that someone broke in here? No, no, I, I don't. Well, now, how can you say that when you see the mess? What I think is maybe someone tried to get out. Get out? Who? Uh, ghost. Ghosts, maybe. <laughs> That's all we need now to find out that this place is haunted. Oh, I don't believe in ghosts. There isn't a matter of believing or not, little lady. This one just is. Maybe old Chris himself, too. What do you mean, just is? Martha, his wife. She come a whiffling and a snuffling around here three years back. The anniversary of her death, it was. In the fog. We had a real pea super that weekend. All you could do was see the nose in front of your face. Like last night. <laughs> Bless you. It was just a whisk. The real ones wrap around you like a blanket. Uh, maybe a shroud. Anyways, that Saturday night, Chris and me was sitting right here at this kitchen table playing casino. When... <laughs> What was that? You didn't think you'd get away from me. You didn't think you'd get away. That, 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 that's Martha. No, it can't be Martha. She's dead. But not peaceful in the grave. Uh, where, where is she? I, I can't see her. Is she... Is she a, a ghost? Why not? She she haunted me all her life. Why shouldn't she now? She's she's dead. I'll haunt you till you're buried. You and your cheap women. You stole my pride. You stole my life. But I will have my revenge. Stop her, Pete. Hold her back. I can't. I, I don't see her. Where? There. With, with the knife in her hand. Look out. Die. Next time I'll get you. Next time. She, she tried to kill me. Oh, don't talk nonsense. There was no one here but us. Huh? If there wasn't, what's that? Driven into the wall. Halfway up to the haft. It was the big kitchen knife from Martha's old apartment in Montauk. Still vibrating from the force that drove it deep into the paneling. But you didn't actually see this ghost. No, not that time. But other times I saw her floating in the mist. Her hair hanging down her back. And nights when the fog would blow in, I'd hear her voice on the wind. And see the lights dimly. Flashing from room to room till Chris would come up pelting down the hill to my place to hide. He put in the alarms to try to shut her out, but it didn't do any good. How did Martha, uh, Mrs. Evans, die? In her bed. Of what? Uh, heart congestion, they called it. She was all alone? Yeah. Well, where was Uncle Chris? A lucky thing for him, the fog was so heavy that night. He stayed over with me. Else he might have been accused of helping her along. Although no one would have blamed him if he had. But he was with you all that night. And that's what I told the police. And Chris, my uncle, how did he die? He cut his throat. Or oh, had it cut for him. Oh, good heavens. What a lot of bosh. Peter Prouty is the town drunk, and he's a bigger gossip than most women. Well, then how did Uncle Chris die? Well, now, I, I'm afraid there's some truth to the bloody details. I, I must confess to you that Chris was always eccentric. But during his last years, he had crossed the border into senility. The uh, drinking didn't help. He and Pete were always a few sheets to the wind. And the Lord knows what wild fancies they hallucinated between them. But you still haven't told me how he died. Well, I'm, uh, I'm afraid he cut his wrist, my dear. Oh. So no one could have been responsible for his death except himself. That's right. 
And his wife? Oh, she outlived all our expectations. She had a very bad heart for years. Well, that's a relief. And you say, Mr. Montgomery, you've checked with the insurance and the damage is all covered? Absolutely. The adjuster's coming by tomorrow to estimate costs. But I can handle that for you. Well, why? Well, uh, aren't you going back to the city? Oh, Ted is. I'm not. What? Well, you know we have to get the rental car back. You, no, no, why don't you come back with me, darling? Because I'm going to be a very busy girl. I want to see the adjuster, and Mr. Montgomery's going to help me to have Uncle Chris's car put in condition. I'm going to drive it in tomorrow so we can pack up and get out of that apartment before we get socked any more rent. Now, Nancy, you're in no condition. I feel fine. And the sooner I get settled in my own house, I can really enjoy having this baby. Darling, now's the time we need a roof over our heads. Yeah, besides, if there is anyone around here looking for something spelled M-O-N-E-Y, maybe we ought to be finders keepers. Oh, if there was, it would be peanuts. Oh, Chris used to make some $2 bets on the horses. And if he won, he had the habit of folding a 10 or a 5 into old newspapers in the cellars and forgetting all about it. I helped him find many a one. Uh, you think that's why the house was broken into, huh? Well, no, I was mulling it over in my mind, and I thought that could be the reason. You know how stories grow, particularly with a solitary person like Chris. But if money is the motive, which is tying you to the house... I beg you to forget it. You'd only be disappointed. I still don't feel right about it, Nancy. Oh, don't be silly, darling. I'll be safe as a church with my double burglar alarm. No. Anyway, if anyone is looking for anything, it's not for me. Well, that's where you're wrong. I am. Oh, hey, that's my line. I'm going to find what I'm looking for when I drive to New York tomorrow afternoon. Now. I'll see you at the apartment, and if there's any hang-up, I'll phone you. You don't have a phone. Well, not tonight, but Mr. Montgomery's arranged for them to connect it in the morning. Now, come on. It's beginning to get dark. Goodbye, Don. Goodbye. Go to bed. Get a good rest. I'll do that, little thing. Drive carefully. Well, not to worry. I wish I was as brave as I'm pretending to be. Hello, Miss Pyre. <gasps> Oh, you... You gave me a start, Mr. Prouty. Where, where did you drop in from? Well, I was out for a walk, and I thought I saw you preparing to leave. Uh, no, only my husband. You uh, planning to stay a while? Uh, more or less permanently. Uh-huh. In spite of what I told you? Pete, you are a big teller of tall tales. I think you get carried away by your own imagination. It could be. Still and all, I wouldn't like to see you in any danger. Me? Oh, what danger could I be in? Are you trying to chase me away from here? Oh, perish the thought. I was just concerned about you. A little woman all alone with no one to protect her. I can manage by myself, thank you. Uh, of course you can. But you batten down all the hatches and hold snug. Looks like we're in for a real Northeaster. Oh, listen to that wind. And you can't steal my birthright. What? Don't let her take it from you. I left it to you. Run, Miss Pryor. Everything seems to have come to a climax. 
If we had not allowed ourselves to become involved, we might pretend to be totally disengaged and say, how does the heroine of such tales allow herself to become so involved? But since we have followed her this far and permitted her to be involved, the question is, how does she escape? We won't know that, of course, until I return with the conclusion in Act Three. Nancy is alone, just wakened from the depths of sleep. The wind roars around the exposed house on the heights above the raging waters, and everything is filtered through the miasma of the drifting fog. Through its half-light, a menacing figure, long hair streaming, looms the reincarnation of Chris Evans' long-dead wife. A kitchen knife held high to strike down at Nancy. And as the voice cries out... I'll kill! I was just coming in, and, and I heard you. Well, what happened? I don't know. I, I don't know. Martha, all those people... Darling, that... darling, there's, it's all right. It's all right. There, there, there's nobody here but us. It, it must have been a nightmare. Are, 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 are you okay for a minute? Where are you going? I'm just going to turn off the alarms. Uh, it's all right. I, I, I'm right here. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we are now. Let's go into the kitchen and... Sit down a minute, all right? Oh, Ted. Oh, what are you doing back here? Well, I drove as far as I could, man, but the, the fog was impossible. I, I decided I'd better feel my way back here. But what, what's, what's been happening? Oh, everything was... Everything was all right when I went to bed. But that little screwball, Pete Prouty, came by just after you left. And he went on and on about ghosts and blood. And... Oh, I... I, I didn't pay any attention at the time, but I, I suppose he fixed all that nonsense in my mind. I'll wring his neck when I see him again. Well, maybe you ought to wring mine for being a prize goose. I, I went to sleep, but then I woke up and I, I heard all these voices and I was sure someone was in the house. Well, there couldn't have been. I set off the alarm when I came in. I know, but I can't tell you how real it was. Ted, I... I saw... I, I saw... Saw what? There was a, a figure. A woman with long hair and a knife in her hand. And, and she... She said she was going to kill okay, me. Okay, okay. Well, take it easy, will you? Oh, I feel like such a fool. It's not like me to imagine things. Now, look, it, it's it's this house and, 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 and your condition. Look, we've got to get out of here, no, Nancy. No, no. I didn't imagine it, Ted. I'm not that much of a ninny. Something funny is going on here. But it's not supernatural. Do you know what I think? Someone's trying to run us out of this house before we find out what its secret is. I'm downstairs, darling. I um I didn't know you were up. Oh, what are you doing? Well, I I woke up this morning. I couldn't get back uh, couldn't get back to sleep. I I didn't want to wake you, so I thought I'd sort of scout around. Well, scout around for what? What I finally found. What? Come on, come on. Let me show you a couple of things. All right. And for openers, uh, let's take a look at this on the hall linoleum. Oh, it's a footprint. Yep, somebody's shoe. But see, see all those squiggly marks inside the outline? Oh, neither of us have anything like that. Right, go to the head of the class. That's the kind of print a storm or a, or a Wellington boot might make. Now, now look at this. Mm -hmm. now, nothing shows up on the rug, but right here, mm -hmm. beside this back hall closet, there's a heel mark with the same pattern. Someone was hiding in the closet. No, because there was no dampness or trace of mud on the rug. Well, then it all doesn't add up. Well, it didn't until I turned back the rug and looked underneath. Like this. <gasps> A trap door. Mm -hmm. Well, where does it go to? Let's open yeah, it. No, no, no. I've already checked it out. 
It leads to a short staircase down to a long, twisting tunnel that descends into a cave that lets out onto the beach. So that's how they were able to get into the house without tripping the burglar alarm. They or he? You mean Pete Prouty? Or Mr. Montgomery or persons unknown. Anyone who didn't want us to settle in this house. Why? Because of whatever they were looking for. But but what? Oh, now, who is it? Oh, I, I think that's Mr. Montgomery with the insurance man. Well, now, I, I feel the insurance company offered a very fair settlement. As your lawyer, I'd advise you to agree to it. Well, we think it was fair, Mr. Montgomery. And I think the house can be put back together very nicely with the money they'll pay. Well, certainly in shape to sell, which, uh, if you'll forgive me, is what I urge you to do. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, I'm going to be very frank with you. There's, um, there's something in this house someone wants. <laughs> I hope you're not suggesting it could be me. Oh, I give you my word, I had no idea there was any other access to this house than through the keys that were left in Chris Evans' effects. <laughs> And I can't imagine what he could have had that was of any value beyond the house itself. Even knowing about the secret passage? Now, what was it for? Oh, my guess is it was built in the 30s when everyone was doing a little mild rum running during Prohibition. But I don't imagine there was a fortune in that. And then you don't think Uncle Chris could have amassed any money? My dear, I knew Chris Evans as well as my own brother. And I assure you, there's no way he could have amassed any secret amounts of money. <laughs> Unless he'd won the Irish sweepstake. And you can't exactly keep that a secret. Oh, hello, Pete. Uh, good morning, Miss Pryor. I come up a little earlier to see how you were, but... And I saw you had business, so I backed off. Ah, oh, that was Mr. Montgomery and the insurance man. For the damage. Are you going to take care of it? Oh, yes. Well, I, uh... I just want to check up on you. Having to spend a night alone in the house. Um, as it happened, she didn't. Uh, I came back. Well, now, uh, that's a surprise. Is it? Don't know what you mean. Do you have a pair of storm boots? Wellington style? I've got several. We see some pretty rough winters. Uh, why? Did you know there was a secret passage from the back hall closet all the way down to the beach? Why, Dad, I most forgot that. It's been sealed up for most 20, 25 years. How did you and my uncle meet? Oh, that was a long time ago. My family were fishermen, but... I thought I ought to give show business a whirl. That's how I met Chris. He was the electrician in the first theater I got a job in. You were an actor? Uh, kind of. I had an act in vaudeville. Well, I, I was the one coaxed him out here to Montauk. I helped him build this house. I always felt it was kind of part mine. Is that why you used the old passage from the beach to break in and tear it apart? He should have left the house to me. It was half mine. I'm even willing to buy it from you. If you give me a decent price. Why, Pete? What are you looking for here? Oh, uh, nothing. Just my due. Oh? Then what's your due? The money. If there was any. But now I've looked for it everywhere. I, I know there isn't any. It was probably just another Chris's big lies. So I'll, uh, see you around. Well, I guess that's that. Mm. Disappointed? No. All I ever wanted was the house free and clear. <laughs> Seems to be that way. Now all we have to do is to figure out how we can keep it that way. Well, I refuse to worry about that now. Oh, it's such a lovely day. Oh, who's this? Well, it can't be the contractor this fast. Oh. Mrs. Nancy Evans Pryor? Uh, yes. A.Q. Sprit. I.R.S. Internal Revenue Service. Oh. Oh, well, how do you do, Mr. Sprit? Um, this is my husband, Ted Pryor. Ah, uh, yes. 
taken a little time to catch up with you, Mrs. Pryor. Are you the sole heir of Christopher Xavier Evans? I never knew Uncle Chris's middle name. Well, now you do. I checked already with Montgomery, your lawyer. Now, let me see. Uh, on the 14th of April this year, Mr. Evans laid off a three-way parlay at Battleground Racetrack on the dogs. The dogs? Yes. Racing type. Like horses. Oh. Said parlay paid off on a $10 bet at 2500 to one. Making a return of two hundred fifty thousand, fully taxable by the federal income tax. My uncle won all that money on a dog race. It happens, man. Not very often, but it happens. You got to be lucky. And you didn't collect the tax on it. That was a slip up in our Florida office. It happens too, but we catch up. So, I'm here to collect it. Well, well how much? With penalties and interest, figure about 125. Thousand? That's how we like to round it off. Oh, we haven't any money like that. Oh, all my uncle left was his house. So I gather from your lawyer. So that if there isn't any money, I guess we'll just have to possess the house. I'm sorry. That's the law. We all packed, Nancy? It didn't take long. We scarcely moved in. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm the one who should be sorry. At least if I had an inheritance, it shouldn't have been a minus. <laughs> a quarter of a million dollars. No wonder Pete was ready to tear the house apart to find it. Well, he didn't. I hate to leave it. Damaged goods as it is, it's a house. Now I'm going to have a baby. And I'd like to have started him off, at least, in a real home. I know, Nan. Just don't push it. Huh? I can't help it, Ted. I... I know. Somehow, I... I just know Uncle Chris wanted someone to be happy here. Only, something went wrong. What are you talking about? Well, his will was made long before he took his life. That was an impulse. I think he would have wanted us to know what he did with the money, but... He just forgot it the last moment. Yeah, if he hadn't already spent it. You know what I feel terrible about? You no, know what? That I couldn't just have put things in shape while <laughs> I was here. Well, that's the little homemaker in you. At least taken down these sleazy, dirt-stiff old drapes and washed them. Gosh, they feel as if they'd been starched. They're so fi... St starched. What is it? Ted. Yeah? Get me a kitchen knife. Quick. Okay. What for? Well, Mr. Montgomery said that Uncle Chris had a habit of stashing away his racing winnings between newspaper pages. Well, how about sewing them in between a curtain drape and the lining? Oh, here's the knife. Oh, good. Now, just let me cut this running basting stitch. There. Well? Ted. What? A $100 bill. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> ah, three stuck together. <laughs> oh, Ted, darling. We're not only going to make Uncle Sam rich, but we're going to be the same. And hang on to the house, too. So, at the end of this tale, we can return happily to the positive proverb, never look a gift horse in the mouth. For a while, it seemed as if Nancy Pryor had stumbled into misfortune. But instead... She came out with the luck of the Irish. I'll return shortly. A year brings many changes. Peter Prouty died, unlamented, of acute alcoholism. Christopher Evans has a namesake in a fine baby boy born to Nancy and Ted. Ted has a job with the county newspaper, and the family has settled down to enjoy the local society, into whose circle they have been welcomed after being sponsored by Mr. Montgomery. Nancy Pryor would be the last person to subscribe to Virgil's warning, beware the Greeks bearing gifts. May everyone be so lucky. Our cast included Joyce Gordon, Paul Hecht, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production is under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. 
Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Car racing is the name of today's mystery game. It's been called everything from a sport to an art form. A racing driver has been compared to a ballet dancer, a musician, or a surgeon at the height of his challenge. Why is he in that driver's seat speeding around that track, defying death, brutally disciplining his every moment, his every movement? And what if the control should suddenly vanish from his hands? What if he suspects his own wife wishes him to fail? Mr. Gabriel, Paul wants me to stop racing, but I won't. I can't. I give you this small piece of jewelry, Betsy. A little mirror with silver bells around it. You wear it, it will protect you. Oh, Mr. G, it's beautiful. It was my mother's. She lived to a hundred years. This charm protects you from danger. When you race, it will keep you safe. At any speed? Any race? You have to do only one thing. Believe. Our mystery drama, The Frog Prince, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Bob Caliban and Patricia Elliott. I shall return shortly with Act One. There must be a reason why auto racers are as much driven as driving. Many motives are given, principally man's need to compete, win, and dare death. At the risk of playing psychologist, a role I really haven't studied, I would say that Paul and Betsy Ring, married, both racing enthusiasts, make the track their way of life because they love it. Second place. He's gaining on Art Beaver. Could have sight now. Here comes the cat. A mile up for the third turn. A five car mile up for the third turn. I hate that. I hate that. The race will continue under the yellow. The race will continue under the yellow cotton flag. I think I see the trouble. Let's see, you want to look through my binoculars? No, no, I can't look. Looks like Art Beaver's engine spat oil across the track, and that started skids and the pileup. When I'm behind that wheel, and the guy ahead of me starts to drift too far, it's all I can do to keep myself from shaking. I am never sure you drive because you like to, Betsy. Isn't one racer in the family enough? Well... I've made just as much money on the circuit as Paul has. Well, I don't you forget it. We both race cars, Paul and I, but never the same event. On well, the same day sometimes, but we decided, having a three-year-old son, if push came to shove and one of us didn't cross the finish line, Paulie would have at least one parent. This race, Paul came in first. But I knew the women wouldn't please him. So, before he got to our trailer, I ducked out. I hate having to make it yellow flags all the way. You came in first, Paul. Uh, where's Betsy, Mr. Gabriel? She went for beer and coffee. I'll tell you something. The crowd didn't like it either. Five laps under the yellow. Well, I was a lap ahead. When I came around again, the ambulance was taking Charlie and Ken away. Next time around, they'd cleared up pretty much of everything except the oil. I sure had luck riding with me. Luck do nothing for you. 
I put sulfur, red pepper, and salt under your seat. They protect you. Mr. G, will you stop doing that? Good thing I had my helmet on. I might have started sneezing and I'd be in the hospital right now. Paul, is no joke. Okay, Mr. G, you, you protected me. Uh, we'll forget about my know-how as a racing driver. My control had nothing to do with it. Nobody had control if off beavers spill oil on the track. Well, anyway, uh, first is a first. The money's the same. You would have come in first if the green flag was up. You were going great. I thought so, too. She behaved like a Formula One. Beer and coffee for the women. Hi, darling. Mm, hi, Betsy. You okay? What do you mean? Me okay? Well, I know how these accidents hit you. Oh, that. So long as it's not you. Well, what do you hear about Charlie and the others? Word from the hospital is nothing's real bad. Oh. They'll all get well. That's good. In all remedies, the force of thought is the most potent ingredient. Well, it's handy to have a doctor around, too, Mr. G, who knows how to set broken bones. <laughs> Betsy, uh, what are we, uh, going to do with our Mr. G, huh? He really thinks no one would win if he didn't put the hoodoo hex on us. <laughs> Seven devils will always ride with you, Paul. Oh, thanks. He's got his insurance. I've got mine. Betsy, forgive, old fella. Mouth speak faster than head think. Uh-huh. I give you this small piece of jewelry. Little mirror with bells around it. You wear it. It always protects you and your son. Oh, it's beautiful. But look, Paul. Yeah. It was my mother's. She lived to a hundred years. This charm will protect you from all danger. When you race, it will keep you safe. It's mesmerizing. When you look into the tiny little mirror there, all I can see is one eye at a time. That mirror repel demons. And the silver bells, they scare demons away. You wear it, Betsy. No harm come to you. At any speed? In any rate? All you have to do is believe. Mr. G, I'll say this. You are the best mechanic in the business, and I'm happy you're on our team. Yeah, but Thank you, Mr. Ring. But you are still a superstitious old mom. Mr. Gabriel, Paul is half-joking. Oh, I am not bothered. I don't want you or him in any smash-ups. Well... Somebody's got to have them, I suppose, and I'll try to make it not me. <laughs> Your beer is getting warm, Paul. Oh, how's the coffee, Mr. G? Good. I finish up and get car into trailer. See you at the motel later. Strange sort of a guy, isn't he? The way he insisted on us calling him Mr. His granddaddy raced cars in France. The old Cajun. Well, I'm a three-generation driver, too. I guess we should feel honored that he's so open with us about his Bayou beliefs. Well, who's to say that our prayers for safety on the track are answered any more than his red pepper and mirror charms? Well, I'm glad you've never laughed about it. It fascinates me. And have you, have you ever noticed his eyes, Paul? So knowing, so calm. Mm. His hands are pretty good, too. Mm. <laughs> And he's always concerned about both of us and Polly. <laughs> I do love this crazy mirror and bell. I believe it's very old. Mirrors have always been used to chase away evil, and before that, shiny metal. But you know, I feel it's as good as anything. If you completely believe in something, perhaps you can force the hand of fate. You know, it might be that power really comes from the human mind. Oh, <laughs> too spooky. Oh, hey, the beers. Hand me that opener. I want to toast the winner. My husband. Hey, where'd you go? I've been lying in bed wondering if you'd run out on me. Oh, sure. You know I'm always up early the morning after a race to get the newspapers. Paul, get up. Nine o'clock. Oh, I feel beaten, achy all over. You should see what they say about you. Oh. Hmm. The Star Herald. Got a picture of you, too. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. No, you're not. You're not a bit interested. 
Oh, you keep the scrapbook, and someday Paulie will get a big kick out of how his ma and pa made enough money to send him through medical school. <laughs> hey, where is my son? I'd like to see him this morning. Well, you have to get up and get dressed to do that. Paulie's with Kitty and Ann and their kids splashing around the motel swimming pool. Hey, I'd like to do that. Uh, are grown-ups allowed? Well, I don't see why not. You're paying for it. Well, okay. Uh, I'm on my feet. <laughs> What's the word on uh, Charlie, Ken, and Bill? I'm all right. Well, so far, so good. I-, I thought we'd go by the hospital later and say hello. You see my bathing trunks? I hung them in the bathroom. Gotcha. Aren't you coming to the pool, Betsy? No. I want to get caught up on pasting these clippings in the scrapbook. I'm way behind in my scrapbook, and I want to get caught up on the Louisiana 500. The Louisiana 500? Oh, that's 13 days away. So? You're going to win that one, too, aren't you? And let's see. This one goes into the book first. Nevada Rally. Only 20 of the 49 starters make it through the first day. Paul Rings, escort, unbeatable. Seven straight win for Paul and Betsy Ring this year. NASCAR, Winston 500. Betsy Ring's racing career. <laughs> Can a woman champ driver be a mother and a winner? NASCAR, Mason Dixon 500. Paul and Betsy add Louisiana-born Gabriel as new pit stop anchor. Gabriel is grandson of racing driver Gabriel, who drove 130 MPH to Beach Creek in 1906 Grand Prix. Paul Ring takes his first Pocono 500 under yellow flag. 30,000 spectators witness five-car pile. No fatality. Next stop for the ring, the Louisiana 500 in Baton Rouge. Good luck, Paul. I love you. Gentlemen. around my neck. Where am I? You're in the Baton Rouge Hospital. Oh, I remember now. Or do I? You've been unconscious for two days. How are you feeling now, honey? Two days? I'd feel better if I knew how I cracked up. It's all blank. Did I... Miss a turn? Well, uh, no one knows for sure yet. Oh. It's the uh, worst it's ever been, isn't it? No, you're alive, sweetheart. That's all that matters. Yeah, but what about St. Pete and Lime Rock? Well, I've got Mr. G scouting around for another car. For what? I'll be out of commission a long time. Oh, I can't cancel those dates. One of us has got to keep trying for the perfect lap. That's the way we figured it, remember? One of us to be well enough to keep going. Well, who's going to take care of Polly? Oh, I am, like I always do. Yeah. What about me? Oh, darling, you just lie there and get healed. And you do what the doctors tell you. What is the fascination we spectators have for auto racing? 
Is it because we see ourselves in the driver's seat with that daredevil? We root for him as we would for ourselves. We want to have that mastery, that control, to be that fearless, to come in first and take the prize money. That racing driver is us. He never loses. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. One more lap around the track to recount what happened to Betsy and Paul Ring, two married racing drivers and their three-year-old son. There's not a pro in the business who won't agree that the art of auto racing is that of complete control against great odds. There's no room for error. Ask Betsy Ring as she and mechanic Mr. Gabriel return to Louisiana after a 13-week tour of the tracks. You see, Mr. Gabriel, it, it's hard for me, brought up as I was, to always understand all this voodoo stuff. It, it goes against everything I've been taught to believe in. Let's see, it needs belief. With it, voodoo, voodoo works wonders. Without belief, it's helpless. Oh, when do you think we're going to get to Baton Rouge? Uh, another hour. Oh, just one more hour? <laughs> oh, you know, I've missed Paul so much. Every day I worry about him lying back in that hospital in traction. But when I called him last night, he was so cheery. Paul is like a son to me. You know that. So does he. His voice was up. He was asking questions. It was great to hear him like that. Because he is getting out of hospital today, yes. He'll be in the motel before we get there. <laughs> Three whole months. It, it was his collarbone that took the longest to mend. Paul, he had bad luck. But all that changed now. Oh, are you sure? I hope so. His bad luck will change. Okay. So long as it doesn't get worse. <laughs> Two more hills, then the road she flattened out. I suppose I'm babbling on because the closer we get to Baton Rouge, the more nervous I am. <laughs> what keeps haunting me is, did they put Paul all together okay? Well, it's best if you don't borrow trouble. Just think of seeing him like I think of seeing Mon Père, my father, and my brother. Mon Père, he is a wise old man. Very, very old. And his father? Oh, he was a racing driver in France, wasn't he? But his son, Mon Père, he never did that. He came to America, to Louisiana, to become farmer. Then I was born, and the racing fever... She begin all over again with me. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet the way you keep my mind off Paul's injuries. If Paul cannot race again, is it the end of the world? Won't be the end of mine. But Paul's world? Well, I don't know. I just want to sit here and look at you, Paul. That's all I want to do. <laughs> Isn't it silly? Yeah, I ought to hit the hay early tonight, darling. Hard to get used to the motel beds, and I got a big day tomorrow. I put Paul into bed, tucked him in, read him the frog print. Oh, he dropped off, just like that. He's grown so much since you've been away. Even in three months. You know, when I went into the hospital, he was just a... Little three-year-old, but now he's more like a real boy. He liked being on the road with his mommy. He took good care of her, too. Well, I guess old Mr. Gabriel did his bit also, didn't he? Hmm. Well, we'll talk about it some more tomorrow. Oh, I am real beat. Seeing you and Paul has made me realize how much I missed you. Paul... Paula, are, are you sure you're ready for a trial run in the morning? I mean, after all, maybe... Maybe I'll take a week or two of just walking around, you know? Paul? Darling? Hmm. Oh, good night, sweetheart. You sleep well. You have pleasant dreams. Oh, Papa, 
Oh, well, my da- darling, what, what is it? It's all right, darling. Oh, darling, you just having a, you're having a bad dream. It's it's nothing. I'm here. I'm here. It's all... I'm sorry. It, it's always the same dream. Same race. I... Oh, how long am I going to do this? I... I thought when I came out of the hospital, I'd, I'd stop having them. You, you, you stop having what? Uh, nightmares? Oh, uh, no, no, it, it isn't anything. You, you, oh, the, the excitement probably of, uh, well, being here with you and Polly. It's, <laughs> oh, it's like old times. Well, darling, do you think you can get back to sleep now? Oh, yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll give it a try. <laughs> you just tell your dream machine. The red flag is out, and that the race with the hobgoblins is over. Finished. Period. Well, where in blazes is he? You know, it's six o'clock. What's the matter with Mr. G? I I don't know, Paul. He said he'd be here at five, and he could get the racer ready alone. He promised. Well, it's after six. I want to get out in that track before the world and his brother takes practice laps. You know how crowded it gets here by seven. Well, something must have happened to him. Mr. G's never been this late. I would have called him, but he went off to his folks and they got no phone. What do you mean it's never happened before? Well, the last time he came down here to the Bayou country, he vanished. He becomes totally oblivious to what century we're living in, and he huddles with his family and Cajun friends, dispensing black bat oil and lady luck oil, and I don't know what. Oh, well, I guess my own fault, putting up with his hoodoo voodoo. Oh, come on, let's get out of here. I'm not hanging around until the great Mr. Gabriel decides to show up. Paul, why are you being so unyielding? Because I know where he's gone and where he is. It's a two-day trek into that swampland where they all live and practice their rights. And I got to cool my heels until he decides to come back to civilization. Yeah, I just got here. I've been walking from the city two days. How you feel? How I look. You look old, there. I am old. And I am sick. Now you will feel better. Now I am at home. Who knows? You're still working for racing people? Same now since I was here last. Here. What you sick from? The evil Loa. Jacques, bring the evil Loa from Haiti. Where is Jacques? He died. My brother died? His barn burned down. He inside. Nothing good come from Haiti. I tell Jacques. He marry Haitian girl. She come here with him. No good for him. But you, Père, your sickness, very bad. I walk two steps, I fall down. Gabriel, you come at good time. Tonight, we hold service to imprison Evil Law for ten years. In ten years, I be one hundred like your mother. I die then. But to bind the evil, to do that, someone in the family has to walk through hot coals. Jacques' wife, Christiane, will do it. She will walk through fire? She must. There, when did Jacques die? Three months last. On which day? Friday. First Friday in month. Why, you ask? It is the same day. Paul Ring almost killed himself in race. I want to help them, Père. You must give me stronger powers. They're good people. First, you help your father and your sister-in-law. Vite, help me up. Christian, 
This is Jacques' brother, Gabriel. Hello, Gabriel. Christian. Go now, Christian. They will tell you when the fire is ready. I have never seen this before. When the evil Loa come from Haiti and visit your own family, he must be banished. You see, they are pouring much kerosene to fire. Then, Christian, she will walk through it. And the evil Loa, he will shrivel and disappear for ten years. She wears nothing on her feet. She will feel nothing. It has begun. She is stepping into the flames. Go, look. Look hard. You see? Her face say nothing. She feel nothing. Christian is not fighting. There, I can't watch. She would burn to death. The evil Loa will burn. Christian will not. She is still walking. How many times must she go across the flames? Seven times seven will drive the evil away. Are you all right this morning? What do you mean? Well, honey, you had another one of those nightmares again. It's the second time since I came back. Oh, I'm sorry to wake you. Maybe we ought to get separate motel rooms. Oh, now, why do you say that? I'm concerned about you, Paul. I'm not criticizing you. And I'm concerned about waking little Polly. It's a beautiful day, honey. I've been up for hours. Now, won't you please get out of bed? I got a surprise. What for? Why should I get out of bed, huh? I'm a racing driver with no wheels. Not anymore. That's the surprise. Mr. Gabriel came back late last night. He's been working on my car around the clock. Well, why didn't you say so? He didn't give me a chance. I tried it out at five this morning. It's ready for the master right now. Where are my clothes? Where you threw them three days ago. Did he have any explanation for not showing up before? Now, Paul, you go talk to him. I told him we were very upset. Betsy, I'm going to the track alone. I'm not having anyone there. In case. In case you fail? Huh. You will not. Paul, I'm happy to see you. You look fine. Thanks. She handled nice. Betsy, run with her a few laps. She do fine. Mr. Gabriel, don't you think you owe me an explanation? Yes, I do. I forgot what day you were going to test. I was so full of thoughts of seeing my father. I have no excuses. I have apologies. Well, that was a week ago. How long does it take to... Well, for you to get back to your homestead and back. We had evil to be rid of. My brother, he died. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, your father, was he all right? No, he was paralyzed in the leg. Well, what did the doctor say about your father? We ask no doctor. We need no doctor. We cure him. Are you saying you cure your father with voodoo? My sister-in-law, she walked through fire 49 times, 7 times 7, and there... He is immediately healed. He walked two miles back to his house, like a young man. Unbelievable. Did did you say she walked through fire? Big fire. They burned big fire. And Christian drive out the evil Loa. Do, do you want me to believe you burned this girl alive so your father could walk? Oh, Christian was not touched. She was in the fire for many minutes, and she came out. Nothing burned. Not even one blister. Stop that. A fire with a, a girl in it. I, I, I can't stand this. My head's spinning around. Let go of me. Let go! Fear of fire. Is racing driver Paul Ring reacting more violently to fire 
than most of us would? What of those who have not only mastered their panic, but can fan the flames to cleanse sickness and drive out devils? Can it be that fire is nothing to fear if you know what master you serve? If you know what to believe? I shall return shortly with Act Three. beliefs and today's coexist on the same continent. Common sense, as we know it, tells us one cannot touch flames without being burned. Common sense, as a philosopher would tell us, is but another term for general ignorance. Baptism of fire is often performed by voodoo priests and their disciples. Paul knows this. Yet why did he become so violent when he heard of it? Now, you stop talking like that, Mr. Gabriel. I don't want to hear any more. Forgive me, Paul, if I have touched a raw nerve. Everything's ready for the test run. You can lapse the circuits for as long as you like. Why did you tell me that awful thing? What possessed you? I thought with you, I was always free to talk. I said it because it happened. But fire. Walking through fire. I'm sorry, I... Oh, I don't feel so good. I, I don't think I can try out the racer today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Something's gone out of me. I should not have gone to visit my father. But when I got to our village, I learned much evil had descended on us. My brother Jacques had married and then been burned to death. Only his wife could drive out the evil. Do you mean a woman must... Burn to atone for evil? In our beliefs, she will not suffer. It's a lot for me to swallow. Paul never got back behind the wheel. He stayed in the motel, read books, wouldn't see anyone. Everything I thought we had was crumbling. I had to make a decision. Look, I'll, uh... I'll get myself together again. Just, just, just give me time. Honey, I mean, there isn't any time. This is what I've done. I've taken everything out of the bank, paid the motel a month's rent in advance, put a couple of hundred in your wallet for food, and I'm... Well, I'm, I'm hitting the circuit. You're leaving? I have to work. I'm driving the trailer myself. I'll head north and see what I can take in. I got a few races lined up. Now, Paul, try to understand. I have to go... Okay. So go. If it's got something to do with your nightmares, Paul, you ought to get some help. It happens to some drivers, honey. In their dreams, they see accidents repeated that they've lived through. Now, maybe it's that. Oh. Anything else? When can I expect you back? In a month? Well, I don't know. Six weeks to two months. Paul... Look, honey, while I'm away, will you do me a favor and yourself? Will you go to the hospital? Tell them the whole thing, the way you feel. Ask them if they can help you. Betsy, don't go. I'm scared. Well, I'm not. I can't wait any longer. I'm not giving it up because... Well, you don't know what you want to do. I'm not asking you to give it up. I'll be back, honey. Well, what's the hurry? Huh? A couple of more days won't matter. Because Kitty and Anne are heading north with Ken and Charlie, and if I need someone to watch over Polly while I'm working, they'll do it. Now, Paul, until you straighten yourself out, they're the only family I can count on. Goodbye. Well, honey, take care of yourself. Oh, hey, uh, wait a minute. Uh, you, you didn't pack these driving gloves. They're torn through. I got a new pair. I'll tell you what. You keep them to remember an old partnership by. Dear mm. mm. Elder, help me, someone. Someone, come, please. I can't. I'm alone. Oh. 
The fire is blown hot. Look at it, please. The flames. The flames. Paul, Paul, let me in. Oh, my Lord. Oh, she's gone. Oh, she's gone. Oh, I can't look at her. Paul. Paul, Paul, wake up, wake up. Huh? Huh? What? What is it? What? What is that fire you were yelling about? There's no fire here. Oh, 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 oh. Mr. G- Gabriel. Oh, it was another of those nightmares, wasn't it? Oh. Yeah. Every time I see it, I... I see more. The same race, the same nightmare, but... Oh, more details. That's what I see it. I s- smell it. I... Oh. Oh, this is torture. I... Am I glad you woke me up? I just find out Betsy and the boy went north yesterday. And I think Paul is here alone. Maybe I come by early in the morning and we have breakfast together. Oh, oh, Mr. G. Oh, I am your man. Look, I'll, uh, I'll have a quick shower and out we go, huh? That, that diner across the street, he, he opens real early. Oh, how is it your fault, Paul? It takes time to get better. He's not ready to race. I couldn't make her understand that. It is not her fault either. She needs to race. She raced then. And what will you do? I don't know yet. And your little boy. Is this right for him? Betsy used to read fairy stories to Polly before he went to sleep. One of his favorites was the Frog Prince. You see, Polly is known his father only as the Prince. I don't want to have him see me now as a frog. You never chucked a race. Mr. G, does it mean anything having that same dream over and over again? Yes, it must. Well, then, let me tell you. It's a race, see? I don't know where, somewhere on the Grand National Tour. I'm on the sidelines, and they start. Cars number 27 and 19 make the turn. There comes Betsy, trying to dive into the second spot. The green flag is falling. 19 cuts inside, you know, cutting off Betsy, and 18 and 22. 22 is crowding Betsy. And the next car tangles in there. It's a pileup. Front and back, she's getting smashed. Fire breaks out, and I see her trying to get out. She's, she can't free herself. Nobody stops. I run to her. Flames everywhere. She's on fire. She's burning. You never told her this. No, I... I couldn't. Well, why give her a handicap she doesn't need? I talked to my father. Mon père. He could cast a spell. Oh, but I don't know where she is. Where she'll race. You have a photograph of her? Well, sure. Right here in my wallet. Give it to me. Do you have anything that she wears? Well, uh... Yeah, she threw an old pair of driving gloves at me when she checked out. They're back at the hotel. Give that to me. Does she still wear that mirror with the silver bells I gave her? Oh, she's never without it. That will help. But alone, it's not powerful enough. Paul, you give me $50, and I promise you Betsy will be protected. How much? If you want me to get to my father's in a hurry, I got to rent a jeep. Darling, well, I didn't expect you for weeks. Uh, well, I didn't expect to find you at the practice track. Well, I'm getting in shape. It's all coming back, isn't it? Well, I'm making myself do it. Oh, you don't know how happy it makes me that you're trying. Uh, honey, you remember that story you used to read to Polly mm-hmm. about the frog prince? Well, uh, this old frog is doing his darnest to turn himself into a prince again. <laughs> anyway, uh... Well, why are you here, huh? Well, it's something that scared me. I, I had to come back to tell you, so I flew in from Pine River this morning. Why? What happened? Well, honey, it, well, it was a race the day before yesterday. All yesterday I was shaking so I couldn't move. The day before there was a bad pile of oh, a real bad thing, honey. Guys crushed a fire. It, it was awful. I was in seventh position. 
coming around the turn. You, you can't see because those trees, remember? Yeah, yeah. They hide the corner. And then all of a sudden, the whole track is covered with smoke. And I was heading straight into them. Here, yeah, go on. Now, this is the scary part. A man ran out with his yellow flag and he flagged me down. So I pulled way over on the inside and I got clear. Well, did you find out who it was? The guy who saved you? I didn't see him again. I didn't want to. Why? Because it was you, Paul. I swear, you ran out on that track and stopped me. I would have burned to death if I'd hit the others. Mr. Gabriel, look who just came out to the track. Betsy. Oh, Mr. G, I thought you weren't working for us anymore. You sent me away, but Paul hired me right back. He's been down here most every day. Todd, he's working with us, too. Like old times. There is no money, but we believe in Paul. Are you coming back to make the team complete? Oh, I, I'm just here on a flying visit. I have to go say hello to Todd. Paul, don't you move. I'll be right back, honey. <laughs> she looks fine. Well, I don't know what to believe anymore. You know, I guess miracles do happen. Betsy was telling me she sure had a narrow escape. Mr. G, your daddy cast a very good spell. When did you see him? Last night. I brought Chief back this morning. He said to tell you he is all ready to go. He just wants to know when you want him to start his spell. doesn't seem to matter what your persuasion is, does it? So long as it's wholehearted. In the depths of Cajun country, incantations and strange powders and hot fires seem to produce miracles. But don't they happen every day to protect those who will it? Today we worship the science of the material. Tomorrow, what a vast knowledge might be ours if we accept the science of love. I shall return shortly. It's been said that there are three true sports. Mountain climbing, bullfighting, and motor racing. All the rest are recreations. No question, speedway racing infects the blood. When the voice at the track says, gentlemen, start your engines, hearts leap up, and the mystique of man against speed begins. Whether you're watching the rookie of the year or the champ of champions, these kings of the road have all decided that in this life, you take what you want. But you pay for it. Our cast included Bob Caliban, Patricia Elliott, and Gordon Heath. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. If I wanted to be a farmer, I could have stayed at home. But here, at least, you can be a wealthy farmer. Captain, no matter how old a man is, doesn't he still have the desire for gold? Soldier Alvarado, I have a desire, but not for gold. It's for something far more valuable. What could be more valuable than gold? You have it. I don't understand. Youth. The fire. The strength of youth. They speak of some... Some magic fountain. A fountain of youth. All one will do is bathe in it. And one is made young again. For that fountain, I would assemble a fleet of ships. To find that fountain, I would venture everything. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... shapes that slides sinuously through the night doesn't mean that I don't believe in love and marriage and any amount of simple things. It's only that when I bring you a nice heartwarming tale, it really should be garnished with a twist of mystery. Like this. A whole lifetime, Mary. That's what I look forward to. Just so long as it's together. Well, if I was left alone, I'd just as soon be dead. Oh, uh, so would I. Only we won't. Because God made us the lucky... Look out! Our mystery drama, Love Me, Don't Leave Me, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars John Beale and Terry Keene. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Rural three-story early American Riverview in Amityville. Nothing like it on the market. Spacious grounds. Three full bedrooms. Available for immediate occupancy. This Amityville horror offered by CBS TV as a special movie presentation. A must see. The Amityville Horror, Sunday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on CBS TV. I could have been in shape for the big one. You could have had a V8. I could have stayed off the sweet stuff. You could have had a V8 instead of what you're drinking right now. Wow, I could have had a V8. V8 cocktail vegetable juice, only 35 calories per six ounce serving. V8, the great tasting healthful blend of eight country vegetables. Wow, I could have had a V8. It's never too late. I'll have a V8. Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, Nelson Rockefeller, Bruce Jenner, Thomas Edison, Leonardo da Vinci. These people and many other brilliant, talented, creative people overcame a form of learning disability. This is Pat Collins for the Foundation for Children with Learning Disabilities. There are over 10 million children in this country who are learning disabled, and they can be helped to overcome their learning differences. We owe it to them and to ourselves. Some of these children can be our country's future doctors, lawyers, artists, scientists, and politicians. You can help children with learning disabilities. Please send a contribution to SCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. That's SCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Ten blocks north of the honky tonk of 42nd Street and Times Square is the Roseland Ballroom. Too many people remember it or have heard of it from the 10 cents a dance days when it was still located on Broadway. But the 52nd Street Roseland has been, is, and probably always will be the greatest night out anywhere for anyone who dreams of romance at a price that the ordinary person can afford. Nowhere else in New York can you dance to orchestras that bring you the haunting melodies from the time when I, along with so many of you listening, was young. Remember this one? Oh, how can I forget? <laughs> they played it on our first date. Mm-hmm. Forty-five years, Mary. I was twenty, and you were... <laughs> What? Well, you know, a woman doesn't like to talk about her age. Seventeen. That's bad. <laughs> That's what I was. <laughs> but since you're already trumpeting that that was 45 years ago, anybody could add up to how old I am now. Me in my big mouth. <laughs> you're not old. You'll never be old. <sighs> I don't want to feel it anyway. Oh. 
Well, we'd better sit down, darling. What's the matter, Mary? You're not sick, are you? No, of course not. But <laughs> just in case you haven't noticed, the music has stopped. Now, you mustn't get sick, Mary. Ever. I don't know what I'd do if anything ever happened to you. Don't be silly and let go of me. People are looking at us. Well, they're only jealous. Besides, I like having my arms around you. I'm just tired. I'd, I'd like to sit down for just a moment. All right, honey. But it's not like you. It will soon be time. I don't want to go. No one ever does. But I'm not ready yet. No one ever is. You're no different than anyone else. But we are. We're... Ed and I are... A special. So are all God's children. Better make your preparations, Mary. It's not like you to get tired. Are you all right? Yes, I, I'm fine. Don't look so worried. Oh, maybe a little rest. Oh, they've started the music again. You knew they would. Well, then, don't let's waste it. I thought you said you were tired. I am, little. But I like so much to have your arms around me. Oh, Ed, it's been a wonderful 45 years. It's only beginning. Yes, I wish Angie and Tom could get as much out of life as we do. Well, they had a different world, Mary. Korea, Vietnam, the whole shebang changing around like musical chairs. Everything coming apart at the seams. And we didn't have it tough. We had the big war. It's so long ago, I forgot it. And at least we came out of it the same way we went in. Angie and Tom, they never had the chance to know just where they stood. But we've always known... We're the lucky ones. Well, my daughter's done better than me. She had four kids. I only had Angie. You regret that so much? Just a long time ago, when I was younger, I always wanted to give you a boy. I didn't know. And you wanted one, too. The best I ever wanted was you. And still do. Forever and ever. Till death to us. Don't say that. But it. I'm just remembering back to that wonderful day we married. Come on. Let's dance. <laughs> All right. Oh. I wonder what Angie and Tom really feel about us. They love us. What else? I mean, like tonight. It was a nice dinner. I should have stayed to do the dishes. You couldn't, my lady. You were going out dancing. Well, that's what I mean. Why couldn't they have come along? Uh, it's not their thing. Uh, I realize. I just wonder if they think of us as silly. Do you? No. Then I don't think they do either. At least we're not old parties who hang around them like a ball and chain. Oh, we'd never do that, I hope. So what are we worried about them for? Let's cut a South American rug, you and me. Tom? What is it, Angie? Aren't you finished yet? No, these darn bills sure pile up. I guess it'll be another hour. You like some coffee? Huh? No, 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 thanks, honey. I got enough on my mind already to keep me awake half the night. The kids in bed? <laughs> Finally. How's Susie? Oh, still got the sniffles, but no temperature. She'll be all right. Oh, did uh, Ricky get home? No, not yet. Uh-huh. I'll have a few words for that young man when he does. I told him I wanted him back here by 11. Well, it's only 10 after or so. <laughs> Ricky's the least of my worries. He's young enough to take care of himself. Yep. That's a funny thing to say. I don't get it. Oh, I didn't mean it the way it sounded. I mean, he's got his whole life ahead of him. Well, Tom, I, I've been thinking about it all the time I was doing the dishes. I'm worried about them. Your mom and pa? Yes. They're not getting any younger, you know. <laughs> 
He sure as heck ain't getting any older than I can see, out kicking up their heels right this moment in Roseland Ballroom the way they do every Thursday night. Well, maybe they shouldn't be. They're both in their sixties. Sure and good for the next thirty years. Hey, wait a minute. They didn't say anything, huh? I mean, they both seem fine to me. Well, I thought Mom looked kind of, you know, odd. Like her face was sort of drawn. Oh, she said she'd been dieting. That can show in the face. Well, they've both been dieting. And Pop looked just as apple-cheeked as ever. <laughs> you know, he told me while you two were in the kitchen before dinner, he sneaked a little snack here and there. <laughs> Mom knows he does. And he knows she knows. Ah, uh, your father couldn't do anything wrong for your mother. <laughs> He's the same about her. He worships her. Just like she does him. I never saw two like them. They sure are a perfect pair. That's just what got me worried. Oh, Tom, what would they ever do without each other? Oh, hey, come on. Take it easy. What kind of a way is that to think? A lousy way. But I can't help it. I mean, I'm going on 40. I can't help thinking now and then my life's half over. And more. But they... They've got so little time left compared. Angie, you've got to snap out of it. You just keep the house and run the kids and take care of me the way you do. And stop worrying about your mom and pop. They can take care of themselves. I hope if anything does happen to them, they go together. Oh, come on, Angie. One just couldn't live without the other, don't you see? The one who was left would be the worst off. Angie. Oh, yes? Now, you just listen to me. You believe in God, don't you? <laughs> what a thing to ask, of course. Right, so do I. And I know for both of us that a marriage like your mom and pop have had for 45 years was made in heaven, right? Right. So you see, God wouldn't give them all that happiness and then take it away. <laughs> they must be sort of special in his eyes. <laughs> so when the time comes, leave it to him. He'll handle it right. You know what, Tom? What? I think Mom and Pop rubbed off on us. I love you. I could have danced all night. <laughs> I could have danced all You night. already did. Not till good night, sweetheart. Well, the rains came. But this is an anniversary. We had that last month. Our wedding anniversary. This is different. 1946. You remember my first night home after the service? Mm -hmm. We danced, and then I took you home and carried you over the threshold. Well, you've got to get me there first, and in this rain, good luck. Don't you know we have all the luck, darling? You need a cab? No sweat. Hey, taxi! Hey! What? How did you do that? It was easy. You and me, we're God's children. <laughs> Cramble in, honey, before oh, get wet. Time yeah. to go home. 625 West 69, please. Do you know how lucky we were to get this cab? Do you know how lucky we were to find each other? Uh, oh, Ed. It's been such a long, wonderful time. It's only the beginning. Ed, don't say that. It worries me. Why? Mm, because we've used up almost all the time. Don't ever think of it that way. We could have 30, 40 years, a whole lifetime. That's what I look forward to. As long as we have it together. It wouldn't matter any of it if we didn't. That's what I'm afraid of. So am I. If I was left alone, I'd, I'd just soon be dead. So would I. Only it won't be. Because we're the lucky... Look out! <laughs> Did you talk to the doctor, Tom? Uh, yes, Angie. How's Mother? Can we see her now? Well, uh, there isn't any point, honey. She's under sedation. But is she hurt? Oh, I, I, I don't think so. Just shocked. But, oh. you know, doctors, Dr. Whalen doesn't want to be quoted till all the tests are in. What about Dad? Well, the truck sideswiped them on his side. I guess he got a pretty hard whack on the head. He's, he's still out. You don't think he... Oh, no, 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 no. Of course not. Oh. Well, from what you say, things look better for Mother than they do for him. I didn't say that. If it has to be one of them, that's the way it should be. It should be Pop to go. 
Angie, I, I thought you and your father were... My father and I have always been as close as any daughter and father can be. Oh, but how can you... Say... Mom and I have been just as close. She's the one who's stronger. If, if they have to be separated, she's the one who has at least a chance to adjust. If Mother died, Dad would wither like an old vegetable. But darn it, why does anyone have to die? What can I say, darling? As it must all men. Oh, I couldn't hatch you, quote for quote. The Welsh poet, Dylan, do not go gentle into that dark night. Or something close to that. <laughs> but Mom and Pop could and should if they would go hand in hand. Oh, Tom, whenever it is, can't the Lord arrange it that way? Death comes as an uninvited guest, an unwanted one. He comes as an enemy, an antagonist. But he comes, too, as a friend and a welcome one. Here are two people at the high tide of life with so much left to offer and so much yet to give. Is it their time? If you had the supreme power to legislate, what sentence would you pronounce on Ed and Mary Harvey? I shall return shortly with Act Two. When even I stopped going to my own coffee club, I knew something was wrong. It had to be my coffee. Then I switched to new improved Kava Instant. Now no one leaves my house with a bitter feeling. Kava's the only 90% acid neutralized coffee. That means it tastes less bitter when you drink it, so it feels better after. And with its improved blend of coffee beans, Kava tastes better than ever. Now my coffee club is so popular, I even turned down my own mother. <laughs> new improved Kava Instant. Tastes better when you drink it, so it feels better after. Down here. When you get a cold, are you a stay-at-homer or a keep-goiner? Keep-goiner. Even with a runny, wet cold? Keep going. Even with a cloggy, sneezy cold? Keep going. Even with a stuffed-up, sinusy cold? Uh-huh. Well, how do you do it? Give my cold a contact. <laughs> of course. The tiny time pills. Look, uh, I really got to get back to work. That's the way. Keep going. Charge. No cold tablet or liquid keeps relief going up to 12 hours per dose like contact. That keeps you going cold medicine. Take only as directed. Turn back toward the window. Crushed out a cigarette. Leave it all. Hi, this is Kenny Rogers. Every cigarette smoker can stop. Don't care how long or how much you smoked, how many times you've fallen off the wagon and tried to crawl back on, or how chained you may think you are to your cigarettes. And here's some tips on how to get loose from the cigarettes. First, believe in yourself. Then, begin to carry your cigarettes in a different place. Switch your brand of cigarettes at least twice a week. Don't carry matches or a lighter. Challenge yourself each morning by jotting down how many cigarettes you think you need. And at night, how many you actually smoked. Don't get crippled in your best years by heart disease. Get some help. Quit smoking. Call the American Heart Association and put your money where your heart is. Give to the American Heart Association. They're fighting for your life. and the nurses, of course. Yet for all their vaunted knowledge, their educated skill, the special cases become as mysterious as life itself. Their treatment, at the last, depends on some tremendous effort of the human spirit, or perhaps divine intervention. Death becomes as whimsical a caller on them as he is to the rest of us plain folks. We just want to keep you for a day or two until we redo the tests, Mary. Doctor, you're sure that Ed is out of danger? Oh, yes, he's healthy as an ox. He lived to be a hundred. I thought we'd both been killed in that crash. Why couldn't we have died together? It would have been perfect. You can't decide that, Mary. You are not God. It isn't fair to take me from him. It isn't Ed's time. Yet. 
But it is mine? Soon, Mary. Very soon. But I can't die when he needs me. How can I help him? How can I help him? Trust in God's mercy. He'll show you the way. You thought what, Mary? What? Oh, uh... No, it doesn't matter. I couldn't really explain. It's just something between me and... myself. So, Dad's okay? Well, he had a slight subdural hematoma, but it cleared up spontaneously. Oh. You can take him home as soon as you want to. Oh, that's wonderful. What about Mother? Well, now, we'd... We'd like to keep her for a little more observation. But Tom said the doctors didn't think she was hurt in the accident. Well, that's true enough, uh, but, uh... But... But what? Now, I don't want to alarm you, Mrs. Gorman. I... <laughs> I should call you Angie. I've known you long enough. Uh, just a couple of routine tests we took, uh, what shall I say, backfired on us. They have to be done again. Just as a precaution. Does Dad know about this? Well, uh, not yet. Oh, he's going to be a wild man. Couldn't you just have him stay on in the hospital so he could go home with Mother? Oh, Angie, I can't justify that. We need the bed, and there's no reason to keep your father. Oh, but there is to keep Mother. Oh, there's something wrong. Something really wrong. Well, let's not cross any bridges until we... Uh, until we have to build them. Do me a favor, will you sit down? I can't, Tom. I keep worrying about Mary there in the hospital. Now she's getting the best of care and Angie's with her. I know. They're not taking any chances until all the tests are in. Well, they'd better not be something bad. I'll get that taxi driver and that taxi company and I'll break Hey, it. wait a minute. You're looking to sue get after the truck company. The truck sideswiped you and that truck company has more money. I don't want money, Tom. I, I just want Mary. And you'll have her. She's fine. By tomorrow she could be home. Come on, get your mind off it. You, you want to play some gin? Why should I play gin? I never win. Yeah, it's with my mother-in-law. With me, you have a patsy. How come? An accountant. Don't ask me why, but I always lose. I've got to face it, Angie. This is one time I can't win. But all the tests aren't in. The last ones. But the first ones proved it out. You see, I've known for a long while that something was very wrong. The second time around, they'll find the same thing. What? Oh, I don't know if I could give you the correct name from all the doctors' fancy language back and forth. Leukemia, I suppose. Acute. But they can treat that today. Some forms. Most, maybe. But not mine. It's irreversible. And, uh, what's that other big word? Uh, not remissible. The merciful thing is, it will be very fast. Oh. Who's going to tell Dad about it? No one. Well, but if you're stuck here in the hospital... I won't be. I will be coming home. To Tom and me? No. To Ed to my own place. But who's going to take care of you? I am going to take care of myself and I don't want any help from anyone. But, Mom, Mom, you can't. I mean, won't, won't there be um, pain? And... I have been living with that for quite a while, Angie, and I'll live with it till as near the end as I can. Pop should know. No. He could help you. He will help me by just being. Now... The one I have to ask for help is you. Oh, Mom, anything. But I want you to help me convince your father of something. But I can't. When I... If I am no longer here, I know how lost he's going to be. 
You can say that again. I want you to find someone else for him. Hold it right here, Mary. Oh. Head of the stairs. You out of breath? A little. <laughs> Me too. These stairs get steeper every year. Uh, well, it isn't that. It's just, you know, five days sitting around that old hospital doing nothing. My knees are a little weak. I love you, Mary. Oh. Welcome home. Oh, Ed. I want to stay here forever. <laughs> well, we want to do a little gallivanting, too. But whatever you want to do, my darling. As long as I can be with you. How long do you think she's got, Angie? I don't know. The doctor can't say. Not long. And there's pain, Tom. Uh, we should have kept them here with us. Mother wouldn't hear of it. She wants every minute she can with him. And then? Well... If worse comes to worse, he can always live with us, can't he? Sure, I guess. I mean, what else is there for him to do? What Mother wants him to do. Find someone to take her place. Ah, oh, no way. That's a dead end. Your mother and father are two halves of the same mold. And they broke it the day they met up with each other. <laughs> I've always thought this was the most beautiful spot in the world. No argument for me. It was a picnic just like this, right under this waterfall, that I proposed. <laughs> but this wasn't where I accepted. Now, wait a minute. You said yes. Oh, of course. But I'd already said that in my heart the first time we met. Oh, Mary, it's been a lovely life. One reason I've been spending all these weeks with you retracing it. What's the other reason? Did I say there was one? I think we ought to unpack and get the picnic laid out. I'm getting hungry. Uh, not until you level with me. We've been having a wonderful, what would you call it, retrospective. Delving into the past, reliving as many of the best moments of it as we can. Why? Why is all this important, Mary? You won't have to prove anything to me. I wasn't trying to prove anything. I just... Oh, all these places and memories are the sum total of my life. Our life. I wanted to taste them once more before... Before what? Ed, darling, I've never asked you for very much, have I, down through the years? Well, I don't know, because whatever you asked for was already freely given. What is it you want? A promise. A promise of what? Would you give it blindly? A promise that whatever I ask, you would try to fulfill? Yes. Now, I'm going to hold you to that when the time comes. Well, what's all this mystery, Mary? Oh, indulge me, just a whim. I don't want to talk about it now. Because the sun is high and the waterfall makes a rainbow. And I love you. And God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. Now, let's have our picnic lunch before the ants beat us to it. like you, Mary. The feeling's mutual. What else is any dance? Yeah, the feeling's still mutual. But... Well, what? Well, you can't dance every dance with the same fortunate girl. Sometimes you have to change partners. Why? Well, if the regular isn't available, then what would you do? Just sit it out. And waste all the music? Who cares about the music if you don't have the right partner to... Uh, uh, Mary. Uh, what is it? I... Oh, I can't any longer. Oh, I can't. 
Ed, get me out of here. I'll take you right home. No, not home. You get me to the hospital. You can see Mary now, and Dr. Whalen, Josh, it can't, it can't be terminal. Ed, what can I say? Don't let her die. It's out of my hands. Well, she's been so well these past few weeks, so full of, so full of life. I've never seen her look better or act younger. Well, you'll never know what an effort that must have been. Look, we're, we're here now. Don't make it any harder for her. Face it with the courage she has. Oh, Mary, darling. Oh, Ed. Oh, my. Don't you look handsome? Well, you look beautiful. I want to. For our last date. No, no, Mary. No. Nothing either of us can do about it. I wanted to see you for this one last time. To tell you how much I love you. As I love you. I know. And that's why I know you won't go back on your promise. What promise? The blind one I asked you for. What is it? I want you to promise me on your heart of hearts that when I'm gone, you... You look for another girl. Mary, I, I couldn't look at anyone after you. Oh, my darling, it's very flattering and what I want to hear, but I've lived with you for close to half a century, and I know you could never bear to be alone. Don't leave me. I have to. You promise? You promise the way you said you would? Uh, I promise. But it won't do any good. enough, Mary. It's all you can do. But he's right. It won't do any good. He'll never know till he tries. Neither will you. Would you be jealous? No. Not of anything that brought him happiness. Then it's time to go. You can't fight it any longer. Remember, he promised. You can die in peace. Mary. Mary. Don't leave me. I... I have to, sweetheart. But it'll be all right. You... See. No. No. I can't live without you. possibly find someone to take her place? A question to be answered when I return shortly with our final act. Well, never thought I'd get hemorrhoids. Just what I need now that I drive a cab. Here's how I use Preparation H. You too? Anybody can get hemorrhoids, especially people who sit a lot. But Preparation H often gives me fast, temporary relief from occasional pain and itch. Sounds great. Even help shrink swelling of tissues caused by inflammation. I'll try it. It's good this week. Yours is the best. <laughs> Preparation H relieves pain and itch, even helps shrink swelling. Use only as directed. Hi, Pat Summerall to say that True Value Hardware Stores offer a wide selection of quality master mechanic hand tools so you can choose the right tool for the project at hand. Like the 12-foot power tape rule with locking toggle blade for just $5.48. Or the home brazing torch kit, complete with rods, fuel, and instructions for just $15.48. Like all master mechanic tools, both are backed by the promise of satisfaction or a free replacement. And they're sold only at participating True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers. Hi, this is Andy Williams. I learned about the importance of donating blood when my mother became ill. Although most people could qualify as donors, 
Many have not donated blood because they have not personally experienced the need, either for themselves or for those they care about. Presently, over 30,000 pints of blood are required in the United States every day, and the need is increasing. The balance between supply, demand, and human life depends on you, the public. Donors often respond when there is an emergency or a disaster, but blood of every group and type must be available at all times. Blood banks depend on people who are willing to give to meet the day-to-day -day blood needs. Donate today at a blood bank in your community. Blood is life. Let's keep it running. A public service of this station and the American Association of Blood Banks. since Ed Harvey lost his wife. And Ed has aged six years in the same time. He has refused his daughter's invitation to live with them and instead has remained holed up in the apartment he shared with Mary, living a half-life, endlessly sifting through all the mementos of the past. He has been slowly driving Angie to a pitch of distraction and his son-in-law Tom to a barely repressed fury at the burden he is putting on their life. A fury that really explodes as he lets himself into the apartment this particular evening. Bob's? Hey, Bob's? Where are you, in the kitchen? I brought some Chinese for you. Oh, now, where the heck... Bob's? Hey, Bob's, it's Tom. You in the bedroom? Hey, you in there? Hey, Bob's, if you are, open up. You hear me? Open up. Hello, Tom. What are you doing in here with the door closed? Why didn't you answer the doorbell? I had to use my keys to get... What's that you got in your hand? This? German Luger? Brought it with me when I came back stateside after the big war. Okay, is, is that thing loaded? Sure. There's a clip in it. Oh, you don't have to worry. The safety catch is on. Pops, what were you planning to do with that? I was just looking through some old things. I found it in the back of a drawer. I even forgot I still had it. Oh, well, well, why don't you just hand it to me? Re real careful, like, please. Sure, if you want me to. Oh, what'd you think, Todd, that I was going to kill myself with it? You ought to know better. Don't you know that to take my own life would be a mortal sin? And I'd never find Mary in all eternity. If you stop talking about Mom, she's dead. Can't you realize that she's dead? You don't have to remind me. No, but maybe I have to remind you about your daughter and me and your grandchildren. We mourn Mom, too, but we accept the fact, no matter how it hurts, because life has to go on. But but you, you, you just stopped the clock, and the way you're acting is driving everybody up the wall. Come on, Pop, give us all a chance, including yourself, to live our own lives. <laughs> I can't, Angie. Be reasonable. That's what I'm asking you to be, Pop. But it doesn't make any sense. How can I look at any other woman but your mother? Well, you wouldn't have to be crazy in love with her. She'd be like a companion. I had a companion. No one can take her place. She doesn't have to take her place. Oh, it should just be someone to get you out of the house, out of yourself. What do you want me to do, Angie? Nothing you don't want to do yourself. Maybe going back to work would help. I don't need to work anymore. I'm retired. Well, maybe you should unretire. I can't go back to the company. Someone else has my job now. You want me to deprive him? Well, get some other kind of work. <laughs> well, I have been thinking of it. But that wouldn't really solve anything. I'd still come home to these empty rooms. Well, then come live with us. Lord knows ours aren't empty. Oh, that's no solution. I'd only clutter up your life. So, we come back to where we started. <laughs> it's just what Mother knew was going to happen. Oh, Pop, you need companionship. You need another woman to start a new relationship with. How am I going to meet her at my age? There's a way. I think it's worth a try. What? Well, there's this woman. Now, she's awfully nice. Not commercial or anything. Her name is Gloria Harmon. And her organization is called the Harmony Club. 
Very carefully run. Very modern methods. What kind of a club is it? A social place where... Oh, people can meet each other. You mean the Lonely Hearts Club? Oh, partner, don't get the wrong idea. It's just a service, a, a, a dating service. It, it's all done by the computer. It matches up people before they even meet. I wouldn't hear of it. Oh. Well, Mary would love herself to death at the very idea. That is, if she didn't get mad, she would. Oh, what am I saying? You listen to what I'm saying. Because before she died, it was Mom who read about this place and told me about it. She's the one who's really suggesting that you go there and take a chance. I'd feel like an old fool. You say it was Mary's idea? Okay, I'll try it. Anything's better than what I've got now. Won't you sit down, Mr. Harvey? Well, don't mind if I do, Mrs. Harvey. Miss. Beg pardon? Miss. I'm not married. Oh. In my business, one likes to remain neutral. You mean you never found a date that would be right for you? That would be telling, wouldn't it? <laughs> Everything is in the strictest confidence and whatever privacy you want to protect, we respect completely. Well, I don't see how that could work out. Don't you have to tell the prospective uh, lady something about me? No. That's the heart of our operation, Mr. Harvey. The gentleman you met outside is Mr. Frisbee, my assistant. Whatever biography you give me goes to him. And he translates it into a card to feed the computer. The computer compares your likes, dislikes, all your statistics with thousands of other members on file from our female clients and suggest the possibilities of any or all of our ladies who might be compatible with you. Well, it, it sounds so, so cold. Not cold, Mr. Harvey. Objective. Scientific. I, I don't know. I, I'm afraid I can't put my heart into this. Oh, nonsense. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want to. Now, shall we get on with a few basic facts? I have your name, address, and so on. Mm, you're 65? Yes. Retired? Yes. Let's see. Hair. I am gray. Eyes. Hmm. Bluish gray. Maybe a hint of green. <laughs> well, let's call them hazel. Some lucky woman's going to like those very much, Mr. Harvey. I, uh, look, I... I don't think I can go through with this. Now, don't be upset. Most people are doubtful and shy to begin with. Give us an opportunity to find someone to pique your interest. If you find the right one, it could open up horizons beyond your belief. There's nothing I want but what I had. Or nobody. But... All right, I'll give it a try. <laughs> This is Gloria Harmony. This is Claude Frisbee at the office. It's a little late for you to be there, Claude. What's the matter? I was setting up tomorrow's appointments, and I have a little problem that has me, well, to say the least, buffaloed. And what's that? It's in this Edward Harvey. I prepared his card and put it in the computer, but I get only one readout. Only one? For such a normal, ordinary man? That's impossible. The computer... Doesn't lie. You have checked. Naturally. Well, oh, then, just set up an appointment with whoever printed out. I tried to do that, but again, there are problems. What? First of all, I checked the name, but she is not in our master file. She's not one of our clients? I say only that I never interviewed or filed her. Yet you have a phone number? Did you call her and set up an appointment? Naturally, I followed through. And? The number I called wasn't a very good connection. It was some sort of message service. Did they say they'd relay the message? Yes. Did they seem reliable? Oh, the voice that answered was very impressive, very reassuring. In spite of all the strange 
sounds in the background, like like music in the spheres. Bisbee, are you all right? Uh, uh, of course, just a little uh, out of my depth. Did you make an appointment for this mystery woman to show up? Uh, yes, tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock. Fine. I'll take it from here. Ah, good afternoon, Mr. Harvey. You're right on the dot. I like to try to be on time. I'm afraid your partner hasn't got here yet. Oh? Oh, oh, would you mind waiting in our get-together parlor? Mm. It's the first door on the right. I'll just make sure and check to see that nothing has gone wrong. This door? That's right. told me you weren't here for me yet. I've always been here for you, Ed. Wherever you are. Mary. Who else did you expect? Well, the computers... Oh, what do computers know about love and human beings? I only tried to do what both you and Angie said you wanted. So you found a partner. I never thought I could. It could only have been you. That's what I told them. Uh... Where I've been. And they said if you wanted to enough, you could be back with me. So that's where we are? That's where we are. But where is... where? There'd be no argument for us, would there, darling? If we just called it... Heaven? isn't too much I can tell you, Angie. Apparently, the moment he walked into that room and the door closed behind him, it hit him. Massive hemorrhage. Perhaps from the taxi accident delayed, perhaps the kind of spontaneous brain lesion which can happen to any of us. He didn't suffer. Now you saw the expression on his face. The opposite of that. Whoever the woman waiting for him was, <laughs> she must have delighted him. But according to Miss Harmon, there was nobody in the room. And then maybe he was welcoming eternity, remembering he could live it with Mary. <laughs> I promised you a mystery. And the greatest mysteries of all are the love stories that transcend death and pass into the history of all time. As this one can, in its small way. I shall return shortly. Cyril introduces Mr. Buster Crab, film actor and author of Buster Crab's arthritis exercise book. I wrote a book on relieving arthritis pain. And I recommend new icy hot cream in the tube. Rub it on. Icy Hot's penetrating warmth reaches way down inside to help relieve minor pain while a feeling of coolness soothes your skin. I'm convinced that new greaseless Icy Hot cream will give you fast, effective relief that lasts for hours. Use only as directed. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniels, and I'm very concerned about hunger in our world. Every minute, 21 children die because they don't have enough to eat. There is enough food to go around for everybody. What's needed now is for each of us to care enough to get involved in this issue. Now, I know you care. What can you do? Write politicians about your concern and support hunger organizations. Thank you. For further information, write Impact on Hunger, 145 East 49th Street, New York, New York, 10017.
A man died in an instant, painlessly, which is to say, mercifully. A man who loved one woman all his life and felt there was little left in life when she was gone. From our story, he joined her in the hereafter. If we want to question that, then we have to question what life is all about. I'm willing to accept that love conquers all. Our cast included John Beale, Terry Keene, Evie Jester, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Why would anyone wish to send annoying notes to such a wonderful, kind person as you is beyond me. You know, I am an avid reader of crime and mystery books. And as a rule, if someone receives messages or warnings of some kind, they either deserve it or it is a case of mistaken identity. I am completely in the dark about this. However, for the present, I, I don't wish anyone to do anything about this. Yeah. I'm going upstairs to rest. I'll answer. This is no time for you to be taking business calls. Hello? Hello? That's funny. There is someone at the other end, but they're not saying anything. Yeah, I'll pick up the extension over here. Hello? Broadway? Yes, what do you want? One million dollars. Who are you? One million dollars. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. WKBN, Youngstown, Ohio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... that more pungent words have ever been voiced than those rebuking the disciple Peter when Jesus said to him, For what doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? What exchange shall a man give for his soul? Such a man was Peter Ordway, the wealthiest for miles around, yet, in many ways, the poorest. What do you mean, breaking in here? Who are you? Mr. Ordway, you know who I am. I never saw you before in my life. You have forgotten, Peter, but I haven't. We were together a long time on that raft. On that raft? Yes. I've come, Ordway, after all these years to collect the debt. Are you going to pay up or not? Oh, Mr. Ordway, he's got a gun. <laughs> drama, The Raft, was adapted from a story by Jacques Futrell, especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis, and stars Norman Rose and Marion Seldes. I shall return shortly with Act One. The time, now. The place, Ordway Grove, an estate on the James River surrounded by a thousand acres of Virginia plantation. Since 1720, the Grove's Georgian colonial house has been the home of generations of Ordways. Now the sole survivor is 70-year-old Peter Ordway, much to the regret of those who know him. In other words, to know Peter is not to love him. This is Frederick Walpole. I've been hanging on to this phone for ten minutes, waiting to speak to the bank's vice president. This is Mrs. Raymond. 
Oh, uh, Mrs. Raymond, good. Uh, I have Peter Ordway here, if you would be so good as to hold on. Certainly. Virginia? Mr. Ordway, what can we do for you? What are you up to down there at the Fourth National? I do follow you, Mr. Ordway. Mr. Ordway, if someone here has done something to displease you, the sooner I know what it is, the sooner we can have the situation corrected. Well, if I knew who the culprit was, I wouldn't be calling you, Mrs. Raymond. Mr. Ordway, I am trying to apologize. I don't know what to apologize for. Didn't the messenger arrive with your monthly statement? I received the statement, and with it I also received a card with something written on it. Why is that why you call me? What is written on the card? Three words. One million dollars. Well, I don't see why that distresses you. I want to know why that card is in the same envelope with my bank statement. Well, uh, uh, probably if some bank teller scribbled that notation down. It was just accidentally included with your check. I cannot accept that. Now, Mrs. Raymond, I want you to make a thorough investigation and report back to me. Goodbye. Walpole? Walpole, are you here yet? Oh, good morning, Mr. Ordway. Beautiful morning. Well, I uh, brought your mail up from downstairs. Nothing of great interest. A few inquiries. Mm. The uh, Antiquities Association wants to conduct a tour of the mansion on Jefferson Davis Day. Uh, yeah, your foreclosure of the Hills Point houses have been signed. Now, what, what is this? This this card? Uh, oh, uh, I didn't see that. It uh, came in an envelope with no return address. Does this card look familiar? A plain three-by-five card. Nothing on this side. With one... Million dollars? Well, B, it's the same handwriting as the one that came yesterday with the bank statement. Uh, what should I do? Tear it up! Two cards in two days with the same words on it? <laughs> Talk about a sudden downpour. The sun was out five minutes ago. Well, Paul, uh, believe me, will you? Uh, we'll attend to the correspondence after lunch. Mm, yes, sir. Uh, shall I have Harper bring you a lunch tray? Well, I'll see how I feel then. Yes, sir. Uh, and call that female vice president of the bank and, and see what she's found out. when it's raining. The raft. We're on a raft on the high seas. Clothes wet through and through. How much longer is it going to be before we're picked up? How long can we hold out? Oh, if I could only forget all of that. Forget who was saved. And forget who was drowned. I brought you your lunch, Mr. Ordway. Hmm? Lunch? Yes. Mr. Walpole said you'd be remaining upstairs. Oh. Uh, has it stopped raining? Well, Mr. Ordway, it stopped two hours ago. Oh, has it? Uh, I must have dozed off. That is because you are staying up too late at night. You are reading too much and writing too much, and it's not good for you. My dear Harper, that is the curse of business. One has to read reports, analyze output, etc., if I don't keep working at it, Ordway Industries could go under. But you're a wealthy man. You should enjoy yourself. You've worked hard all your life. Now's the time to stop. Enjoy your plantation. <laughs> well, on my day off, I take one of my mystery books and I go rowing on the James River. You should try that. Harper, how long have you been housekeeper here at Ordway Grove? Since I was 25. Don't you remember? <sighs> You've been a good friend to the Grove and the plantation. It's been a good friend to me. Now, put this tray on your desk, and I want you to eat every scrap. Harbor, good morning. Didn't expect to see you dusting the hall furniture at eight in the morning. Mr. Ordway, what in heaven's name are you doing downstairs so early? When you're my age, you don't need as much sleep. Uh... Has the mail come yet? At eight o'clock? No, oh, there's a new mailman. He takes his time. Why don't you go upstairs? I'll bring you some breakfast. Because I don't wish to. Don't wish to what? Go upstairs. I wish to see the mail when it arrives. You are a stubborn man. Yes, I am stubborn. Harper, why didn't you ever marry a pretty woman like you? Well, I... I suppose, because nobody ever asked me. Besides, if I did marry, who would take care of you? You are more than any single sane person could handle. 
I suppose I should bring a cup of coffee right here. Could I persuade you to sit on the bench? What for? Well, then you'll be out of the draft. It's cold this morning. I'll fetch the coffee. Warm you up. Who said anything about being cold? I'm not cold. That's what I told them. Who's cold? I'm not cold. It was freezing on that raft. November, December in the Atlantic. But I wouldn't show fear. I'm an Ordway. The disgusting spectacle of the six of them. Mooning for a cup of hot coffee. All right, one was a woman. But the others... People are such cowards when they're out of their element. Oh, 30, 40-foot waves. Not a ship to be seen day and night. Oh, saying they wanted coffee instead of saying their prayers. Here's your cup. Now drink it and give me some peace. You are the only person in the world I permit to talk to me like that. And where are you going? You know I don't take sugar and cream. I'm picking up the mail just in push through the slot. I'll leave it here on the table. No, on second thought, I shan't. I want you to drink that slowly and quietly. And then you may read your mail. You may remove the letters from the envelopes. Since that is Mr. Walpole's job and your secretary doesn't arrive till nine o'clock, am I asking too much to expect you to say please, Mr. Ordway? Please, Harper, would you open my mail? I'm particularly interested if there's a, a letter containing a three-by-five card. Well, you finish your coffee. I am perfectly capable of handing the letter opener. Well, this is your lucky day. I can't see why such an ill-tempered gentleman as you should get your wish, but here is your three-by-five card. <laughs> Mr. Ordway, would you be careful of that china? Give, give, give me that card. Oh. You're as white as a sheet. What is it? No, I, I'm all right. I'm all right. Mr. Warple, you arrived just in the nick. Mr. Ordway isn't well. I'm going to get him some water. Oh, oh what is it, sir? It's... It's... It's another one. Another one of the... of the same. Why, well, that's three in three days. What does it mean? What, uh, one million dollars for what? For whom? Here. Now drink this water down, Mr. Ordway. I told you I hate water. It has something to do with that card, Mr. Walpole. May I see it? One million? What do you suppose that means? Hmm. It's the same handwriting as yesterday's and the day before that. And the one slipped into my bank statement. And you had no idea what it means. What? None. Perhaps it's some kind of blackmail. Uh, do you think we should call the police? No. No. No police. But if we don't go to the police or hire a private investigator, how are we ever going to find out why these cards have been sent to you? I don't care why. I want to know who sent them. Why, someone's at the front door. Uh, I'll go. Now, Mr. Ordway, let me bring you a soft-boiled egg and some toast. A and what do you say to another cup of coffee? Telegram for Mr. Ordway. I I'll sign for it. How about it? Yes? Another cup of coffee? No, no, no. Now, Harper, uh, you stay here. Is a uh, telegram for you, sir? Oh, don't, don't stand there. Give it to me. <gasps> Mr. Ordway! Lord, he's, he's fainted. Uh, what do we do? Uh... I'd lay him down on the bench. I've got some smelling salts in my apron. <laughs> I always carry them, especially with him. Mr. Wilbur, lift his feet up onto the bench. We have to decide what we want to do. I've examined the stores, and there's not much left. Not enough, I'd say, to last another week. Either we were shortchanged originally, or... Has been secretly stealing the food meant for us all. How is he, Harper? Since we got him up to his room, he won't say a word. I left him lying on top of his bed, wide awake. Oh, I wonder if we shouldn't call Dr. Anderson. That's really not necessary. If I thought so, of course I'd call a doctor. It's a little rattling to have someone sending you strange notes. Could I see the telegram? All it says is one million dollars. 
Yet it was enough to make him faint. Of course, he is 70. He's no youngster. But does he owe someone a million dollars? Not that I know of. It's a threat, then. With malice of all thought, I'd say. Give me that oh, telegram. Oh, Mr. Hood, are you frightening? We, uh, we didn't hear you come down the stairs. Walpole, I won't be needing you anymore today. You may have the rest of the day off. Mr. Ordway, anything I can do to help, please, will you call on me? Harper, you are the only one I can trust. Well, whoever's sending you these notes, I think is shameful. Why would anyone wish to send annoying notes to such a wonderful, kind person as you is beyond me. You know, I am an avid reader of crime and mystery books. And as a rule, if someone receives messages or warnings of some kind... They either deserve it, or it is a case of mistaken identity. I am completely in the dark about this. However, for the present, I, I don't wish anyone to do anything about this. Now, I'm going upstairs to rest. I'll answer. This is no time for you to be taking business calls. Hello? Hello? There's someone at the other end, but they're not saying anything. Yeah, I'll pick up the extension over here. Hello? Hardway? Yes, what do you want? One million dollars. Who are you? One million dollars. If someone demands such a large sum of money, he must have reason to believe he can get it. But what for? For services rendered? Possibly. And if payment is not forthcoming, what could be the penalty? The hard currency of ultimatums? Riches, says the Proverbs, shall not profit in the day of revenge. Is the threat revenge? To help you solve the puzzle, I shall return shortly with Act Two. of 70, and also on the edge of a dilemma. He is being subjected to a barrage of demands for one million dollars. His personal secretary, Walpole, has been ordered not to inform the police. However, his housekeeper, Harper, has a mind of her own and uses her day off to investigate. Mr. Ordway, what are you up to wandering about the front hall? Did Cook serve you up the luncheon I ordered? Well, I wasn't hungry. Uh, Isn't this your day off, Harper? You're entitled to a full day. It's only three o'clock. I had to come back to you and report to you the results of my investigation. Report what? The matter of the telegram. I hoped I might unearth a clue. After all, you can't send a telegram without someone in the telegraph office knowing who sent it. Well, I interviewed a manager in town, checked the records. Blind Alley... As detectives would tell you, the message and the cash to cover delivery was put through the mail slot in the telegraph office. Where's Mr. Walpole? What? Uh, I sent him on an errand. Well, it's just as well I came back when I did. Was there another of the telephone calls? I mean, while I was out? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, the nerve. Makes me very angry. Oh. Uh, Mr. Ordway, he's faded again. Cork! Oh, Cork! Help me get Mr. Ordway the whole bench. I'm going to call Dr. Anderson. I should have done it yesterday. What is it, Dr. Anderson? Is it serious? Yeah, I wish he lived on the ground floor. But we managed to get him up to his bedroom, all right. Serious? Take a look. He's resting comfortably. I am not Anderson. I dislike being in bed in broad daylight. Listen to him. He may have had a slight stroke. I'm not surprised. Every time I see him for a checkup, I tell him the same thing. He doesn't listen. I know what you tell me. Nerves, overwork, no recreation. Well, I've got no time for recreation. My my business is... No time, poppycock. You're 70 years old. You and Ordway Industries are worth $50 million. Now, if you want to enjoy any of that money, you need a complete change. 
Take a cruise, a good long cruise. Get some sea air no. into your lungs. Instead of this stuffy Georgian mausoleum you live in, take a trip on the water. No. Yes, sea air, an ocean trip. I couldn't ever, never again. I'm afraid. We'll never get out of this alive. Only three of us on this raft now. Holding on. Night and day. No food left. Hardly any water to drink. What is the use of all my money to me now? I've never lived. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. The raft is leaking. Too much weight. How much longer can we stay afloat? Harper tells me you had a bad afternoon and Dr. Anderson was here. You look all right this evening. Never better, Walpole. Uh, did you... Did you bring what I told you? Did, did you get it? Well, of course I got it. Here are the bullets, and here is the revolver. At 22. All right, Walpole. Uh, uh, dig into that pile of correspondence on the desk. But... Mr. Ordway, uh, are you loading that revolver? Um, <laughs> well, it's not much use to be empty now, is it? Just, uh, don't point it at me. Uh, did you, uh, receive any more of those telephone calls? Yes, I did. And I invited the caller to join me here this evening. That person, the, the one who wants the million? Told him the front door would be unlocked. To walk up one flight of stairs to find me. So, that's why you wanted me to buy the revolver. Man's home is his castle. It's his duty to protect himself. Ah. Come in, sir. I've been expecting you. Uh, do close the door behind you. You haven't changed much, Ordway. I don't know you. I don't expect you to recognize me. I didn't have white hair and a white beard in those days. Who are you? You know who I am. We were together long enough on that raft. You haven't forgotten. Oh, that... that raft. I've come to collect the debt, Ordway. You received my little reminders, didn't you? Those cards. And the telegram. Uh, uh, sir, whoever you are... Lord Paul, uh, pay no attention to the man and he'll go away. I, I just picked up his revolver. Look, uh, look at that poor man. Blood uh, all over his face. Uh, Mr. Walpole, why did you shoot him? Mr. Walpole, my name is Detective Gower. You're not under arrest. We've merely asked you to come down to headquarters to make a formal affidavit as a witness to the crime. Would you please begin? Uh... Yes, um, uh, my, my name is, uh, Frederick Walpole. I'm, uh, 48 years old. Uh, I've been in Mr. Ordway's employ for about 30 years. I, uh, went to his house at, uh, 9 o'clock this evening to take dictation, and at his request to bring a revolver and a box of bullets he asked me to buy. Uh, he, um, he sat behind his desk, loading the revolver, and I sat facing him across the desk. I I heard the door open behind me. I, I I thought it was Harper, his housekeeper, and then I I, I t turned around. Who was standing in the door? A uh, man. Um, he, he seemed pretty old. He he had a white beard, white hair. His face was ruddy, like a, a sailor or someone who lived outdoors. Anything else you can remember? Um, yeah yeah. He he had a cane. He he was leaning on it. Can you remember what was said? Well, um, first, Mr. Ordway said, who are you? You know me, all right. We were together long enough on that craft. He said either, uh, craft or raft. I'm, I'm not sure which. I've come for the reward you promised me. One million dollars. Then, suddenly, Mr. Ordway fired his revolver. 
Now, the man must have fired at the same moment because I only heard one shot and, and Mr. Ordway fell over. Uh, the man disappeared. Uh, Mr. Ordway had fallen in back of his desk. Dead. Um, I, I ran to him and, and picked up his revolver where he dropped it. Uh, Which is where Harper, the housekeeper, found you. All right, that'll do for now, Mr. Walpole. You mean I, I, I can go? Yes, you may, but please don't leave the city. We'll be back to you again. Yes, go on, Mrs. Harper. Uh, is it Mrs. Harper or Miss Harper? Miss Harper, I'm afraid. After hearing the shot, I ran upstairs to Mr. Ordway's floor where he has his office and bedroom. I banged on the door and went in. And then what did you do? I saw Mr. Walpole holding a pistol and standing over the late Mr. Ordway, who was bleeding on the floor. I ran out of the room, called the police and Dr. Anderson. Is there only one door leading in and out of that room? No, there are several. The main one is from the stairs, another one to the office, to his bedroom, and another to the private sitting room. So it was through one of the other doors that the assailant could have escaped and not been seen by you. Did you notice whether the other doors were open or shut? No, I didn't. All I could do was run downstairs, call the police and the doctor. Who did you call first? I called Dr. Anderson first, hoping that Mr. Ordway's life could be saved. Please continue, Dr. Anderson. Yes, Mr. Ordway had been dead about uh, half an hour when I arrived. Uh, the police were already there. For your information, we've recovered two unexpended cartridges, twenty-two caliber, one copper jacketed slug. Hmm. Well, is there anything uh, further you wish from me at this time, Mr. Cowell? Thank you, no. But I would like your full report as soon as you can have it ready. Harper, you thought I'd killed Mr. Ordway, didn't you? Well, how can you blame me? When I found the smoking gun in your hand, it looked like a quick hit. I'd only picked it up from the floor where it fell. The man who shot Mr. Ordway had disappeared. Oh, he's too horrible. Poor Mr. Ordway lying in the morgue, being examined by forensics. Or is it ballistics? Or, uh, when are they going to bury him? Well, as soon as the police release him. Oh, I hope they hurry. Until he's safely in the ground. We can't have the reading of the will. You know a lot about this, don't you? Well, I, 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 I've never attended a reading of the will, but I am longing to do it because we mystery buffs, we know that if the murderer is a relative or a friend, he may have the most to gain from the will. Or, or, or thinks he has. I certainly want to be there to watch because there's no telling how people will betray themselves. Mm, I'd be very surprised if the man who shot Mr. Ordway was a friend or a relative. Well, I'm off. And Frederick. Uh, Frederick? For 22 years you've called me Mr. Walpole. If you'd like to, why don't you move into the house? There are plenty of guest rooms. And you could work here as much as you wanted to. Mm. Detective Gower, I think I may be of assistance to you in solving the Peter Ordway case. Well, that's very nice of you, Miss Harper. But you know we've docketed the murder as committed by a person or persons unknown. He's known, all right. And I know him. It is Frederick Walpole. It's just as plain as the nose on my face. I've invited him to stay in the house so I could keep my eye on him. And I'll bet you there was no white-haired, white-bearded, ruddy-faced man with one leg. Did he tell you that? No, as a matter of fact, he'd forgotten to, but he called me about it. Which made it easier for us to check the hospitals. Such a man did present himself to the Jamestown Hospital to have a bullet removed from his shoulder. We're checking to see whether it matches either the bullet removed from Mr. Ordway's body or the gun that Mr. Walpole picked up. So you still believe Mr. Walpole is innocent? Well, let us just say that so far we haven't seen any evidence of his guilt. Are you coming to the will reading? I don't think so. That is entirely a family matter. Miss Harper, may I give you a bit of advice? Yes. Yeah. Don't stick your nose where it doesn't belong. Dear Miss Harper, can't 
Can't you just see her? Devoted, carrying the torch for her employer, Peter Ordway. And now that he is dead, she will, in the tradition of Hercule Poirot, Nero Wolfe, and Jane Marple, do her utmost to bring the guilty to justice. Willy-nilly, I shall return shortly with Act Three. the surface of most people, and what you would find underneath would surprise you. Here is Peter Ordway, whose estate on the James River goes back two and a half centuries, whose family was revered and respected. With every passing generation, the lineage dwindled, until now, the last of the Ordways has passed into the beyond. However, there are people with memories, newspapers with news, and skeletons that rattle in closets. Frederick, I believe I'm on to something. Oh? I spent the entire day in the Sentinel office looking through their old newspaper stories on the Ordway family. Mm-hmm. Where are my notes? Here. Now listen. On November 14th, Mr. Peter Ordway and a party of five from the staff of Ordway Industries took off from Virginia Airport for Brazil. Encountering severe storms, the plane appears to have lost radio contact and has not been heard from since. Now, here's another. Rescue in the Atlantic, December 29th. Mr. Peter Ordway and one other gentleman, not yet identified, were picked up from a life raft in the southern Atlantic. They had been adrift for over a month. Hmm... I wonder where I was when this happened to him. Why, why didn't I hear of it? But, Frederick, I didn't either. Nobody ever talked about it. But it fits together with what that man said that night, remember? We saw a lot of each other on the raft. Hmm. You've got something there. What's your news? <laughs> Any calls when I was out? Uh, nothing exciting. Uh, we've been asked to Mr. Ordway's attorney's office tomorrow for the reading of the will. Nothing exciting. The will reading? We might meet the murderer himself there. I can hardly wait. Well, look who's here. Detective Gow, I thought you weren't coming to the reading of the will. I'm glad that I did. It was very interesting. Fascinating. Congratulations to you, Mr. Walpole. Thank you. I was absolutely floored by Mr. Ordway's bequest to me. $50,000. I don't know what I'll do with all that money. Of course, compared to what he left you, Frederick, it wasn't so much. But I'm sure you deserved it. It was an interesting bequest, Mr. Walpole. An unconditional gift to you for your loyal service of one million dollars. Well... It was news to me. I'm uh, still in a state of shock. Then you won't take this news too hard. You're under arrest. You're arresting Frederick? On suspicion of the murder of Peter Ordway. Hello? Jamestown Hospital? Emergency, please. This is Detective Harper. I am working with Detective Gower on the Peter Ordway case. Oh, you're familiar with it? Good. Now, one of our men jotted down the address of that one-legged man with a white beard and white hair who came to emergency the night of the 15th to have a bullet removed. You handed the bullet over to ballistics. Would you please check on the address he put on the ledger? Oh, hold on, thank you. Got it? Fine, I'll take it down. Holderby Benjamin. 144 Steamboat Road. Uh, any telephone given? Okay, we'll check into it. Mr. Holderby, it's nice of you to let me see you on such short notice. Well, I don't get many visitors, so I can't be choosy. My name, as I told you on the phone, is Harper. <laughs> Miss Harper. This is the first job I've had in the outside world for, oh, quite a few years. Oh, you mean you're not a uh, professional survey taker? Oh, my goodness, no, Mr. Holderby. I, I was a professional housekeeper for many years, but uh, 
My employer died and I had to look for other means of employment. Now, as to you, Mr. Holderby, I can see by your complexion you are an outdoors type. I have been for some time, yes. Mm -hmm. Were you born around here? Not too far. You have had an accident to your leg, I see. Yep. An injury sustained in the war? Yep. Oh, I... I don't want to embarrass you. It's all right. A shark bit off my foot about 30 years ago. Mm, how dreadful. You were swimming in the ocean? Uh, you might say that. I was trying to save my life. Fascinating. And what brought you back to your birthplace? I had some accounts to square. Miss Harper, tell me something. How did you happen to pick my name? I'm pretty much a stranger in these parts. Oh, I, I didn't pick it. I mean, the county sent me a list, which I am just going through alphabetically. And when I came to H, there was your name. Mm -hmm. Now, um... What other questions no, do you have for me? Do you train for a profession? I was an airplane mechanic and pilot. I started 35 years ago. Well, now, that is interesting. For a commercial airline? No, I flew a private plane for company. Really? We go everywhere. Up to Canada, down to South America. All on company business. Well, I must say, this being a survey take is much more interesting than being a housekeeper for Peter Ordway. Oh, my. You were his housekeeper? Yes. Did you know him? Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. Poor man, he died mysteriously. He was shot to death. Is that a fact? Miss Harper, you're a very clever woman, but not clever enough. Now, you and I are going to sit here, and you will tell me the truth. How you happen to come here and who you're working for. No tricks and no lies. <laughs> Mr. Walpole, I want you to tell me why you pretended the million-dollar bequest was such a surprise to you. You don't believe I was surprised, Detective Gower? I know you weren't. I can only assume that you were paid for services rendered sometime during Mr. Ordway's life. All right. I'll tell you. But I am in no way confessing to anything. Thirty years ago, I was 18. I... Had a small job with Ordway Industries in the contract department. Peter Ordway had planned a trip in the company plane to Rio to finalize a contract. At the last moment, the head of the department took sick, so I took his place. What time of year was this? Uh, winter, November. Not the best flying weather. We uh, took off from Virginia Airport. Mr. Ordway, myself, a uh, bilingual secretary, two officials from the International Division, and the pilot... Somewhere over the Atlantic, the motors conked out and we had to ditch the plane in the ocean. We all got into an inflatable raft and hung on for dear life. What's your name, young man? Uh, Frederick Walpole. I I'm in your contract department, Mr. Ordway. Yeah, well, we've been on this raft for three days and no one's spotted us yet. Oh, someone will show up, I'm sure. You're either an optimist or a fool. There's not enough food or water for six people. Hey, you. Pilot. Ben Holderby. Yes, Mr. Ordway? Take a look at the stores. Tell me how much is left. Ordway was right, Detective Gower. There was hardly enough provision for three people, let alone six. The morning of the 15th day at sea, the two company men from the International Division disappeared. They'd fallen overboard during the night, or so I thought. We were down to quarter rations. Instead of four biscuits a day each, it was one. One for Miss Hart, the secretary, one for Ben, the pilot, one for Ordway, and, and one for me. Four days later, the girl disappeared. Yes, it's a darn shame. I can't understand it. How could she have fallen overboard last night? We, we've had such calm seas. She was a nice girl. Well, now let's take stock. Only three mouths to feed. Myself, 
You and Ben. A Walpole. Sit a little closer to me. I want to tell you something. Now, you know I'm a rich man. Oh, yes, sir. You also know it could be days or weeks before we're discovered. No food left. The water, if we're careful with it, just about a quart. And then it's drinking the Atlantic or nothing. Look down there. She's leaking. Every day another inch. Three people are too heavy. Now we could last a whole lot longer if there were only two of us. Now, if you could arrange that... It just wouldn't be Tiger be Baseball without... a man with a lifetime job. You mean for me somehow to push Ben into the water? I'd hit him over the head first. He's a strong man, a good swimmer. You saw how he got this raft out when we hit the water. Now, you get rid of him. Mr. Ordway, why should I do that? For one million dollars. Mr. Walpole, if you're telling me the truth... I am, Detective Gower. Then someone else knew of Ordway's plan to buy death for a million. The man who you claim shot him that night. Did you recognize him? White hair, white beard, one leg and a stump. No, no, I, I never saw him before in my life. Are you sure? People change, you know, and this was 30 years ago. No, sir, I did not know him. Walpole, for the present, I'm booking you. At least I'll know where to find you. Miss Harker, you wanted to talk to the man who fired that gun. How could you shoot such a wonderful man as Mr. Ordway in cold blood? Not in cold blood. It was self-defense. The only difference between him and me was that my aim was better. How long are you going to keep me here? I don't know what to do with you. I haven't figured it out. Why did you want a million dollars from him? Because Ordway owed it to me. Many years ago, I did him a favor. One favor? One million? That was the going race. He never paid me. Ben Holderby! Open the door. This is the police. Holdby told me Ordway had offered him a million to do him a favor. And I'll bet it was to get rid of Walpole. Just as he offered Walpole a million to get rid of Ben. Yet both men are still alive. Miss Harper, I have an idea that uh, you could precipitate some action here. If you don't object, I'll have Holdby and Walpole brought to the holding area and have them confront one another. Then I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't get to the bottom of this. you. You're the man who shot Mr. Ordway. You were so intent on him, you didn't see me, but I saw you. He tried to kill me first. Your name's Holderby, isn't it? That's what it is. That that voice. Where did we meet before? You met 30 years ago. Ben piloted the plane. You and Mr. Ordway were on Frederick. The one that went down. Frederick? You were that kid who worked for the company. Yes. I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. I came to collect because Ordway promised me a million to get rid of you. Because three guys couldn't survive in that leaky raft without food. Well, he said the same to me. But that night I heaved you as far into the sea as I could. I never saw you again. I, I, I swam back under the raft, held on, and waited until you were asleep. Then I hit you with everything I had and dumped you overboard. I... I I never thought you'd make it. I almost didn't. I saw those black fins heading for me. I thought it was all over. Sharks started snapping at me. Thank the Lord, a fisherman pulled me out before too much damage was done. And what about you? Well, two days later, Orway and I were rescued. (laughs) I, I, I know it sounds crazy, but I'm... I'm sure glad I didn't kill you. It's been on my mind for a long time. Well, I hope you've got all the information you need, Detective Gower. We 
We've got what they said on tape. Not that it'll be of very much use. Mr. Ordway must have suspected who was sending him the demands for the million dollars. That's why he sent Frederick to buy him a gun. (laughs) Nobody guilty, I I guess so. Except Mr. Ordway. Isn't there a saying about those who live by the sword die by the sword? happen to be one of those who believe the love of money is the root of all evil. It can be the root of good as well. Used judiciously, it can bring security, satisfaction, and reward. Misused, it can cause death, as it did in the story of two men who were bribed to kill. In the end, the man who tempted them lost the very life he tried to preserve. His own. I shall return shortly. comforting to be certain that evildoers are paid back with their own evil. But it doesn't always work that way. So let me pass along my motto for peace and longevity. Do unto others as if you were the others. Our cast included Norman Rose, Marion Seldes, Russell Horton, and Mandel Kramer. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Listen to the poet when he says... The innocent and the beautiful have no enemy but time. Yes, innocence and beauty could survive in all their magnificence and glory for all of eternity if every clock in the world could be stopped forever. That might be a blessing for the innocent and the beautiful, but where would it leave the rest of us? Oh, hurry, operator. Please hurry. Answer me. Please answer. Operator. Put down that phone. This is the operator. May I help you? There's a man here who's going to kill me. Put it down. My name is Ella May Maltby. You heard one I Number 28 Bayard Circle. No. 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 <laughs> drama, Her Long Blonde Hair, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Lloyd Batista. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. The mute violin in its case. The piano standing alone in the empty room. The silent organ in the deserted church. What sweet songs have they sung in the hands of players who have long ago gone? A tall, dark-haired, and rather intense-looking gentleman of about 40 walks briskly down the crowded street. Now he stops. Evidently, something has caught his eye in a shop window. A look of horror seems to spread across his face. He is quite agitated. What could there be in a pawn shop window to cause him to feel such distress? With an obvious effort, he composes himself and walks into the shop. 
Yes, sir. You have a violin in the window. Uh, which one? The one in the open case with the bow. Yes. The bow, it, it's made of very light hair. Uh-huh. It looks like blonde hair. <laughs> I wouldn't call it blonde. You wouldn't? To the best of my knowledge, I don't think horses' tails come in blonde. It doesn't look like horse hair to me. It doesn't? Uh, it's a woman's hair. A woman's long blonde hair. I was under the impression that violin bows were made out of horse hair. Uh, this is obviously the blonde hair of a woman. I, uh, I, I want to buy that bow. Well, I couldn't sell it to you. You mean you wouldn't sell it without the violin? Oh, all right, all right, I'll buy that too. I couldn't sell you either one of them until the end of the day tomorrow. Why not? Because that's when the loan expires. Well, if you can't sell it, why did you put it in the window? Now look, mister, all I did was put it in the window 24 hours ahead of time, so who's hurt by it? Well, what would happen if you sold it to me right now? It doesn't make any difference because I'm not going to do it. I'll make it worth your while. What are you going to make worth my while? The person comes in here to claim the property tomorrow and I don't have it. They got a lawsuit. I could lose my license. I tell you, I must have it. You come around here at the close of business tomorrow. If it's still here, it'll be for sale. No, but it's very important. Why? Why is it so important? It's an ordinary violin, an ordinary bow. Why is it so important? Is is there anything I can do to convince you to sell it to me now? No, mister, there's nothing. Well, you had better listen to me. You see, I intend to have that bow. Look, 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 you listen to me. There's a button right next to my foot. All I have to do is step on it. In one minute, the cops will be here. Now, now, what do you say, huh? Do you want to go quietly? Like a gentleman. Howdy, Benjamin, honey. Ella May. Ella May, and right as rain. Here it is, 4 p.m. on the 15th day of July, and little Mama Ella May is turning up one more time, just like that bad old penny. Only this time, we got us a heap of good old pennies. $105 worth, and that's a living, breathing fact. Uh, let me get it out of the window. Mmm, you take one long, last look at that fiddle, Benji, because you never going to see it again, ever again. I hope so, Ella May. I know I said this before, but this time I mean it. I'm putting all that bad stuff behind me. Oh, yes, I, I'm going to get the band together just like we used to be, and I'm going to get me another recording contract. We're going back to Nashville, Tennessee, and then Hollywood, California. <laughs> You'll see it all in them big yellow lots, Benji. Your country cousin, Ella May. Now, you don't believe it. Oh, sure, 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 I believe it, Ella May. All that whiskey drinking, Benji, all them sniffing powders, they're gone. I made my decision, Benji. I seen my daddy in a dream, and he said to me, Ella May, child, I raised you to labor in the vineyard of the Lord. What are you doing on the payroll of the devil? You know, Ella May, a fellow was in here yesterday. He wanted to buy your fiddle. Well, he can't have it. He seemed awful anxious. Why don't you leave it here for another day? He might offer you a lot of money for it. Oh, no, I can't. Well, why not? It's just a fiddle. No, it ain't just a fiddle. See, it was hand-carved by my granddaddy. It ain't a masterpiece by one of them old-time Italian geniuses, but it's a part of my family. Benji, I couldn't leave her go. Not for a million dollars. All right, all right. I just thought I'd tell you. I couldn't make it without her. Just holding her makes me think of my daddy and granddaddy. And they'll keep me on the straight and narrow. Do you understand? Yes. It's going to be very hard for me. I couldn't make it without this fiddle. Well, I wish you luck, Ella May. The very best of luck. Thank you, Benji. And I hope and, and I pray I'll never ever again have to look at the inside of this place. No offense, Matt Benji. <laughs> None taken, Ella May. And when I get to Hollywood, California, I'm going to send you my autograph on a pawn ticket made of shiny, solid 24 karat gold. Do you believe it, Benji? Why, sure. Sure, I believe it. Ever 
And who are you? I'm not sure I know how to explain this. Mm. I followed you home. Did you? You don't look like one of my fans. But, honey, if you want my autograph... No, no, no. I, I, I don't want your autograph. You don't? Well, what do you want? M may I come in? I don't believe we've been properly introduced. I assure you, I'm a highly respectable person. They can be the most dangerous kind. Most of them lead lives of quiet desperation. Hey, I guess that threw you, huh? Well, I... You figure here's an ignorant little old country girl. Where'd she come off quoting Henry David Thoreau? But I had plenty of time to read in airplanes, hotel rooms, backstage, waiting to go on. My favorite pastime is reading poetry. Oh, then you, you see, we have a great deal in common. I teach poetry. No! Uh, yes, yes. My name is Damon McLeod. I'm a member of the faculty at Eastern State. Is that a fair? Uh, yes, yes. You see, here, uh, here's my driver's license. Um, my faculty ID. Well, well, come on in, Professor. Uh, yes, well, thank you. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to come to the point... That bow of yours, the, the fiddle bow. What about it? Well, I should like to buy it. Why do you want it? Well, name your price. Oh, it don't have a price. Uh, tell me, where did you get it? My granddaddy made it. Where did he get the hair? Off oh, in the tail of a pony. Where else? No, that, that isn't true. Are you saying it's a lie? Oh, oh, no, dear, I'm, I'm sorry. I, maybe, maybe I'd better go. Are you sure you're feeling all right? Huh. Uh, maybe you need a little country fiddling to get you back on your feet. And little mama, your country cousin Ella May, is loaded and ready. Why, well, just you listen here. I've never been better in all my born and blessed days. <laughs> You won't get away with it. What? You heard what that fiddle was saying. Mr. I... You heard her? Her voice? Now, mister, I, I think you have come to the wrong place. Uh, you, you better leave. No, no, I'm not leaving without that bow. I'm willing to give you everything I own just for that fiddle bow. I keep on telling you, it ain't for sale. Oh, you see, you see, I'm sure you don't care. You heard what it said, and it doesn't bother you. Oh, but you see, you'll, you'll be playing in a concert hall. Or, or perhaps on the TV before millions of people. And they'll hear it. But, uh, you see, don't you understand? I can't have that. I, I, I don't understand. What? Because it's her hair. Oh, yes, I want that bow. I won't leave here without it. Uh, now, honey, why don't you uh, 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 just sit down here uh, and I'll go in the kitchen and get a piece of wrapping paper. All right? Now, I'll be back before you even know I'm gone. Oh, I hope he stays for it. Oh, oh please, operator, hurry. Right. And some the hands. This is the operator. Oh, oh. Down that phone. My name is Ella May Maltby. He's going to kill me. Put it down. Number 28, May I Circle. I'm all sick. No. No. Oh, 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 oh. oh. You're, you're, you're hurting me. I, I can't. I can't breathe. Operator. Operator, may I help you? What did I hear on the radio today? Ella Mae Maltby was murdered? Well, we don't know she was murdered, darling. They said the telephone operator reported she was calling for help. There, there was a man in the room. He was about to kill her. Yeah. And the telephone operator heard her screaming. Sure, sure. <laughs> Look, honey, the lady making the call could have been having one of those hallucinations. What are you saying? Well, I mean, they're on drugs. Yeah, so many of them, and they just kind of... Well, you know, they go into these kind of scenes. Oh, yes, but... Besides, the... she died of a heart attack. She did? Yes, yeah, so stop playing detective. That's my job. No, no. You see, so many of them are just destroyed by the life they live. Like she was a little girl from the country, played a fiddle and sang. She made a lot of money, got a lot of publicity, and... She couldn't handle it. I guess it killed her. Happens all the time. 
Well, is there a possibility somebody could have been there and was attacking her? Well, I guess we'll never know. Did she have bruises? Sure. She was bruised all over. Well, doesn't that prove... She had a rough time these past two, three years. Honey, she was in the gutter. Ah, uh, I feel so bad. Yeah, I understand, but what are you going to do? Oh, listen, about dinner. We have some stew left from last night. You can warm it up. You mind? Why should I? It always tastes better the second day. Uh, say, listen, why don't I give you a lift? I'm worried. Oh, why? It's not much of a drive to the college, and the parking lot is very brightly lighted. It's filled with people when I get there and when I'll be leaving. Yeah, I suppose. Oh, yeah, I'm so excited. I always wanted to go to college. <laughs> well, you could have when we first got married. No, not with my father being sick and needing all that money. Well, I wish you didn't have to go at night. Oh, it's just this one course, honey, and it's only twice a week. Besides, it was the only one this particular professor teaches. This guy must be red hot. He's the authority on medieval English literature. His name is Dr. Damon McLeod. McLeod, huh? Damon McLeod. Why is it that that name sounds so familiar? <laughs> why the name is familiar to us, but why should it be familiar to him? And he's a homicide detective. Well, regardless of what the coroner may say, we know Professor Damon McLeod was instrumental in causing the death of Ella May. Is another lady about to enter his life? Mrs. Magda Sikorsky, wife of the aforesaid homicide lieutenant? We shall expand on this in Act Two. so they say. To be strictly accurate, what he fiddled on was not a fiddle, as we know it today, but a type of stringed instrument called, possibly, a rebec. But it was played with a bow. And since a bow seems to be the source of the drama in our story, we are certainly dealing with classic materials. Oh, come in. Oh, let me see. You are... Oh, no. Please, don't, don't, don't tell me. I'm so proud of my memory. I, I use a system... Oh, dear, but something's gone wrong. You, your name can't be Mrs. Helicopter. Oh, you're close. It's Mrs. Sikorsky. Well, so much for my system. <laughs> but I remember your first name, yes. Magda. Ah. Yes. You're here for your conference. Uh, yes, Professor McLeod. No, no, please. My name is Damon. I find when I'm teaching adults, this professor and Mr. and Mrs. business becomes terribly stuffy. Oh, I, I'm very happy I was able to get into your class. I'm interested in English poetry, you know, especially the very old ballads and folk songs. Uh, there are so many. Is there one you would like to analyze? Uh, Magda? Oh, excuse me. Uh, I was looking at that picture on your desk. Oh. I think she's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Such glowing golden hair. Yes. Long, shining blonde hair. She was my wife. Oh. She will always be my wife. But well, she's dead now. Oh, I'm sorry. She was... Well, she was killed. Oh, oh no. Yes, yeah, some... Some intruder, some robber. Well, a reminder, I suppose, that for all our sophisticated, complex civilization, and in many ways the raw animal passions of the barbarian savage still smolder underneath. <laughs> well, however, as they say, the world must go on. Tell me, did you have a poem in mind? Oh, yes. The Two Sisters. The Two Sisters? It's also called Benori. I'm aware of that. Do you object to the poem? Why should I possibly object? Well, I, I thought I detected a... The Two Sisters, or Benori. That's one of the hundreds of ballads sung there in the Middle Ages. Now, what shall be the basis of your analysis of the Two Sisters? Well, the story is simple. Two sisters who lived near the river Benori. The, the elder one was plain. The younger was beautiful, with long, flowing golden hair. Yes, yes. Uh, the knight in shining armor that every girl is waiting for arrives finally. 
he chooses the golden-haired young one. Yes, yes, we know that. The dark-haired older sister, driven to a jealous rage, pushes the younger sister into the swiftly flowing river. She drowns. Far, far away, her body is washed ashore. A passing minstrel sees the long golden hair and uses it to string his heart. Yes, but all of this the poem tells us. Where is your special insight? Later, the minstrel appears at the castle of the dead girl's father. And suddenly, before all the assembled people, the harp tells the tale of the murder. Yes, very well. Now, what conclusions can be drawn? Psychiatry had not yet been invented. But how do we know it was the harp that was speaking? The sight of the harp, strung with the golden hair of the dead girl, may have assailed the conscience of the older sister. How do we know that it wasn't the older sister's voice that was singing? We don't. Yes. The sight of the golden hair... May I develop this line of thought, Professor? Am I on sound ground? Professor McLeod? What? Oh. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Go ahead. See how you can develop that theme. Thank you, Professor. Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, Mr. Benjamin around. That's me. I'm Lieutenant Sikorsky, the police homicide department. Yeah, my credentials. You called and you said, well, you had some information about the murder of Ella Mae Maltby. Yes, sir, I did. Well, we don't know if it is a murder. The coroner's report listed as a fatal heart attack. If someone was in the apartment and tried to beat her up and that caused the heart attack, then it would be a murder, right? Well, if someone was in the room. I read in the paper that the telephone operator... The operator says Miss Maltby said there was someone in the room. Well, why don't you want to believe it? <laughs> well, because we have no way of knowing whether or not it's true. I mean, this girl was very deeply into drugs. There's one way we can find out. Oh, yeah? Lieutenant, maybe this is nothing. I liked her. She was a good girl, no matter what she did when she was having a bad time. She was a good girl. Okay. When... Things would get very bad. She would have to pawn the fiddle. And somehow that would bring her to her senses. She would straighten out, earn some money, come in here, buy it back, and stay free of drugs for a while. And then go through the whole routine all over again. Yes, yes. But this time I think she meant it. I, I'd like to think she meant it. Anyhow, the day before she was killed, a man came in here. Now look. Maybe this doesn't mean anything at all. No, no, go ahead. He wants to buy her fiddle. Well, now, not the fiddle. The bow. The bow? Yeah, he, he, he's all excited over this bow that belongs to her fiddle. Hmm. Is there any value in it? Oh, well, to him, yeah. To him, there is. I mean, it, it's just an ordinary, more or less cheap bow, but he gets this idea it's made out of a woman's blonde hair. And was it? I don't know. But what's the difference? He insists he has to have it. He, he almost gets violent. I, I, I say to him, the owner still has another day to redeem it. Come back after the deadline. Did he? No. Well, so that should be the end of it, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, except... I got this crazy idea. He waits outside the shop. He sees who she is. He follows her home. She doesn't want to sell him or give him the bow so. He kills her. Or gets her so scared she... She dies of a heart attack. Yeah, well, uh... It's just a theory. Well, like I said, Lieutenant, there's one way we can find out. Oh, yeah? She came in here with $105 she needed to redeem the pledge, Okay. She walked out with the case, in which was the fiddle and the bow. Now, tell me, Lieutenant, was the fiddle or the bow or both taken from her apartment? If they were there, then my theory about this guy is out the window. We're, we're dealing with uh, my imagination. But if they are missing, you got yourself a suspect. Hey, can I use your phone, a uh, local call? Oh, sure. See, I remember coming into the apartment. I saw the body, did I? Did I see a violin case? I don't remember. I'm not sure. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, this is Sikorsky. Give me the property desk, will you? Thanks. Jerry, Lieutenant Sikorsky here. The Ella Mae Maltby thing. You got a list of the stuff in her apartment in the file? Okay, good. Well, what about her fiddle and the bow? Are they listed? Huh. Is there a listing for the violin case? No? Oh, okay, Jerry, thanks. It uh, wasn't in the apartment, huh? No. But then I was right. Yeah, but we have no way of knowing if she took it home. Uh, maybe she sold it on the way. No, 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 no. If if she wanted to sell it, I, I told her she could get a lot of money if she left it here another day. Lieutenant, don't fight it. She left here, it was five o'clock. She got on the phone, called for help. According to the newspaper, it was about six o'clock. No, 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 no. She, she had to go right home. Well, can you describe this man? He, he was tall, well-built fella. He had dark hair, getting just a little thin on top. Regular features. And how old? Uh, maybe 50, give or take a year or two. Very intelligent fella. How could you tell? Well, we spoke. He spoke like a man with a good education. Besides, he was wearing a vest, and I could see he was sporting a Phi Beta Kappa key. You gotta have brains to get into that. Are you sure it was that kind of key? Well, don't I get enough of them in here? I have a whole tray full of them right there in the case. Uh, he didn't tell you his name or anything. No, what I just told you is everything I know. Why would he want that fiddle bow? Or why would he want it bad enough to kill her for it? You're busy, darling. I'm never too busy for you, Lieutenant. Just let me end this sentence. There now. Yeah, maybe... Maybe you can give me a hand. With your police work? Darling, what brings this on? You never asked me before. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe for the first time I'm dealing with a person that you would know better than me. And what sort of a person would this be? Well, an intellectual person. One who wears a Phi Beta Kappa key. He would be the one who caused the death of Ella Mae Maltby. Why would such a person kill her? Well, because she couldn't or wouldn't sell him the bow for a violin. Why would he want it? Yeah, I don't know. It was in the pawn shop window. He obviously had an obsession about that bow. He, he was convinced it was made out of a woman's blonde hair. A bow that was made out of a woman's blonde hair. That's absolutely... I guess it's remarkable. Oh, yeah? Why? I'm analyzing a Middle English poem. It goes back at least 600 years. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Where does that fit in? It's a harp. Well, we're not sure it's a harp. But it's a stringed instrument that was strung with the long, blonde hair of a murdered girl. Well, what does it have to do with all this? <laughs> well, now that you mention it, nothing. I wonder what Professor McLeod will have to say about it. Professor McLeod? Would his name be Damon McLeod? Yes, Damon. Uh-huh. Now, what does that mean? Uh huh. <laughs> Nothing. It's just when you mentioned his name the other day, I thought it sounded familiar. How would you know him? Well, I went back to the office. I checked it out. It was about a year ago. His wife was murdered. Oh yes, yes. He he told me she'd been killed by a a, a prowler or a burglar. Was the person ever caught? That kind. Ah, uh, yeah. You don't crack too many of those. Oh, pity. She was such a beautiful woman. She had the longest, loveliest-looking blonde hair. Now, you know all the facts in the case. So you're probably saying to yourselves, Hey, Lieutenant, how much more help do you need? But be fair. If all you knew was what they knew, how smart would you be? However... We'll give them a chance to prove themselves in Act Three shortly. It is written that gentlemen always seem to prefer blondes. 
We, of course, take no sides in this controversial area. We must remark, however, that our story describes a fascination with blonde hair that covers seven centuries. First, we are concerned with a poem about a medieval knight who preferred a blonde-haired girl to her brunette sister. And more recently, with a college professor who is obsessed with a violin bow that he insists is made of a lady's beautiful blonde tresses. And now, we continue. We've come to the end of another adventure in learning. In addition to your regular assignment, you might trace the origins, Anglo-Saxon, French, or Latin, of many of our everyday words. Well, until Thursday evening, then. Yeah, well, I'm going to... Do you have a moment, Professor? <laughs> well, only for those people who call me Damon. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, this poem I'm studying, this medieval myth, the legend, whatever, suddenly uh, uh, acquires a, a deadly modern significance. What are you saying, Magda? Or perhaps it doesn't. I, it, it may all be churning about in my imagination. If a poem can inspire the imagination, it becomes a living, vital thing. Well, what do you make of this? The death of a folk musician, a, a country musician, Ella May Maltby. Did what? Oh, what about it? Ella May Maltby. Well, she is murdered because of her fiddle bow. Well, I, I, I'm afraid I don't understand. It seems a man wanted to buy her fiddle bow, which she had pawned. Well, how do you know this? The pawnbroker told this to the police. Yes? A, a man who was evidently very distraught was desperate to buy the bow. Just an ordinary violin bow? Oh, Why? Uh, he was convinced it was made of a lady's blonde hair. Oh. The police now have a theory. Oh, yes. This man who wanted the bow so desperately followed her home and killed her for it. Well, if you will pardon the pun, we seem to be drawing a rather long bow. Oh, yes, perhaps. I, I just I just thought it was rather interesting. Yes, yes, I'm sure it is. The, uh, the pawnbroker, can he describe this rather distraught? Gentlemen? Oh, yes. He was able to give a very accurate description to the police. I see. Shouldn't this prove that there's nothing new under the sun? Well, good night, Professor. Uh, good, good night, Magda. He had taken three locks of her yellow hair, and with them he strung his harp so rare. He went into her father's hall, and there the court assembled all. He laid his harp upon a stone. And straight it began to play alone. Woe to my sister who murdered me. By the bonny shores of the Binori. You? Yes. What can I do for you? Why did you tell the police I killed her? Isn't it true? Oh, well, I didn't mean to. You see, it's just that I have this temper, this terrible, uncontrollable temper. Why, why did you tell the police? Because I liked her. She was a girl with heart. And because I lost a daughter to those same things that were destroying her. All of us have these terrible moments. I was walking past your window and I saw that violin bow and, and I stopped be because it was her hair. Her long blonde hair. Well, now, look, look, now look, look. stay look. where you are. Don't you now, move. Please, please let go You're of me. You're trying I... to move down to the other end of the counter where that button is. The one you told me about. The one you step on to call the police. Now, please, 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 just listen to me. I don't want to hurt you. Because I said to myself, that's her hair. It's her hair. Whose hair? Jessica's. Jessica's. You know, her name should have been Jezebel. Oh, please, please, don't get so you excited. Think I I'm... have reason to be excited. My wife. She married me for what? Just for my name. 
So she could be Mrs. Somebody, have a home, some money. Oh, she would run around with other men. She would laugh at me. She, she'd sit there and comb her long golden hair and, and laugh at me. Well, you should have divorced her. Divorce? Oh, does a divorce restore a man's honor? Does it erase the memory of her obscene laughter? Well... Oh, I can still hear her. I go out with other men because you're not man enough. I'll show you who's man enough, I said. And so I lashed out at her. I hit her again. And again. And again. Please let go of my so arm. she and... struck her head very hard against the piano leg. I could see the light just flicker and disappear from her eye. Please, Miss I... The last time I saw that golden hair, there was blood on it. And then I saw it again. It, it had to be hers. On that fiddle bow. You see, I know her hair. I love her hair. I followed that woman home. Please, could I get you a glass of water? And suddenly I came to my senses. That is, I thought I did. What sort of madness is this, I asked myself. I was about to go away when... when she began to play her fiddle. And she played it with that bow. And then I knew it was made of Jessica's hair. Look, mister, you got to understand that was you impossible. Fool. I heard it. The bow didn't make the fiddle play. It made the fiddle talk. And I could hear it say... I am the heir of Jessica McLeod, who was killed by her husband. Killed by her husband. Mister, that's impossible. It... Why did you have to tell the police about me? Now, look, look, I'm a citizen. I know my yes, duty. Yes, am I, I supposed to go to jail for the rest of my life? Sacrifice my career, my reputation for two stupid, worthless women? Mister, you need help. Well, what good are they? What use are they? One was a slut. The other was a drug addict. We don't have the right to judge. Shut up. I'd like to help you. Oh, yes, you'd like to help me right into prison. I'll help you. I'll help you to keep your mouth closed forever. <laughs> Don't you want any dinner? No, nah, I'm not hungry. Now, why do you say it was your fault? Uh, we should have kept an eye on that pawnbroker. But how could you know? Uh, the killer's crazy. He'd feel threatened. He'd want to silence anyone who might be able to identify him. And, and now, without that pawnbroker, the description doesn't mean a thing. I could never stand up in court. Oh, uh, well, I'll be late for class. Hey, you're working pretty hard. School can be tough if you've been out for a while. I wish I could do something to help you. Maybe you can. You want to retype my theme for Professor McLeod's class? <laughs> if it doesn't put me to sleep. Oh, come on, Lieutenant. You're a better typist than I am. <laughs> okay, okay. such a bad story. He had taken three locks of her yellow hair, and with them he strung his harp so rare. So on, so on, so forth. He laid his harp upon a stone, and straight it began to play alone. Woe to my sister, who murdered me by the bonny shores of the Binnery. me, Sikorsky. Uh, you remember maybe a year, two years ago, a woman named Jessica McLeod was murdered? Yeah. Well, you went out there. You talked to the husband. Do you remember what he looked like? Yeah, he was tall, maybe 50, dark hair. Did he wear a Phi Beta Kappa key? Yeah. Yeah, I remember it was hanging from a chain on his vest. I'd assume it was that kind of a key. Why? What's doing? 
Well, I'm not sure. Just yet. Is it possible? <laughs> How could it be possible? Why, Magda, what seems to be the trouble? Oh, it won't start. Yes, it doesn't sound good to me. Oh, I can't understand it. May I give you a lift? Oh, I, I couldn't put you to so much trouble. It's no trouble at all. Oh, well, I'm, I'm very grateful. I, I just called my husband, but there's no answer at home. Oh, uh, you, you just missed the turn. The turn? You have to go up Torrance to get to my house. But we're not going to your house. What? We're going to mine. What are you saying? My dear Magda, you're writing a theme on the two sisters. Oh, but, but please, listen, I, I... You think it's just a piece of poetry. Please. It's a statement of truth. Eternal truth. Professor, I... I Don't must... call me professor. It makes me angry. And you must not make me angry. <laughs> inside. Oh. See, I must prove something to you, to you, and to you alone. For only you can appreciate the truth and the poetic justice. Uh, see? Look. On the table. Uh, uh, a violin. And the bow. Yes. The bow. The bow that's made of her hair. Jessica's hair. Jessica? My wife. Oh. The wife I killed. Don't say a word. Do you play the violin? Uh, uh, I, uh, when I was a little girl, I... Pick it up. Oh, uh, but I, I haven't Do played Do as I say. Play. You play anything. Just as long as you run the bow across the strings, the bow will talk. Play. You hear? You hear what it says? What the bow is saying? I am the heir of Jessica McLeod, who was killed by her husband. Killed by her husband. Didn't you hear it? Didn't you? Let go of me. Let go of me. You heard it. Murder will out. That's the theme of all the ballads. Let go of my arm. Or are you going to kill me, too? Is that why you brought me here? Did you tamper with my car? Don't you make me angry. And if I do make you angry, does that give you the right to kill me? What did you prove by killing all these people? No. Your wife, poor Ella May Maltby, that inoffensive little old man. I showed them. What did you show them? I showed them I am a man. You showed them that you're an hysterical, unbalanced psychotic. Oh, no, no, don't say that. Whether I say it or not, it's the truth. Oh, oh let, let me help you. Help me. Now, you sit down and, and you just listen to me. <laughs> I think you're a real man. Oh, do you? Do, do you really? I do, yes. Of course I do. Magda! I, I, I saw your car in the school's oh, parking lot. Put that gun away, Lieutenant. Damon is all right now. Oh, that's the first time you ever called me Damon. It's true you killed your wife and, and Ellen... May Maltby and Mr. Benjamin, isn't it? Yes. But you don't have to do any more of that. We all know you're a man. Isn't he a man, Lieutenant? Absolutely. Uh, Jerry, do you and Frank want to escort the professor down to headquarters? I... Are you coming too, Magda? Yes. I'll see you there. I'm very sorry about those other people. But not about Jessica. Magda, are you all right? Oh, yes, I, I, I think so. I, 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 don't, I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't come along just now. Oh, you had him. <laughs> you solved it, Magda. Oh, I... 
so did you. You came here. Is it possible? A poem maybe 700 years old gives us the clues for a modern-day murder case. Why not? What's 700 years when it comes to the truth? The truth lives forever. It never changes. It endures all the ravages of time and space. It is the same now as it was in the beginning and as it shall be in the end. And if you're willing to wait just a few minutes, I may add to it when I return. Why do people kill people? Love, hate, jealousy, revenge. You can add as many more as you can think of, but you won't be able to think of any that are new or original. We are told that there is nothing new under the sun, which means that if there are no new virtues, there are no new vices. All we may add is new shadow. The substance shall always remain the same. Our cast included Lloyd Batista, Martha Greenhouse, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.